Step three, you grow hard about what you wanna be. Step four, everybody just do your thing. Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. 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 Wake up. Today's gonna be a good day Yo, Set your affirmations, aspirations I got shit to do, the aftermath of preparation Good food, good mood, blood in circulation One step at a time, yeah that's how you make it Set a goal you control and the steps you take them I try to pick one thought, have some concentration And if I make a mistake, it's called education I try to do this every day, call it replication Wake up, today's gonna be a good day Wake up Today's gonna be a good day. Wake up. 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 Today's gonna be a good day. Life ain't easy, y'all. I think there's a reason, though. Ups and downs, just like every different season, y'all. Sometimes I'm high, other times I'm barely breathing, though. You always gotta fight and hide from the demons, y'all Negative thoughts are poison, they ride uh. Head full of flaws, so here come the clouds uh. They'll never stop unless I can swap All the bad for the good in my head when I'm lost uh. Yeah, so I'ma fake it till I make it Positive thoughts are overtaken, I got patience One day at a time, it's how you operate a cadence A flow, you grow, you show yourself a foundation Stay away from all the shit that causes temptation I know that I like to do it cause of sensation I live my life in my head like a narration Don't expect greatness, do my best, man, I'll take it Wake up, today's gonna be a good day Wake up, today's gonna be a good day Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. 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 Step one, wake up early, gon' rise with the sun. Step two, get some good, some food in you. Step three, you grow hard about what you wanna be. Step four, f everybody just do your thing. Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. 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 Wake up. Today's gonna be a good day. Wake up. Today's gonna be a good day. Wake up. Today's gonna be a good day. Yo, set your affirmations, aspirations. I got shit to do. The aftermath of preparation. Good food, good mood, blood in circulation. One step at a time. Yeah, that's how you make it. Set a goal you control and the steps you take them. I try to pick one thought, have some concentration. And if I make a mistake, it's called education. I try to do this every day, call it replication. Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. 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 All right, we are here. Let me get this set up. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Laracon Online. Amazing to be back with everybody. Um, give me a second. Checking everything here. Looking good. Stream is live. All right. Um, one more second. Okay. I think we're good. All right. Here we go. Okay. A few uh, little bits of business here. 
and then we will uh, jump into our first talk. We have, I think, actually 19 speakers, so it's going to be a very, very full day, um, and we're excited to bring it to you. Let me do this. Okay, again, our second uh, Laracon, which is completely free. Thank you so much to the sponsors for making that happen. I think it's been really amazing to uh, be able to just broadcast this on YouTube and get it out to the whole world. Um, I think we're close to like 100,000 views on the last event. Uh, so it's really amazing to just reach so many more people. And uh, so, yeah, so definitely support our sponsors. I really appreciate it if you can do that tweet at them, check out their offerings. So critical to letting us uh, continue to keep this a free event. Um, so I am gonna go through a couple of those partners right here. Uh, Gold Partners obviously have really just done, I, I can't even tell you a tremendous amount to support this event, it's unbelievable. Um, and all these partners are longtime partners, which I, I really love. Um, so definitely make sure to check them out over at laracon.net slash swag it's also linked from the website amazing offerings we have sentry giving away three months uh for your application monitoring needs um Kirschbaum doing a thousand dollar open source giveaway titans doing a giveaway and also running this really cool laracon puzzle event where you can kind of be interactive and uh solve various puzzles and then um vehicles doing an iphone 14 or uh or samsung drawing uh, and also they're doing mob programming sessions today. So if you're interested in learning about mob programming, uh, go ahead and head to the swag page. There's a link there with details. They're actually uh, running an event during Laracon where you can hop in and uh, learn more about that. So check all that stuff out. Uh, there's that and so much more over on the swag page, hundreds of dollars of discounts and giveaways and everything else. Uh, so definitely please, please check that out. Silver Partners, again, amazing. Again, all uh, companies have sponsored in the past. So check them out. Uh, Kurotech and Jump, both giving away uh, Laracast subscriptions, which, I mean, that's like gold. Um, and then About You is actually a very large uh, uh, e-commerce shop in the EU. And they're giving away 10% off. Uh, so go have a shopping trip uh, if you live in the EU. Check them out. They're a huge Laravel shop. And again, always very consistent supporters of Laracon and Laravel. So thank you so much to, to all the silver sponsors. Again, community sponsors, right? We love these guys. Uh, many of them have left uh, offers on the swag page for their products and services. So please check that out. Um, a lot of great offers from the community partners. And then us founding partners, uh, Lara Jobs, Laravel News, and of course, Laravel Forge. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about us uh, later on, but um, we are offering $100 off job posting at Lara Jobs. So if you are looking for help in your Laravel shop, uh, obviously Lara Jobs is the best place to look, uh, both look for a job as well as post your job. So check that out um, and get $100 off with the code below. And special thanks, Koneko and Flick Nelson, obviously uh, just doing an absolutely ridiculous job uh, on the design elements and everything. This year, again, uh, you know, if you go back and look at the original Aircon online, uh, the website and the slides and everything compared to what these guys have just taken it up, I mean, you know, heights I never thought we'd see. So they've done an amazing job. Thanks so much to them, amazing community contributors to the event. Um, so really, really appreciate everything they do for the event. Okay, so we have over eight hours of, of uh, talks, um, 19 talks, which I think is probably our most ever, um, two rounds of lightning talks. So a whole variety of things going on. Um, obviously, if you can't stay for the whole thing, check out you know what you missed on youtube later it'll be up right after uh, the event we have swag again and merch i guess i should say merch um so store.laracon.net again also just linked from the main website t-shirts hats all that stuff check that out um again all with the amazing uh design and the illustration flicked did so uh really cool uh 
Flick also gave us the digital version of these great wallpapers again. I know a lot of you liked that last time. So uh, just on laracon.net, if you scroll down, there is like a digital swag section where you can download all these wallpapers, um, which are really cool. And the colors this year are just amazing. So if you're interested in that for your phone or your laptop or whatever the case is, check that out and download those. Those are just free. Um, like I said, everything will be up on YouTube after the event. Uh, I did want to know, notice or uh, note that um, I think I've got the auto closed captioning set up correctly. So hopefully YouTube is using its AI power to build some closed captioning for us right now. Uh, but either way, at the end of the event, we always send it off to be professionally closed captioned. Um, given that this is a very long video, it does usually take a couple of days for them to turn that around. Uh, but once we get those files back, then we will upload them into YouTube and then there will be a professional closed captioning uh, of the event. Okay, uh, obviously you have to subscribe and like, we need the likes, we need the subscribes. Go ahead, click it right now before you forget um, so that you're just aware of what we're doing. And of course the likes just help out with uh, the YouTube algo to uh, present us to more of the Laravel community. So please do that when you have a second. All right, I think we're ready. So exciting. Um, all right, before we have Kai come in, we're just gonna start off with a message from Sentry. They did a really nice video. So again, these are just a couple minute videos from our gold sponsors. So I really appreciate if you watch them and uh, check out their offerings. So let's go ahead and let me do that. Let me turn myself off here. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah and I lead DevRel here at Century. And today I wanna to tell you a little bit about our Laravel support. Let's get into it. So to get started, head over to our docs page on docs.century.io and click on the Laravel link, which you can see right here. Here you will have our install and quick start guides. So to install, all you need to do is use Composer and install Century Laravel. You can use this code snippet here to capture unhandled exceptions. You can configure your Sentry DSN with this command, and you can set your traces sample rate with this snippet right here. You can see here that a colleague of mine, Simon, was notified in Slack of an error that came through on a Laravel app. We've set up our Laravel project such that we will get alerts inside of Slack. And so you can see that this alert happened inside of this particular channel. And Simon is able to quickly click into it to be able to discover what is the problem. When we do click the link, we're taken directly into our app in Sentry, and we can see even more details about the error that occurred. This includes the error message, how many times this error has happened, and how many users were affected by it. When we scroll down onto this exception page, we can see some contextual tag information as well. Of course, we have our stack trace showing the exact line of code where this exception happened. And with this show more button, you can actually see all of the local variables and what was their value at the time of the exception. And of course, it's not just enough to know what state the application was in, but also how our users got there. So we have this timeline of activities that happened up until the exception occurred in our breadcrumbs section. And since we've enabled transactions on this Laravel app, we can also click in to get more detail to see how this error affected any of our service calls. Because a checkout request isn't just one single operation, we can also look into some of the details of the other operations that occur during checkout. And by clicking here, we can actually dig deeper into that same error that we were reviewing on the previous page, but this time showing information that is relevant to that particular transaction. That's how you can understand the health of your Laravel app with Sentry. Give it a try. Okay, thank you so much to Sentry. Um, again, check them out over on the swag page. Uh, they're offering three months free. So, I mean, just try it. It's free. Uh, and uh, it's a really great service. So highly recommend that. And please check them out. Um, okay. Let's do this. Let's do this. All right. Hello. Hello. Wow, I just saw you on stream. That's crazy. I know, and now I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, you're going to kick us off. Um, let me stop my share. 
I'm going to take over. That looks so good. Is, you're seeing the presentation view, not the speaker view? <laughs> yep, I am. You look, uh, cool. looks good. You're all set. I'm going to let you take it away. Cool. Then let's do this. So hello, everyone. Welcome to Laracon Online. I am super excited to be here. And I'm very excited and honored to be the one opening up the conference. So let's jump right in. My talk is going to be about using the type system to make impossible states truly impossible. So my name is Kai Zasnowski. Here's a picture of me in case the video isn't enough. You can find me on any of those four pages um, except for SoundCloud. And you should check out my GitHub because I also do open source stuff. And I think some of it is pretty neat. So let's get into the actual talk because none of you actually care who I am. So here we go. All right. I am going to start this talk with not a disclaimer, but sort of I want to frame this talk a little bit because this is going to be about strict types and type hints and all that stuff. And these things can be a little contentious, let's say. I want to sort of establish where I am coming from. So you can at least follow my arguments through this lens, even though you might disagree with some of my conclusions, which by the way, is a very healthy thing to be able to do. So let's get started. Things I like. I like static analysis tools. I think they're pretty cool. I like well-typed code. And by that, I mean code that actually uses type hints and not just doc block annotations. And I like it when tools yell at me when I'm making a mistake. So these three things really go hand in hand because if I want tools to be able to yell at me when I make a mistake, these tools need to be able to understand my code. And the way we usually communicate to these tools is with type information, right? That's how static analyzers are able to follow the data flow inside of your application. So all this kind of leads you to write code in a certain way. It usually ends up being very explicit and you may or may not like the style of code. I happen to like it, but just so you're aware, this is kind of the lens through which you have to view this talk. And yeah, let's get started. Oh yeah, I also like my wife. Okay, so let's look at some code. There are going to be three examples in this talk. And the first one is about preventing time travel. So let's say you have some kind of clock component in your application. Right, so it's an abstraction around waiting for a specific amount of time, getting the current time. I think this sort of thing is more common in library code than it is in application code, because in a library, you might not necessarily want to pull in a dependency like carbon if you're not already depending on it, but you still might have to deal with time uh, in, your, in the package somewhere, and you want to be able to test this without the test suite actually taking forever. So you might have something like this. Now, all the examples we're going to look at are simplified, meaning this interface probably has more methods than just this one, but we only care about this one, so that's the only thing I'm showing. We're also not going to see any implementation of these methods because that's not what we care about. Okay, so this clock has a method called wait that takes a number of seconds and then presumably waits for that number of seconds, right? The call essentially blocks for this number of seconds. And what we're interested in specifically is this part, the parameter and its type. So we have declared seconds to be an integer, which I think makes sense, right? With dates and times, I'm never quite sure. I think seconds are integers. Let's just for the purpose of this example, assume seconds are always integers, okay? There's probably some fractional second nonsense, but I think this, this looks pretty reasonable, right? So how we can then use this method is by, for example, saying, wait 69 seconds, which is pretty nice. And that works as expected. We can also do this. We can wait for zero seconds. And that can be useful depending on how you're calling this method, right? Like the parameter, for example, could be computed somewhere in your application. And handling zero, this is essentially a no op, right? It doesn't actually wait. Um, but this would allow you to like eliminate a conditional that you would otherwise have to write around. Um, if the number just happened to come out as zero, you can still just call this method. So this can be useful. The issue is that this is also possible. We can call wait with negative five seconds, at which point you get time travel, baby. So this call doesn't really make any sense, right? Like waiting for a negative amount of time, what does that even mean? So the problem we're having here 
is that this is a perfectly valid use of the method. This type checks, this is syntactically correct, everything works, but it's also complete nonsense. And we, you know, the humans, we can tell that this is nonsense. Waiting for a negative amount of time doesn't make any sense. If I were to tell you, meet me in minus 50 minutes, you'd ask me what kind of drugs I'm on, right? We can tell that this is nonsense, yet it's possible because PHP and static analyzers can't tell that this is nonsense. Because the only information we have provided them with is the type information. And the type information said that seconds is an integer. And minus five, perfectly valid integer. PHP doesn't differentiate between signed and unsigned integers. So negative values are a okay. So here we have a call that's kind of nonsense from the get go. Ideally, this shouldn't even be possible, yet it is possible. So let's say we wanted to avoid this from happening because waiting for a negative amount of time is essentially undefined behavior, right? And weird stuff could happen if we just allowed this value to propagate through the system. So what you would usually do is you would add what's called a guard clause at the beginning of this wait method, where you check that the parameter you've been provided with satisfies certain requirements. In this case, it needs to be zero or greater. It can't be negative. And if it isn't, then we throw an exception. So you should probably also provide a more helpful exception message than I did here, but it's kind of the way you would go with this, right? At least this way you could prevent weird stuff from happening and let the user know that, yo, there's something weird with your code. You just try to go back in time. This works, but I also think it misses the point a little bit because this is fixing the symptom. The problem is that this call shouldn't even be possible. The real problem is, that seconds just isn't an integer because integers can be negative, but seconds can't. You can represent seconds as an integer, sure, but it apparently has additional rules it has to satisfy that our regular integer doesn't. So if it isn't an integer, then what is it? Well, if I were to tell you in real life, like wait for me for a specific amount of time, what do we call this specific amount of time? It's a duration, right? You wait for a given duration. So ideally, we would be able to type in this as duration. So let's try and narrow our types. Now, PHP obviously doesn't come with a duration class. The closest thing is probably date interval, which I find incredibly clumsy to use. But duration like that doesn't really exist. So the way we introduce this as a type in an object-oriented language is by adding a class, because every class also introduces itself as its own type. So let's try and do this. And here is the final keyword. You'll be fine, don't worry about it. It doesn't have anything to do with the example. I just couldn't resist. So we have a duration class here and it's really pretty straightforward. All it does is it wraps the same integer we had before. I made it read only so it's immutable, up to you. But that's all it is. However, this is also where we're gonna add this if condition we had inside the wait method. In the constructor of the duration class itself, what this means, and this I think is a very important, one of the most important things when it comes to object-oriented programming that I think a lot of people are kind of glossing over is objects need to guarantee that they're always in a valid state. It shouldn't be possible to create or manipulate an object in such a way that it is in an internally inconsistent state, right? The object has to guarantee its own invariance, the, its own rules that it has to satisfy. By putting this in the constructor, we have essentially made it impossible to create a duration instance that has a negative value. So that's pretty cool. The other nice thing about having an actual class for this concept is that we can improve our API a little bit. Because right now, the only reason we know that the unit we're dealing with here is seconds is because the parameter is called seconds. But depending on your IDE or text editor, you might not see the parameter names and then you have to click into the implementation and have a look at what the parameter name is. It's kind of uh, not that great. But now that we have an actual class for this, we can just add a name constructor, for example, call it seconds, and it takes the number of seconds and just returns an instance of this. It basically just calls the constructor internally, but we've kind of removed this ambiguity by saying duration seconds five. Now it's very clear what the unit is. And you can imagine we could easily add minutes, hours, days, and all they would do is just take in the integer and then multiply it by whatever value to get back to the number of seconds. Because we always want to deal with the seconds internally. It's just the easiest um, way to do, easiest to do math with it. But this is another benefit that having an actual object for this gives us. And that's it. 
That's the entire duration class. That's all it does. It wraps the integer, but it also guarantees this rule that this specific integer has to follow and prevents being created otherwise. So if we go back to the system clock now, let's update our method signature. And instead of accepting just any int, we accept the duration instead. And just by doing that, we can immediately get rid of this if condition because now this condition is guaranteed by the type. You cannot have a duration object that is negative. That means everywhere in my code base where I'm now getting past the duration object, I know for 100% that the value is going to be correct or it's, it's sensible, right? It can't have a value that's negative. I know this um, whenever I deal with a duration object. So here's how you would use this. We could say clock wait and then duration seconds five. I think this reads pretty nicely. There's no ambiguity of what the, um, what the unit is. We don't have to do weird stuff where we have to multiply some integer by like 60 and then 24 to get some other unit. It's very expressive that way. So that works as expected. What about this one? This was the problematic bit from before. Now it get, gives us a type error because we expected a duration object, but we got an int instead. To be fair, whoops. Standby, technical, technical problems. Standby, standby. To be fair, this error would also happen for valid integers, right? If we pass in positive five, we get the same error because any integer is now off limits. But if we try to do something like this, where we really wanted to create a negative duration, we would still get an error just for a different reason now because the duration object cannot be created with a negative value. So we have made it literally impossible to even call this wave method with a negative, with an invalid input, right? It just doesn't work anymore. We've taken something that was syntactically possible, but semantically wrong and made it actually nonsense on the type level. It just isn't possible anymore. So noise. So let's move on to the second example, seller-friendly discounts. So imagine you're writing some kind of e-commerce application and in there, of course, you have some kind of shopping cart. And again, the shopping cart here, the example is simplified. So the shopping cart really is just an array of products. And the products probably have a price and a quantity, I guess. And then we have a total method that we don't really care about, but it supposedly loops over this products thing. And then there's some high level math to calculate the total value of the shopping cart. Pretty straightforward. Now. Let's make some money. What we want to be able to do is apply a discount to this shopping cart. And one way we could model this is by adding a discount field to this class. And it's a float or null. So null meaning there's no discount applied. And if it's a float, that's the percentage of the discount. So we have a 25% discount. This field would be 0 0.25, right? And then we also have an apply discount method, which really is just a fancy setter that takes this percentage and just sets the field. And then the total method you know, has to account for the fact that there might be a discount and potentially multiply by one minus the discount, I guess, I think. Okay, cool. Pretty straightforward. What we're interested in is this part, the percentage parameter and its type. So we're saying it's a float, right? Which makes sense given what I just explained, that we want this to be a, to represent the percentage, we have um, a float, so 25% of the 0.25. That seems to make sense. That's kind of a very common way of representing percentages in code. So what we can then do, for example, is apply, apply a blazing discount of 42%. Well, oh, that's weird, there's a trading zero there, that's strange. Anyway, that works, however, you might see where I'm going with this now. We can also do this, which is a 0% discount. Um, and that to me feels a little different than the zero second wait from before, because that could still be useful. This is just straight up nonsense. A 0% discount just isn't a discount, it's just the original price. What's even worse though, is that we can do this. We can apply a minus 10% discount, which straight up by definition, isn't a discount anymore, right? If you're a seller, you'll love this one. If you're Scrooge McDuck, this is great. You just made everything 10% more expensive. But luckily for us buyers, we can also go the other way. We can apply a 200% discount, 
So now not only does the seller have to give us the shopping cart for free, they also have to pay us the original price of the items in the shopping cart. So if you have a discount like that, you're going to be out of business in a week. So similar issue to what we had before. All these calls, the minus, uh, minus 0.1, the 0, the 2.0, they're all perfectly valid uses of this method the way we've defined it. But we also know that it's complete nonsense, right? A zero uh, minus 10% discount just by definition isn't a discount. This call doesn't make any sense. But PHP and static analyzers don't know this because we've told them percentage is a float and 2.0 and 0 and 0 0.1 are perfectly valid floats. So you might do the same thing as we did before. We add a guard clause to the shopping carts apply discount method. And we essentially add some kind of bounds check, right? The percentage has to be greater than zero and less than or equal to 100. And if not, we throw an exception. Same idea as before. We at least prevent any weird stuff from happening if we just blindly started using this value. Again, though, this is kind of fixing a symptom. The real issue is that a discount just straight up isn't a float, right? It obviously isn't because floats can be negative, a discount can. Floats can be zero, a discount can't, and floats can certainly be greater than one, and a discount can't. You can represent the discount as a float, sure, but it has a lot more rules than any other float has. It only allows a very specific number of floats, right? So it clearly is something else. So what is it? Well, I have said the word discount approximately 500 times in the last two minutes, because that's exactly what it is. A discount is just that, it's a discount. If you're writing an e-commerce application, discount is an actual concept in your business domain, right? That is something your application has to deal with. This is a concept that business people will understand, that you will understand. It's its own concept. So we should have something in the code base that actually represents this concept. So let's try and narrow our types. Let's introduce this discount type. Once again, we will create a final class called discount. And this time, instead of wrapping an int, we wrap the float. So it's the percentage internally. And we also add this if condition to the constructor to check that the percentage is within the allowed bounds. So same as before, we're preventing a discount from even being constructed with a value that's outside of these bounds, right? We're guaranteeing that the discount, if you have an instance of it, is always in an internally consistent state. Same as before, though, now that we have a class, we can improve the API a little bit. So the one thing that I kind of always dislike a little bit about using floats to represent percentages is there's a little bit of ambiguity there about what your 100% is. So if I have 0 0.5, is that 50% or is that half a percent, right? There might be conventions around this, but it's still there's some ambiguity there. So why not add a method and call it percent off and it takes an integer. And then we just divide by 100 internally to get back to the float because having the float internally is pretty nice because it allows us to do math with it. But there's no reason to ex like subject the user to this implementation detail. By doing something like this, we can say discount percent off 50. There's no ambiguity. This is 50%. It's literally what it says, right? So cool. We've encapsulated its logic and improved our API. So let's go back to the shopping cart and change our types around. So instead of accepting a float, we now accept a discount object. The rest stays the same, except that we can now remove this if condition again, because same with the duration from before, the discount object now guarantees this behavior, but it is always within these bounds. When we accept that discount object anywhere else in our code, we will never have to worry about this specific minutia again. So here's how we use it. We can say cart applied discount and then discount percent off 25. Again, I like how this reads. This is pretty straightforward, pretty expressive, no ambiguity, pretty cool. This doesn't work anymore because now we get a type error, same for minus 10 and zero and 200, right? Like all these other um, examples don't work anymore. Even if we try and wrap them in a discount object, the discount object itself is just gonna prevent that. So once again, we've made a situation that was supposed to be impossible having a negative 10% discount. 
but was possible syntactically and made it actually impossible on the type level. It is now nonsense on the type level and static analyzers will understand this. So noise. Now, the last example is a little bit more involved because I have taken it from an actual application that I work on at my day job. I have kind of simplified a little bit, but the core concept and the core problem is the same. So I have to give you a little bit of background for decode examples to make sense. And this example is going to be about device IDs. So what do you see? You might see, I see a rectangle, but I say, no, you see an application. This is your application. And in our application, we have users, like almost every application. And let's give this user a name and call him, I don't know, let's just pick a name at random, Aaron, right? It's the first one on the list. And so Aaron and any user in this application, in fact, have devices associated with them. And the device for the purpose of this example is a laptop, a computer, a mobile phone, a desktop computer, right? Any of those things. Um, so that's associated with a user. To keep it simple, we'll say there's a one-to-one -one relation. A user has exactly one device. So Aaron also has a device. And now you might look at this and say, well, this looks pretty straightforward, right? We have two models, uh, user and device, and there are some kind of relation, probably two tables, a foreign key. What's the deal here? Well, this would be easy if that's actually where Aaron's device lived. But Aaron's device, alas, is all the way over here across the big cloud in the sky we call the internet in some external system that we don't have direct access to. We have to go through some kind of API, right? It's a third party service. We don't actually have the device information in our own application. All that we have is the device's ID. And the ID of the device is always a UUID, okay? So instead of Aaron having this entire device associated with him, he just has the device ID. So if we ever want to know more about this device that's associated with a user, we have to actually perform a network call to look up the information in this other service. So this is kind of the lay of the land. Now, we have some kind of user model. And really, all we care about for this example is that the user has a device ID field. And it's a string that contains the device ID, the UUID of the device that's associated with the user. And let's ignore the situation where there might not be a device assigned. To keep it simple, there's always a device assigned, right? So having a string seems fine because it's a UUID. Then we, of course, also need some kind of way to look up the device's information based off of that device ID. And for that, we could have some kind of device repository. And this is kind of unrelated to the talk, but I thought it would be interesting to point out. This is a good example why device repository does not, sorry, repository does not imply database. Okay, I think a lot of people conflate these two things. This repository would perform a network call, which is completely fine. I just thought I'd put that out there. I'd be happy to elaborate somewhere else. But yeah, I thought it would be interesting. Anyways, so this repository has one method we care about for now, which is called find. It takes the string and then returns a the device or null, depending on if it found one. So we are interested in this part. We're claiming that device ID is a string, right? Which seems sensible because it's a UID. Foreshadowing. So the way you would use this in the application most of the time is you have the user object from somewhere, right? It might be the user from the request, but you have the user object, and then you want to just grab the device ID from this object and pass it in here. So you would do something like this, right? You just say user device ID, and that's how you usually call this repository class. And that works as expected. However, we're claiming any string goes. So does every string go? Can we pass in an empty string? Can we pass in a string that's not a UAD? Well, yeah, we can. But we also know that these calls will never return a device. Because I've said, a device ID is always a UUID. So passing in anything that isn't a UUID, we already know ahead of time that it's never going to find anything. So these calls are nonsense, right? Yet they're still possible. That was a crazy transition. Let's look at this again. Woo. Okay. Anyways, so one thing we can do 
is we can have some kind of if condition at the beginning of the method where we just check, is this device a valid UUID? And if not, we just immediately return null. There's no need to perform the network request. We already know that it's going to be null. We could also throw an exception. I just decided to return null here, right? Um, the Ramsey UUID is like the canonical package for PHP to deal with UUIDs. If you're using Laravel, which I assume you are, uh, then this is already included because Laravel itself depends on it. So if you've ever used Laravel string helpers like str UUID and str ordered UUID, you get back one of these things. So there's nothing you have to install in order to make this work. You can just write it exactly like this. So yeah, this would work. It would prevent a unnecessary network request. But again, I feel like it's missing the point because the point is that a device ID just isn't a string, right? Because strings can be empty, but a device ID can't. Strings definitely don't have to be valid UUIDs all the time, but a device ID does. You can represent the device ID as a string, sure, because you can represent a UUID as a string, but it has other rules. It has to satisfy other requirements that a regular string doesn't have to satisfy. So if it isn't a string, then what is it? Well, in this case, it's kind of obvious, I would say. A device ID is a UUID, right? So let's try and narrow our types a little bit more. So this one is a little different. So we have some kind of eloquent model here. What we could do is we could just update the doc block to say, well, this now returns UUID interface. And that would successfully trick static analyzers and your IDE into believing that that's the case without actually changing the fact that it's still a string. So now it's just wrong, right? So this is not how we're going to do it. We're going to leave it like that because we're going to change something so that this annotation is actually correct. But the way you do this in Laravel is by using casts, attribute casts, model casts. I don't know what to call them exactly. And I have put a link to the relevant part of the documentation in the bottom left because I'm going to be going through this fairly quickly. I'm not going to show you how to implement a custom caster because they're not that complicated, just because I don't have enough time. I will publish these slides afterwards so you don't have to screenshot this uh, or be afraid that it's forever lost. But we're going to just go through this very quickly. So you add this cast array to the model. And in here, we essentially describe some kind of mapping of field name to what caster should be applied to the value of that field. And we want the string that we save in the database to be turned into a UUID. Now, Laravel doesn't come with a built-in UUID caster, so we would have to write our own. And this is the part I'm kind of glossing over. This is a class you would have to write yourself, the UUID cast. Essentially, what it does is it takes in the raw value, in this case, the string, and then it's supposed to return, in this case, the a UUID, right? Or throw an exception if the string value isn't actually a UUID. So then after doing this, if we try to access the device ID field on the user object, uh, we would get back a UUID interface like the doc block claims. Cool. So now that we have introduced this type and changed the field uh, type of the user to this type, let's go back to our repository and change this type up here from string to just UUID interface. And just by doing that, once again, we can get rid of this condition because you can't have a UUID interface or a UUID that isn't also a UUID, right? It, it makes sense in this case. So it's now guaranteed by the type again. So let's try and use this. We can say repository find user device ID. This works because user device ID now returns a UUID interface and the find method ex expects that type. So that works, that type checks and that behaves as expected. This doesn't work anymore. We can't just pass in a string because it's the wrong type. Same with any other string. So now we've ruled out like a whole bunch of possible errors where we are just passing in any kind of string where we already know it's not going to return anything. We've actually encoded this information at the type level. Like if PHP was compiled, right? Like this would be a compiler error. It's kind of always how I like to think about it. Cool. However, I forgot to tell you something. So I forgot to tell you that, yeah, users, um, they have UUIDs too. So not just the device ID, but the user itself has a UUID. So the user class doesn't actually look like this. It looks like this instead. 
So it also has a UUID field, the UUID of the user, that uses the same caster. So both these fields return the same value, uh, sorry, the same type, which means, yeah, yeah, we can also do this. We can try and call the device repositories find method with the user's UUID, which, yeah, it's a, okay, it type checks, right? The user's UUID is in fact a UUID, but again, we, the people, the humans, we can tell that this doesn't make any sense unless you have a UUID collision, right? This call will never return anything. And it's kind of annoying to me that this is even possible. This shouldn't even be a sensible call to make. This should be some kind of, well, you know, quote unquote compiler error. So that seems to suggest that a device ID isn't a UUID. You can represent it as a UUID, but we kind of want to differentiate it from other UUIDs in the same system. So if it isn't a UUID, what is it? Well, I said the word device ID so many times it stopped sounding like a word because that's exactly what it is. A device ID is a device ID. It's its own concept, right? In this application, the concept of a device ID exists because we don't actually store the device itself. So we're having to deal with this raw string a lot. And this particular raw string that looks like a UID is actually kind of special to us. So let's try and encode this into our type information. Let's try and narrow our types. So we create, oh, I forgot the final here, dang it. Uh, we create another class called device ID. And notice how it's wrapping a string, not a UUID interface or anything like that. That's because there's no reason to wrap it twice, right? All we wanna be able to make sure is that the string we're passing to the constructor is in fact a UUID. We don't have to turn it into yet another object. We can just use the string that's easier to deal with, right? But we wanna make sure so that's why we put the if condition here in the constructor that we can actually create an instance of this class that isn't a valid UUID. And in this case, that's all we have to do. So we just kind of made a more specific kind of UUID just to be able to differentiate it from other kinds of UUIDs in the same system. So what we can then do is we can go back to the user and update the types accordingly. So we would have to implement a respective device ID cast um, that takes a string and returns a device ID. It essentially works the same way as the UID cast goes. So once again, check out the docs on how to implement them. But now we have two distinct types for these two separate fields. So if we try to do the same thing again from before, after we change the device repository's uh, method signature from UID interface to device ID, now, this bit from before isn't actually possible anymore because we get a type error. Because we expected a device ID, we got a UUID interface. Now we've made it explicit, this isn't just any UUID, we're expecting a very specific kind of UUID, and it's in the device ID field of this user object. So cool, once again, we've ruled out a whole bunch of possible calls that we know ahead of time are nonsense, and they're now actually nonsense on the type level. So noise. Now, I can already, I don't have the chat open, but I can already hear some people go, yeah, that's, uh, that's some pretty cool over engineering you have there, dude. Like you took a string and made it really complicated. Okay, so obviously you can overdo this, right? I am not saying create a first name, last name, favorite fruit, mother's maiden name class for every possible string in your system or every possible number in your system. If that's what you're taking away, I have failed. The reason I extract a device ID in the last example was because for this particular application, device ID was actually an important concept that existed in this domain, right? We're dealing with this particular string so much that it has a special meaning to us that other UUIDs don't have. And in this case, I actually want to make this explicit in the code and to make it really clear when we're dealing with specifically device IDs and not just any string or any UID. It's very dependent on the application if you have to extract something like this or not, or if you should extract something like this or not. So I don't actually want you to look at these specific examples I gave too much, but it's Instead, there's a pattern that I want you to notice, and that's the real thing I want you to take away from this talk. 
So if we go back to the three examples from before, we have the clock, the shopping cart, and the device repository. And then we zoom in a little bit. This is what they looked like right before we extracted the duration, discount, and device ID class, right? And they all follow the exact same pattern. All of them say they declare a type that is fairly broad, any int, any float, any string, right? And then they immediately check that it's not any string, not any float, not any string. Right? It's a very specific kind of int, specific kind of float. So whenever you are like immediately contradicting the type definition we have given in the method declaration. So if you see this pattern happen in your code base, it can be a sign that there's something in here that is, is trying to get out, right? There's some concept in here that's kind of being hinted at by these if conditions that isn't explicitly named in the code base yet. I know this whole talk started out by being sort of a type safety thing, but this is just like domain modeling, like it's not really architecture, but you get the point, right? Like if you identify why is this if condition here, like why does this specific float have to have these bounds, right? That seems to suggest it is something specific to my code base, right? It probably has some kind of meaning, especially when you see this happen in multiple places in the same code base, and it always relates to the same kind of data. So if you have a, an e-commerce application, you're probably dealing with discounts in more than just one place, right? And if you represent the discount always as this float, then technically you would always have to have this bounds check in place whenever you accept just a raw float to represent the discount, right? Because anywhere this problem could potentially happen. I know realistically you're not gonna, right? You're gonna have this in one place and then you're gonna say, well, I know by the time this method gets called, it has been validated somewhere, hopefully, you know, until it hasn't. Um, so you're just gonna leave it out. But if you see this happen in multiple places for the same kind of data, that is a very strong sign that there's something in here that is important to your application, that has meaning to your application that you haven't been able to name yet. And then taking that and extracting it can be very, very, can make your code very expressive. It can really make your, make you understand your own domain better, right? Because you've identified this concept and now you go, oh yes, of course, and everything sort of falls into place. If there's only a single place in your code base, let's say you have this wait method, and it's the only place where you're dealing with like seconds that have this specific um, requirement, then you don't have to extract this, right? I probably would because I like having very explicit types, but by all means, just have the inline statements, you're fine, right? But think about it when you see this happen, if there could be something in here that you just haven't quite identified yet. So to sum this all up into a single slide, if a parameter has to satisfy certain invariants, certain rules, right, certain requirements, then consider promoting it to an object that guarantees these invariants. So we took the duration and we made sure that you cannot create a duration object that is negative. The type, the object, the concept, it guarantees this rule, it encapsulates right, the state and the behavior, there we go again, it's object-oriented programming, it encapsulates these two things and gives them a name. And I can almost guarantee you that you have some part in your current code base where you would be able to do something like this and it would improve uh, the overall code base because now you've actually named some concept that wasn't named before. So I hope that this was useful. I hope there was something in here that you were able to take away from this. The final classes are now over, I think. Uh, so you can breathe a sigh of relief again. Let me know if this was useful to you. You can reach me on Twitter. And thanks a lot, Ian, for having me. And to everyone else, I wish you a great, well, not term, also you, Ian. I wish you a great rest of the conference. So thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. That was awesome. Really, really good stuff. Great way to start yeah. off the event. Thank you. Cool. Stop. All right. All right. We're going to move on here, though. We got lots and lots and lots to cover. All right. Let's see. Okay. All right. This looks good. Okay. Uh, before we get to the next talk,
just want to talk for a second about Curotech. Um, Curotech is a software development services company focused in the Laravel and Vue.js ecosystems. Uh, if your company is looking to outsource a project or hire contracted uh, staff to augment your developers, get in touch with them. Um, they're longtime Laravel sponsors, longtime Laracon sponsors. So a uh, really great team to work with. Check them out. Uh, you can do so at the URL below. And then also don't forget at uh, laracon.net slash swag, uh, they have a giveaway going on as well. So check that out. Um, and also a video there. So you can uh, give that a look as well. And thanks a lot to them for sponsoring. Really appreciate it. All right, let's see. Now we're gonna talk about some servery stuff which this is an area I'm not as good in. So I'm pretty excited to hear this talk. So Boson's getting connected. There we are. Hello. Oh, almost there. Hey. Hi, how are you? Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Okay, I can hear you. All right, so I'm going to let you take it away. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I can't share my screen yet. Okay. There we go. Okay, cool. You, you, and yeah. So hi everyone, and good to be at Laracon once again. And I'm very happy to be here. And I'm also excited because this is my first Laracon talk and it's good to be here. So I hope everyone have um, a great uh, time at Laracon this time. So uh, let's just jump right to my talk. I will be talking about Kubernetes and Laravel. And just before we start, I'm going to just say a little bit about myself. My name is Bosso Egberinde, and I work at Shopify currently as a backend developer. And I'm also building PHP Sandbox and also play the PHP Sandbox, which is a place where you can actually try out Composer packages just before you install them. And on PHP Sandbox, you can actually get to write um, PHP codes in your browser. You can actually run your Laravel app and the likes in the in the browser. So that's a little bit about myself. So about this talk. So this talk is just a basic introduction to Kubernetes from a high level point of view. So we are not going to be carrying on and exploring some inner sides of what Kubernetes is. So because we are obviously not going to be having a lot of time for that. And then is a soft landing on how you can get started with Kubernetes and Laravel as well. So let's get right to it. Why are we even talking about Kubernetes to start with? And the reason I'm going to give for this answer is just because of the way the Laravel community is. The Laravel community presents us with a lot of options. For example, if I don't want to use Homestead for my development environment, I could use Valet. If I don't want to use Valet, I could use Laravel Sail. If I want to choose a front-end um, tool, I can use Inertia, I can use Laravel Livewire. We even got help from someone from the community as well. So this is just uh, the approach. This is just the intent of actually getting to add more options to the table as far as what we can uh, do with Laravel is concerned. In case you are looking at maybe starting to look at what you want to use Kubernetes for, this uh, is just adding to that option on the, on the list. So moving on, let's get started by just talking about Kubernetes briefly. So 
From the makers of Kubernetes, the search is an open source system for automating deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications. So this probably means if your app is not containerized, Kubernetes is probably not um, something that you are meant to use because Kubernetes only work with containerized applications to start with. So Kubernetes handle all the management, the scaling, all the efforts that goes into you trying to do all of that by yourself. Kubernetes actually does that on your behalf. So basically you give a containerized application to Kubernetes and then Kubernetes can run it, it can manage it, it can scale it, it can self heal it if uh, the container gets destroyed or crashes or something like that. So Kubernetes can do all of that and even more for you. So why do we have Kubernetes in the first place? Why was it invented? The reason why it was invented is just to actually solve the problem that comes with running containers. You know, the invention of one problem leads to the, uh, the creation of another, this invention of a solution to a problem leads to the creation of another problem and all of that. It goes on and on like that. So containers came in and the pain that comes with trying to manage containers actually came with it as well. So Kubernetes is designed to actually um, attempt to fix things that could go wrong with you trying to run your containers. So whether you are running it on a virtual machine or you are running it on a um, on physical machine, there are just so many things that could go wrong with running off containers. We can say, okay, what if the container crashes? It could run out of memory. It could um, use up its space. It could, it could probably be the host that is even going to die while the container is running. Or even the container runtime itself could die or they are just, a plethora of things that could go wrong while you are trying to run your container. So, and that is why Kubernetes was designed to actually approach and solve those problems. So how does Kubernetes do the things that it does? So to start with, Kubernetes is um, basically, we are, when we are talking about Kubernetes, we are referring to the Kubernetes cluster itself. And within this cluster, we have a, bunch of nodes from one to as many as you want. And there is a special type of node that is actually called the control plane. So basically a node is just um, a host machine, whether physical or virtual machine that runs um, a set of software that actually makes it qualifiable to be called a, a node. So it runs the kubelet, the coproxy, as well as the container runtime as well. So the coproxy, being the guy that actually is responsible for the networking within the node, while the container runtime actually runs the container itself. And then the kubelet actually gets to communicate with the control plane itself. So then there is this other guy that is also present inside the cluster, who is also a node, but it's a special type of node and it's called a control plane. So, and the reason why it's called a control plane is because it does a lot more than what a, a, an average node in the cluster would do. For example, it's, um, it runs a scheduler, which basically tells, um, which basically is responsible for knowing in which part of the cluster is it going to be running a particular container. Also, it runs the API server through which you can get to communicate with Kubernetes itself. And also it runs the etcd, which is responsible for storing some certain um, state about the cluster within the cluster itself. Then it also comes with some bunch of other software depending on how you want to customize your cluster as well. So all of these together, comprises, uh, they, they make up together to become the Kubernetes cluster itself. And as you can see, you can have as many as possible um, nodes that you want, because you, uh, it depends on how you want your own cluster to function, or it depends on the kind of workload your cluster is actually going to be handling, or some other stuff like that. And then the nodes themselves, they run things that are called pods. And within those pods are where the container itself are actually running. So containers um, are not actually being interacted with, but we are actually getting to interact with the pod itself within the nodes that are running them. So moving on, how do you get to have your own cluster? before? Because before we can actually 
get to interact with Kubernetes, we have to have a cluster. So there are a couple of options that comes to play. You have the local Kubernetes clusters and you have the cloud-based Kubernetes clusters. So locally, you can install Kind, which is a containerized um, Kubernetes cluster, and you have Minikube, which is based on virtual machine, just like Homestead as well. So, and um, depending on what you want to do, or depending on the kind of cluster you want, you can choose any of this option. And then you have the cloud provided Kubernetes cluster, which of course the two popular ones would be the Google Kubernetes engine on Google Cloud and the Elastic Kubernetes service on AWS as well. So uh, for this talk, I have a local cluster that is set up and it's basically defined by this particular configuration. So as you can see here, I have a configuration that defines a cluster. This is actually not specific to uh, Kubernetes, but specific to Kind itself, because I have Kind installed locally. So you can see here, I have two clusters that have been two um, workers, two nodes rather that have been defined. And one has a role of a control plane while the other has a role of a worker. And if you look at this place, I added some extra port mappings and also I added some couple of extra mounts just for us to be able to get through with this stock as well. So, and then this cluster actually comes with something that is called an ingress controller. So because by default, a Kubernetes cluster is actually made in such a way that it cannot, re uh, it cannot receive any um, connection from any network that is outside of the cluster. So an ingress controller actually enables us to be able to receive traffic from the from outside of the cluster into the cluster. So and with that, we are able to have something like this. Uh, we have um, something like this, a URL like this. So for us to be able to reach services inside the cluster as well. So if I run something like Docker PS, I could see that there are two containers that are running. So since kind is containerized, so it's running inside um, a Docker container. So I have this control plane here, and then I have this worker node here, both running. And then you can see this port that is exposed, and that is why I'm having this particular, this particular guy here this particular URL here, and it's showing 404. So we still get back to this as we as we progress in, uh, we're trying to learn about Kubernetes. So uh, moving on, for us to interact with Kubernetes, after we've had the cluster, the next thing we have to do is to start um, telling Kubernetes what to do. And basically for us to be able to tell Kubernetes what to do, what we do is that we define certain um, API resources that are otherwise referred to as Kubernetes objects. So these objects will be received by the Kubernetes API and they will be validated. And once they are persisted, the Kubernetes engine will make sure that the state that is um, desired in the config is actually the state of the cluster itself. So that means when you say, okay, Kubernetes, I want to run this particular container and you define that in the config, if that container is not running in the cluster yet, Kubernetes will make sure that that container is running. So, and we have these varieties of objects that we can use to interact with Kubernetes. So there are ports, deployment services, and some other ones that we can't even mention there just a lot of them and there can be custom objects as well. So how do we manipulate this object? How do we communicate with uh, Kubernetes itself for us to be able to manipulate and create this object or delete them or read them or something? So there are three options that are available, which the first one obviously is the command line, the official command line tool. So that's kubectl. And then the Kubernetes dashboard as well has the Kubernetes API itself. So all of these three are just you trying to, you trying to interact with the Kubernetes API itself. So if you, if I come here, I can run kubectl. And you can see that I actually have the command line tool already installed. So that means I can use that to interact with my cluster and I can run something like kubectl get pods. So, and you can see it's saying no, no resources found in this default namespace. So the command line is more like my gateway into the cluster at the moment. So 
let us go on and talk about how we can work with Laravel, why we can, why we are trying to deploy it into the Kubernetes, Kubernetes cluster. So for this, we have a sample app that I created. So and the sample app is just a basic Laravel scaffold. So it's a basic Laravel scaffold, nothing so fancy. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't call anybody a hand. It's just working on its own. So it's just a default app. I call it LaraQ. And the only thing that is special about it that it does is if I run this Q100, it's going to, you see, it's going to deploy some, uh, dispatch some jobs into the queue worker, into the queue and the queue worker will actually get to process them. So that means we want to take this app and get it deployed onto Kubernetes while still maintaining the functionalities that the hub already has. So for us to get started with that, um, I will introduce us first off to, I will introduce us first of all, okay, I will introduce us first of all to um, how we can actually send configurations that we want, a desired state of the cluster, how we can modify a desired state of the cluster. I will introduce us to that one first by opening this file. So from this file, you will see I define, um, it's a YAML file. So, and then I define a couple of things and um, everything is just describing a deployment that is related to Nginx. So you see, I define the name, I define the kind of the object, which is deployment. And also I define the name, the label, which is also in, I'm defining a name, um, a name here as a label as well. Then I have a selector here that matches a label, that matches a particular, um, a particular pod. So, and then this is the pod template. The pod is where the containers are actually running. So this template here defines a pod and then a pod can run uh, one or more containers as you would like. So, and here I have the container, which is basically an Nginx container, which uses this default Nginx image. So for me to apply this configuration to Kubernetes, to the Kubernetes cluster, I will run kubectl apply. So I already have this chef. Yeah, and then it says deployment, already deployment created. So I can now do kubectl, get deployments, get deployments. And you can see that I have Lara QBA that was created 14 seconds ago. And then the effect of this that we expect is that this container is now running. So I will come here and do kubectl get pods. And you can see that I have one pod that is running. So, and a pod, Inside this pod, we have a container that is running. So a pod basically abstract over a set of containers. So I can just copy this and run kubectl, and then I can do exec just like we do in Docker and do hash, oops, yes. So that means I'm now inside of this container that is running. So, and if I do call localhost, so I could see that I can see the default Nginx page. And if you remember, I mentioned that the Kubernetes cluster is not possible for you to access things from outside. So that means we are depending on this ingress that is here, this ingress controller. But now we've not told the ingress controller how we want to expose this particular application for us to be able to view it in the browser. So the next thing we are going to do is to find a way for us to actually expose this running application so that we can access it from the browser since that is the goal. So uh, I'm going to come here and introduce another kind of Kubernetes objects. And then I will do that by defining the API version. So I will say D1 and I will say the kind is service. And from there, I'm going to define a metadata and I will give it the name of the service, which is going to be Laracube because my app is Laracube. So then I will define the specification for the service. So and inside the specification for the service, I will define a selector, which is going to select the particular port this service is going to be routing to. And then I will define a name for it. And I will say uh, Laracube. Yes, I will say Laracube and I'm going to define the ports and um, 
the port that this container is going to be listening on is this port 80. So I'm going to define the port to be 80 here. So and once I do that, I will go ahead again and apply this configuration and I will do cook CTL apply. And once that is done, you see the service is now created. And if I do cook CTL get service, so you can see that this service is created. So another implication about this is if we do kubectl exec, and I will go back into this container. If I do call Lara cube, and you can see I can now access the engine X page itself. So the service allows us to be able to abstract a set of pod because I could have uh, multiple ports that are running this particular container. So, and um, instead of we reaching the port directly via the high key, we can reach it via um, just a name like this, a service name. So, but still yet the service only is reachable within the cluster, not outside of the cluster. So I'm going to introduce another Kubernetes object, which is called um, an ingress. And for us to do an ingress, it kind of takes a little bit um, of difference. So I will come here and paste this and I will specify networking, networking.k.io slash v1 as the API version and the kind is still an ingress. So now I will define, I'm going to define the metadata that will specify the name of the ingress as well. So the name is Laracube. And once I do that, I will go ahead and define the specification for the ingress. So in the specification of the ingress, we are going to define a set of rule that is going to determine how services that are external to the cluster will be able to access the cluster itself. So I'm going to say uh, the rules, I will define rules. And then from the rule, I will add HTTP. And you can see my autocomplete already had a couple of, a couple of stuff. So here I'm going to define the path type which is prefix, uh, we shouldn't worry about what this means because they are not going in depth into what all these, uh, what all these things are going, to, are going to mean. So for the backend, we are going to tell this ingress that we want to route anything coming into uh, this particular ingress on this part, anything coming on this part. We want to route it to a backend that is a service and that name of the service is Laracube. Laracube and once we are done with that, we are going to go ahead and then we can apply this configuration again. And once we apply the configuration, okay, there's an error here. Okay, there's an error here. So I will specify the port number here. Let me specify the port number and let me apply that again. And then the service, the ingress is created. So, and normally the expectation is that I can now access the Nginx page here. So, which is working fine, but this is not where we want to stop because we want to really serve our Laravel hub. So I'm going to go ahead to add PHP to our deployment because PHP is required for us to be able to run a Laravel application. So what we are going to do next is just to add one more container here. I'm going to add one more container here. I will call this PHP. And then I'm going to use um, a custom image that I made, Bosunski slash Lara cube. So, and um, I'm going to expose the port 9,000. Nginx will use this port 9,000 to communicate with, uh, with this PHP FPM that is going to be running inside of here. So, and this image is basically built, is basically built out of here. So this is what we just added um, a PDO, my SQL and this to the image as well. So I'm going to go back to this and once I, once I'm done hiding this, I'm going to apply the configuration again. But before that, I want you to note something because if I do kubectl get pods, you will see that it says one out of one container is running because initially we define only one container, which is the Nginx container itself. So if I run kubectl apply and it's applied. So if I run kubectl get pods, you can now see that I have two of two running. 
and then it's now terminating the former pod that was running, which is just a single container. Now I have two containers that are ready for use. So, but we've had it PHP FPM, but that doesn't mean it's working. So that means we have to configure Nginx for us to be able to use PHP FPM as well. So what I'm just going to do right now is that I will show you this Nginx config that is here. So this is an Nginx config. And one thing that you should note is about this particular part and this particular, it's including a particular configuration. And this is the configuration here that is just enough for us to be able to um, run a Laravel hub. So we can ignore what the content of the file is and just focus on what um, the file is, is doing. So it's not perfect. So we can just now go ahead and try to configure Nginx. So for us to do this, Kubernetes provides a way for us to actually define configurations. So I'm going to introduce another Kubernetes object, which is called, which is called um, config map. So the kind of this, uh, the kind, the type of this particular uh, Kubernetes object is going to be a config map. And from there, I'm now going to define the metadata for, for the config, the metadata, and I will define the name, I will call it Nginx config. And from there, I'm going to now define the data that is going to be stored inside this config. For the first one, I'm going to write it as nginx.fig, and then I'm going to now put some data inside here. So I will copy the content of this, the content of this file, and then I'm going to paste it right here. Then I'm going to go ahead and define another one that is called laracube.fig config, and then I'm going to now copy the content of this, and I'm going to put it right here. So all looks good so far. So we've defined the configuration, but we haven't used the configuration yet. So for us to do this, for us to use this configuration, we have to, uh, we have to first apply it to Kubernetes so that Kubernetes can store this configuration. Then Kubernetes provide us with a way such that we can actually mount configurations as, as, um, as files into the particular container that we want to run. But, we want, but before we do that, we have to first of all define um, a volume for this particular, for this particular pod. And then what I'm just going to do is to go ahead and define volumes for this particular pod, the Lara cube for the Lara cube pod here. So, and then I'm going to just um, define the name of the volume. I want to call it Nginx config. And from then I want to tell, I will tell Kubernetes that Kubernetes should use a config map for this particular volume. So, and then I will specify the name of the config map, which is Nginx config. And once I specify that, it means Kubernetes can now mount this particular um, config as a volume. But that doesn't mean it's mounted into the container yet, but uh, we can now go ahead. Now that we've done it this way, we can go ahead and mount it into the container itself. So for us to do that, I will say volume mounts. So, and then I will mount, um, I will mount the config engine x engine hex config and then i will specify the subpart here so which is engine hex dot fig and then i will mount this into slash etc slash engine x slash engine x config so this is the default part for the engine x configuration i will just mount it to override the default the default one and this you can be you it can be noted that is actually matching with the name of the configuration that is defined inside of here. So, and once I do that, I'm going to do the same thing for the other config as well. So I will just copy and paste this and name it laracube.conhev, but instead I will save it inside sites available slash laracube. And then I will name this to laracube.conhev. So everything looks good so far and I can come here and try to apply the configuration again. So, and 
Okay. There are some errors. Okay, okay, okay. We have some errors. Okay, the deployment Lara Cube is invalid, not found in the next config. So the volume mount is actually not found. Okay, okay, okay. Nginx config, Nginx config. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go over this um, again. Sites available, Nginx config, volume on to one. Okay, let me just apply this, it's complaining about this first. So we apply this to so engine X config. Okay. <clears throat> this is weird. Okay, this is G instead of X. Okay. Yeah. So that works now. So I can go ahead and copy this again cube and this is going to be sites available slash lara cube dot can have and if i apply it again it's applied so if i run kubectl get config maps you can see i have my nginx config here and if i do kubectl describe config map yeah so describe config map and you can see that I have this configuration right here that is defined just as you define it in the file. So now that we have that, now that we have that, I expect that our containers, we also now have the configuration. So if I come here and refresh, nice. So that means the FPM is working, but it couldn't find the, the files. So if you look at the configuration from here, we actually have this defined as a root, I mean, from here. So, but if we check our container, we do kubectl get pods, and I go into this pod, kubectl exec dash it. Then I specify the container, which is PHP, and I use this. So if I list, if I list the hub directory, you see it's empty. So that is because there is nothing there. So what I'm going to do is to mount this particular folder that we have here, laracon slash laracube, which contains our application. So, and I'm just going to do that by just going into the deployment once again. And as a PHP container, I will specify the volume mount. I want to mount it into slash hub. And then the name of the volume is HAP. So, and uh, I have to define that volume before I can use it. So I'm going to just come here and define that. So I will define the name, which is HAP. And then the host part is going to be slash Laracon slash Laracube. And once I'm done with that, I can exit this and apply the configuration again. And once it's applied, I'm expecting that this should now be showing a Laravel hub. Okay, cool. A Laravel hub now shows, but that isn't all that a Laravel hub does because if I go to this place, I say Q100. And if I do that, you see I'm getting this connection refuse, which obviously, um, the hub is trying to connect to Redis, but it doesn't have Redis currently because there's no Redis running in the cluster. So what we are going to do now is to introduce a new deployment that is going to be um, our Redis deployment. So I'm going to copy this quickly. So I'll copy this and I'm going to paste it right here. So and once I do that, I'm going to rename this to be Redis, uh, Redis, and Redis and Redis just to match the selectors. And also I don't need this volume because this is a Redis container. I don't need these containers as well. So I will change this to Redis and I don't need the volume mounts. 
we don't need that. So I will use the Redis Alpine image. And from there, I'm going to just delete this because we don't need the other things. So now that we have this, we can apply this configuration again. And I can do kubectl apply. And once I do that, if I run kubectl get ports, we can see that I now have a Redis port that is running and it was started four seconds ago. So, but we still can use our Redis um, service that is running our Redis deployment yet because we still have to find a way for us to be able to contact um, Redis within the cluster. So, and for this, I'm going to define another, another service because if you remember, you can use a service to actually access um, a particular set of pod that is running within the cluster. So I will call this, uh, I will call this service uh, Redis service and is going to link to the Redis pod that is defined in this deployment here. And I'm going to use the default Redis pod 6379. And once this is done, the next thing I'm going to have to do next, next thing I'm going to have to do next while we have this is that I'm going to define our queue worker because um, I want us to have a queue worker that we can scale differently apart from the hub because depending on the workload of your hub, you want your queue to run independently of your main hub itself. So I'm just going to make a copy of this particular deployment and because I need the PHP image that is there, so I don't need the um, Nginx container. So I'm just going to delete this. And once I delete this, I'm also going to, I don't need this port as well. And then I still need this volume mount. So I will remove this as well, not needed. So I'm going to call this Laracube Worker. So and I will rename that for the other part. So this one as well, Lara Cube Worker and Lara Cube Worker. So if I come here now, I will have to define the command that will start this particular container. So I'm going to specify command and it will be PHP artisan and it will be Q, Q work. And so that this won't break, I'm going to make sure that the working directory to run the command is slash hub inside the container as well. So once I am done with this, I'm just going to apply the configuration and I will do kubectl apply. And once it's applied, I can run kubectl get pods. So, and you can see I now have Laracube worker, I have the Redis and then I have Laracube itself. So if I do kubectl, logs and I put this, you can see that the queue worker is actually running and I can actually follow the queue as well. The queue is actually running. But if we go inside of here and I still try to try my queue, it's still not going to work. And that is because we haven't told the hub to actually use that queue worker. That um, Redis deployment that we, we, we actually have now, that Redis deployment that we have here, we've not told the hub to actually use them. So for us to do that, we are going to inject the name of the, um, the Redis service. We are going to inject it into the container. And for us to do that, I will just define an EMV um, um, key here, and then I will call it Redis host. That's um, the default that Laravel uses. And then I will define a value and the value will be the Redis service that is defined in the name here. So, and once that is done, once that is done, I am going to copy this and I'm going to copy it to the original deployment that we have that is running the web hub itself. So I'm just going to come here and put that there. So once all the configuration is made, I can, with this and I can run kubectl apply. And once it's applied, I can see that kubectl, okay, let me just get the pods first, kubectl get pods. And the 
containers have been restarted and they are running. So if I go into Laracube and say, oops, CTL exec dash IT and this, and then I select the PHP container and I enter the container. If I run HMV, you can see that I have the Redis host now defined as this right here. So I can exit it and I should expect that the, the queue worker should work fine now. So if I try to find the queue worker, get pods, and if I copy this and I say coop CTL logs, and I follow the logs, and then I come here and I try this again. Good, it works. And the queue worker also works. That's great. So we've been able to replicate all the uh, functionalities of our hub uh, while still trying to learn about Kubernetes using the Kubernetes object itself. So uh, what's the next step? What's the next step? There are a lot of things for us to learn about Kubernetes, of course. I've only been able to show quite um, a few of them. I mean, some of the things we can do and um, some of the ways we can actually try to configure our Kubernetes cluster to be able to run Laravel applications. There are still a lot of things we didn't talk about, of course. So, and uh, that is because of the time that we have at hand, which I would like to just be consistent by. So I'm looking forward to, um, seeing what everyone will do with um, Kubernetes so far. And I'm also looking forward to um, what you are going to learn about Kubernetes. So maybe um, this would serve as a stepping stone for anyone that really wants to learn about Kubernetes while they are still trying to um, work with Kubernetes within the scope of Laravel as well. So uh, thank you for the talk, and I hope you have a good um, Laracon event. So I hope you've learned a little thing in my talk about Kubernetes, and thank you. Thank Over you so you. much. That was amazing. Uh, that's one of the more uh, impressive live codings we've ever seen at Laracon. That was, uh, <laughs> I, I can't, you pulled that off amazingly with only one little typo, I think, in there. So fantastic job. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Thank you. All right. We're going to now open this up. Okay. Let's see. We're good. All right. We are going to uh, have a message here from Kirschbaum, and then uh, we will get on to the next talk. Hey. I'm Katrina, a web application developer at Kirschbaum. As you know, we've been longtime contributors to Laravel, and as a developer-driven company, we couldn't be more excited to be here with you again. The message I came here to share with you all today is a personal one for me. About a year and a half ago, I had just graduated from a Node.js bootcamp. I was looking for a safe, supportive place to land where I could thrive and be given the tools I needed to become a great developer. As I was looking for my next opportunity, I stumbled across Kirschbaum. We were able to work together to customize an apprenticeship that met my specific needs. Now keep in mind that I had almost no Laravel exposure, but I did have a lot of passion and drive, and it turned out that Kirschbaum had an awesome team that has truly helped foster and support my growth. As you might've guessed, my three-month apprenticeship went well, and I was offered a full-time developer position at Kirschbaum. On top of that, I was asked to work with one of our awesome project leads, Alex Six, on building out our apprenticeship program. Since the apprenticeship program has had such a positive impact on my career, I now want to extend an invitation to you. It doesn't matter if you're fresh out of cold school or already started down your career path. As an apprentice at Kirschbaum, you'll never feel siloed. You're a part of the team. In addition to having a designated mentor, you'll have the opportunity to learn from everyone's experience. This 12-week program is a great opportunity to learn and grow with us and potentially become a long-term developer on our team. So if you're excited about learning something new and want to work on real client projects with top-notch developers who will support you and show you the ropes along the way, then please reach out to us. 
You can find more information on our website at kirschbaumdevelopment.com slash apprenticeship, or feel free to reach out to me directly with questions or just to connect at Code Katrina. Have a great Veritas. Okay, thank you so much to Kirschbaum. Uh, that's an amazing program they have, a, a 12 week remote apprenticeship program. So if anybody out there is interested in that, or maybe you know somebody uh, who would be a good fit for that, definitely check that out. Um, there is a link on the swag page. Uh, and also of course, check out Kirschbaum's uh, services. They're an amazing development shop, long time. Lara Khan, Laravel sponsor. Um, so again, all those details on the swag page, along with the giveaway uh, of a thousand dollars to your favorite open source project. So lots going on there on their uh, posting on the swag page. So definitely check that out. Thanks again. All right, let's get Caleb in here. I know a lot of people are waiting on this one. Future of Livewire. I hope it's good news because I use Livewire a lot. So. See here, there it is. There he is. Hey. Hey, how are you? Hey, good. How are you, Ian? All right, great. I'm excited for your talk, so I'm going to let you take it away. Cool. Thanks. Okay, let's do it. Um, hey, folks. So, yeah, super excited about the talk. You heard me blab about that on Twitter because I've been working on this stuff for too long. You've been he hearing me talk about it for too long. Um, so yeah, I've been interviewing a lot of people about Livewire uh, companies, people who use you know Livewire in the wild on the daily for money, also known as professionals. And the thing that I've been hearing, you know, at, I'm asking them like, why do you use Livewire? Like, why would anybody use Livewire in the right mind? And the answer I'm getting almost unanimously is like, we can just do so much more. We can just get so much more done, especially like agencies. They tell me we can take, you know, a developer or a junior developer, somebody who knows Laravel, and they can immediately start providing value to clients. They can be useful and do front end stuff and be valuable, which I think is really cool. And it sort of helped me to crystallize um, Livewire's mission a little bit more and also helped me to reflect on the state of the web, which uh, I'm totally broken record on this. Like, shut up, Caleb, about how the web is so complicated. Uh, but it is, you know, am I right? The web, the modern web, the front end specifically, I'm calling you out, it demands more of a web developer now than, than ever before. It's on this curve of demanding more and more and more. And I'm thinking back to even when I started griping about this stuff, when I started writing Livewire and that stuff, like people are sitting around campfires right now singing songs about the simplicity of three and a half years ago. Um, and you know we're like three state management paradigms away from that now. Um, now there is some you know, good things, of course. Uh, I, I actually am a big fan of JavaScript. Actually to write something that allows you to not write JavaScript, you have to write a ton of JavaScript. So I've fallen in love with it and I do love it. Um, but yeah, again, the complexity is just going like this. And then I was thinking about like 10 years ago when I kind of got into this game, what, what clients were asking me for. Like, like, what did people want me to build them 10 years ago when I was slinging Bootstrap and jQuery? Well, they, they were like, okay, we're gonna need some forms, like a couple forms, and we're probably gonna need a, like a data table, and then maybe a chart. We'll need a chart and like a modal, right? Those are the kinds of things that people wanted. And, you know, it's been a long time. We got a lot of advancements in technology, ML, and AI, and VR, and all this stuff. But what are people asking for now from us? Forms and tables and modals and drop, you know, it just like hasn't changed that much. We're doing kind of the same thing. But the amount of stuff you have to know has just gone like this. So yeah, the web is demanding more and more and more from developers. So where does Livewire fit into this? Well, Livewire is the embodiment of my deepest value as a programmer, which is taking hard things and making them easy. Its goal, its mission is to require less of developers to take you where you're at and give you superpowers. That's the mission. And that's kind of the tree we've been barking up and we're still barking up and we've come a long way and we've done a lot of cool stuff. But uh, so we haven't launched a major version in two years. Two years ago at this Laracon, we launched Livewire V2. 
And since then, you know, we've, we've been improving it it's super stable. It's great. But there's this list of things that I want out of it and that I've talked to other people that they want. And, you know, I'm, I've just been co compiling a list of all of my greatest wishes in the world for Livewire to get it to this level where it can do everything you'd ever dream and blah, blah, blah. But the problem is that the code base, it's all on right now. It's good for what it does, but the things I want to do need something bigger, better, faster, more robust. Like right now I maintain Alpine and Livewire. And there's like two libraries that do a lot of the same things. So for a long time, I've wanted to rewrite Livewire to use Alpine, like at a core level. And there's a bunch of other plumbing in Livewire that just doesn't fit for some new fancy stuff that I want to do. So I rewrote the whole dang thing a couple times, actually, which is always a good idea. If you're wondering if you should rewrite your code base, the answer is absolutely yes, always. Don't even think about it. Um, so yeah, but that's done. And I made a bunch of cool stuff that I'm super excited to show you. So let's pop into the editor. Here we go. Okay. Blank page. Blank routes file. Vanilla Laravel app, as always. And let's go into this welcome .blade.php. So here's just a file. We got our Tailwind CDN and a little wave. First thing we're going to install Livewire, not Artisan. What are you doing? Composer, require Livewire, Livewire. Okay. And that's basically it, you know, and I always demo this and, uh, and then I always talk about how I always demo it. And then I go, okay, you just compose require and then you add Livewire scripts, right? Like how could you make that any simpler? Uh, well, we have. Now those scripts are automatically injected for you in Livewire v3. So basically you just compose a require Livewire and you got it. So let's create a component and see this thing work. Artisan make Livewire, make this an inline component. And of course, a counter component. You gotta make a counter and I'm not gonna make you watch me make it. Yep, okay, so here's our counter and then let's render this on the page. Okay, basic Livewire stuff. Load up the page and nothing shows up because did I save it? I didn't. We hit the plus. There you go. You have a live dynamic page with a smattering of PHP and a composer require. So all those, those assets are now injected for you automatically, unless you're doing Livewire scripts yourself. There's going to be very few breaking changes, by the way. So don't be scared. And not only is Livewire injected now, Alpine is also injected out of the box. Um, so Livewire ships with Alpine because, you know, it's, well, it's built on the thing now. So yeah, we could do something like this. X text, uh, hey, right? And this is Alpine. And there you go. Or you can use that fancy dollar sign wire thing that you've seen me demo a few times probably that basically exposes a JavaScript object of your Livewire component to Alpine to the front end. So you could do Alpine-y things like multiply it times eight, and then it just multiplies. In fact, I'm doing Titan's puzzle, you know, in between the talks, the, you should check it out, go on Titan's Twitter and check it out. It's really cool. And I got to this, this part, uh, the, whatever, I can't think the wordle part and I couldn't get past it. And so I failed the puzzle by the way, because I hacked it, uh, to find the right answer, opening it up, whatever. I shouldn't have told you that I hacked it, that you can hack it, but, oh, sorry, Matt and Dan. <laughs> But anyway, they use this a bunch. Like there's, it's Alpine and Livewire and they use this uh, pretty heavily, which I think is, is pretty cool. It's super powerful. Okay, so it ships with Alpine now. That's great. We're not gonna use a counter example for this talk because it's too contrived. We need something that's more real world, you know, something complex that you're writing in the real world. So we're gonna use a to-do app, of course. All right. To do. So this is going to be our muse for the talk. This is what I'm going to show you all the stuff in. Well, first thing, let's build it out and I'm going to make you watch me do it this time. So to do's equals and the first to do. Okay. And then we're going to have a property just called to do. And that's going to be our input, you know, that's going to bind to that and whatever. And then we'll have an add method where we pop that to do onto the to do's array and we reset the input to empty. Okay. Good enough. Um, so yeah, so now we start styling. And when you're you know, writing something out, when you're building a component out like this, uh, what are you doing? You're typing something, you're hitting command S, then command tab, then command R, then you're taking notes, then command tab, then write and rinse and repeat over and over. And the JavaScript folks are laughing their heads off with their hot module replacement and their hot reloading. 
they think they're so cool being able to just modify something and see it just change on the page. Well, um, we want to be cool too, but the thing is, I really hate build steps. I hate any sort of thing where I have to type like NPM run anything. It's just kind of my own weird thing. And I've, you know, in Livewire, that's one of the things I want it to be simple. You don't have to manage a build and NPM anything. So I don't want you to have to do this or even something cooler like this. So I'm like, is there a way to provide hot reloading without requiring an extra step? And there is, and it's kind of black magic. Let me show you. So I'm going to open this page up and let's just start building it out. We're going to throw a div in there with an input and wire model that to our to-do. Okay, hit save and whoa, psh, it just updated on the page. Let's add a placeholder. To-do. Come on, Caleb, to-do. Come on. And there we go. You modify any state of the thing. And here, let's add a button. And this will be wire click, add, hit save. And the button adds and our state is preserved. We can just kind of build this thing out live for each through to do's as to do. And in here, li to do. Save it. And first to do. That's not what we want. UL, haha, <laughs> styling. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's pretty cool, I think. And it, it works with some pretty like crazy tailwindy stuff like BG black. Just be, yeah, there you go. I mean, not only that, it, you can use like tailwinds, um, whatever, you know, JIT compiler to do wild things with no build step. It's just nuts. To me, this is totally nuts. Do you think it's nuts? Because I think it's nuts. All right, so that's pretty cool. Um, another feature while we're at it, if we go ahead and actually add this, let's make sure that it works. Second to do, okay. And yeah, it works, it's live, it's great. Um, so notice how that just popped into the page. This is one of those symptoms of live wire -y type frameworks, things that take backend rendered HTML and pop them into the page where, you know, in a JavaScript app, you might see some nice transitions of things coming in. You can use Alpine for that, but granted, like, it's, it's easy if you have, if you're using Alpine to do the toggling, Alpine transitions are easy. But what about when something is toggled in with live wire? We used to have wire transition and we brought it back. We used to have it and then we wrote Alpine transitions and I realized how hard transitions are. So I took it out of live wire, but it's back. Wire colon transition. And now we could say third, add it. And it just whoosh pops into the page. And again, this is gonna, I'm gonna say this with a lot of things. This is all built on Alpine now. So this wire transition is X transition under the hood. So you can do all that fun stuff. Like let's only transition opacity for a duration of, uh, I don't know, two and a half seconds. Save it, fourth, add it. And then it's just gonna slowly fade in, which I think is pretty sweet. So yeah, so that's wire transition. That's hot reloading. Um, if it feels like black magic to you, uh, you're right. It totally is black magic. And I won't explain everything about how it works, but it uses server sent events if that's any tip off. So cool. Let's, um, let's get out of there and back into a browser that actually has dev tools. Okay. Great. Continuing on. Um, I'm just going to open up with, uh, maybe the most, one of the most controversial new features. Um, I think it's pretty cool and I'm just going to show it to you. So check this out. Let's say, you have button X, this is like a little clear button. So you might have wire click clear, right? And then a method called clear where you're saying this to do equals empty string, okay? It's all good live wire stuff. Type into the bar, hit X, it just disappears. That's great. But if we look at our network tab and we did something and then we hit X, we did a whole server round trip. What a waste. Like. You shouldn't, you probably like, why, why do you need to go to the server just to clear an input field? Shouldn't you use JavaScript? Yeah, you should. And you could use Alpine and that would be fine. Um, but I want to show you something just wild. And you might think, when would I ever use this? And uh, you know, I don't know, but it's one of those things I did for me because it's possible now. And I think it's pretty cool. So check this out. You can declare a method as JS and then return JavaScript from it. And this is your actual component. So we could say this to do equals empty string and that's JavaScript. So if I type in here, that works. And if we look at the network tab, nothing happened. So it's pure JavaScript. And by pure JavaScript, I mean pure JavaScript. We could make this to uppercase 
and not just two uppercase, Caleb, you need to do, aha, uh -huh. type in, hit clear, and now it's to uppercase. Not only that, we can call methods like add. So add something in to uppercase and add it. Not only that, we can actually await the calling of this backend method and do something ridiculous like return ridiculous from this method and alert that and check this out. Womp, pop, cool. Isn't that bonkers? I think that's pretty bonkers. Um, yeah, so that's that. And this, you know, like I keep talking about, this dollar sign wire, it's the same thing. It's this JavaScript object that's a representation of your live wire component. And because of the way it's written now, it's a real JavaScript object that you can that has the properties and the methods that your thing does. In LiveWire 2, it actually feels very similar. You can do most of that stuff, but it's a fake. I'm kind of intercepting stuff and sending requests. This is real. It's a real JavaScript object. So I'm pretty jazzed about that, if you can't tell. But yeah, this is one of those fiery things. Get out your fire emoji, but like also your torch and pitchforks and fight about it or something on Twitter, probably. Um, so here's at JS that I, so this is kind of new, like you haven't seen anything in LiveWire where you're adding an annotation to a method or a property or anything. Uh, this is new. So that's something that, uh, yeah, LiveWire 3 is going to use a lot. So let me show you another feature that uses this at locked. So in LiveWire, public properties are public. You can manipulate them on in JavaScript in a browser, just like you just saw. But if you want to lock them, like if there's a model ID or something, that you know, normally you have to validate everything that comes in, you know, from the browser. Every all those public properties you have to authorize uh, and validate. <laughs> um, but now you can just add at locked if you want, and yeah, and this is as opposed to doing something like, you know, this would be the LiveWire two way of doing it. Not to do's. What am I doing? Locked equals, and then something like that. That's kind of what we've done for for other things like listeners and query string and whatnot. But I like this better because it co-locates information about a property right next to the property. So let's take a look at that. I type in here, I hit plus and cannot update locked property. It's just impossible. Okay. Um, yeah, so you're going to see more of that. Another cool one, just when I was, I don't know, dreaming about the other you know, possibilities of something like this. Let's say you had a date and it's like a carbon instance or something, but you have a text input on the front end that you want it to be like, M slash D slash Y format, you know, and stay in that format in the browser so people can edit it. But in the back end, it's an actual date time object. Um, so you could do that now with format M D Y. So we can pass parameters to these annotations and achieve some pretty cool stuff. Um, if you're thinking, why not use PHP attributes like this? Uh, we might. We might offer both. We might only offer one. We're not sure yet. Just going to make sure that the PHP versions we support support it and that we like it better. Um, but yeah. So that's locked properties, which I think is pretty cool. That's format. All right, let's keep moving on. Here's, here's a breaking change. This is uh, the only big breaking change to my knowledge. We're pretty dedicated to keeping the API exactly the same and keeping the upgrade path really easy. Fortunately, this one is as easy as a find and replace. But I think after talking with the LiveWire community and myself, uh, I'm talking to myself, you know, it is almost uh, unanimous that, that people want this. So what is it? So this wire model to do is on a text input, okay? And as I type in here, in LiveWare v2, it would be sending Ajax requests out to the server to re-render the component as I type, which is good if you're doing a live search, something like you know live filtering. You want that behavior, and that's what LiveWire started out doing. Like those were, I was like, this is what you're going to use LiveWire for these little livey things, but now you use it for your whole app, and. 95% of the time you're using wire model, that's a waste of requests. 95, 6, 7% of the time you're using wire model, uh, you end up using defer, which has been added, I think, in V2 and basically allows you to defer the synchronizing of that data until a network request gets sent. So this is the new default. It's just deferred by default. This is going to cut down on requests big time, especially for newcomers into library that might not know all the ins and outs. You know, they're just kind of using it on the surface. So now as I type here, nothing gets sent to the browser. I blur out of the input, nothing gets sent until I do something like hit this plus. And then it got sent to the browser, which is pretty cool. If you think about it, I mean, this is exactly, not only does it now feel 
like uh, JavaScript on the front end with those transitions and just, you know, dynamicism, it also looks like it under the hood. Like if you look at the network requests, it's just the same as if this was a JavaScript SPA and you were filling out a form and submitting it to the server to be validated or stored in the database or something like that. So that's another kind of goal of this rewrite is not only make the experience feel like JavaScript on the front end, but open up the hood and make it look like it, make it, make the same, make it the same network, um, you know, demand, right? Okay. So if you do want the old syntax, you can, or the old behavior, you can opt into it with wire model live, which I just think looks better anyway. And then as you type, I don't know if I saved that file. Yeah. Okay. As you type, it just loads it up like that. So that's wire model live. And you'll see that another theme here is reducing network requests basically just trying not to waste uh, server resources, you know, to save the world, climate change or something. Um, so wire poll is something that exists in LiveWire v2 that you can add to any element and it'll just pull the server and keep that, that bit fresh um, and updated. And that still works. Uh, so let's actually demo this. Let's add now and now, 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 it's going to show the date and every two and a half seconds, it's going to re-render this component. Yep, but, and this is all well and good, but let's say you got like a zillion components on your page that are all wire polling. Currently in LiveWire, these zillion components, every two and a half seconds would be firing off a request to your server. Now, so there'd be like 10 to one zillion, of course, requests going back and forth every time, which is a lot. So now in V3, all requests are bundled by default. When I was talking about the plumbing that needed to be redone in LiveWire, this is what I'm talking about. Making LiveWire able, one of the big things is making it able to handle multiple uh, updates in a single request simultaneously so that it's only one round trip to the server. And this isn't just for polling, this works at a deep level. Like if you emit an event from one and listen on the others, it's only one request. If you, uh, what else? Like if I literally just had four hands and could click plus four times instantly, all those requests would get sent up together. So it's a change at the fundamental level. Uh, yeah, and wire polling, something other people have requested is if you start polling at different times, like you have something pop in here that's polling and pop in here, why not corral them into one interval and send them all together? And we do that now. Polling is now corralled as well. So yeah, uh, that's a polling thing, but it's not just for polling, it's for everything, events, anything. You're gonna see that a lot. It's also unlocked a bunch of uh, new capabilities, new abstractions in LiveWire that I think have been missing. And, and again, trip newcomers up a little, and let me show you one. So uh, this is, I think this is the thing I'm most excited about functionally, like the thing I will probably end up using the most. Let's make, uh, let's do this. So a little to-do counter. Okay. Oh, come on now. To do's. <clears throat> okay. So to do's. Oh, we still have this now going on here to do. Okay. And then as we type, this gets updated. Great. Now let's just pretend that this is something that has a bunch of functionality. Like it goes to the database, it has its own server methods and functionality and whatever. And because of that, you're tempted to extract it into a nested LiveWire component like to do count. Okay. Let's add that, open it up. Okay. And then we'll swap it out right here. Whoops. That's the Laricon link. I didn't put it in the clipboard. Okay, great. So we got this. And if we try to render this, it's going to say to do's doesn't exist because we need this to be a public property called to do's. And we want it to come from the parent. And you can do this in LiveWire right now. You could just say to do's, to do's, and it'll automatically map what you're passing into properties if you haven't set them rather than needing mount or construct. So whatever, this is stuff that you can do in LiveWire version two right now. And let's take a look at it on the page. So we try to add a second to do and to do's didn't update anymore. We lost that reactivity because in LiveWire, every component, even nested components are islands unto themselves. They send their own server round trips only for themselves because we can't bundle them together like you just saw until now. So I give you reactive props. So you can now add an annotation called prop, save it, save it, refresh. And now second, we add it and there it is. Now it's reactive. So this is huge for 
um, for nesting components. And again, it only sends one payload and two updates in that payload. Um, yeah, because this is another thing that trips new people up and it's just annoying for old people um, where you know you try to nest a liveware component, you lose that reactivity. You go, how do I get that? And usually the advice is, well, just use a blade component for most of those nesting abstractions. And, you know, and that, but then you have all the, the behavior, you know, littered in the parent, whatever, this is what you would intuit. This is, this is a much more intuitive way to use live wire components. Um, speaking of intuition, when I was just sleepily working on this talk in the wee hours, I went to type this as I was rehearsing it and I accidentally just typed this and, and then I was like, oh, that's actually pretty sweet. Um, and I tweeted it and you all agree. So I made it happen for live wire V3. You can just use that syntax instead of being repetitive. Cool. Um, all right, let's keep going. That's a, that's a big improvement to the nesting story, um, but there's more to be done. There's the second half of that. And let me show you that. So this input, you also might have the temptation to make something like to-do input, a nested component for an input, and especially for inputs, because you could, you could imagine that like it'd be pretty nice to extract this into a child component, and do stuff like as you're typing auto fill in like cities or something, whatever. There's a lot of things that you might want to use, you know, live wire for. So let's open this and let's extract this into this component here. Okay. And we don't have to do in this component. So let's create a public property called value. Okay. And just so you know that we're using it, I'm just going to throw a test in there, call this value. And uh, yeah, we got a couple things. What, what went wrong? I didn't save this probably. Okay, so yeah, it's filled out, cool. I hit the plus and nothing gets added because we've now, again, these are islands. This is its own island. If we modify this value, it doesn't synchronize it with to-do. In the dream world, you just do wire model to-do, right? Um, but that's not really possible. So again, the advice is put it in a blade component and then do your wire model stuff. Well, this has been done as well. So modelable. You add this at modelable to any property, and now it's available for being wire modeled, and it'll sync it up. So we could type in here, second, and hit the plus, and now it works. And it only sent one request, and everything is reactive. <laughs> so this is a big benefit uh, to, to nesting components. So we're almost there. There's one more thing. One last thing that we need to make the nesting component story really good. And that is, let's say that on this input, you wanna add some functionality for like, if I hit the enter key, I wanna call the add method, but the add method lives up in the parent. So how am I gonna do that? Well, we now have parent. So you could just call parent.add. You can kind of think of this, decol told was like, this is like the equivalent of, you know, view going from emitting events back and forth for communicating between components to you know, provide an inject or the you know uh, providers or whatever in React, where you're kind of passing like behavior down um, or accessing parent behavior from a child rather than firing things and listening for things. And this is kind of the same thing, but the liveware version. So we type, we hit plus, and no, not hit plus. We type and we hit enter, and then it works. Cool. So I think that's cool. Hope you do too. Let me show you another one. All right, so here's our little layout file here, and here's our to-dos component. And let's just say that you have some, I don't know, footer at the bottom of the page or something, but you want something inside of here, like this to-do count, to render inside that footer, but you need access to the component scope. So I've encountered this, the last time I encountered this, I was building like a multi-step form where there's like a next and a back button, but we wanted to render those in the footer, like in a sticky footer thing, but they, you know, like we could do events and stuff, but it'd just be nice to keep them in the component, but render them somewhere else. Um, so we can do that. It's called teleport, teleport. And you just teleport it to any query selector. So we'll say footer, like we added, and teleport. Save this, and there it is. Now it's rendered in the bottom right, and check this out. If we look in DevTools, uh, here's the main bit. This is our live wire component. And then here is that div footer. And as I type into it, uh, let me open that up. Okay, here's to do's two, to do's three. So LiveWire is, it's reactivity. The thing where it changes the HTML doesn't have to be constrained to its own DOM. 
which is pretty cool. Like uh, modals that you might have in a LiveWire component that you don't want to be CSS position Z index weirdly constrained to your container. You can pop it out and just throw it on the end of the body tag and it'll render you know, full screens. So this is something that I've wanted to add for a while. And another one of those features that because it's built on Alpine now, Alpine already has teleport. So this is cake. It's like a lie for me to make you think this is cool because it's just an alias for Alpine's teleport. Um, yeah, so there's that. I'm a liar. Okay, let me take this and wrap it in a blade component called flyout that I made. Um, and by I made, I guess I in some way I did, but I just grabbed it from Alpine components. If you're not in the Alpine components, I just you know went there and grabbed this slide over. It's all tall stack, just popped it into a blade component. So here's our flyout. Yeah, shout out to my own product pitch, shameless pitch. Um, fly out to do count. Okay, we got the hamburger, we got the to do count. Now let's just say that this to do count goes to the server and does something expensive. So we're going to sleep for two seconds. Um, I'm tempted to do this because of the first stock, the first talk, the drop that low key uh, joke in there. Um, so sleep too, but that would just be too long to wait, you know? The joke, you know, it, it would be a good buildup. Um, all right, so we rendered the page. It takes two seconds to load. Too long. Why are we holding up the entire page just because of some little widget or doodad hidden away in a flyout that we don't even see? So I've demoed stuff like this before and showed you how you can build deferred loading. There's a bunch of different ways to do it, but there are some shortcomings and some hangups, and it's a little annoying. So we made it really easy. You could just basically add lazy to any component. And now page loads instantly. And it's not even running in the background. It's waiting until it shows up in the viewport. And now it's going to sit there, go to the, the server, spend its two seconds, and then render on the page, which is pretty cool. But of course, this is kind of weird to just have like a blank thing and then have stuff jarringly pop in. You might want a skeleton loader or even a spinner or something. So our story for that is you add the static method called placeholder and just return uh, some blade basically you could turn a blade view whatever you want and i made this little spinner blade component and again by i made i think i stole this from heroicons and yeah so we're just spinning and then there it is so it doesn't show up until it shows up and yeah so you can defer loading charts and data and whatever flyouts um on youtube actually youtube's slider is this it's like whole flyout menu works the same way. Like it's deferred, it defers loading that entire slide out until you actually slide it out. So yeah, there's some validation for you. Um, you got your lazy loading, you got your placeholder, pretty cool. This to me, this is one of my favorite new additions because it's like so much bang for your buck. Like, come on, you're adding one word and you get all this value. This is one of those like, why does anything have to be hard about lazy loading? There's nothing that needs to be hard about it. So let's strip away that stuff and just make it as essential as, as possible, but keep it extremely flexible. So that's that, cool. Okay, let me show you the thing. I say the best for last, if I do say so myself, but I think I keep saying that about, about multiple things. Um, yeah, so, okay, here's our routes file, route view slash welcome, cool. Let's change this to get, and let's render this as a full page component. This is all normal LiveWire stuff, and it's gonna look automatically for a layout file that I already built, and it's the same thing, tailwind and a slot, but it's got this nav bar with a few links. Do you know where I'm headed? So here's this link thing. I click around, you know, it's all good. It's pretty fast, but it's local and it's, you know, like a to-do app, uh, but it is loading, you know? And so this, this feels like a backend server rendered app. It doesn't feel like a JavaScript SPA because you're seeing that loading bar, you know, until now, check it out. It's called navigate. You add wire colon navigate to any link and bam, I hit about, just loads, no load button, super fast, super snappy. State is preserved. If I add some to do, I go to about, I hit the back button. It's all loaded from the cache. The back button's in the cache. I can still continue modifying the state, which is pretty cool. And this is just like, not only does it just feel really snappy, which is important. Um, it saves on server resources. And yeah, it's just really fast, especially on slow connections. So like, let's slow this down to fast 3G and I'm gonna do a full page reload. So I shouldn't have done that while I'm doing the hard refresh. Okay, full page reload. Hit about, 
wait, what are we at here? Two minutes. So it's 2.67 seconds to do something like that, right? Well, let's add back in wire navigate, hard refresh, and okay, we gotta wait here. All right, check this out and pop. And there we go. The whole thing happened in 600 milliseconds and only transferred 10 kilobytes instead of the 200 or whatever that it took for the whole page to load. So this is just huge. It's just gonna make apps so much faster and feel really clean and really JavaScripty. You're gonna be able to do that. Like I think of it like a squint test, but for a UI. We're using the thing and I do this just for fun. So like just pretend that you don't know how it's built. And you're like this, you know, it's like a desktop app. Everything's wishing in and it's all really fast and clean, whatever. And it just feels indistinguishable from like a React SPA or something. It's just really easy to write. So here's another thing I'm pumped about. Uh, you can add prefetch to any link. And yeah, you can just hover over the link. And when you're hovering over it, it'll fetch it so that when you click it, it's ready. So it's like time travel. It's anticipating your desire to visit that page, fetching it so that when you click it, it's cocked and loaded in the barrel. It's just going to bam, show it up on the page. So that's prefetch. Oh, what's this? I'm trying to save something. Okay, cool. Um, this is good. I think we've outgrown this example. Um, let's move on to something a little bit bigger. So transmit.tailwind UI. This is uh, tail one of Tailwind UI's new templates they have and whatever. They're great. This is the podcast one. And this is something that you, know, you do. And I'm like, oh, did I share the sound? Is this super loud? I don't know. I think I did share. Hey everyone, and welcome. You get to hear Adam's beautiful voice. Um, I don't know if. Okay. Welcome to another. Yes, yeah, so it's Adam's beautiful voice. You click the through the pages, will... and things are persistent. Scrolling gets persisted between pages. It would be great if Livewire could do this. As you can imagine, I wouldn't be demoing it if you couldn't. So I already have the wire navigate set up. This is a pound for pound copy. Like you know, if you load these side by side, there's like zero pixels different except for the date, because I forgot to update it. So yeah, this works great, but like the sidebar, that's not persisted between requests, the player, anything like that. So let's open up this podcast layout that I have here. And I have this podcast player and we can persist any bit of the layout by just adding persist and labeling it. So end, end persist, okay. So now, if I play Adam's voice, oh, did I play it? No, okay. If I play Adam's voice, hey everyone, and welcome player. to another episode I click to of a page. Their side. The Works. podcast where state still preserved. I can go back and forth. The scrolling the is automatically, you know, uh, persisted and whatever. So we can do this for the header as well or the sidebar. Um, yeah, and let's do that. And yeah, so scrolling is is persisted across pages, and state is preserved. So like, if we go back, oh, I'm doing all sorts of messed up stuff. Um, yeah, so scrolling, we show something, we start listening, hey hit everyone, forward, and, to and everything is just completely preserved like a true SPA. So Livewire and Alpine, yeah, stuff super easy to build something like that in now. This is kind of the final boss here. This is the thing I've been saving until, until I feel like Livewire, you know, is like ready for it and Alpine. And I think they are now. To me, these are all the biggies. These are all the biggie things that that yeah, that I wanted to do and they're done. And, and this is the future. I showed you the future. Um, there's a little bit more future. There's a new app or a, sorry, a new site. looks a lot better than whatever I hacked together two or three years ago. Um, Martin Rariga, he designed it. Jason Beggs implemented it. And yeah, it's just finally does the tool justice. It just is like a nice looking page. You know, Taylor quoted as Livewire is fire. I might've quoted him on that. Um, Livewire has, uh, yeah, it's kind of everything. You got your forms, your tables, everything you need. So finally a page that I think does the tool justice. A lot of people are talking about it. It's like the talk of the town. Um, yeah. And I too think Livewire is fire. I do agree. And uh, all new docs. So docs are redesigned. They're going to be rewritten for Livewire V3. There's going to be a bunch of education coming out. There's so much coming out. Is it ready now? No, I'm sorry. I've dropped anything I've demoed in the past forever. I just dropped right away. That's not the case with this one. This one is just too much of an undertaking and I want to take my time and I want to make sure that it is solid. So I'm going to build it in public. It's going to be launched as a beta soon and, uh, and we're going to test it in the wild and make sure that it's, that it's really ready for prime time. But once it is, ooh, is it going to be so sweet? So go ahead and uh, throw your email in this crappily designed Livewire landing page 
and uh, and I'll send you updates about Livewire V3 and upcoming stuff. Uh, we have a new partners program. If you're a company that relies on Livewire and you want premium support, we do Zoom calls. I show off stuff like this. People in the partners program knew about all this stuff. I taught that lazy thing came from somebody. Um, so if you're into that, check out this partners page, sign up for that. Um, that's how we make money. That's how I've been able to do this full time for three years because of you guys, you know, giving back and buying screencasts and everything. Um, and we want to keep growing. I want to turn it into a company and make it, you know, we already have Josh Hanley, Jason Beggs. Um, I'd like to bring them on like full time and really just make this as good as we can take this project all the way. Uh, just keep pushing this paradigm as far as we can. So I'm super stoked. Also pumped from uh, shout out to my tweet. And uh, I hope you dug it. Thanks. That's it. Bye. Amazing. Wow. That's big. Uh, as a big live wire user, I'm very excited about literally everything. Every single thing in there is like, I'm like, yep, need that. Need that. That's amazing. Can't wait to use that. Sweet. Like, nice. Fabulous. It's all for you, awesome. Ian. It's all, it's for, all you. for me. Mm -hmm. It's all for Laracon. That's right. Thanks a bunch, Ian. Thanks for putting <laughs> right. everything together. Thank you, man. All right. Appreciate yeah. it. All right. Wow. That's a, a solid start to the conference, those talks. Whew. Okay. Um, all right. So it's break time, I believe. Yes, break. All right. So we're not going to be back in 20 minutes. We're going to be back in 10 minutes uh, so that we stay on schedule. So 1120 Eastern, uh, we will be back. So everybody go get up, stretch your legs, and we'll be back in 10 minutes. All right. See you in a few. Even when you feel low, you can still go. Even when you feel slow, you can still go. Even when there's no hope, you can still go. I never answered a no, man, I still go. Go, go. Every single day I'll be making moves Till I'm buried in my grave uh, To the system I don't wanna be a slave I've been doing shit my way uh, Or the highway And in the driveway Is a nice range Cause I grind through the climb I invite pain You'll never hear me bitch Nah, I don't complain Just gotta flip the switch And you can go and obtain Anything you want Anything you need Your mind's got the key ingredient It's belief uh, Better see with the negativity But I just slide right by that you can still go even when you feel slow you can still go even when there's no hope you can still go i never answered a no man i still go 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 you got a mind but even that could change you could flip the gray matter like some batter in your brain uh, that's why to say fake it till you make it a eh? and if you play that game then you just might make a change rearrange all the bad to okay take the worst stuff saying turn them to a game take the best stuff saying put them on display on repeat in your brain till you're feeling no more pain uh, never slow yourself down you can do some more push past start the pain and you'll find a door open it up and finally explore everything that you thought you could never do before uh, And even when you feel low, you can still go Even when you feel slow, you can still go Even when there's no hope, you can still go I never answered a no, man, I still go Go, go Every single day, I'll 
I'll be making moves till I'm buried in my grave. Uh, to the system, I don't wanna be a slave. I've been doing shit my way, uh, or the highway. And in the driveway, it's a nice range. Cause I grind through the climb, I invite pain. You never hear me, bitch, nah, I don't complain. Just gotta flip the switch and you can go and obtain anything you want, anything you need. Your mind's got the key ingredient, it's belief. Uh, they'll see with the negativity. But I just slide right by that energy. Even when you feel low, you can still go. Even when you feel slow, you can still go. Even when there's no hope, you can still go. I never ran to the no man, I still go. Go, 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 Gray matter like some batter in your brain uh, That's why they say Fake it till you make it, eh And if you play that game Then you just might make a change Rearrange all the bad to okay Take the worst stuff saying Turn them to a game Take the best stuff saying Put them on display On repeat in your brain Till you're feeling no more pain uh, Never slow yourself down You can do some more Push past start a pain And you'll find a door Open it up And finally explore Everything that you thought You could never do before you can still go Even when you feel slow You can still go Even when there's no hope You can still go I never answer to no man I still go Go, go Even when you feel low, you can still go. Even when you feel slow, you can still go. Even when there's no hope, you can still go. I never answer to no man, I still go. Go, go.
Okay. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I just noticed I had the songs on repeat. It's can't have that, so I'll uh, fix that. We got a whole playlist of stuff here. We got we got to get to them all. Um, all right, one second. Okay, we're good. All right, all right. So let's uh, first before we get to a whole pile of lightning talks. Um, which are going to be really awesome this year. A lot of great talks in the Lightning Talk sections. Um, we're going to have a, a message from our friends over at Titan. So let's uh, do that. Hey, it's your old friend, Matt Stauffer. You may know me from some of my Laracon talks, my book, my blog, the Laravel podcast, or whatever else. You know I love Laravel, and you know I love helping people. And what you may also know is that I'm one of the founders and partners in an incredible company called Titan. You've probably seen our logo around for sponsorships, you've read some of our blog posts, participated in some of our fun Laracon challenges, and probably heard amazing talks from our team members from Laracons over the years. However, while you may know me, and you may know the name Titan, you might not know as much about what we do or how we work. We got a lot of values that will not surprise you if you know me, empathy, candor, self-care. But at the absolute core of how we work, there's one vital concept, and that is trust. The kind of trust that we build on is, is a choice. It's a leap of faith, and it's a conscious decision to believe someone's willing and ready to do incredible work on your behalf. And when things get tough, they're going to have your back. We work that way with each other, but we also lead that way in our relationships with clients. We choose to trust, and that means we can get all the cover-your-ass stuff out of the way and get real work done. So let me tell you a little bit about how we get real work done. Take two brilliant, professional, hilarious, curious, empathetic, talented software programmers who spent the majority of their careers working in exactly your tech stack with practical work experience building applications across an incredible number of different companies, industries, countries, you name it. Now, imagine those two programmers focusing all of their professional energy on your product, your code base, your idea every working day, and give them access to 21 more of the most brilliant experts in our company Slack all day long and pair them up with a world-class project manager. That's what it's like to work with a Titan embedded team. So if you're interested in talking to us and learning more, check out titan.com slash Laracon right now. You can immediately book a call with my business partner, Dan, directly from that page. And there's one more thing I want to share with you, something fun. You may remember Titan, like I mentioned before, has created some fun Laracon challenges in previous years. This year, we put together a little puzzle game for everyone to play during the breaks between each of the conference talks. The first three people to solve all the puzzles will win either AirPods or Samsung Galaxy Buds, your choice. And once the top three prizes have been awarded, 10 more winners will be chosen to receive some Titan swag. We'll pick them at random from all the players who complete the challenge by midnight Chicago time tonight. So to get started, again, head over to titan.com slash Laracon to get your first puzzle clue now. Okay, thank you so much to Titan again. Um, if you're interested in working with them, obviously a fabulous team that's been around Laravel from uh, from the start. So you can uh, contact them from the swag page. Uh, also, they're running this really cool puzzle contest as they described in the video. So check that out. A lot of uh, interesting prizes in there. Um, and a lot of people talking about that online and everything already. So I think they've done a, done a great job with that. So check that out. Um, all those links at the swag page. Thanks again, Titan. Okay, and now we're going to do lightning talks. Um, I think I'm actually going to go through the intros right here uh, so that I don't have to come back to my slides every time. So I'm just going to kind of intro them all to you right now, and then uh, then we're gonna we're gonna roll. So um, here we have Marge, oh, wait. Tim, Ralph, Marcel, and Kaneko. So uh, that's going to be our lightning talk round. We're going to go one into the other, and it's going to be great. So let me bring in our first one. All right. Hey, Ian. Hello. All right. I'm ready for you to kick off our lightning talks. All right. Let me get my screen share going. 
All set. All right. You look good. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Welcome to my talk on sustainable self-care, building a good life. My name is Marge Holmstrom Sabo. I do people operations at Titan. And really what that means is I get to care for people as much as those people care about code. And I want to say thanks for having me today so that I can also help everyone listening learn more about caring for themselves sustainably. So what are we going to talk about? We are not talking about spiritual journeys, recipe, blog descriptions, or one-size-fits-all sweaters. Self-care is not a one-size-fits-all. It is not a formula that I can give to everyone to say, here, follow this recipe and you will have a good life. Um, we're going to talk about definitions, our agreements, what now, some reminders and resources to take forward with you after this talk. Uh, definitions, we're going to talk about what do I mean by sustainable, self-care, mind, body, spirit, and community. Because each of those things, if we don't have a common understanding of what I mean when I say that, you're going to say, I don't get it. This lady's a weirdo. Uh, also a weirdo, but I don't want it to be because we don't understand each other. So moving right along, sustainable. I'm not going to read all of this, but these are the relevant definitions for sustainable. It essentially means using things wisely so you don't use them up before you're done. Um, it's avoiding burnout. It's meeting your needs in a way that you can continually meet your needs. Next up, we've got self-care. Um, definition of self-care from Merriam-Webster is to care for oneself. It's three words that involve a lifetime of work. So for a very short definition, it's a lot more complicated than we might think. Mind. Mind is a noun. It's the element or complex of elements in an individual that feels, perceives, thinks, wills, and especially reasons. It's the con conscious mental events and capabilities in an organism. See the organized conscious and unconscious adaptive mental activity of an organ organism. Additionally, you can also think of it as the nervous blob of gelatin that lives in your head. Next step, body. Body is the organized physical substance of an animal or a plant, either living or dead, or a human being, or the meat sack that you live in. That one's not the formal definition. It's just how I think of it. Spirit. I debated on this one, calling it spirit or soul, but it's really that animating force or vital principle held to give life to physical organisms. It's what connects your body and your brain and makes you you. The immaterial, intelligent, or sentient part of a person. I like that phrase and def definition pretty well um, because sentience is nice, um, but also we can't point to it and say, this is your spirit. It's invisible. The activating or essential principle influencing a person. So your personality could be considered your spirit or your soul. And finally, community. Community is an attributive noun. And it's a unified body of individuals, so a collection of people that have common interests, living in the same area, um, characteristics in a larger, as a larger group within society, a body of persons of common or professional interests scattered throughout a larger society, so maybe a community of academics, a community of medical professionals, a community of Laravel coders. Um, or a body of persons or nations having common history or common social, economic, and political interests. So NATO, NATO could be considered a community. And next up, we have agreements. So these are the things that I'm going to ask all of us to agree to during this talk. Um, because if we can't agree to this, it's really difficult to believe in the importance of self-care. So we are all going to agree that we are worthy of loving care we deserve to be whole. We are capable of nurturing and supporting ourselves. We can accept care from and offer care to others freely. So all of these things are important as the primary basis of self-care. So what does all of those things, those definitions and the agreements have to do with sustainable self-care? These are great questions. In every philosophy, mind, body, spirit, and community are the foundational elements of self-care. 
without these things, you cannot care for yourself and you cannot be whole and you cannot be well. So now we get to the fun part. I actually got to go get some more Lego bricks for this talk because it was the best metaphor I could think of. We're going to talk about the house of you and all of the resources. So we're just going to start with this. Here's this great big box. Imagine at the beginning of your life, you're given a box of resources and those resources are shaped like Lego bricks. And each individual brick is used to start building the kind of life you want. So for example, here we have this lovely little blue wall. We're gonna say that's my brain wall or my mind wall. And this is my body wall. And this is my spirit wall. And here's my community wall. And I took those blocks out from my resource bucket and I built some walls to represent or be my mind, my body, my spirit, my community. But I got all these walls and they're all disconnected. I'm like, oh, that doesn't really work to make a shelter for myself. They're all not together. I could do something, but it'll fall apart. So, hey, look, I have this like cool little integrating piece. So I can just like stick these walls on there and then I'll have a cool little house. I'll be safe. I'll have what I need. All right. So yeah, we have this, uh, it's sort of a house, but there's no walls that are fully formed. There's no great doors. It's partial integration, but it's incomplete. It is not a good shelter or a place of safety because I can't get in or out of it easily. So what we want to do with our resource bricks is build something a little more substantial with maybe some windows. And you'll see all of the different colors involved because we've made the choice to build mindfully, to build our mind, our body, our spirit and our community together so that it creates a shelter and a support for ourselves. So once you have that, once you put all of your bricks together and you've made a shape, like mine looks like, I don't know, just a funny little house, but maybe you got a really cool Millennium Falcon kit and so you're gonna live in a spaceship, but how do you live in your house that you built? You have to keep learning about your house. When I was doing my first run through, the door came out and so the reason I like this metaphor is because you have to keep maintaining your resource. You have to keep caring for yourself. Otherwise things just fall apart and all of a sudden you don't have the shelter, support and care that you need as a person in the world doing stuff. So how do you keep learning about your house? To care for yourself sustainably, you must first know yourself. This is the part that gets fun and this is the part that why to care for oneself is a lifetime work. We will change over time. And so what you need in one year may be very different the next. So in terms of your mind, I have a list here and I want you to read it. And keep in mind, you're gonna see some of these things repeatedly. But when you're thinking of your mind, what are the things that helps your brain feel happy and healthy? Sleep, this is my list. Yours will be different, add to it. Sleep, good nutrition exercise, meaningful work, medication. These are all things that I use at various points in time to keep my brain happy and healthy and functional. And it's what are the resource blocks do I have available and how do I use them for my brain? For my body, what does my body need to function well? It also needs sleep, nutrition, exercise, regular cleaning, sometimes assistive devices, if you ever broke your arm, you're going to need a cast. Without it, you're going to feel terrible. Or maybe you need a walker. Maybe you need a wheelchair. These are all ways to care for your body. And sometimes it's medication because if you have an infection that you can't fight on your own, you're going to need that extra help. Your spirit. What does your spirit need to feel peacefully energized? And this was a funny way to phrase it, perhaps but peaceful energy, that sense of calm, and that sense of productive, I am at peace with who I am, with what I need, and I have the resources to function wholly. That's the goal that I always have for my own spirit. And that's a peaceful energy. It is not frantic. It is not anxious. It is just calm and ready. 
to meet the world. And to do that, I have hobbies. I make time for play. I have engaging work. I take time to be quiet. And I have time to choose adventures. So those are all things that my spirit needs to feel cared for and to be at its best. Community. This one seems a little strange, perhaps, to include in a conversation about self-care, but the people you surround yourself with are the people who care for you, who will help you when you need help. And our community, the people who surround us, directly influence the type of life and the type of successes we have. So those communities, in my case, are family relationships, the 2 a.m. emergency friendships, the people I can call in the middle of the night when I have a flat tire or there's water leaking into my basement for whatever reason. Whatever that reason is, there will be people you need to know you can call at 2 a.m. and they will be there. It's the people who live around you, your neighborhood, affiliations of education, religion, or profession, and those familiar strangers. Caring for all of these communities helps to enrich and enhance my own life because it makes me happier to be in the world wherever I am. And that matters for you too. Surprise homework. So it's not going to be me unless I also say, here, here's something I want you to think about. Um, screenshot this for immediate reference if you want to do this homework now, but it'll also be available in my talk slides later. But take time for yourself to identify one thing in each category of mind, body, spirit, and community that will help you to feel whole. Make time in your day to practice at least, at least one of those things each day. And then set time on your calendar in a month to reflect how has your life changed or what is different now that you are actively putting resources into each of those areas that are foundational for your own self-care. So some reminders, because they're helpful, and this will look very familiar to you if you looked at the agreements, you are worthy of loving care. You deserve to be whole. You are capable of nurturing and supporting yourself. And you can accept care from and offer care to others freely. Doing these things is going to help you feel your best. And you deserve that. You are a worthy, deserving, loved human being. So resources and gratitudes, I'm not going to go through all of this, but these are foundational. The resources here are foundational to my understanding of sustainable self-care. And then I wanted to offer a big thanks again to Ian for having me, my team at Titan, um, Tanya Tarr at Cultivated Insights, and everyone who walks around being kind. That's important and it matters. Thank you, everyone. I believe in you. Thank you so much. A really important uh, talk and very well done. Thank you. And the first time we've had Legos, I believe, on Laracon. So a nice, uh, nice all around there. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Ian. Thanks. Okay, we are going to go to Tim. There he is. Oh, Hello. There we go. Now I can hear you. Awesome. All right. I'm going to let you take it away. All right. Sounds good. All right. Uh, let me share the screen real quick. Hello, um, and uh, welcome to my talk. It's uh, let get, Let's Get Physical, uh, Database Internals and View. So I'm Tim Martin. Uh, I am a software engineer at Curology. Um, and I want to clarify just up front that I'm not a DBA. So if I can learn some of this stuff, then so can you. So let's get into kind of what we want to talk about today, um, which is uh, I want you to care about database internals. Um, because uh, in a, that's, that's really kind of the goal of this talk is, is to figure out why we want to care about that. And kind of these are my goals. You might say they are my... Uh, relational goals. <laughs> um, you and your database, I want you to be tight. I want you to really understand each other. Um, because I truly believe that the world, if all, you know, this is what the world looks like, if all devs understood their database internals, they're really going to have a deep understanding of um, uh, be able to, you know, really deliver more value to their customers because they're going to spend less time fighting their database and trying to find ways to like hack it and find, you know, what are those little things we can do to really improve performance? A few disclaimers. 
Um, the examples I'm going to be giving here are all MySQL 5.7 with the InnoDB storage engine. Um, and I'm going to be picking on UUID primary keys as an example. Um, so the key thing here is just don't extrapolate too much with what I'm talking about. Some of these things don't apply to, like, for example, a lot of these things don't apply to Postgres. Um, so what I, I'm really trying to get across here is how little changes can make a huge impact in performance. And that's what I want you to take away from this. All right, so let's talk about our initial schema here. Uh, we have the kind of our classic employees department schema. Um, it's the, the uh, hello world of databases. Um, we have here, uh, what we see is we have a varcar 36 for the employee UUID. Um, that's our primary key. And we have kind of a similar thing for our primary key over in the department UUIDs. Um, we're mostly going to be focused on the employees table. Um, so we have a foreign key pointing to our department's table. And then we have an index on our first name and our last name. We have an index on hire date. And we have an index on department UUID because we need that for the foreign key. Um, so the first thing I want to kind of like um, search I want to make is that smaller is better. Um, and, you know, the first thought is like, hey, disk space is cheap and plentiful. You know, why are we caring about the size of data on, on disk? And the truth of the matter is, is no, most of us probably aren't going to care too much about disk space. Um, but we do care a lot about memory. Memory is not cheap. Um, and memory tends to be kind of that, that first thing that, that impacts database performance. Um, and if we take a basic look, I'm oversimplifying things here, but MySQL, um, when we write to MySQL, yeah, we're going to write to disk, but we're also going to put things in memory. And MySQL, most of the time, if we're, you know, we have enough memory and we're, our data is not too big, it's going to be reading from the buffer pool, which is actually in memory. So we're not actually going to even be doing disk IO. Um, so if we can keep all our data small enough where we can fit it in memory, we're going to have better performance. The other thing too is that Generally, when it comes to doing performance, the key thing is less is like do less. And so if we're comparing less data, if we're reading less data, um, we're generally going to get better performance as a whole. Um, so given that, you know, how do we take this, these UUID columns and we have uh, basically we put them as VARCAR 36s, right? Let's let's just think about how we can like make those a little bit smaller, right? And the key thing there is that uh, UUID. Uh, especially UID v4, which is what we're talking about here, is basically 128 bits of randomness. Um, and so that's where we can start taking this. And we're like, hey, a varcar 36 is 36 bytes, right? Um, one for each character, effectively. And we can take this and we can cut it down to 16 bytes just by putting it in a binary instead of instead of that varcar 36. And what we'll see here is we expect to basically gain back or to, to, to reduce the size by 40, 40 bytes for each row, right? Because we cut it off the department UID 2 and the employee UID. Um, and so this is just kind of an example of what that might, you know, how we would pull this out. What we see here is that the, the table size, that primary, or the clustered index size, drops by 600 megabytes, which is great. And it's like, all right, yeah, we made a huge improvement. But what's strange is that our index size decreased by a whole gigabyte. And it's like, well, why'd that happen? You know, like, um, we're only indexing the department UID. That's got a little bit smaller, but it should have been a whole gigabyte worth. Um, and so that's where we kind of get into some internals. You know, why are these indexes so much bigger? Um, and so we're going to talk about uh, B trees, in particular B plus trees in MySQL. Um, and so I'm not going to go into B trees because we could probably do a whole conference about B trees. So I'm going to give the short, uh, uh, egregiously like uh, understatement is that B trees are a combination of a binary tree and a linked list, or B plus trees, I should say. Um, and so what's interesting about how MySQL does it though is that MySQL actually stores the whole primary key in every single leaf node. So um, that means that when we go back and we look at our indexes, right? We have an index on first name, last name. We're storing, we're basically duplicating that employee ID and putting it in every leaf node for this. And then the higher date, we're putting it there. And the department UID, we're putting it there again. So we don't have, you know, 40 bytes. By changing that from a 36 byte like uh, column to a 16 byte column, we're reducing it this whole row by 100 bytes, um, which that's why our index size gets so much bigger. Um, and I do want to kind of like point out here too that, you know, uh, we have B trees and we have B plus trees that implies, you know, B plus is getting B plus in school is obviously better than getting a B. That also implies that there's kind of one more step and that's the A tree. <laughs> okay, that was for me. Um, so we need to talk about insert performance. Um, so we're inserting all these, these rows into this table, right? We're using random UID V4s. Um, and what we see is that over time, the as as the size of the table grows, our insert time starts to climb up too after a certain point. So you can kind of see this here. This is this uh, horizontal axis is the size of the table, and the vertical axis is the insert time, or time to insert. Um, so you know we start getting into why that would be, and uh, I like to call this section uh, "Stay Together for the Leaps." Um, <laughs> and basically, what it is is. Uh, 
MySQL uses what's called a clustered index for the table. So the actual like table itself, that primary store is actually an index, kind of like any other index. Um, but what's different about this special, special about this one is that instead of before, you know, we and I have the higher data is like, you know, the node that we're working through, we actually have the primary key. And that's what kind of our binary search tree looks like. But then at the bottom, we include the primary key and the row, right? And this is in a page. And a page is like an atomic unit, basically, that MySQL will write to disk. And this gets into basically MySQL wants to write data that's close together, right? Um, it's much faster to write, basically, it costs the same amount of time whether we have one row in here or whether we have a thousand rows in here. We're still going to write the same amount of data every time. And so, what kind of becomes weird when we have UIDs and are random is that we're kind of inserting these randomly in different pages. And so we might come down, the first one might go into, you know, this one here, and then the second one might go into the, towards the end, and then the third one might go in the middle. And each time we're doing that, we're writing a lot of data, yes. Um, but also what kind of becomes weird is that when we get to what happens when one of these pages fills up, and that's when we need to do what we call a page split. And page splits are very expensive. Um, and the reason is, is because basically the parents, we have to split the parents up, you know, half the children go with one parent, half the children go with the other parent. It's very sad, it's very expensive, and tourney fees are involved. It's a whole thing. So we want to avoid that. And so you're looking at this data structure and we're like, hey, how do we how do we avoid that? And you start to say, like, well, why not just append them to the end of this tree? Right. Like, why not just like build out this tree and always just like try to put them always at the end? So if we can if we can do our inserts where we're always adding to the end of our B tree, you know, always adding to one side, we can group them all together into a single page. Right. But then we also don't have to do page splits. And so that's where we can get into this this final schema here. And the key difference here is that we actually moved, we added a column um, and we put this, basically we moved the UID into a unique key. Um, and we might need that because maybe we need that for security reasons, right? Maybe we don't wanna have an auto incrementing key exposed to, to our, our end users. Um, but internally we use this employee ID and that's an auto incrementing integer. Um, and so when we look at our insert performance, we see that our insert performance went from, uh, you know, like doing, you know, kind of scaling pretty poorly so we look at this and it's much, much, much more flat, you know, um, with this auto increment key because we're not having those page lists and we're doing our page writes, you know, kind of consistently. Um, but what about the table size? Because we added another column, didn't we just make everything worse? I made that whole big deal about why, you know, table size matters. And then I went and added columns and added an extra index too. Um, but when we actually look at the data size, uh, what we see is that um, the total size of the table of this auto incrementing version is 14% smaller than the UID version. And this comes kind of ties back to that original thing, which is the size of your primary key gets exasperated because it's included in every index. So we have a 32-bit integer, which is a lot smaller than 128-bit UUID. So insert performance improves, and we would expect write performance to improve too. Um, so we have a, you know, 14% smaller than the UID, uh, the binary version, and 45% smaller than the barcode version. Um, so that's it, right? Like we learned everything we need to know about why we shouldn't use UIDs and primary keys, um, but this is a redounding no. Um, what I want you to take out of this is not that UIDs uh, keys are bad. Um, it's that little changes in your database um, can make a huge difference, right? Um, so this is where I want you to go home and you know figure, take your database, whether it's Mongo or Postgres, Cassandra, whatever, learn more about your database, learn how it works, get to learn kind of those details and the next time, you know, there's some big database issue, you can kind of be the hero and uh, save everybody else. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you all, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. All right. Thank you so much. That was great. I love database stuff, even if I don't totally understand it. All right. Thank you. All right. We'll get Ralph in here. It's like we got him on audio and there he is on video. Hey, Ian. Hello. Um, all right. So we're going to let you take this away. Carbon, this is something that doesn't get enough love. So I'm excited we have a, a talk on this. So uh, take it away. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Uh, so let's first just start by sharing my screen. So um, today I'm going to talk about Carbon. And Carbon is a tool that we Laravel developers use almost every day. And almost every Laravel developer knows how to use Carbon a day, sub week, at month, whatever. That isn't really interesting. However, Carbon also has more advanced ways which you can use to 
increase the maintainability of your code and make your code easier to understand. Today, I want to talk you through a few tips and techniques that you can use to improve your code. Um, uh, Ralph, for those who, oh, yes? one second. We're not seeing your screen. So I just want to make sure if you think it's shared, Sorry. it is not shared yet. Oh, that is interesting. There we go. Ah, That's there we it. go. All right. So about carbon, a few techniques and interesting things that we can use to in your in our daily lives to improve our code. So for those who don't know me, I'm Ralph. I'm a freelance therapist, software engineer. I in my daily life I work on maintaining existing applications and building new applications. I have a personal blog on ralphjsmith.com where I write about problems I encountered in my life and how I solve them. So if, if you're interested in that, you can visit it and subscribe to the newsletter. Another hobby of me is creating Laravel packages. So I created several open source packages and also three paid packages for Filament. And Filament is an admin panel in Laravel and Livewire. So if you're into Lar uh, Livewire, you should absolutely check that out. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, today I'm going to talk you through uh, three things. The first thing is that I want to show you very br briefly something about carbon itself, an interesting method. The next, I want to talk about carbon interval. And finally, I want to talk about carbon period. And carbon period is, well, in my opinion, the most interesting one. So let's get started with carbon uh, carbon itself. So the first method I want to explain to you is carbon is the closest method. And it's not really expl explaining, but there is a little caveat to be aware of. So let's say that we have two dates. We have date A at today at 8 a.m. and we have date B today at 10 a.m. All right. We also have a base date, which I'll set for today at 9.15 a.m. So the next thing that we want to do is get a date which is closest to the base date. Well, everyone, of course, can see that that is the date at 10 a.m. So let's just verify that that works. See, we get a date back at 10 a.m. So, but how would this behave when we set the date at 9 a.m.? 9 a.m. is just exactly in the middle between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. You might think that there's a second difference, but there really isn't. So let's run it again and see what we get. Oh, we get 10 a.m. back again. So why is that? Well, if there are two dates um, and those are the same distance in time to the base date, Carbon uh, will just use the second date as the default. So if we flip those around the comma, run it again, see we now get the date at 8 a.m. So there is also the opposite method, which is farthest, and the method works exactly the same. It also defaults to the second one. So it's something that's not really mentioned in the docs, but interesting for you to know about. All right. The second thing I want to talk about is carbon interval. And carbon interval, uh, it might be interesting to have a little bit of background what an interval is exactly. So if I were to say, I will meet you in four hours and 50 minutes, we are talking about an interval of four hours and 50 minutes. We can wrap that interval in a PHP clause. And if we do so, we can get useful information from it, like the number of hours as an integer, or, or the number of minutes as an integer, which is 15, or perhaps the number of months as an integer, which is zero in our situation. So to show you this more, I created a little demo application. As you can see here, we have a page uh, to manage posts. And each post has a published end date. If the date is null, the post is still in draft mode. If it is a date in the future, the post is scheduled. And if it is a date in the past, the post has already been published. All right, so now our client wants to uh, say, well, I don't like these dates time. I don't like these dates. They aren't easily scannable. So can you replace them with something like uh, X days ago? So, well, of course, let's do that. Well, the first thing you might want to try is using diff for humans. And diff for humans is something um, that we most developers know about. So let's see how far us gets them. All right, let's switch back to the browser and see this works pretty good. Five days from now, 17 hours ago, a few weeks ago, and one month ago. However, our client says, well, this isn't good enough for me. Um, it all says one month ago, but I want to say to see, is it 25 days ago? Is it 34 days ago? It shouldn't round. Well, if you encounter a situation like that, it might be useful to use a diff or a date interval. So let's check that out. Uh, first, we want to get a diff, and we can use two methods for this. 
We can use the diff method or we can use the diff as carbon interval method. And those methods are methods are yeah, practically the same. Uh, the only thing is that carbon interval extends date interval. So something like carbon interval extends date interval. So personally, I always prefer to use carbon interval since that offers just a little more functionality. So let's now get the number of days from this diff, right? We can use D. We can concat that with a string days ago. All right, let's see how this looks like. We'll switch back to the uh, to the browser and we can see that it looks pretty well. Uh, for this talk, I'm just looking at the dates in the past, but the, for the future dates, you can um, modify this yourself as well. So let's go back to the second page. Hmm. This is interesting. Well, what is the problem here? Well, the problem is that I ordered the published at column descending. So that means that you would check yeah, that the older posts are lower in the table. So that also means that the number of days would only increase the lower we get. However, why isn't this the case? Well, to explain that to you, I will use an example with two dates. We have the date September 14, which is today, and we have the date August the 10th. If I were to create a diff between these two dates um, and check the number of days, which, uh, which it gives as the diff, um, we would get four. Well, why does it give four? Well, Carbon thinks we only need to go four days back from the 14th of September to the 10th of August. Uh, and in addition to that four days, we go back one month. So instead of providing us with something like uh, 34 days or 35 days, it just says one month and four days. Well, luckily there is a way around this and that's by using the property called total days. So instead of the D, we can use total days. And as you can see in the other completion, we also have total minutes, total months, whatever, whatever. And update it to total days and let's switch back to the browser. Awesome, this already looks much better. There is still one problem because it gives calculates these days as a float. So add a little rounding over here, round, enter, yes. See, well, this looks, this is what we would expect. Now we can precisely see how many days each post was published. And we can quickly see if there was a certain pattern in these posts or if there wasn't a certain pattern in the scheduling. All right, that was uh, something about date interval. And uh, the next thing I want to show is also still about date interval. Um, and that is sorting intervals. This can be very useful in things like Excel exports or in other situations. So let's consider this situation where we have three carbon intervals. We have a carbon interval of 30 minutes, we have an interval on 10 minutes, and we have an interval on 20 minutes. So next we wrap all these intervals in an array. And what we want to do is we want to sort that array so that it gives the lowest interval first and the highest interval last. So how are we going to do it? Well, PHP offers a handy method called usort uh, that's also available, for example, on the Laravel collections. And that usort allows you to pass a callback or a callable. So that could be a closure value at some custom logic for sorting, or it could be a reference to a method. So for now, um, we will make use of something interesting in interesting that carbon interval also provided. We can call the method on carbon interval called compare date intervals. And as you might recognize, this thing is a tuple and something that we are also using in our routes files quite often. So let's run this and see whether we get the desired result. See, first we, it's the 10 minutes interval. The second thing is the 20 minutes interval. And the third thing is the 30 minutes interval. This is very useful in particular if you are having perhaps hundreds of intervals to make a very precise uh, ordering. Well, this isn't of example, it isn't of course complete until we use our PHP 8.1 feature, which makes it look even more pretty. So we can just call this method at these three dots and PHP will treat it as the same what we saw earlier. See, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and 30 minutes. All right, that was carbon interval. The final thing I want to talk about is carbon period. And carbon period is what I call the king of reducing ugly code. So what is carbon period? Um, carbon period is something, uh, is well, a class, and you give it three things. The first thing you give it is a starting date. The second thing is an end date. 
And the third thing is an interval. So for example, you could give carbon periods the uh, first day of this year, January 1, you could give, and you could give it December the 31st, and you could give it an interval like one week. If you do that, you can use the carbon periods class to for each, to use for each over that class. And then it will give you 52 weeks, the start of each week, for example. So let's see this in action. Let's switch to our application. And here we have a simple dashboard. This dashboard contains a graph with all the posts ordered by each individual week. So in the second week of 2022, we published four blog posts. Now our client says we want to enlarge uh, an individual week. So we'll, to do so, we'll add a drop down at the top right of this chart. Uh, that allows our client to select all, to select an individual week and view the posts for that week. Also, all right, let's go to the chart. And here we have an interesting function, get filters. And this function, and we will use this function to return our filter. So this works like you would expect uh, the value and the label. Let's show this. Uh, let's save it and show it. See, we have X and we have the label. All right, let's now remove it. What we're going to do um, is start an array and we will return this array and in between we will fill that array. So first I will show you an example or an example of uh, how we could do this without carbon. And then I will show you how to do it with carbon, which is much clearer. So uh, without carbon, we could do something like for each um, over the years 2020, 2021 and 2022 your application, you probably would want to make this dynamic, uh, but this is of course for the demo. So the next thing that we want to do is add another for each and go over every week. So for the year, so we'll make a range from one to 52. And now we want to add, add each week to this weeks array. So how are we going to do that? The first thing that we want to do is create a variable called start of week. And we're using carbon now and a very useful method called set ISO date. And set ISO date is something that you really should remember because it allows um, because it allows people to set a date from only the year and the week. So in our situation, it will just put in the year and the week. And then the final thing we want to do is add it to start of week. All right so that we always uh, start on Monday. So now that we have that, let's add these weeks to the array. So we can use the weeks array. We can push a new key, start of week, format it like year, year, week, and add the format again for the label year, week. All right, let's see how this looks like in real life. Awesome, see, now we have a nice list of all the weeks. To make it a bit more intuitive, let's reverse this array and, and preserve, preserve keys through, all right, uh, typo, yes, and C. So now we have the most recent weeks at the top and the oldest weeks at the bottom. However, there is a little problem with this. And the problem is that we are missing a week. Well, I will show you that uh, instead of adding the label year week, I will add the start, I will display the starting week of each, so the starting date of each week. And let's now dump this weeks array. And so that you can inspect it somewhat closer. All right, here you can see we have all the weeks in 2020. And at the end we have week 52, which starts on the 21st of December. The next week that we get is the first week of 2021. However, that week starts on the 4th of January. So we're obviously missing a week here. Well, the thing is that some years have 53 weeks and some years have 52 weeks. And years with 53 weeks happen quite frequently. So we need to account for that. So we could do something like uh, uh, weeks in year is carbon create from the year. And we could get the ISO weeks in year. All right, next update this range and see how this looks. Refresh and here pops in the new week 2020-53. All right, let's check this out in real life. 
Let's reload it here and see, now we can filter this on an individual week. So let's check out week 32, for example. This, in this week, we published three blog posts. So this is, of course, very useful. However, what if our client says, well, we want uh, not to show every week, but we want to show every second week. Well, of course, they could go by updating this for each, by only skipping even or odd weeks or whatever. But that isn't really sustainable because this code is already quite well ugly for a relatively simple thing. So how should how do we want to improve that? Well, we can improve that by using carbon periods. So how do we create carbon periods? Well, carbon period we can start with. Uh, so let's start with since I will hard code it for now on the first of 2020. We will go until. 2022, 12, 31, and we have an interval of one week each. So the next thing that we want to do is, yeah, let's just comment this out. And now that we have this carbon period, we can do a for each over it. So we can do carbon period as week. So what carbon is doing now is automatically accounting for every odd situation like 53 weeks, um, all sorts of complex situations are handled by carbon. So let's now copy over this part of code to add it to each week. Let's update this variable and use it. Let's go to the start of the week as well and see what we get now. All right. So, all right. As you can see, we now have all 50 weeks. Uh, we, in 2020, we have week, um, let's check it. We have week 53 again. So carbon now uses this uh, to calculate every week. And it is also very useful, uh, for example, uh, or it's, it's very flexible. So say that our client wants to have an interval of two weeks, we can just update it and see that it only skips, that, that it only displays every second week or every third week, whatever, that doesn't really matter. This, the point is that it is really flexible and reduces ugly code. So let's reduce this. The final thing that I want to show you is is making this a bit more beautiful because now we're manually we manually need to calculate the starting date of the year and the ending date. So, for example, you could want you might want to do something like create from year input 2020 and 2022. So, how would we implement that? Well, an easy way would be to create a macro for it. So, let's go to our app service provider and date carbon periods create a macro and call it create from year. Next, we need to input a closure. That closure receives the starting year and it receives the ending year. Let's also allow passing null as the ending year um, because if we are doing that, we will default to the starting year so that you only have to input, for example, a single year. So for example, if you're ending year, that's default to the starting year. So if you only wanted to the weeks for 2022, uh, you just only, you only have to input 2022 here and not again. So let's get the start of period. We can do so by creating carbon create and we input the year here and starting year. Then we go to the start of year. Let's duplicate this to the end of period and we carbon create and we go to the end of year. All right. The final thing that we need to do is return the carbon period instance itself. So we could do since starting since start of period until the until the end end of period. All right. Let's now check whether our code works. Uh, all right. Oh, this is all right. Ending year. It says that it isn't used. All right. Now it should work. Let's refresh this, and it still works as expected. Or let's go back to our um, all right here. We use. 2020 to 20. Let's pick this back to one week. See, it now it gives us every single week starting from 2020 to 2022. So this was carbon period. Um, let's now switch back to keynote again. Um, I hope you uh, learned something from this talk that you are able to apply this in your own life. Uh, there, these are several interesting tricks that you can use to increase the maintainability of your code, reduce ugly code. It's awesome.
So I hope you ended up, of course, that it saves you some time. I'll publish an overview of all the discussed tricks plus a few bonus tricks on my website, robjsmith.com. will probably be later this week. So subscribe to the newsletter if you want to get a notification of that. And the code of the application will be on GitHub. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you so much. That was great. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. Let's get Marcel in here. Finally, some testing. There he is. Hello, hey. sir. Hi. How are you? Doing good. Good. All right. I'm going to let you take it away. All right. Let's go. So let me share my screen. Here we go. All right. So keynote first. Welcome to my talk, Where's Waldo? Or UI and component testing with Cypress. I thought about wearing like a red and white striped shirt, but felt like it's a bit too much. My name is Marcel Potsut. I'm hidden somewhere there. And um, I'm CTO at Beyond Code, where we create software tools and video courses for people like you, software developers who love Laravel, Livewire, uh, Inertia, Alpine, all of that stuff. Feel free to follow me on Twitter. So UI testing, what's Cypress, what's it all about? As developers, we tend to test a lot of our application and we focus a lot on the backend part. So for example, we ensure that when we perform a certain action that something ends up being stored in our database. Or we test that when we do something, we get a redirect that points us to a specific URL. We can even do some sort of integration tests by ensuring that when we visit a route, we at least get a 200 OK so that we are sure that we don't break everything and uh, send some internal server errors. We can even take this a little step further and ensure that when we visit a website, we expect Laravel to return a view. This view should have a user property. This user property should be an instance of the user model. This user model should have a name, which is equal to Taylor. That's quite a lot of testing that's going on in just these couple lines of code, which is great. And you should definitely do this, but it basically stops there. So all you can test is everything up to the response that you send to your browser. And then it's kind of a black box. So if the browser renders to the JavaScript or the CSS, if everything works there, we have no idea. All we know is that we send the response that we expect it to be. And that's exactly where UI testing comes into place with things like Cypress. Now you might say, wait a minute, Marcel, isn't there a layer of all dusk? Yes, there is. So let's compare Cypress and Dusk. They both do kind of the same thing. First of all, Cypress is framework agnostic, um, which allows you to test your Laravel app, a WordPress app, a standalone React, Next, Vue, whatever application you want to build with Cypress, while Dusk is a bit more Laravel specific, of course. Cypress is written in JavaScript. And this also means that you have to write your tests in JavaScript, while Laravel Dusk allows you to write your tests in PHP. Now, this might sound like it's going to cause some trouble because often we need to log in users, create some users from factories or models from factories, but we can all solve this with Cypress as well. Last but not least, Cypress not only allows us to run end to end tests with a real browser, but we can also use Cypress for component testing. Besides all of this, Cypress is a bit faster than Dusk, and having a faster test suite is always good. And Cypress comes with a really cool UI that helps you develop and debug your tests that I'm going to show you in a bit. So to install Cypress, as I said, it's written in JavaScript, so you have to install it using NPM or Yarn. Once you did this, you need to install the Laracast's Cypress package. It's maintained by Jeffrey Way, as the name suggests, surprise, surprise, and it's kind of the missing link between your Laravel application and Cypress. So this allows us to interact with our database and our models. And then this also provides this Cypress boilerplate code, which basically sets up all our Laravel application so that we have an example test, the Cypress configuration file, et cetera, so that we're basically ready to go and test our app. All right, enough of the slides. Let's show some code. I have prepared an example application that is called Laragon. It's kind of an alternate universe 
Laravel conference uh, where all the speakers are missing. So if we take a look at this site, all the speakers are basically just question marks. The names are mixed up. And well, on this image, the idea is that you hover over the image and then you need to find the speakers. Some are easier to find than others, like Kaneko here. Now, watch out. I asked Sineko if it's OK if I put the funny eyes on his face. He's totally fine with it. So if you click on a speaker, you get uh, some super loud sound, than, uh, sound that can, only I can hear on my headphones. The speaker count increases. And on the speaker list, we now see Kaneko's image. We see his name not mixed up. And all of this logic happens in JavaScript. And we need to test it with our browser. So our usual testing approach doesn't help here. It also doesn't matter if we would use something like LiveWire. We would need to test this with a real browser. So if we jump to PHP Storm, this is how the application looks now that I have installed um, the Cypress bottle plate. So inside of our tests folder, we have this Cypress directory, which holds all of our tests. So the first test that I want to take a look at is a very basic integration test. The syntax is similar to um, past and just if you've used it before. So within this describe method, we basically group all of our tests. So the first test is it shows confetti after clicking on a speaker. Now we have this global Cypress, this CY object available where we can basically now interact with a browser. So we visit the homepage of our application. And as the confetti gets drawn on a canvas element, once we visit the homepage, we expect that a canvas element that we retrieve from the DOM should not exist because right when we visit the homepage, we shouldn't see any confetti. Then we get the hero map element, which is this big image with all the speakers, and trigger a mouse move event to a certain x and y coordinate. And then we click on the exact same coordinates. These are just static coordinates in my test that ensure that I hit a speaker. It's Kaneko in this case. And once we click, we expect that a canvas element should exist. All right, so how do we run these tests now? To do this, we can just open up our terminal and run npx Cypress open. And this is going to open up this interactive UI that I just mentioned. Here we can now choose between either using end-to-end -end testing or component testing. We're going with end-to-end -end testing first. And now we can choose which browser we want to, do, to use for our testing, Chrome, Edge, Electron, or Firefox. Let's start Chrome. All right, there it is. And in this UI, we now have all of our tests. And once we click on a test, it will immediately start running all the, or click on a file, it will immediately start running all the tests that are in there. So if we do this, we see that the test passed. Um, you can see that we already saw the confetti. So if it was too fast, let me just rerun the test. There we go, okay. Now, what's really cool about Cypress compared to, for example, Laravel Desk is this UI, as this allows us to basically time travel through each step of our test. So check this out. First, we're going to visit the homepage. If I just hover over this statement of our test, I can see on the right how the DOM looked like at this state of our test. Then we try to get the canvas element. The assertion is green. The canvas does not exist. Then we get the hero map element. You can also see that it's highlighted here. We trigger the mouse move trigger the click. Here you can also see the before and after. So before the click, nothing was highlighted. Afterwards, there was. Then we got the canvas element and expected that it exists. The assertion is green. Everything's uh, passed, and that's OK. So just like that, you can basically write integration tests using Cypress, because all you can do is uh, automate your browser and interact with it. It doesn't matter if you want to do uh, file uploads, typing something into text, scrolling the mouse, using drag and drop, all that stuff. So basically everything that you can do manually in a browser, you could do with these Cypress tests. Now, what about Laravel integration? So for example, in a real world application, let's say you want to test some JavaScript behind a login in like an admin dashboard, you want to log in a user. So the way we can do this, first off, in our welcome blade, I have this little section in here, which is just this auth section that when a user is logged in, I'm going to show the name of the logged in user and then you are logged in. So we want to test that this actually works. So jump into our test. 
And this now contains two tests. So the first one, very simple, it does not show a section when not logged in. So we visit the home page, then we get this auth section div and expect that it does not exist. Now, the interesting part, it shows a section when logging in as a user. Here we can use the login method on the Cypress uh, object. And this one is provided by uh, the package from Jeffrey Way from Laracast. So what this does is it's going to ask our Laravel application if a user exists with these attributes. If it does exist, it's simply going to log in that specific user and even return it. If it doesn't, it's going to call the user factory to create that user. So we can even do some more advanced stuff like uh, using specific factory states, using factories of specific models, or even evaluate PHP code right within JavaScript. So we log in the user, then we visit the home page, and this time around, the auth section should be visible and it should contain the text, hey, Marcel. So let's go to our test Chrome and run this test as well. Both tests are green and they passed. And just to ensure we can now do this time travel thing again. So let's go to the first test, nothing's here. The second test, we have the login, which also returns the user as an object. We visit the page. This time we have the section, get the section, and it contains the text that we expect it to be. All right. Next up, I want to show you visual regression testing, which I think is really cool. So let's open up the test. Very simple. All it does is we visit the home page and then we match against an image snapshot. So if you ever did some snapshot testing with PHP unit or a pest, this is kind of the same thing, but this time we're testing against an image of a website. So what this does is if we whoop, open up the test, this is going to take a screenshot from our application and store it. Now, the next time we run this test, it's going to take another screenshot and then compare it with the one that we just took. So if we're going to do our welcome view, well, let's just remove the navigation bar here. Save this, rerun the tests. It's going to take another screenshot and now this time the test fails because the image is 64% different from the one that we compare against. And we can go to PHP Storm. There we have this snapshots directory with a diff output. And here you can see the exact difference. So on the left side, we have the sort of the base image that we compare against. On the right side, we have the screenshot that we took during this test run. And then in the middle, we basically have a diff of those two screenshots. So all the red pixels are actually different. So um, in this case, it's quite a lot. And this is especially useful if, if you remember the pre-Tailwind times or if you're using on working on a site that doesn't use Tailwind. I often change one selector that I thought was very specific for one part of the application, deployed it, and then somewhere entirely else in the application some style changed. And having these kind of visual regression tests really helps to track those down. You can configure the threshold when at what kind of percentage you want things to break. Uh, so you can really fine tune this. All right. So that's basically end to end testing with Cypress. Now I want to really show you really quick the component testing part of it. So with end to end testing, we can test the whole website as is. And with component testing, what this allows us to do is we can test individual view or react components. So if we jump to a test file for this component speaker, we can see that we have one test that says it does not show the speaker image if it was not found yet. So we should see this question mark and the mixed up name. Now, instead of visiting a website, we are mounting a view component. So we mount the speaker component here and provide a speaker property, which is just this uh, static object that we have here. And then once we mount it, we can just use the same Cypress browser automation tools that we do with the end-to-end -end test. So we can assert that the image should not exist and the span should be this mixed up reversed name. On the other hand, it shows the speaker image when it was found. 
Once again, we're mounting the speaker component. And for this Laragon site, I'm using Pinya, which is a state management system for Vue. So all I'm doing is we're going to test it again, but this time I want the initial state of my application to contain that I already found the speaker Marcel Putziot. And this time the image should be visible. It should have an attribute called source. This source attribute should include my name and the span this time around should be the real um, name, not the mixed up one. So if we are going to test this, you can see both tests are passed and it's the same thing. We can see what the uh, individual assertions and steps in each test did. And I think this is really cool because of course you can test your view components or react components um, in JavaScript itself, but using Cypress allows me to use all of the browser functionality. I can click on things easier. I can maybe do drag and drop stuff and have this nice UI on top of it. All right. There's a ton lot more that I would love to show you about Cypress. It's really cool, but this is just a lightning talk. I don't have enough time. There are custom Cypress commands like this login command. You can add your own uh, assertions to Cypress. You can do all that. There is a very extensive plugin ecosystem. So if you want to add support for this image snapshot, it's not built into the core. This is a plugin that I just added. And what uh, I think is really cool about Cypress is that you can even add some GitHub actions that when a test fails, will send an image and even a video of that failing test over to Slack. So if you have some kind of flaky test, which can happen with UI tests, this is especially helpful if you want to debug those tests. Thank you very much. You can go to laragon.net if you want to find out uh, all the speakers in the image and search for them. Enjoy the rest of the conference. If you have any questions about Cypress UI testing or anything else, just reach out to me via Twitter. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'm definitely going to go do that and click on Koneko's head. That's mandatory. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks. All right. Let's see, we have Koneko coming in, possibly. There he is. Oh, you're looking luxurious there. Yeah, I brought my hijackers closet, uh, clothes, clothes, sorry. Sorry, my bad English. <laughs> so Marcel, sorry, no funny eyes today, but uh, let's let's go with the talk. All right, let's do it. Okay, so first of all, hello everybody. Uh, really nervous, not excited uh, to be here. And just a quick bon dia e boa tarde uh, to all the Portuguese uh, talkers out there. So let's begin by sharing the screen as usual. Where is the thing? Share. So hopefully you are seeing my screen as, as expected. So uh, if you're not seeing my screen, Ian will just step in into the Zoom call and just say, you, I cannot see it, your screen. But hopefully we, you see I can it. see it. We can see it. Nice. <laughs> So let's begin. Please welcome to the iChecker's Guide to the Laravel community. And first of all, I'm Kaneko, and I'm currently the full stack developer at Medicare. And I'm also official title here. Thanks, Ian. I'm the Laracon Online Technical Consultant. And I'm also the Laracon EU host. Plus, uh, for the past weeks, I'm all uh, I'm helping them organizing the next event. Uh, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell button to get notified. I, I always like to one always want to say these YouTube things, but okay. don't forget to like. Um, first of all, bring your towel since it's a, I have mine here, so you need to have your towel for this one. So a long time ago in a repository far, far away. Okay, I only have 15 minutes, so I don't have time to show the entire text. So first of all, have you met Taylor? Um, so Taylor Otwell, he started uh, as a .NET developer. I don't know if you know it. 
And later on, he created his own PHP framework because who never. Uh, later, he joined Userscape, and later than a couple of years later, he started to work full time on Laravel. He gets his first employee, and how he has an awesome 18 developer all across the globe. And people are worried about him, mostly with his health. So these sort of questions starting to appear that often. Even Matt Stauffer uh, questioned one time that what happened to Laravel if Taylor Otwell disappeared? And by far, this is my favorite, but it's just Reddit being Reddit. Um, but don't panic, uh, Laravel is in good health, plus uh, Taylor is also in good health. But why Laravel? Why Laravel is so special, is so magical, is so popular between ourselves? But let me do a little bit of a twist in the question. Why Laravel is Laravel? And could it be thing due to the is incredible documentation because Laravel's documentation is, is, is very good and you know it. If you end up in that page, you know it is very good. But could also be due to the fluent code, the, the way that we code, we have enjoyment of coding in, with Laravel. I mean, you look at it and uh, wow, I'm just lacking words of how you code Laravel. But it could also be due to the ecosystem around Laravel. Uh, because Laravel, so I sorry, uh, shorts that I'm lacking the word now. It just simplifies building web applications, and I mean you have a quite a bunch of first party uh, packages out there that you can use it to do your application right away. And there's the second layer. Uh, of uh, applications, packages that you can also use to do your code and give your boost on your production. Or it could be just because it's the top framework, at least it's what GitHub says about it. But why Laravel is Laravel? Again, I ask. Uh, for me, honestly, is it's more than a framework. For me, Laravel, it, maybe it has the best community. Yeah, it's the community. And the community itself does a lot and it shares a lot. And, and it follows the, the rule of Bill and Ted that you need to be excellent. Uh, you don't need to be excellent, but the, the community follows that idea. And newcomers to the community sees that right away that everyone is just cool and just good vibes. And this community helps and it helps a lot. You, you, when you need help, you can go to, for example, the Laravel IO forum and just go there and ask your question and you, you're always gonna get help. Even Laravel Discuss uh, has also a forum for, for you to ask your questions. And it's so popular for people to help each other that they put like a gamification for you to uh, to stimulate people getting the right answers. And but for if forums is not your thing, you can always go to the Laravel Discord channel and just ask it right away your question. And this community also shares, and by sharing, I mean every single time that any cool thing that happens around the community is going to be here. It's going to be on Laravel News. Uh, every, any package uh, that is worth consider and any news around the community it was going to be there. It is going to be here. But if reading blogs is not your thing, you can always hear the Laravel News podcast and you're just going to be updated as well. And you also could listen to the Laravel podcast. Matt has been doing an incredible job this season by interviewing the creators of the most popular frameworks in the Laravel ecosystem. 
Or if you want daily tips and tutorials, you might check also Laravel Daily by Paul Villas that he shares quite a lot of good information daily and in, in his blog and on his Twitter account. Or you can always get updated uh, by what's happening in the framework. Uh, Christoph is doing an incredible job for the past weeks that is been just sharing what's new in, in an incredible new way. And you should follow Gaurav thread uh, Twitters, uh, tweets uh, that he just collects everything that cool that happened uh, within the community and he just puts a long thread with all of that. And of course, you need to follow the memes that Ninja Parade does it. It's very cool. Thank you, Ninja. But the Laracast, if you want, uh, if anyone is sharing quite uh, the, the way to teach, the, the way to, for you to learn anything, uh, the way is going on Laracast because Jeff Rue is doing an incredible job in there. That's the way. I just wanted to put this pun here, so sorry. Um, but this community also welcomes anyone that is new and wants to get in. And OnRamp is a very good project that Matt uh, with Titan is being developing. Uh, it's an easy way to, to provide an easy entrance to Laravel new developers. So if you're fresh new in the, level, uh, in the Laravel ecosystem, just go on ramp and you get a good proper uh, roadmap for starting coding. Also worth the mention, uh, Laravel's project by Susanna. Uh, it's an incredible project. Uh, she's, as it says on the landing page, she's making the world of Laravel more accessible to women, non-binary and trans developers. Such an incredible job that she has been doing. And this community also connects. And how do this community connects? So right here, right now, I believe. So Laracon is online, is happening right now and is being hosted by Ian for the past years. And it's an incredible opportunity for everyone to get together and to be part of something that happens real time with everyone. And if you're more an in-person, uh, if you like more in-person conferences, you have the next one that's going to happen in Lisbon uh, in Larkon U and is, is, is hosting by Yoren. Uh, right next, you're going to have the very first Laracon India um, uh, that is currently organized by Visal. And there's quite a bunch of other Laracons out there, like uh, Australia and US, uh, but it doesn't, doesn't have yet, uh, yet a date for the next one. Worth to mention, uh, the Laravel Live. UK, it's not an official Laracon, but it's also a good place for you to get together. Also, doesn't have yet a, yet a date a defined. Meetups, the most way, um, most easy way for you to go to a meetup, maybe, or you can even check it out the past events. You should check the Laravel Worldwide Meetup hosted by, um, by Freik you should check it uh, all the past talks and have a look for the next ones. Uh, but you have also local meetups. And if you look for it, I strongly believe that you're going to find in at least one uh, on your country. But if there isn't, why not just create your own uh, and invite anyone and share knowledge and connect to the community. Quite a different thing that uh, happened last year. Uh, Christoph invited a couple of guys uh, to have what we call a laracation. So it's pretty much uh, a vacation, but with the Laravel folk. And it was just an incredible experience to be with them a couple of days. 
especially after all the pandemic uh, that happened and it was quite remarkable so this could be like an invitation for you to have this idea and send invitations and starting your own location but this community also gives back this community not always take from laravel so it creates a lot Livewire, uh, we just see the future of Livewire and we all still stoked with everything that Caleb show, shown us. Here, the photo Caleb doesn't have as a little bit of longer, so I need to update that. Um, you have also Inertia, yes, that's if view is a little bit more of your flavor. And still today, fresh ideas are starting to appear. Even display is a, a little bit different so the community is always getting creative in creating uh new stuff tailwind tailwind is the most impressive css framework out there and it's it was created by a, a laravel community member past is the the go-to way to test your application and i i bet you that you're going to have fun creating tests with best. All the Spatsy packages, packages that never end, and most of them coded and created by Fake. And do not forget about all the Beyond Code software that uh, the team puts out there and just to make our life way simpler. And with all this in mind, I could not believe, I could not agree more with Matt Stoffer. Uh, Matt, uh, in the past Laracon US, he said this, people, and it's very true, people are racing, they are eager to release more videos, more free tutorials, more memes, more whatever, more hot, hot tips, people are keen to share and to be connected. But I just mentioned at least a small fraction of people that are currently and daily sharing stuff. There's a lot more, a lot more people in the community. And even this slide just show even yet another small part of the community. And with that in mind, let's open the door back to the, the, the last reference that I say that maybe we have the, the best community. I need to rephrase this. I'm sorry, but we have the best community out there. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Follow me. Thank you. Amazing. Uh, we have never done one like this before. This was a great idea you had to kind of go through the whole community and point out all the resources. We always have new people obviously join the community. So I think this is really useful uh, kind of having it all in one spot here. Yeah, it's good for newcomers that are still out there and even for the OGs. It's good to know that they are still remember, remembered. We're remembered. Yeah. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I'll see you. Bye bye. See you all. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes. Let's do that. Let's do this. All right. Let's see. All right. All right. So let's just do a little business here and then Matt's gonna come on. Um, just quickly tell you about some of our OG projects. Uh, Lara Jobs, obviously sponsoring the event by uh, running it. Um, $100 off, post your jobs on Lara Jobs. If you're looking for a new job, find it on Lara Jobs. Uh, that's the spot for all your Laravel related job needs. Tell your boss, tell your friends, Lara Jobs. Um, and then, oh, hey, why is this not going? There we go. Uh, and then, of course, Laravel Forge. Um, Kaneko just kind of touched on this, but uh, a lot of the growth in Laravel and all the new features we get every year uh, is really made due in large part to Forge. And, um, you know, it really is the primary factor in letting Taylor work on Laravel full time and having a team of people to help uh, in all the aspects of running such a huge open source project. So if you need to manage uh, servers, e even beyond Laravel servers, but of course Laravel servers as well, 
definitely check out forge.laravel.com. Um, I use it myself with, I don't even know, at least 15 servers we probably have uh, being managed by Forge. So check that out. Just the best way to manage servers. Uh, I couldn't deal with it at all without that. So uh, check that out. Uh, and again, that's from Laravel itself. So all that, uh, all those revenues go back into the Laravel community, essentially. All right. Now we're going to have Matt Stauffer. Let's bring him in. There he is. He's ready. All right. How's it going, right. man? Good. I can hear you. I can All see right. you. Let me share a screen. Make sure we can. Oh, all right. Take a two. Let's make it happen. All right. There we go. You're good. I see your background. All right. Thank you, my friend. Thanks. Hey, everybody. All right. <clears throat> As I warned the chat ahead of time, and some of y'all saw in the video earlier, I do have a beard now um, and realized that the, the headshot that I've been using for all my profile pictures for the longest time is several years old. So I promise I'm going to fix that. But no surprises. You know, you saw the video earlier. Today, my talk is called Abstracting Too Early. Although while I was in the middle of building this talk, I realized it's actually kind of also complicating too early because not all of these things are going to be specifically abstractions. But I was halfway in the talk, didn't want to rename the thing. So you can just kind of bear with me that they're not all technically abstractions. So there's three parts to this talk. And the first part is a story. Uh, I'll note this on Twitter, but all these illustrations are by Titan's wonderful designer, uh, Noemi Olvera, who's also an illustrator and a hand letterer. So in the 11th century BCE, there was a young warrior who had a lot of kind of one-on-one -on -one fighting experience, except it wasn't really fighting experience. It was really more kind of like hand-to-paw combat. It was really just hunting, no formal combat training. And then this person ended up in a situation where he was going to basically duel a powerful enemy soldier. He has tons of fighting experience, much bigger than him, much stronger than him, got all the better, tool, better tools. And so all the people on his side got together and said, we got to prepare you for this fight. So we're going to give you the absolute best tools available. It's going to be the king's armor. It's going to be big. It's going to be strong. It's going to be similar to the tools that are going to be used by this guy you're going to be fighting, right? Unfortunately, doesn't actually look that great in this guy, right? And what we discover is that armor is so big and so bulky and so unfamiliar from what he's been working with, it actually made it very difficult for him to move around. So he rejected the armor. He instead wanted to work with what he actually was familiar with, what he was actually prepared for, the ways he's more accustomed to. And when he went armorless, using the tools that he was familiar with, the tools that made sense to him and his sizes and abilities, it actually worked. It worked with the size and skill. He remained flexible. He didn't try to use tools that were the best for everybody else. You may have noticed this sounds very similar to David and Goliath, but it also might be similar to Nestor and Ereuthalian and a couple other stories. But the point remains, which is... The biggest tool, the most complicated tool, the tool that everybody else uses, the tool that the person who you want to be like uses, isn't necessarily the tool that makes for, sense for you. And what you should do is know yourself and know what makes sense for you, and then figure out that basically that's what you want to be reaching for, the thing that makes sense for you, not for somebody else. So in this talk, you as a programmer, or you as a programming team, or you as a product team, whatever else, are the young warrior, and microservices are the king's armor or Kubernetes, sorry, Bosun, uh, Docker, uh, repository pattern, event sourcing, separate front end and back end repos, and whatever else. So what I'm not saying is that any of those things are bad, right? It's good that the King's armor exists, but not everybody should wear the King's armor. So the really the TLDR, the simplified version of this talk is Yagni. You aren't going to need it. And I'll talk about that more in a second. It's Yagni from a lot of different angles, a lot of different applications, a lot of different specific contexts, but it's basically Yagni. But if I sat and gave you a talk where I just said the phrase Yagni over and over again for 40 minutes straight, it would probably not be that interesting. So I figured let's go into a little bit of nuance and specifics and particulars. So like many of my talks, there are really two primary pieces. We just finished part one, the intro. We got two primary pieces. And part two is concept. I want to teach you some ideas to use to you, you can apply when making decisions about what kind of abstractions, complications, tools you're going to use in the future. And then part three is going to be about practical examples about how to apply those ideas and very common scenarios that I see people to help you avoid mistakes I see far too often. If you're not familiar with me, Titan, the a company that I own, we're a consultancy, which means we work with different code bases every single day. And so we have a lot of experience seeing lots of different contexts where people reach for things that aren't a good fit for them. And a lot of our 
work isn't just coding, it's guiding people towards what's going to make the most sense for them. And so I'm hoping to take a lot of the things that we apply to each client one-on-one -on -one and instead share it for free to everybody so you all can get that benefit. And of course, I still hope you hire Titan, but I hope you can get this value without actually having to engage with us in the first place. So I'm going to teach you, remember, this part two is about concepts. The first concept is Yagni, unsurprisingly. So the basic of Yagni is it's a phrase that means you aren't going to need it. And I want to give you a real quick example of a context in which we can apply this idea. So you've got a new application you're building and it needs auth, authentication, authorization, whatever else. But what we don't know is the full future of this application. Is it going to eventually move to single sign-on? Is it going to be eventually extracted to a microservice? Maybe one day you'll have to pr pr protect the Pentagon. You know, like we don't know what's coming. So because we don't know what's coming, let's build for everything that might possibly happen. We're going to have 14 layers of custom encryption, four different interfaces, you know, just in case these things might, right ha might happen, right? So this is obviously an, an over complication, or I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it's a very con common idea where we're building what we have in front of us and we're asking the question of like what might happen and then we build for that. And so Yagni is trying to respond against that. Um, so Yagni is supposed to be, you aren't going to need it. Um, I like to say instead, you ain't going to need it. Um, so just because, you know, I live in the South now. Um, but the general idea around Yagni is that we're actually really terrible at predicting the future. You know, we'd like to think that we're good at predicting the future, but in reality, we actually... Um, we can predict all sorts of possible outcomes and even doing our best ability to predict those possible outcomes, we still tend to pick the wrong ones the majority of the time. And so what we want to do is basically we're trying to control for bad outcomes by using abstractions and planning. We're thinking about all the head. Oh, it might predict the Pentagon. It might move to SSO. But in reality, we're just not very good at it. And so Yagni is just saying, you aren't going to need it, right? Look at those things and say, you don't know what's going to happen. I'm going to talk about that more in just a second. But first of all, let's talk about where Yagni was popularized. So there's this concept called extreme programming, which I love because first of all, it's brilliant. And most of the great programming practices we have today came from extreme programming, but also because it makes me think of extreme skateboarding, but instead you're like, you know, like standing on an old school keyboard or something like that. But XP kind of introduced a lot of concepts or popularized a lot of concepts that we rely on today. We've got pair programming, unit testing, a lot of other things. And it had a concept called simple design and another called incremental design. When you take those together, they're very Yagni-esque. So simple design is all about basically choosing the simplest possible thing. And incremental design is saying, choose that simplest thing, deliver it, get feedback, and then build the next thing and then deliver it and then get feedback. And it starts sounding like agile because, you know, agile, not the agile, you know, industrial complex, but just being agile is very connected to extreme programming. There's a really fantastic podcast episode from Sarah Bine on, oh, you know what? I jumped to one too quickly. First of all, let's look at the Agile Manifesto. I mentioned Agile and the Agile Manifesto is a one of the original places where people who were working Agile-ly got together and said, let's kind of like take some of our best ideas and write them down. And so one of the things that they say in the Agile Manifesto is welcome changing requirements, even late in development. And if we're all talking about how agile we are and how agile we're trying to be, we got to recognize that being willing to have your requirements change on an ongoing basis is necessary for working that way. But if that's the case, then we can't do all this super crazy long-term planning because we need to be able to change, allow for those plans to change anyway, right? So if requirements change, your well-laid plans aren't going to work anymore. Now the right slide. Fantastic podcast episode from Sarah Bine on the Titans um, podcast called the 20% Time Podcast, where, and it was, the, it was titled Yagni. And she has a couple quotes from that podcast that I deeply loved and I want to share with you. So the first thing she said was, when faced with multiple paths, choose the simplest. So let's say you are at that point and you're building an auth system and you don't know which one's going to come in front of you. Well, if you listen to Sarah, and we'll talk a little bit about why she says those things, what she would say is, don't pick on which has the most flexibility. Don't pick on what, you know, which has the most likelihood do whatever, you know, I just like your focus should be on the simplest. And then that's going to, you're going to ask, well, why? Because of course I should want the one that has the most flexibility. And there's kind of two reasons that she points out in the, the in her um, episode. And the first thing is number one, she says, leave your options open. So let's say when you're making decisions about an auth system, you arbitrarily have five different options in front of you and they vary in complexity and complexity and flexibility and all this kind of stuff. And so you have to pick one of them. You pick one and then you get a year down the road to this thing you were planning for. And it turns out you picked the wrong one. Well, now you're screwed because you don't have those other four options anymore. However, if you deferred that decision as long as possible, kept it as simple as possible, then when that thing comes up, you now have all those five options and you can pick the right one. Something that we say at Titan a lot that we learned, I think originally from Adam Wethin is you never know less about a project that you do on day one. So day one is probably the worst time to be making these long-term decisions. And yet it seems to be the time we do the most because we're doing all this upfront planning. One other thing that Sarah said on that podcast is it is very, very easy to turn simple code into complex code later but it's extremely hard, if not impossible, to turn complex code into simple code. 
So again, you may find yourself trying to build this very complicated code on day one with the hope that it's going to do the best job of serving your needs and, and, the, and down the road. But what happens if down the road, that complex code is what you needed? Well, you're stuck because it's spaghettied all the way through the entire application. Whereas if you say, we may need that complicated code later, but we're going to start simple now. If you need simple later, you're good. And if you need complex later, you're good. Because starting from simple, you can do all sorts of other things. There's also a fantastic article in this direction from Lucas Costa called Why Long-Term Plans Don't Work and How to Fix Them. And one of the main things he said in here is long-term plans are pernicious. And I wish I had remembered the exact definition, but basically just don't, don't do long-term software plans. And he says, yearly software development plans are my favorite genre of fiction, which I freaking love. Um, because, you know, it's basically like yearly software plans when you're planning what your application is going to do a year from now, it's just never actually going to make a case down the road. So all you're doing is planning around something that's not going to happen. So one of the things you know if you read this article, which and by the way, I'll put a, um, all links to all these things and a few other things at the end of the talk, and I'll also tweet them out. But one of the things that he talks about is the length is one of the biggest concerns here. And so he says, when you're talking about long-term code plans, there's really only two options. You've got the imaginative ones in which you think nothing's going to go wrong, or you got the naive ones in which you say things are going to go wrong. So we're just going to add buffer to our estimates, right? Like you can notice that this smells a lot like no estimates. Have you ever heard of no estimates before? And so basically the point here is if you say, we think it's going to take four weeks, you assume four weeks and nothing goes wrong. But if you say, we think it's going to take four weeks, so we're going to build them eight, you're still being naive because you still think it's just just as simple as adding buffer on top of that system. When in reality, it's not even just that our ability to estimate is bad, it's our ability to know what's going to change is bad. It's not just code or understanding of the code that changes over the span of a process, it's also the requirements that happen. So what he says is really the only valid option is make shorter plans. It's not about get better at making longer term plans, it's about making shorter plans. Okay, so that's it for Yagni. We're gonna move on to our next concept here. Sandy Metz is a Rubyist. Um, she's a teacher. She's an author of uh, Pooter and then uh, Practical Object Oriented Design and also 99 Bottles. Um, and a lot of her teaching is around simplicity. And it's in Ruby. So unfortunately, it's not always as easy to do things as simply as she suggests in PHP as in, as, as in Ruby. But there's still a lot of really fantastic teaching. And one of the things she said in a talk recently that was, well, not recently, in 2014, I think, um, was really just one slide as a part of a bigger talk. And she said, duplication is far cheaper than the wrong abstraction. And it literally was just one slide, but people jumped on that slide so much that she ended up writing an entire blog post around that particular slide. And she basically said, um, an existing abstraction has momentum. So if you're building an application and you introduce some kind of an abstraction where it's a, you know, oh, we think this thing's going to be repeated. So we're going to build some kind of tool around it that makes it so that all the time we're calling it, we're calling that one kind of abstracted tool, right? And the thing is, once you've built that abstraction in, it has momentum. And so new developers who come along and have something that's a need that's similar will say, well, obviously we have to work with that abstraction, of course, right? Because it's already there, but it doesn't really fit anymore. So we're going to have to make it bigger and heftier and more you know, flexible and take more parameters. And if you've ever watched open source projects develop, this is something that's very common is they often you know, expand to scope basically the need of every single person who's ever opened an issue in that open source project despite that might not potentially not giving the best actual user experience for the people who they were primarily trying to serve at the beginning. So the problem is the wrong abstraction chosen at the beginning is going to severely increase your ongoing cost of change because now every single person who comes along has to adopt this existing abstraction and try to work with it and modify and tweak it. One of the things that Sandy said here is, first of all, we need to be a lot less scared of duplication. But second of all, in those circumstances, often what we need to do is actually remove the abstraction, reduplicate everything, and then allow our eyes then to be able to make the decision. So it's not like she's saying it's an un a, the wrong abstraction is an unfixable problem. But it's a very common problem that we don't notice because we often think, oh, if we introduce the wrong abstraction, we're just going to notice it later and then fix it. But it brings momentum along. If it's already in the code base, even if it's the same human being working on it later, you're like, oh, well, I made that decision then when I was head deep in it. So it must have been the right decision. Tiny moment for me to um, share some thoughts about um, separation of concerns and DRY. Separation of concerns is hugely overrated. And it's gen generally the idea that, you know, your things that do different things should be separate from each other. But it's one of these where like, it doesn't actually specifically mean anything. So it's just something that people use as kind of like their pet statement to point out why they really don't like a particular 
pattern or a particular ORM or something like that. But you, you can apply separation of concern in so many different ways in so many different spaces. I would just say, please throw it out. Please stop using it as a conversational point. Dry is not as terrible, but it is still overrated and abused. People are constantly doing things where they pick an abstraction that's not the right fit. They pick that abstraction way too early. And it's because of this fear that repeated code is bad. And I'm not going to say it's not bad, right? Like we've all hit a point where you, you change the thing in one place, but you didn't remember to change it in another place because it was duplicated. Okay. That is a pain point. There's not, I'm not saying, but, and, but a lot of that kind of stuff, when that happens, it's, it's in much simpler stuff where this repetition is around extracting a template component or something like that. But when we're talking about architectural patterns, allowing a little bit of duplication is going to allow you to have a much better understanding of what's going on when you actually get to the point where you need it to be extracted, you need the complication to happen. Whereas if you do it super early, then you often will build it in the wrong way. And so I have an alternative to propose to dry, which I learned from my friend, Sean Jones. And he says, I live by wet, write everything twice. And I laughed so hard, not only because it's hilarious, because it's true, but the fact that it's literally wet and then dry. And oh my God, I just love this man. Um, there's another name for this. I think it's called the rule of three or something like that, or the whatever, but basically don't ever try to, if you see two of something, be perfectly happy. And the only time you should even begin to consider um, actually extracting it out or abstracting it out is when you get to three of them. All right. Next point while I take a drink from my beautiful Titan mug. Abstractions aren't free. So what I mean by this is a lot of times when somebody comes up with the idea that they're going to bring in this new kind of like, um, technical pattern, organizational pattern, architecture pattern, new big fancy tool or whatever, they say, well, we might as well introduce it now because we'll probably need it later, or we might need it later. For example, if somebody comes along and they watched a DDD course and now they want to build 16 namespace deep, deep architecture astronaut, you know, bull crap, they're like, well, it'll make it easier in case we actually need it later, right? But the problem is that's not actually true. Every abstraction you introduce also introduce some costs. And those costs could be all sorts of different things. They could be coordinating deploys if you've got multiple repos as a result of your abstraction. They could be finding the code if you did an architectural pattern change. It could be getting this pattern right, because if this pattern is new for you, now you have to, you're not just building the feature you're building, you have to build the feature in like the right way for that pattern. And that is a cost for every new programmer. There might be ongoing maintenance cost for the integration or the complication or the abstraction. There might be some expertise that's required in order for people to work on it. And now that changes all of your hiring process because you have to hire people who don't just write Laravel or JavaScript, they have to write it in this particular way, right? And all of your future development will now be constrained to work within these patterns. And you might hit a point where that's not actually the right decision. So my point here is that introducing an abstraction is never free. Every abstraction you introduce, every new complicated tool that's not kind of part of the base tool tooling of your work, none of those are free and they introduce some kind of cost. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't do them. It just means if someone's coming along saying, look, we should just do this new complicated thing because that's not the best way to do it. The because is if, well, we'll talk more about the because as we go, but just know it's not free. And I do want to note that a lot of people will do a lot of these things because of the expectation that they need to get hit some massive scale later. And the problem is they're making such decisions at the beginning of the project that they are never actually get able to get to the point where they hit the big scale because they fizzle out or they waste too much of their time or they never get the thing to, to actually ship because of the fact that they were so busy working on these architectural patterns that slowed them down versus staying live, staying like the, you know, the shepherd without the, the heavy armor and being able to move fast at the beginning when it's important to actually get your product to ship. All right, next big point, work to your team. So when I mean work to your team, what I mean is you're not Amazon, you're not Netflix. Uh, some of you, at least one person who's spoken so far is Shopify, right? So I'm not saying nobody is. And if you are Netflix or Amazon or Shopify, who else, well, then maybe these things are the right things for you, which is why I'm not just so you know, like there was a Kubernetes talk earlier today, and I'm, I'm glad for people to use Kubernetes who need Kubernetes um, and microservices and all these other ones. But the thing is the vast majority of us aren't those people and don't need those things. So what I mean by this is not every tool works for every team, just like the story at the beginning. Not every single one of you is the king. So therefore not every single one of you should make wear the king's armor. Now, the problem is the king is like theoretically better than a subject, right? So I'm not saying negative things about you, but like if you have three people, if you have people who only know PHP, then you probably shouldn't build a, work with a tool that was in Go and is built by a, you know, a group that has 80 teams of 20 people, right? You just got to understand that your team is unique and therefore the needs of your team, the tools that are going to fit for your team are different from other people. And my last tip is very specifically related to extractions. And by extractions, I mean 
um, abstractions or tools that require you to actually pull some code out of your existing application. So we're talking about things like microservices and refactoring your code bases and some other things we'll talk about later. I'd um, like to pull things out to libraries, but anything that involves pulling code out of your monolith to somewhere else, a lot of the mistakes I see people making are in this particular context. What I want to say is prepare for extraction. The extraction misconception is that if you have a jumbled, messy, spaghetti code base of monolith, the monolith is the problem. And all you got to do is just extract it out to microservices, whatever else, and it's going to fix your structural issues. But the thing is, what's really going to happen is you're going to extract a jumbled mess into a whole bunch of separate jumbled messes that now have hard barriers between them. And so refactoring becomes much more difficult. So extraction doesn't fix your structural issues. It actually cements them into like code based separations with HTTP calls in between them, right? So what the point that I want to make here is if you have a messy monolith, you have a messy code base, refactor it first, because most abstractions, most extractions used well require you to re-architect or refactor or modularize or whatever else before you do them, unless you just want to cement your problems in forever. So just do the refactoring in the first place. Okay. So what I'm saying here is never extract, never do any kind of extraction without refactoring first. If your code base is messy and you extract to a model, uh, to, a, to a microservice or anything else, you're just cementing your messiness in place forever. So do the refactoring first. And what you might find is that once you do the refactoring, you didn't actually need that extraction in the first place. Place. But if you do, that's fine because that extraction will go so much better because you're not cementing your problems in place. All right. So that's the end of part two, which is the overall ideas. So what remains is talking about some concrete premature abstractions I see very commonly in our industry and the ways to apply some of these concepts to those premature abstractions. Like I've said before, none of these are bad ideas. None of you are bad if you've used these before or given talks about these before or written books about these before or tweets about these before. There is no shade here to anybody. My point is that often when we talk about new and exciting technologies, we talk about them in ways and we internalize them in ways as if it is the thing that everybody needs to do. And I want to free people from those ideas. So for each of these examples, I'm going to have five sections. What is this thing we're talking about? Why do people usually want this thing we're talking about? What are the dangers of this particular thing? When does this thing make the most sense? And how do we approach it wisely? I want to caveat, I'm not going to get every single edge case or every single whatever. So if you really love one of these patterns and I didn't catch one of the reasons why it's great or whatever else, it's totally fine. This is just to give everybody a general overall understanding in my experience of how to approach these things and how to think about them. So the first one we're going to talk about is the repository pattern. So what is a repository pattern? It is a database architecture plan in which you don't want your application code. So let's talk about your controllers or your plain PHP classes, whatever else to directly call your ORM. Usually, and if you're not familiar, Eloquent is our ORM in the majority of Laravel applications. Normally the way, the reasons people want, well, actually, hold on, why people want is next. So what is it? It is that. And so instead of calling, for example, in your controller or whatever else, calling, you know, person colon colon all, you would say person repository colon colon get all people. So you're basically creating a separate PHP class. that's usually either a straight um, popo, P, uh, plain, PH, plain old PHP object, or it extends some interface, the repository interface. But basically all it does is has no connection to your ORM. It's literally just PHP. It's just got a whole bunch of methods. And each of those methods is the name for a particular thing you're doing. And then it makes a call out to your ORM. So the reason people want this is, first of all, it promises this idea of loose coupling. Your application code is not no longer directly calling your ORM, and it's no longer directly calling your particular database type. So in theory, if you want to change from Eloquent to Data Mapper, or if you want to change from SQL to NoSQL or something like that one day, in theory, the repository pattern makes that easier for you. And additionally, if you have complex database model logic, like for example, you know, you have a particular call you need to make that does inner joins with all these other complicated things, and you don't want to put that complex logic in your controller. You don't want to put that complex logic in your model. If that's a preference, I'm not saying you should, but that's some people's preference. Then they want a class to put it in. And there's a couple of different types of classes you can put it in, including uh, query builder class objects and stuff like that. But a repository is one place to do this. So these are some reasons people reach for them. So let me talk about the dangers of the repository pattern. First of all, every single model now needs an extra class. You now have an extra layer of code you have to maintain, have to test, have to manage your interactions with, have to remember where things live. Every call you're ever going to make is now have to have an extra method. So you can't just say something colon colon R all and take advantage of what your ORM already has for you. You now have to write a specific method for that particular call, which is extra effort, extra code, and a lot of times un it's unnecessary. And the thing is the promise of like, separating yourself from, you know, from your ORM or from your thing 
doesn't really work because you're almost always still relying on a particular shape of a collection of data. And even the methods that you're writing are usually based around probably the method names in your ORM. But even if not, they're usually based around the method names that make sense given the type of calls for your particular database driver. And I'm not talking about the difference between MySQL or Postgres. I'm talking about the differences between um, SQL and NoSQL, right? Like the calls you make in a SQL database are not going to be the same as the calls you make in a NoSQL database name. So, but good luck actually trying to write method names in your repository that would make sense for both. So it has the promise and the idea of this separation that's not actually there. And you also end up getting these crazy method names. And this is not even the worst at all, but like find author by ID scope to tenant. Like imagine having to do that every single time you're making a call and you just get these longer and longer and longer method names that don't actually make a lot of sense. So when did the repository make sense? The number one reason why I would, I would suggest you use it is when you have a lot of complex database logic and you prefer to keep your models clean. And that doesn't mean everyone should prefer that. I don't, but it's perfectly fine if you do. If you like clean models without a lot of decorator methods on them, then a repository class is one of the helpful tools you could potentially use to organize that complex logic. It's not the only one, but it makes sense there. All the other reasons why people use for a repository pattern, not good reasons for it. So how to approach the repository pattern wisely. Don't use it unless you need it. Don't use it just because people say, oh, you should do it, or you saw some famous person using it, or because one day we may change databases, drivers, and stuff like that. Those are not good reasons, okay? And I just want to say directly, one day we may change database drivers is a terrible decision, or a terrible reason to make basically any decision in programming. Eloquent gives you a 98% the same um, access layer to the vast majority of SQL database drivers. And if your project has halfway in and switches from SQL to NoSQL, you got bigger issues than how you wrote your, your direct code. So don't even worry about that. So if you have a real need that can be solved by the repository pattern, go for it. All right, on to our next one, microservices, getting spicy. So what are microservices? It's when you split one or more of the pieces of your application off into smaller applications. Usually each of those applications is going to be a separate code base. It's going to be hosted separately, maybe not in the, maybe in the same host, but usually a separate subdomain or something, and often written in other languages. So why people want monoliths There's are microservices. There's a lot of reasons, but here are some of the biggest ones people talk about. Number one, scaling. If different parts of your application have the potential of needing to scale at different speeds, for example, one piece is really resource intensive and the rest of it's not, people like microservices because then that one piece can be separate and it can scale up without the cost of scaling the entire thing up. Number two, a lot of people have the desire to be able to work with different languages and or frameworks for each part of their application. Number three, modularity, meaning basically the different parts of your app, each of kind of independent to each other, is something that often people reach for um, microservices for. And finally, fault isolation. If one of your pieces of your application breaks and it takes the whole app down, microservice promises to save you from that problem a little bit. So let's talk about the dangers here. Uh, if you have not a chance, had a chance to check out grugbrain.dev, I would absolutely check it out. Um, it's a very fantastic and enjoyable and hilarious set of basically teachings from Grug. Um, and one of the things Grug said is Grug said is Grug wonder why big brain, uh, meaning like the architecture astronauts and stuff like that, take hardest problem, which is factoring system correctly, introduce a network call too. And if that doesn't make sense, basically it's what's saying is organizing, structuring, architecting, factoring your applications really well is very, very, very difficult even when you're doing direct PHP to PHP calls. So it's like, oh, let's take this. It's kind of what I was talking about before about cementing your problems. Let's take this and now put HTTP layers between every single one of those calls too. And it's a little bit of a joke, but it's kind of a really good point because when you do switch to microservices, you now have all of these layers that were pre previously handled within your same framework, within your same application, within your same um, language and behind the barrier of a server. And now you're opening those things all up to the internet. So validation becomes more difficult. Authentication becomes more difficult. Firewall and HTTP and port issues become more complicated. I mean, they, they show up because they weren't there before. You now have more comp code bases, which means your deploys are more complicated. And then also you have a very common thing where you got one dev who's really excited about Phoenix or Rust or Golang or whatever cool new language as it is at the moment. And now all of a sudden you, a small team of three people or five people or even 20 people now all of a sudden have a Rust dependency for the rest of your lives. You have to have a Rust programmer forever. And you know, you know and often it's only that one person who introduced it who even knows Rust. So good luck when they go on vacation and the Rust service breaks, right? There's just all these costs that come from it. And often you have to build entirely complicated messaging systems because again, you can't rely on the internal messaging systems or your framework or your language because now they're not on the same 
same server and not possibly not in the same language. So now I have to build these intermediate systems, in, intermediate systems between your different applications. So when do microservices make sense? When one piece of your app truly, not hypothetically, not potentially, but actually measurably has different needs for scale or, you know, some, one of the other things I talked about before so badly that the costs of microservices are outweighed, that's when you should start thinking about it. And only then don't do it preemptively. If, and here's one that I think is the most common example is if one piece of your app could run away, that should be two words or whatever, with memory usage. For example, if you're encoding video in one piece of your app and you can't configure your server or your PHP code or whatever else to make sure that that thing running away doesn't take the whole app down, all right, well, maybe you need to put a healthy barrier around the video encoder, right? But the likelihood that that's going to happen with a lot of the other app sections of your app is not, is not the case. So again, like oh, we're talking about practical, real life, measurable concerns here, not well, it's just the right thing to do because maybe maybe it'll scale one day, right? Or finally, if there's a demonstrated need for some costly technical thing, whether it's concurrency, like how many calls are happening at the same time, or speed, maybe you're processing tens of millions of rows, you know, and, and PHP just can't keep up or something like that. If your primary language can't keep up with one of those things, and another technology could. Pro tip, it's not nearly as frequent as you think. PHP can do a ton. And optimizing your PHP is going to give you a lot further than, you know, you're, it's going to help you in a lot of different ways, but also it's, it's going to get you further cheaper than just choosing to artificially introduce something like Golang or something like that because you've heard it's faster. So again, it's a demonstrated need that cannot be solved by your current um, uh, framework and language and everything. So how do you approach it wisely? Number one, prepare for your extraction. Just like we talked about before, modulize your monolith. monolith. Take the monolith, put it in different chunks, factor it well, do that before you switch to microservices. Because again, you might discover that you don't need microservices. But even if you do, that extraction will be so much easier if you factor it correctly ahead of time. Number two, many of the promises of, of the microservice are your individual standalone microservice being able to scale up and down. But do you actually have an op setup right now where you can individually scale that thing up and down? Or are you going to extract it? And now you just have two apps, neither of which are actually scalable. So while later in this talk, I am going to talk about don't overly complicate your ops. If you get to a point where you actually need microservices, then you probably actually need a more complicated ops setup, which means you're a lot further along at that point than I think a lot of the people who reach for microservices are. Um, so you should make sure that when you spin up that microservice thing, you have the ability to actually spin that microservice up and down a little bit quickly. And don't extract until you actually need to. Remember, like it's not the hypothetical theoretical future because that, this is abstraction is introducing a significant amount of cost. And finally, this is a personal preference ver versus something that I've seen happen across the whole industry. But I would say keep it in the same language as possible. And I say this because I'm a hiring manager at my company, which means I'm the one who's responsible for figuring out which technologies I need to be hiring for. I also help our clients do hiring. And the number one pain that I see people have in hiring that they weren't expecting these types of circumstances is when one person who was doing a whole bunch expanded their abilities and expanded the code bases. And now all of a sudden hiring doesn't just require you to hire for like a generic Laravel or Vue or React developer. You now have to hire somebody who had all the abilities of that person who expanded the scope of your thing. So if you have one person who can do Rust and they're like, I want to write it in Rust. And you're like, yeah, no problem. And then they leave. You now have to hire for a Laravel and Rust programmer. And there's a lot less of those than a just straight Laravel programmer. So if at all possible, keep everything in the same language. All right, next one, complicated hosting. For example, Kubernetes. No shame to the talk earlier today. When I talk about complicated hosting, I'm talking about any hosting setup that requires or suggests a de dedicated ops person. And I understand that that's a little bit of an, uh, an arbitrary thing. But what I would say is, if your average programmer who can use Forge, Envoy, um, Heroku, Vapor, uh, tools like that that are meant not to be used by an average human being, but an average pe human being who at least knows how to be a programmer, if the tool that you're reaching for cannot be easily run by that person without going through like some serious training, serious courses, all that kind of stuff. That's what I mean by complicated hosting. So Kubernetes, I mean, most Docker and production systems of any sort are going to be this way. Anything that is really kind of like a whole new set of things you need to learn on top of the basic, like I know how to log in a forge and click buttons. That's a complicated hosting setup for me. Kubernetes is one example. Um, in case you didn't hear the Kubernetes talk earlier, Kubernetes is an infrastructure as code tool where you basically write your code down and say kind of this is the state I want all my code to get to or all my hosting situation to get to. And then it man manages kind of like scaling everything up and down, um, setting up your deploys and even kind of monitoring everything like that for a containerized application. So Kubernetes is for stuff like Docker. So why do people want these more complicated systems? Often it's the perception, not the reality, but the perception that simpler hosting setups won't scale. It's literally just shiny object syndrome of seeing something that's new and cool and thinking, well, what I have is not good enough, I'm going to get something better. There are some very valuable um, 
things that come from the automatic management of certain things like load balancing, resource scaling, health management. Remember when I was talking earlier about microservices, I said your microservice should be able to scale up and down. Well, that's a lot harder to do with any of the traditional services I mentioned, except Vapor. Yay, Vapor. So again, if you're like, oh, well, I'm working with Forge and I can't, well, look at Vapor before you look at Kubernetes. Okay, I'm just going to say that. But finally, people often like the idea of infrastructure as code, where your server management and the definition of the, the healthy state of your servers is going to live in code. It's going to be documented. It's going to be repeatable. It's going to be programmatic. It's going to be committed to source control. So there's some values there. The dangers, number one, all of them, they're literally named, like my, the definition is complicated, right? It's so freaking complex, especially if you're talking about something like Kubernetes. The talk earlier today about Kubernetes was wonderful, but one of the things that should have cemented for you is it ain't free, right? You're not getting Kubernetes without doing some heavy lifting and some heavy learning. And a lot of these tools are very complicated to set up in the first place, but they're also very complicated to manage ongoing. They often require an ops person, because remember, that's part of my definition. They require you to have a person who's devoted to this. Or if you do have that one Kubernetes nerd, that Kubernetes nerd has now got a job for life. Because again, if they ever leave, you now don't just hire a Laravel programmer. You have to hire a Laravel programmer with Kubernetes experience. So again, avoid moving to some of these complicated systems unless you're a place where you have the budget and the willingness to hire someone either dedicated to be doing this or to recognize that that's going to be an ongoing part of employing part of your team as people who have this ability. So when do these complicated systems make the most sense is when the existing tools, especially thinking about Vapor, because I know that Forge and Envoy only get to the point of like the more traditional VPS type system, but Vapor is not the more traditional VPS system. So especially when Vapor no longer meets, needs, meets your immediate or provable short-term needs for scale, that is the time when it makes the most sense. Not hypothetical, not theoretical, provable, immediate, or short-term. So how do you approach it wisely? Don't do it unless you need it. I think you must, might, this might start sounding a little familiar. Ensure you have a dedicated person to handle DevOps. And I'm not saying this person can only be doing DevOps, but you need to recognize, especially if you're like the, the team lead or the CTO or whatever, that like this is now a role you're going to have to pay for and hire for for the rest of this application's lifetime. And finally, wait to move until your existing hosting tools have measurable difficulty at your current or short-term predicted scale. If you don't have the ability to actually look at your CPU usage, your memory usage, your load time from different areas around the world or any of those things, then you're not in the, the right point to make a decision to move into one of these complicated hosting systems. First, figure out how to prove it. And then once you've proved it, then make that decision based on the data that you've gathered. All right, the next one, it's another complex setup, but this is complex local setup, not complex production setup. So what I'm talking about is any local development setup that involves a custom built solution. So I'm not saying anything like sale. I'm not saying anything like Homestead. What I'm talking about is a custom Docker file just for you, custom Vagrant file just for you, some other custom local build thing that your team set up just for you. So why do people want these? The first thing is because it promises the ability to have your development environment perfectly mirror prod, which is a valuable thing to have. The second thing, honestly, the most common reason why we see this is it's shiny. Someone's excited and they don't want to work with a tool that exists out of the box and they just want to nerd out. I'm just going to be very direct with you. If somebody in your team comes wanting to build a custom thing, I'm not saying they're always wrong, but it's smelly. And the smell is often that they got really excited about some new cool tool and they just want to use an ex excuse to you know, kind of do it on your project. The dangers. I watch 62% of a video course about Docker is not the same as I can actually build a local Docker build that won't screw everyone on my team of 15 people over as I have to fix it hundred times. And I'm sorry to say that I've seen this so many times, but the difference between I can actually build this thing in a way that works for us and I'm interested in, it and I'm willing to try, there's a big difference between the two and people don't often know that difference about themselves because they've never actually worked with it in a production or in, in a real, you know, code base. So the dangers of building, working with these complicated local setups. Onboarding new people is more costly. These tools are always, even when working perfectly, more costly to bring somebody in on because usually they involve custom builds that have to happen every time. Usually something breaks because this is not something that new people are spinning up thousands a day because it's some big public system. There's one person spinning up in the system once a month when you hire new people or once every six months or something. And so it's not getting tested at the same pace. It's always more complicated. Um, and then often um, when you need to make changes, those changes are also a lot more complicated to make because you are in a situation where let's say you need to add a new dependency that th this person's never worked with before, the person who set up your Docker system, or your Vagrant system. Well, now they have to learn. Now they have to add it. Now they have to test it. Now they have to rebuild it. And if you're using something like Sail or something like Valet, like there's a million people who've done these things before and you just press the button and other people have tested it and you're not the first person doing it. 
you also now have to, just like we were talking about Kubernetes, you have to have a Docker guy or a Docker girl around. You have to have a Vagrant guy or a Vagrant girl around. And you end up with things that commonly happen in, on these projects where you say, well, sorry, the person who set this up doesn't work here anymore. Or the person who set this up isn't in today. It's a very common problem. And imagine bringing new people onto the project or something messing up with someone's local system. And instead of going on Stack Overflow or the Laravel forums or anything like that, you're like, oh, well, there's literally only one person who can answer it and they're on vacation for a month or they, they quit or they're too busy today. Like huge problem. And again, this is a process issue, but it's a very significant process issue. So when does it make the most sense to build your local infrastructure this way? If you've started with the simplest options, sale, valet, homestead, whatever else, and you felt a real pain point, there's an actual problem that is insurmountable by your team using those existing tools that cannot be dealt with. And even then I would say, see a lot of those um, tools right there allow you to like publish your configuration and modify it. I would start there. Go with a modified homestead configure, a modified sale config over building your own custom thing. So how do you approach this wisely? Number one, don't do it unless you need it. Kicking the dead horse over here. Number two, don't do it for an actual team unless you've done it for fun before. So if you are that person going to volunteer to make the custom Docker file or custom whatever else, go play around with it in the side. If this is some really fun thing for you, then do it for fun and run into those pain points and get other people to try it long before you're ever trying to do it for an actual team. And I gotta be honest with y'all, uh, if you are going to have, if there's some reason you absolutely have to do this, consider paying somebody who does it professionally and have them on call to do modifications. Because like I said, a lot of the costs here come from when you're bringing in somebody on your team who's not accessible. All right, uh, the next one is extracting components and classes to libraries. So something that people often do is take pieces of your application and extract them to a front end component or a back end component that can be shared across applications. Usually they're in different code bases and they're loaded via package managers. The number one reason why people want to do this is because they have code that's going to be shared between different projects run by the same team. For example, front-end components that are going to look the same across two different websites. Uh, you want to extract them out. So one of the dangers is coordinating deploys for these different components across multiple projects is very difficult because you often have different teams, different timelines, different feature deploy you know, timelines, everything like that working across your multiple projects. So if you make a change to this shared dependency for one of your projects, it might be a breaking change for the other project. And now you have to rush those people through a different timeline of deploys, when in reality, all you want to do is just make something in this other one. And often people say, oh, well, the solution is Semver. And I'm just going to tell you that using Semver for very simple things like fixing a login button is very painful. I've done it before and it's not as cool as you think. So what I would say is it makes the most sense when you have things that are things that you would normally make sense as a package anyway, with helpers or utilities, stuff that could be released as a composer package or an NPM package. When you have those that you want to extract, those make a ton more sense. So don't extract until you need it, kicking that dead horse. Don't extract unless it would make sense as a composer or an NPM package. And then the last things I would say, extract as little as possible and tools with as minimal surface area as possible. All right, last one, event sourcing. I'm a little bit over time, so I'm going to rush this one a little bit, and I'm sorry. Event sourcing is a DDD-related tool where instead of having resources in your database, for example, a blog post that can be modified, you have events in your event store. This happened, this happened, this happened. And to find the current status of your resources, you can play events through over time. But often in event sourcing, it's not even about resources changing over time. The events themselves are what are important. So why do people want them? Well, one of the promises is that at any point, you can replay the history of events and the code that's replaying it can be different because if you want your outcome data to look a little bit different shape than another one, then you can just say, oh, well, change the projection building code and then rerun it. And all of a sudden our database looks completely different without migrations, without anything else. There's a lot of cool promises that come there. You also get a full history of everything that ever happened. And of course, event storming just sounds fun. Like who doesn't want to do something called event storming? Dangers. Number one, the vast majority of applications are not appropriate for event sourcing. That doesn't make event sourcing bad. It just means it gets reached for in places it shouldn't. But even for apps where event sourcing is appropriate, a lot of times people think they should make their entire app event sourced, when in reality, usually only a small portion of the app should be event sourced. And when you're doing that, setting up communication between the event sourced part of your app and the non-event sourced or stateful part of your app can be very difficult because their communication and timelines, their paradigms are all very different, very separate from each other. The good news is there's some great teaching on this, but I just want you to understand that this is a cost from choosing event sourcing if you have not done it before. So when does event sourcing make the most sense? It's when your project, your application is based on events. It's often things like banking, shipping, manufacturing, insurance, telecom, things where the most important thing that's happening in this industry, in this application are actually this happened, this happened, this happened, not what is the current state of this thing, right? And any other project where you need to be, be able to evaluate and prove every action. Sometimes doing an audit log for your application is good enough, but sometimes event sourcing gives you a better access to a definitive state. Not there can be no state of the thing other than the sequence of these events. Okay, event sourcing makes more sense.
So with event sourcing, don't use it unless you need it. Only apply it to the smallest part of your app possible. And if you're going to do it, research and plan how to handle that internal communication between your event sourced and your stateful code as early as possible. So this is not a full TLDR of the entire thing. Remember, the TLDR itself is Yagni, but I'm going to give you just a couple real quick summary points, and then we'll be done. Number one, we can't predict the future. We're terrible at it. When we try to do so, we introduce premature abstractions. We make all sorts of mistakes that are going to tangle us up later. Number two, abstractions aren't free. Don't introduce an abstraction just because, oh, it may help us later. There is a cost coming from introducing it, so only introduce it when you need it. Number three, write simple code and make that code easy to change to delete in the future because if you make it simple now, when you have more knowledge about what you need later, that code will be great for you to say, oh, now that I know this, I have this really simple code I can work with. And finally, many abstractions don't actually solve your architectural or factoring problems. They actually cement them. So most importantly, fix your existing code, fix your existing monolith. Don't just reach for shiny objects. I hope this has been helpful for you. I'm going to tweet right after this with a whole bunch of links and a link to the speaker deck. Um, you'll see this, this set of links available to you. And uh, thank you so much, Ian, and for the rest of the Lyricon team for having me. All right. Thank you, sir. That was thank uh, great. Thank you. All righty. Let's see what we got here. Okay. So we are on break. Uh, we are not going to do 20 minutes, um, but what we're going to do, I want to stay on schedule. Uh, we're going to start Taylor's talk at 1.40 Eastern, so 10 minutes. So we're going to take a 10-minute break, and then we will be back here for Taylor's keynote. Um, so get up, stretch your legs, get a drink, all that stuff, and we will be back here in 10. See you in a few.
Okay, we are back. All right, looks like everything's good here. Okay, all right. Um, first off, before we get to Taylor, <clears throat> just going to uh, have a sponsor slot here from our very good friends at Vehicle. Uh, so let's do that. Play this. Vehicle is a Canadian dev shop located in Southern Ontario, specializing in Laravel, Vue, and many other JavaScript frameworks. Our 75 person dev team works with clients to help them build exceptional web and mobile applications. We act as an extension of our client's existing dev team, working with them to ship clean, maintainable code. We are one team with our clients and we share in their successes. Our goal is to help you guide your team into building products you can be proud of. Here's how we deliver on that promise. Our foundational values are caring, growth, and delivery. We seek to provide a caring environment that enables our team to focus on growth. This in turn allows us to deliver for our clients. So what does working with us look like? We have daily Slack communication with your team. We collaborate with you on weekly or bi-weekly sprint planning. We provide demos and retrospectives at the end of each sprint. We work with your team to have collaborative PR reviews, and we have daily pairing and mobbing sessions to ensure we ship high quality code. Mob programming is a form of collaboration that eliminates dev block in a creative space that promotes growth, learning, and knowledge sharing. Join us for our public growth sessions. Reach out to us to learn more. We love giving back to the tech community. We organize JavaScript and PHP meetup groups in our community. Find us on Meetup. For this Laracon, Vehicle is giving away your choice of an iPhone 14 Pro or a Galaxy Z Flip 4. All you have to do is opt into our emails and you've entered. And for an extra entry, join us for a mob programming workshop that will be running throughout the day. If you'd like to learn more about mob programming, the details are in our description on the Laracon swag page. But enough about us. We want to learn about you. We would love to have a conversation and learn what you've been working on. You can visit our website at vehicle.com or send an email to go at vehicle.com or connect with us on our socials to keep up to date with us and the Vehicalian culture. We also wanted to give a big thank you to everyone at Laracon who helped host this online event. We look forward to hearing from you and thank you so much for watching. All right, 
thank you so much to vehicle um again check them out on the swag page they have the mob programming sessions they're giving away on iphone um so a lot of different things are offering over there and obviously of course if you're interested in their development services uh, all the contact information is there on the swag page uh, you know we've worked with them for a long time very long time sponsors of laracon laravel uh great team over there so check them out all right here he is mr otwell let's bring him in I think he's coming. Hello. Hello, sir. All right. I'm going to let you take it away. The people are ready. All right. Sounds good. You see my uh, console window? Yep. Okay. All right. Well, uh, welcome back to Laracon. Um, it's great to be back here giving another Laravel update to you. Um, and uh, thanks to Ian and Uterscape uh, for organizing this event, for all the sponsors that help us stream this for free, which is, um, you know, pretty awesome that we can bring this to everyone um, around the world at no cost. Uh, so thanks to all of our sponsors for making that possible. And uh, yeah, it's great to be back. Uh, the talks have been pretty amazing so far. Uh, they, they've really blown me away. And uh, this summer marks um, 11 years of maintaining Laravel. Um, and pretty much all of those years have been fun and full of cool features in their own way and, and full of improvements uh, in the framework and in the ecosystem and community. And I uh, hope you're all still enjoying Laravel as much as we enjoy developing it uh, here at Laravel. We've got um, a pretty decent sized team going uh, here now. And um, I still love waking up and working on Laravel and continuing to make it, you know, what I think is the most productive way to build uh, full stack web applications. And, uh, you know, being at Laracon is also, I was just thinking this morning, um, it's always a fresh reminder that it feels like the key to the success of Laravel has always been just that it has a community of awesome people that build cool things and share cool things. Um, so thank you to all of you for continuing to be excited about Laravel, for building cool things with Laravel, for tweeting cool things about Laravel, uh, for tweeting funny, uh, Laravel memes. Um, it just makes the whole ecosystem awesome and fun and a joy to be a part of. So thanks to all of you. Um, as I'm sure, you know, um, I usually use these opportunities to sort of give you an update on, um, some of the new things in Laravel, some of the new things around the ecosystem. Um, I have made my life a little bit harder in that regard in recent years um, because, you know, years ago, we would actually hold back features. Um, so we would finish a feature. Uh, I would finish working on some feature in the framework and I wouldn't release it at all, even though it was totally done. And even though it may have been totally backwards compatible with the existing release of Laravel, I would hold it back, you know, for the next Laracon or for the next major release. Um, but when we switched to yearly releases, we kind of stopped doing that. And we used to have a major release every six months, uh, which was pretty breakneck pace. Uh, but now that we switched to yearly releases, we, we really don't try to hold back any features like we used to. Um, so we kind of continually ship them uh, throughout the year. And that's great for the framework. You know, it's great for all of you, I guess, uh, because you're sort of continually getting the stream of new updates. But it does make my Laracon life a little bit harder because... Uh, you know, everything's already been shipped, um, but we do have a few um, new updates that I want to show you today. Um, some of it is stuff that we've shipped kind of in the past uh, six to eight weeks, uh, you know, something like that, the past two or three months. Some of it is stuff that you haven't seen at all. Um, so if you've seen some of it, um, great, you know, bear with me. There will be things that you haven't seen. Um, but a lot of people actually don't uh, stay up to the bleeding edge of what's new in Laravel, you know, on a week by week basis. So I'm going to cover some of the recent stuff and then we'll dig into some new stuff. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about is the artisan CLI improvements that uh, Nuno Maduro 
has been doing it and and basically has completed i would say at this point um i basically put a base camp task out there on our internal base camp that said improve cli output or improve artisan output or something like that and that was a pretty broad uh, project but basically the goal was to totally reskin artisan to be much more beautiful much more attractive much more helpful to feel a lot more modern i guess you would say and a lot more um just fresh, uh, better status messages, more colorful output, better organization. And uh, he really knocked this out of the park. And I think some community people pitched in as well on a few commands uh, to really make it really great. So, you know, I'm sure if you've used the latest Laravel, you've seen some of this, but things like, you know, the route list um, to view your routes looks way better. If you're still on Laravel 8 or uh, on a release of Laravel before this was released, you know this is uh, much better than what we used to have where a lot of times the text would be all wrapped and garbled around because it couldn't fit on the screen. Uh, same thing with like the event list. Um, if I do artisan event list, you know, we get a much cleaner uh, formatted output of all the events in our application and what they look like. And even when we do things like make a model, uh, make model conference, you know, we get these nice, colorful informational messages. Um, every command in Laravel has been totally revisited, revamped, even things like the queue and artists and serve have all been revisited, kind of reskinned, giving a fresh coat of paint. And I, I'm just really happy with how this turned out. So thanks to Nuno for um, all of his work on that over the last couple of months. All right, so get rid of that. Um, I want to kind of stick with the CLI for a bit because there's there's a few new commands and a few new features um, that have come out over the last few weeks that I wanted to talk about. Uh, one is a, a new command from James Brooks um, called the about command. So what, what you do is you just type artisan about and you get like a high level overview of your application's kind of status and basic configuration. Um, so you can see basic things like the application name, uh, the Laravel version, uh, whether you're in debug mode or not. So that's really important if you're in production to know um, you want that to be disabled in production, of course. Um, whether various things are cached and then what kind of drivers you're using, you know, across broadcasting, across cache, across database, a really quick high level overview of your entire application so in this case i can see that my routes aren't cached so if i were to type artisan route cache and then run this again you know now i get an indication that those routes are cached so this is actually a really helpful command in production um, not just in local development to just kind of do a, a quick sanity check of what drivers you're using what's cached and what's not cached and just to be able to spot something that might be off in production really quickly without necessarily digging through your environment file or your configuration files manually this can just tell you really quickly uh, what's going on and go ahead and clear out those cached routes all right, so that's the, the about command. And now I, I'm not demoing this, but you can actually add your own sections to this command. So if you're or you if you are a um, package developer, you build Laravel packages like something like Livewire or uh, the Excel package for Laravel, you can actually add your own sections to this about uh, screen. So dig into the docs for that. Um, it's a good way to give end users some insight into different configuration options in your package if you have those. All right, um, James and Joe Dixon also worked on a new DB show command, which gives you basic stats about any of your configured database connections in Laravel. Uh, let's check it out. So if I do artisan DB show, that's just going to use my default connection, which is, I think, just my local MySQL database. And I can see uh, things like the number of open connections. You can see I have two open connections there, the number of tables, the total size of the database, and then also a breakdown of the size of each table. So it's a really quick way to see you know, where you're at in terms of database size and table size. Now you can actually add another option to this where you do artisan DB show counts. And now I'll actually get the number of rows in each of the tables in my database. So again, this is just a really quick command that you can run to get a high level overview of the state of your database, how many connections are open, what the table size is looking like really, really quickly, uh, both in local development and even in production. All right, uh, so that is the DB show command. Um, we are going to stick with the console and database theme, and I want to show you a new DB monitor command, which I believe was also developed by James Brooks here at Laravel. So the DB monitor command is basically a way to alert yourself if one of your database exceeds a maximum number of connections. So 
this might mean that your database is becoming overwhelmed um, or getting a lot more connections than you expect. And you might want to notify your development team or your, whoever else about, uh, hey, something may be up with our database or we're receiving a lot more traffic than normal. Um, so let's take a look at how it works. Basically, I just run Artisan DB Monitor to fire it off. And right now I'm okay. I have two connections. All right, but typically you would set this up actually in, in the real world on your scheduler. So if I hop into my Laravel project and go to the console kernel, you can see I've got DB monitor set here to run every minute, which is probably typically what you would set it to run at. And I'm passing dash dash max equals 100. So this tells me I want you to um, alert me if more than 100 connections are open on my database. And it's just going to check that every minute and then let you know. So what actually happens if um, that maximum threshold is exceeded? Uh, what happens is a database busy event is fired. And we can listen for that event and do whatever we want to notify ourselves that our database is receiving more traffic, more connections than normal. Um, so probably you would do that like in your event service provider. So if I hop over, hop over to my event service provider, you can see I've got an event listener here for the database busy event. And that event's also going to expose to me the connection name and the number of connections that are currently attached to that database. So, um, and I'm just going to log those out to Ray, um, which is kind of a, a souped up uh, die and dump type of uh, software. All right, so let's go ahead and I'll pull up Ray and I'll pull up... Um, my terminal and do artisan schedule run. So it ran that and I didn't get anything in Ray because I don't have a hundred connections open. So let's drop this down uh, in my console corner kernel to just one connection. Um, and then we'll go ahead and run that again. So I'll get Ray up there, run that. And you can see I did actually um, catch that event this time because we have more than one connection and my sequel there's the connection name and then the number of open connections is uh, right there but you know you might use this to fire off a notification again to your devops team your developers say hey something isn't quite right or we're getting pretty busy on our database so that they can take a look at things obviously you would probably want to set this you know below the Mac based connections you can actually handle, you know, at some percentage, maybe 90% of the connections you can handle or whatever you think is appropriate um, to get that notification. All right, so that is the DB monitor command, um, if you haven't seen that yet. Um, next, I want to show you another database related command by Jessica Archer, who is a, also a team member here at Laravel. Um, and this is the model show command. This is another one of those commands that's just a great high level overview of what's going on in your application. So I can do artisan model show user, and I get this really nice output of all the attributes on the model, all the relationships on the model, what those uh, relationship models are, and all about my columns, the table. It's just a really kind of uh, high level overview of everything. You know, what attributes are fillable, what attributes are hidden. Um, it's just a really quick way to dive into a model without having to sort of inspect the source code for each relationship, each attribute, or even open the migration to see what database columns are there. Um, just a really fast way. I've got another uh, model here called Ticket. And you can see uh, a ticket belongs to an airline. It belongs to a flight. And I can see those models and I can see different attributes here. So really quick way to dig into your eloquent models and inspect them without having to open migrations and dig through source code. If you just want to refresh your memory, um, sometimes you might forget what relationships are actually available on a model. You're already in the command line. You can just boom, bring it up right there really quickly and easily. Uh, so Jessica Archer contributed that. I'm really happy with how that turned out. Um, and uh, one of the final commands I want to show you is a new command from Tim McDonald called the docs command. So sometimes you're on the command line and you just qu can't quite remember uh, what you're looking for. Now you can do something like artisan docs routing. It pops open a browser to the routing page in the documentation. Um, you know, likewise, I could pretty much do anything I want here. Um, artisan docs validation and jump to the validation page. Um, a really quick way just to pop open the docs and you can even just do artisan docs and get a list you know, of different options here, Laravel Valet, pop open the Laravel Valet documentation. So again, uh, the Laravel docs, we put a lot of work into the docs. So this just makes it easier to jump right into the docs if you're already on the CLI. Really simple little command that Tim McDonald wrote for us, but I think it's pretty, pretty slick and pretty nice uh, to be able to just jump straight to the docs from your command line. All right, and then um, 
finally, uh, Nuno also released, as you may know, Laravel Pint, um, which is a layer on top of PHP code style fixer that doesn't require any configuration out of the box to format code in the Laravel way. Um, and um, on my command line, all I really need to do is run Pint, which I have alias to um, vendor bin Pint because uh, it's a composer dependency. It checks all my code. It fixes everything. You can see I have a few issues here, like unused imports and things like that. And, uh, you know, just fixes everything and makes it uh, match the Laravel style, which is kind of like PSR 12, but it actually has a few differences. Um, PSR 12 actually dictates that all of your trait usage needs to be on a separate line, some things like that, whereas Laravel doesn't really follow that convention. So this is almost like a custom Laravel style formatter. But if you prefer PSR 12, you can actually... Um, do that as well by doing pint preset PSR 12. And now that's going to run with a, a few different types of um, um, linters or, or formatters, you might say, where it actually matches the PSR 12 spec exactly. Um, so that is Laravel pint, which I'm sure many of you have actually already seen before. Um, I think that was a pretty popular tool. Um, it's nice just to be able to hop in the command line, type pint, and know my code is uh, like Laravel approved, so to speak. Um, all right, so that's all the console commands I wanted to run over with you today. Um, let's dig into a little bit of code now. Um, we're still going to keep a little bit of a console theme, though, because I want to show you signal traps, which are a new feature um, that Nuno has been working on that make it really easy to intercept and handle process signals in your artisan commands. So what do I mean by a process signal? Um, if you're running something long running like a queue worker um, and you're running it locally, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have hit control C to cancel that long running process. That's actually sending a signal to that process that tells it, hey, you need to quit. Um, and then the process shuts down. Now you can actually register custom handlers uh, in your CLI commands to let you do things when your process received this receives these kinds of signals like gracefully shut down or roll back the operation that it's in the middle of performing if it's not quite done yet so that your data or whatever is not left in a broken state now you can actually already do this um in console commands now even before a nuno's feature uh, but let's take a look at what it looks like now before um nuno's improvements so i'm going to open up this process command file and what it looks like now is you have to implement the signalable command interface, which is an interface uh, provided by the Symphony console component. And then you have to come down here and you need to define two methods, get subscribe signals and handle signal. So get subscribe signals returns an array of signals that you want to handle. And handle signal is invoked anytime your process receives one of those signals. And then you need to inspect the signal to see what kind of signal it is and then do whatever you want to do. Um, so this is not bad. So let's go ahead and actually try this. Um, so my handle method, you can see I just go into an infinite loop and we'll just say working every second. And then um, if I get the sig int signal, this is the sig int constant is actually built into PHP. It has a variety of signal constants that you can use. Um, if I get the sig int signal, we'll say we're gracefully exiting and then we'll just sleep for another second and then exit the process. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this command. This is the app process command. And um, let's see, app process, we can see working, you know, kind of like we would expect. And then if I hit control C on my keyboard, we'll see gracefully exiting. And then it waited for a second and now we're actually exiting. Okay, so all of this is fine. Um, but it doesn't, a couple problems. One, it doesn't work for closure based um, artisan commands that you might just find in your routes console file because we have to implement this interface. We have to find these extra methods. And um, it actually does require a couple of extra methods on our class. And you know why write more code when you could write less code? Uh, you know what I mean? So we decided to come up with signal traps and I'll show you what they look like. If I hop into my route console file, and go down to this trap command, you can see that I can just call this trap and then pass it an array of signals and then an anonymous function that will invoke when any of those signals are intercepted. And then, uh, so I'll register my signal handler and then I'll go into my while loop and you know do the same, basically the same as we were doing in the previous command, but um, this time in an anonymous console command and we'll use the new trap callbacks. All right, so let's go ahead and run this artisan trap and you can see it's working 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 and then we control c gracefully exiting and we're done um so 
signal traps are a really kind of lighter weight alternative to the whole signalable command interface, multiple method implementation, very lightweight, very Laravel style. Um, and I think it makes it just much simpler to handle these kinds of commands or these types of signals in your commands. All right, whether you're using a command class or you're using a command closure. All right, so that is signal traps. Um, Moving on to the next thing I wanted to talk about is, of course, I'm sure many of you know, we transitioned to Vite as our default front-end build tool in Laravel. Uh, Vite is a build tool developed by Evan Yu, the same developer that created Vue, although Vite is not just for Vue applications. You can use it to build React or even use it in you know all sorts of other different ways. Um, Laravel Mix had previously served us well for the last five and a half years, and I'm sure will continue to serve many of your applications well for years to come um, because there's no immediate need for you to migrate to Vite if you don't need to. But in moving to Vite for new applications, we had a few goals. Um, we wanted to move to a much slimmer tool that was much closer to the metal, had very quick build times, very fast hot module reload times, and sort of just a smaller surface area because um, when... Our approach to building this Vite plugin was a little different than when me and Jeffrey first collaborated on Laravel Mix uh, many years ago. Um, back then, Jeffrey and I were really trying to hide Webpack from you almost entirely and sort of build an entirely new abstraction and sort of domain-specific language for uh, doing front-end asset compilation. And so when you're in a mix configuration file, it doesn't really feel like Webpack at all. Honestly, it doesn't look like your typical Webpack configuration file you might find on, online. It's all very hidden from you. But with Vite, we're staying really close to the metal and our Laravel integration with Vite is really just a simple Vite plugin. But your Vite configuration file in your Laravel application really still feels like a pretty typical Vite file. It doesn't feel like some new DSL has been created um, and everything is hidden from you. So that gives us much less to maintain it gives it a much smaller surface area for the plugin and and makes it a little bit uh, more manageable for us to not be kind of responsible for so many things um so i'm sure many of you have seen Vite, but i'll go ahead and show you kind of what uh, how fast it is to to develop applications with beat so if i go into a, a new breeze application let's start one breeze app and we'll just kind of create a new application here All right, I'll change into that directory. Composer require Laravel Breeze. And then Artisan Breeze. Install view. All right, and that's going to install sort of an inertia view stack um, for this new application. And of course, Breeze gives us all the registration and login forms and all of that. All right, so I've got this. Um, let me pop this open. I'm going to change this database. Uh, refresh that, and we'll go ahead and start the Vite uh, dev server. So we've got that running. Um, let me pop this open in the browser, breezeapp.test. We'll go to the register page, and let me open this up in the editor. All right, register view. And so here's the code for the page we're looking at right now. And if I go down to, I don't know, um, you know, just this name thing right here, change that to Laracon. You can see it updated there on the left. I can just update the page. It updates really quickly. And um, I can even use uh, different Tailwind classes. Uh, let's see. Something has gone wrong with my dev server here. Or maybe my uh, my tailwind is actually purged, so I may not be able to do that. Um, but basically, it's giving you auto refresh, kind of like Caleb showed earlier with uh, Livewire, really fast live uh, refresh and um, sort of gives you that real-time development experience that you would want when you're building a front-end application. All right, so that is Vite. And while I'm in here with Breeze, I wanted to make this Breeze app to show you. We've made a few adjustments. So... When you create a new Breeze application and you use Vue or React or even the Blade stack, you get all of these components. Um, so if I go into my resources directory, JS, and there's components and there's things like button, checkbox, uh, input label, nav link. And um, these used to all be prefixed like Breeze label, Breeze input, Breeze 
error, things like that. We've removed all of those because people were finding it quite confusing that they can't really, or they shouldn't really mess with these components. And we wanted to change that. So now it's just input label, text input, input error with no breeze prefix, just to let people know you can modify these components that come with these starter kits. These are part of your application. You don't have to be scared to change them to fit your needs. Um, so we've dropped all of those prefixes in the latest release of breeze. All right, so that is uh, some of the minor things we've done in Breeze. I wanna hop back into my other application though um, to keep talking about some new Laravel features. So I'm gonna change back to my other application and let's hop back into this routes file. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about is a good improvement to uh, mailable attachments that Tim McDonald recently worked on called attachable objects. Um, this is a really cool little DX improvement. And first, let's take a, look, uh, take a look at the way you would traditionally attach something to a mailable. So I've got this invoice pane mailable. Um, and if I hop into that file, you can see that um, it accepts this invoice, which is an eloquent model. And then we're going to make a markdown mailable you know, view and we'll attach the invoice to it. And this is how you would typically attach a file in Laravel uh, in previous, you know, previous years and for, for quite a while, actually. You would call attach and you would pass some like path to a file on the file system or maybe a path to something on some storage disk. And then you pass an array of options, maybe for the file name or the MIME type or whatever. And uh, this is fine, you know, this works uh, well. Um, I can hit this route, this attachable route. Let's see here, Let me go back over here. So if I hit Laravel slash test patchable, helps to migrate your database. Um, that's done. And then if I hop into MailTrap to my little uh, you know, dummy inbox, I can see the invoice has been paid and then I have the attachment as we would expect. And that's all well and good, like I said, but uh, we wanted to clean this up a little bit and we're actually working on more. Um, uh, more improvements to mailables as well, or at least I am. Um, so what you can do now is since many times when you have an attachment on an email, it seems like there's often a corresponding eloquent model in your system for the thing you want to attach, either an invoice like we have here or a ticket or a real estate listing or something. But usually when you're attaching something, a lot of times it feels like there's an eloquent model underlying that thing. And we thought it would be nice to just be able to pass the eloquent model directly to the attach method, which is basically what attachable objects lets you do. So let's streamline this code a bit. Um, if we hop back into this invoice paid method, I'm going to crack open invoice itself. So this is an eloquent model and you can see that it implements an attachable interface, which is in the mail, uh, the mail namespace. Um, and this interface just dictates that you need to have one method, the two mail attachment method. And from here you can return an attachment. And this attachment class has various factory methods that you can use to use to create attachments. So you can do attachments from path, or you can do like I have done here, attachment from storage disk where you're grabbing an attachment from S3. Um, but this basically encapsulate that, encapsulates that same attachment logic that we had in the mailable. So the object gets to define how it should be attached to emails in a consistent way across your system. So attachment from path, we pass the path, and then as, and then our custom sort of name that we used to be defining in the mailable. And um, that's it, that's all we need to do is just return that. And so now if we hop back into invoice paid, we can just attach this invoice. We don't need to specify anything else. It knows how to do the attachment because this is an attachable object. And so now if we hop back and we hit that route, we should get essentially uh, the same result. So I hit this attachable route again. Uh, we get a new email here and there's the attachment and it, we get the your invoice.pdf. So it's the equivalent behavior, but we've sort of moved that attachment stuff into the attachable object so that if we're attaching this from multiple different mailables throughout our system, all of that information about how to actually attach that object and what options it needs are in the attachable object itself. And we can just pass it directly to the attach method. So it ends up cleaning up your mailables quite a bit and also lets you just dry up some of that attachment logic if you're doing it from multiple places. Um, really quickly before we move on on the topic of attachments, we've also added test assertions to let you assert that your mails have certain attachments, um, which you weren't able to do before. So if I hop into this example test, you can see here, I'm not sure if you're aware, but you can actually new up a mailable in your test and then make various assertions on it. So 
Like I can assert that certain things are in the HTML or certain things are in the plain text counterpart uh, of the mail message. But now you can even do assert has attachment. And this also respects the attachable object. So I can just pass the invoice directly into assert has attachment and that will, should work fine. So my test passed there. Uh, and this is a new assertion that just came out in the last week or two um, that you can use to assert that your mailables have certain attachments, um, which you couldn't do before. All right. So what is next here? Okay, I want to show you another um, improvement that was sort of cooked up by Tim McDonald um, that we noodled on um, called invocable validation rules. And this is actually going to be the default way to write class-based custom validation rules in Laravel 10. The old way will not go away um, because that would be sort of a pointless breaking change. But this is sort of the lighter weight new default to write class-based custom validation rules. And I'll uh, dig into it now. So if I go down here to invocable, you'll see that I've got some input here and I've got a validator and I want to validate that the name is a long uppercase string. Let's say, um, we'll say that it's greater than six letters and it's also uppercase for whatever reason. Um, and so we're going to write this first. We're going to write it how you might typically have written it in the past. Um, I haven't written it yet. So we'll just kind of walk through it together. And then once we've done that, we'll build the invocable rule so that you can kind of see the difference. So let's hop into the console. Artisan make rule long uppercase string. All right, so I'm gonna hop into that rule and um, let's go ahead and start figuring this out. So um, let's say if string length of value less than or equal to six, we want to return false. If string to upper value does not equal the original value, um, we also want to return false, which basically means the string was not uppercase. Otherwise, uh, we'll consider it valid. All right, so this looks like pretty much what we would expect. And then we hop down to the message uh, method and we need to return a validation message. Message, But this is where things kind of get a little bit confusing and unintuitive. Um, this validation rule is actually validating multiple things, the length of the string and the case of the string. And you might think that, you know, well, don't validate multiple things in a validation rule, but it's actually not that uncommon to need to do this. For example, if you have a valid product ID validation rule, you might need to validate the format of the ID and also maybe that the ID um, has not been used within the last six months or something. And you want to encapsulate that concept of a valid product ID into a single rule called valid product ID. Um, so it's not super obvious what I need to do here. And I'll, I'll show you what you actually have to do is something like this. You have to come up here um, we'll make a messages array and then we need to like add messages to it here. So the string is not long enough. So we'll do that. We won't return false there. We'll come here, do kind of something similar messages equals the string is not uppercase. Remove this. And then here, instead of returning two, we'll say like return empty messages. So if the messages are empty, that means the validation passed. And then down here, we'll return the array of messages. Okay, and I think this should um, sort of accomplish what we want. So if I hit this invocable route, this string is um, not more than six characters and it's also a lowercase, so it should fail both cases here. Um, let me close some of these tabs. Laravel tests invocable okay so both of those checks failed as we would expect but as you can see it wasn't super intuitive how to actually validate that with multiple messages and how to return all the messages just from the stub that we were given after we ran make rule we would have to kind of go digging for how to do that all right so let's make it write the same rule as a new invocable rule and see what it looks like all right so i'm just going to basically get rid of all that artisan make rule long uppercase string and this time i'm going to say dash dash invocable all right so now we've got a new invocable rule all right so if we hop in here we get a little bit less scaffolding out of the box we just get an invoke method that receives attribute value and this fail callback and this is very similar to closure based validation rules if you've ever used those where if the rule fails you actually invoke this fail callback with the message that you want to give as the failure message so let's write the same um same validation rule. If string length value less than or equal to six, fail. The string is not long enough. 
if string to upper value does not equal value, fail, uh, the string is not uppercase. And that's all we need to do. We don't really need to return true or false. We don't need any sort of messages array. We don't need to count the messages, any of that. We can just write this and call that fail callback as much as we want and everything else will sort of be handled for us. Um, so now if I go back and hit that route again, we should, I think, see the exact same thing. We do, we see two error messages because we had two failures. Um, the string wasn't long enough and it wasn't uppercase. So I think this way of writing custom validation rules is just a little bit lighter, a little bit uh, cleaner, a little bit more intuitive for how to actually do this um, without having to like make temporary variables and instance variables and holding messages and, and counting them and all of that. It's just way simpler, way more streamlined. So I think Tim get a, did a good job on this. And like I said, um, in Laravel 10, it will actually be the default when you run make rule you won't need the invocable flag um, to make an invocable rule. Um, that will actually be the default, although the old style of rules will continue to function um, as normal to just uh, you know not break applications. All right, I'll back those changes out. Next, I wanna show you a, a really recent addition by Ralph Smith, who actually spoke earlier, um, that I think will really help you during local development sometimes. So if we take a look at this fillable route, um, you can see that I'm basically just creating an airline and I'm passing a name to it. I've got this airlines table. It basically just has a name column. And uh, let's go ahead and just hit this route and see what happens. So I'm gonna hit the fillable route. That wasn't even spelled right, fillable. And you can see that I get this error that field name doesn't have a default value. Now I'm sure a lot of you have probably run into this error as you're building Laravel applications locally. Um, the problem is it can be really confusing at first. Like your first thought is, um, I know name doesn't have a default value. That's why I gave you one here on line 52. You know, that's why I provided you a name. And it kind of takes you a second to realize what's going on. And once you've used Laravel for a while, you might know that, hmm, I wonder if name is actually in my fillable attribute on my airline model. And if we hop into airline, we can see that, oh, it's not. That's why um, the name was sort of just silently discarded, which is sort of the default Laravel behavior. If you pass any attributes to these mass update or mass creation methods, um, any attributes that can't be filled are just sort of silently thrown away, uh, which is actually what you want in production. Um, you want to just discard any of those attributes. But during local development, that can be a little bit confusing because the error message is not super indicative of what's actually going on, which is that the attributes being silently discarded. So Ralph PR'd a new method um, that I'm invoking here in my app service provider, where you can just say model prevent silently discarding attributes, and you can tell it to only do that, for example, in the local environment. And now once I've enabled this behavior in Laravel, if I go back to my route and hit that fillable method, you can see that I get a much more descriptive error message. I get add fillable property name to allow mass assignment on airlines. So much more obvious as to what actually was going wrong in that route. You know, um, now I know, oh, okay, I'll just go add the name to the fillable array or I'll just do, you know, guarded equals empty array and really live on the classic Laravel bleeding edge to allow everything. Uh, but anyway, much more intuitive. Um, and hopefully that will just save you a little bit of brain cycles as you develop applications locally. Now, sticking with eloquent models, we are shipping finally a way to do UUIDs and ULIDs on your eloquent models really easily without writing any custom, you know, creation handlers or anything like that. This is something Dries has been working on the past week or two, and I'll go ahead and show you how it works. So we'll kind of stick with this airline model for a second. Let me go ahead and make a, a fresh database. And we're actually going to tweak a few things. So right now, this model is set to use auto-incrementing primary keys. Um, so let's go ahead and tweak this to use UUIDs, and we'll see what it looks like. So first, we're going to go to the migration. We will you know, make maybe a string for ID. Make that the primary uh, key. And then we need to go to the airline model. And all we need to do is say has... UUIDs, import that class. And I think that's really all we need to do. So if I refresh this, I'll hop into an artisan tinker session, airline factory, create. And you can see the ID there is now a UUID. It is not an auto incrementing, uh, you know, standard one, two, three, four type of integer ID. 
Um, so again, really easy to start taking advantage of. This was probably a little overdue, I would say, in the framework, but I'm glad we finally got this out there. So it's really easy to use UUIDs instead of IDs. Um, these are, of course, um, ordered UUIDs. So they're sort of lexicographically sortable in a, an efficient way for the database because they're all kind of time sequential. Um, they're not the standard UUID version four. Um, also using this feature, you can actually have multiple columns be assigned to UUID. So it doesn't just have to be your ID column. For example, if I were to go back to the um, our migration for a second and add like, you know, table string, I don't know, discount code or something. I don't, I don't know what we could do, but and say we want also want this column in addition to ID to receive a UUID, then I can hop into my model and just come in here and define a unique IDs method. And this will return the ID or the attributes that we want to be assigned a unique ID. Um, I think I did discount code actually. And now when we create an airline, um, both of those columns will actually be assigned a UUID. So let's go ahead and re-migrate our database, hop into Tinker, create an airline. And now you'll see ID and discount code actually both were assigned a UUID. Um, so really simple, really easy. Now we've also added support for ULIDs that might be something you've never heard of. It's called, I think, universally unique lexicographically sortable IDs or something like that. And it's the same concept as a UUID in that it's 128 bits of randomness into an ID, but it's only 26 characters instead of 36 characters. So it's a little bit more compact than a UUID, a typical UUID. And I'll show you how to do that now. So I, we can actually just leave everything um, in our migration, our database table the same, but I'll just hop into this airline model. And um, instead of has UUIDs, just do has ULIDs. I will import that, get rid of that. All right, and that's really all we need to do. I'll go ahead and make a fresh database, artisan tinker airline factory create. And now you'll see my ID and my discount code are actually ULIDs, which are a little bit shorter, again, a little bit more compact, but they're still ordered sequentially in terms of uh, sortability. So uh, a ULID I generate 10 minutes of now will be sorted after ULID I just generated um, and so forth. It's just like a U ordered UUID, very similar, but just more compact. All right. So you can start using that really easily as well. All right, that is UUIDs on models. Next, I wanna show you a really cool feature contributed by Jess Archer. Um, and I think you'll get a lot of use of it in your database seeding. So imagine we have three models. We're gonna keep using our airline model, uh, but we also have a flight model and a ticket model. And the ticket table contains both an airline ID and a flight ID. So the airline the ticket belongs to and the flight the ticket belongs to. Um, likewise, the flight, we hop into the flight table also contains the airline ID. All right, so stay with me. And then if I hop into the ticket factory, um, as you might expect, we're gonna create an airline and a flight for the ticket on the factory when we create a ticket. But then also the flight factory is also going to create an airline because it belongs to an airline. So you may be able to see where I'm going with this, but this is pretty typical model setup. Um, we're kind of denormalizing a little bit of these keys for faster access maybe. Um, but what actually ends up happening in the scenario, if we go to our database seeder, I'm gonna uncomment this create tickets. So if we just did ticket factory create, let's see what happens in the database. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and run my migrations and database seeding hop into table plus. So let's hop to the tickets table. We have a ticket. Okay. One ticket. We have a flight ID of one airline ID of one. If we go to the flights, this is kind of strange. We have a airline ID of two, even though this ticket belonged to this flight, this flight belongs to a different airline. And then we end up with two airlines, which is maybe not what you would want or what you would expect. And the reason for that is kind of it makes sense when you think about it. You know, we told the ticket factory to create a flight and to create an airline. But when the flight was created for that ticket, that also created an airline because on the flight factory, we had the airline, you know, uh, creation as well. So we ended up with duplicate airlines or two airlines. And that's fine. There's ways around that already um, in Laravel's model factory. So I'll comment this out. 
And this is one way you could approach it, which is using the for method. So we could create the airline here on line 44, and then we could create the ticket and we could say, we wanna create it for this airline that we already have here in memory. And then we also have to call for for the flight. So we create the flight and we say that flight is also for this same airline. And we kind of have to work our way up the chain of using the same airline in each instance that we need one, you know, kind of manually via the for method. So now if I were to see my database again, and I refresh the airlines table, you can see we actually do only have one airline now, which is what we wanted. If I go to flights, it belongs to airline ID one, which is what we wanted. If I go to tickets, it belongs to airline uh, airline ID one. So now everything's pretty much sorted out. This is what we wanted. We wanted a ticket that belongs to an airline and a flight that also belongs to that airline. Um, and all the IDs are sort of make sense. But as you can see, that could, or as you can imagine, that could get like a little bit cumbersome having to manually do that through four methods all the way up your sort of dependency graph if it was multiple levels. Um, so we've introduced a new method called recycle. Uh, let me show you that. So I'm going to comment that out. I'm going to do this. So now I'm going to say ticket factory recycle this airline that I'm giving you. Anytime you need an airline during this model factory operation, recycle this instance that already exists just every time. Um, so now if I run my database seating, I should get the same result that we just had. So I get a ticket, airline ID one, flight, airline ID one, one flight. Um, so it's just a shorter way to say, I already have an instance of this type that I wanna give you. And I just want you to keep using that every time. Um, in a much more terse, much more kind of nice Laravel style way. All right. So that is a uh, model recycling. Um, let's see, checking my time here. I think I'm going to um, actually skip ahead um, to a, a section and skip and gloss over a, a small little feature that I don't think is um, a super big deal. So I'm going to jump to something that Nuno has actually been developing called the Laravel process component. Um, so if you've used or needed to invoke external processes in Laravel in the past, you may have used a symphony process component, which is a way for executing external processes that you can interact with their output, things like that. So like, for example, we use this in Laravel horizon to fire off, you know, multiple queue workers at once to get their output, to sort of monitor their progress and things like that. And you kind of have to do it through symphony process manually. Um, which is fine, but it doesn't have the same sort of Laravel style API that you might expect from other components. So let me jump into this process project, pop it open, go into routes console. So we've been working on a new way to interact with processes in your application that feels a little bit more consistent with the APIs throughout Laravel. So you can have a process facade where you could call process path um, to some path and then just run a command and you get the result right there. Um, and then, then you can inspect the output, the exit code. There's some convenience methods for like, is the exit code zero, basically okay, or is it non-zero failed? And then you can get the output as an array, different things like that. So really just kind of slick, terse API that you might expect from Laravel. So if I run like artisan process, you can see that it dumped the contents of that storage directory right there. And then, you know, the exit code, it was okay, false, it was not a failure. And then there's the array of output. Okay, um, and you can also do all the other things you might expect if you've ever used Symphony process directly before. You can call run and pass a callback to get all of the output from the process as it's happening. So in this case, we're basically echoing uh, one, two, three, four, five, um, and we'll output all of that output as it comes in using this little function that just timestamps the output and puts it out on the console for us. So if I do artisan process output, you can see one, two, three, four, five, and so on. So we can get the output as it's happening. And then this is really cool. You can actually fake processes, just like we introduced with the HTTP client, how it's really easy to fake HTTP responses. You can actually fake process output as well. Um, so this is really makes it really easy to test interacting with these external processes, which normally wouldn't be that easy. Um, you know, to isolate. So in this example, I'll just say start and then I'll say process forever, which is a convenience method for saying, I want this process to not have any timeout because by default, the process component is going to throw a timeout exception after 60 seconds. So in this case, we wanna say, I wanna let this run forever. 
and then we'll run uh, sl the sleep command and then we'll say done. Um, but if I hop into my tests, because that's what I want to show you in this example, if I go to example test or I'm sorry, process test, um, I can, you can see I can do process fake, just like you might do mail fake or HTTP fake. And I can call uh, that artisan command process testing. And then I can say process assert ran sleep three. Okay, um, so I can run that test and it passes and it doesn't actually sleep for three seconds. You know, I, I've kind of faked that process. I can also fake specific processes. So if I go down here to this next example, you can see that I'm uh, running the ls command in a certain directory and then I'm just dumping out the files that were um, given by that command or returned by that command. And then if I look at my test, I can actually pass just like the HTTP fake, different com uh, commands and the results that I want those commands to return. Um, so I can fake out each command individually. So any ls command, I'm using a wildcard here, I want to return this as the result. Oh, that's formatted a little funky there. I want to return these two strings as the result. Um, or I can process all, or I can say all other commands, I want you to just fail with an exit code of one. And then I can expect the output to contain that output and then assert ran LS. So I can actually set multiple expectations on different processes and fake out the results individually to make it easier to test. All right, and of course, what would, it, what would a Laravel feature be without a macros? I can actually macro the process component. So I can say macro LS because we've been using that quite a bit. And I can say that is supposed to use this command, you know, the LS command. And once I've got that macro defined, I can just say process colon colon LS. I've essentially created this macro method that I can then invoke throughout my project and I can give it a path and then I can run it. So if I do artisan process macros, you can see I get the output that we would expect. So macros, classic Laravel feature, uh, gotta love them. Um, and then a really cool feature is this sort of concurrency pool feature where you can start multiple processes and wait for them all to finish at the same time. So, you know, if I were to do it sequentially, I would do process run, sleep one, process, process, and run three different processes. And what that looks like is artisan process concurrency, you can see process one done, process two done, process three done, but they ran sequentially. They didn't all run at the same time um, concurrently. So I'm gonna comment that out because in this case, I want to run them all at the same time. Uncomment this, and I can say process pool, kind of like HTTP pool, and then run these different processes. And these will all be started up at the same time. And then this will actually um, sort of wait for all of them to finish. So they're all finished once we get to this next line of code of all done. Um, and it makes sure that each of those processes, processes has wrapped up and finished what it needs to do. So now if I run that same command, you can see I got all the output at the same time and then all done. So it makes it just like a little bit more convenient to run concurrent processes and then wait for them all to be finished um, without having to do loops and checks and all sorts of other things. So really slick little feature there um, by Nuno. And uh, this will, we're still refining this process component. Um, some of the syntax could uh, go through minor changes, but this is something we hope to ship, you know, in the next few weeks um, to make it a little bit easier to deal with these external processes in Laravel. All right, next I want to talk about precognition, which is one of the last code features I wanna show you today. Um, this is something that Tim McDonald has been working on and I've got a separate precognition project that I'm going to hop into here. Let me pop it open. All right, precognition. So Precognition is a new feature we're introducing soon to Laravel to make it easier to provide a good validation experience on the client. And to demonstrate what I mean, we're going to use Laravel Breeze like we've used in the past, and we're just going to look at the registration form. All right, and I'm going to jump in here and just kind of build these assets while I'm thinking about it. Actually, let's just start up the Vite dev server. All right, so you know this is the typical Breeze registration form. And as we all know, a uh, user would typically come in here, uh, maybe fill out some of these fiel fields, something like this, hit register. My database is probably not migrated. Taylor Otwell. 
password. And then we get these sort of validation errors at the end. Um, and, you know, that's fine, I guess. Um, you know, but the problem is a lot of times we want the validation to have a better user experience. We want to show these validation errors before um, we actually finish filling out the form, you know, as we type. And if you use Livewire, like Caleb demonstrated earlier, um, that's actually already pretty easy. But if you're not building with Livewire, you already have an application, it can be pretty difficult to do. Um, because some of these validation rules, they only make sense on the server, right? Because things like checking if a user name is unique is something that can only be done on the server because we have to hit the database. There's not really a way to port that validation rule to the client side. So how can we handle the situation to provide this sort of validation errors as people are typing in the form? Um, so, you know, one approach people might take is something like this, where let's pop open this form. Um, and this is a inertia view um, application. We've got a form here with all of the registration fields. And then when it's submitted, we post the form to the register route. Um, so one thing we could do is define like an extra route that just, def that just validates. It doesn't do anything else. So it basically takes all these fields, validates them, but it doesn't actually process the registration. And then we can invoke that on like the change event of the input. So let's go ahead and try that first. Um, I've got a notes file. I'm just going to grab some things from. So I'm going to grab these couple things. So let's define this validate function. Um, and that's going to post to a new validate register route that we're going to define. So we'll hop into our routes file. And I'll just kind of drop this down here below the register route. And you can see that the validate register route just basically type hints the form request where we have all our validation rules. But like I said, it doesn't do anything else. We basically are only creating this route to validate the input of this form. It doesn't serve any other purpose. It's just sort of an extraneous route to kind of do this validation song and dance. All right, so we've got this route, we've got um, this callback. So we'll just come down here to like the uh, username input and do at change and we'll invoke validate when this field is changed. And let's just kind of see where that gets us. Um, so I'm going to refresh this, make sure that's good. Taylor Otwell. And you can see when I tabbed off the field, it did kind of kind of do what we expected. Um, it, it fired off a request, it validated all the inputs, but this isn't exactly the behavior we want either. You know, um, but the problem is we got validation errors for all the inputs. We really only cared about the username input. So handling this whole situation is actually even more complex than we might've thought. You know, we kind of need to keep track of how, what every field that's changed thus far and only validate those fields and only show the error messages that apply to those fields because we don't want to overwhelm them with error messages that are down below that they haven't even gotten to yet. Um, so yeah, this isn't quite what we wanted. And you can see how this would quickly get a little bit more complicated than you would expect to be able to use all of the robustness of the Laravel server-side validation features while still getting a really good client-side validation story when we're building these sorts of React and Vue inertia apps. Um, so we think this could be much, much better. And that's what uh, Tim and, and I have also been kind of working on and trying to refine and figure out. And that's what we're calling uh, precognition, which is not really a separate package or anything. It's just sort of a new feature within the framework itself that you can use to make this much, much easier. Um, so let's transition this example to using precognition and we'll see what it looks like. All right, so let's hop back into this register.view and let's just delete this validate, we're not going to need that, that validation callback. And instead of use form, let's use precognition. So this is a view helper. Um, I'm sure we'll also have other helpers as well um, that is going to return a few things. So we need to pass a few things to it. Let's pass the route and let's pass the method. And it returns more than one thing. Um, so it returns form, validate, and then it also returns other things we can take advantage of. Um, like whether the form is currently validating and also the fields that have been changed thus far. So it gives us a few things that we can use to inspect the form. All right, so we just define it like that. Use precognition instead of use form. And then we'll come down to our field at change and we'll actually pass the field. And let's go ahead and do it for um, email as well because we want to make sure that's unique. 
um, validate email at change. And then on our back end, let's just, we won't need this at all anymore. We don't need any extra route. We don't need any extra anything on the back end. The one thing we do need is just a middleware. Precognitive, I think I've got it imported as. Yeah, so I'm going to uncomment that. So it's just a middleware that's built into Laravel. So I'm going to say this uses the precognitive middleware. And then let's kind of see, I think that's what we need uh, to make this precognitive. Uh, we will just refresh the page here. I'll type in Taylor Otwell and tab off the field. And you can see the username has already been taken as soon as I left that field. So all I had to do was instead of use form in my view uh, helpers, I just do use precognition. And then I add that middleware to the route that's going to be precognitive. And then it pretty much just works. I don't need to define any extra routes. I don't need any extra validation callbacks. I don't need any Laravel validation port to JavaScript. Um, and I can use the full gamut of Laravel validation rules um, while still getting a really clean experience on the front end. Like I know um, this Taylor at Laravel email is already taken. If I try to use it, you can see I get the validation error. Um, if I change it to something that hasn't been taken, of course the validation error goes away. All right, so a really good validation experience without, I think this is the key, without having to really modify our backend code at all. We just write our Laravel application like we always have. We use the precognition helpers on the front end and everything just sort of works. But how does it work? So it's actually pretty simple. What we did is when precognition um, fires, when that field changed and, changed and we called that validate callback, precognition sends a request to the normal register route, but it sends a header called precognition and that header is set to true. Um, and when that header is set to true, Laravel will evaluate the route arguments, the arguments of the route or the arguments of the controller being the form request, and it will resolve those, but it will not process any further into the application than that it will even if their validation is successful it will stop the request there send back an empty response which basically lets the precognition helpers know there's no validation errors for this request and that's it it will never go past that if there were validation errors of course you get them back on the client side like normal and all of the normal inertia view form helpers can be used to show the error message really easily really quickly um, so it's actually a very simple feature under the hood, but it unlocks so many possibilities for improving the validation experience in Laravel and on the client. And it's not just limited to validation. We've worked up several other examples, such as handling uh, conflicts. Like if one user is uh, manipulating a record, but another user updates it on their machine, you can actually use precognition to show that on the front end as well. And we'll be sharing more of these more complicated examples um, as we kind of refine this feature, which we also hope to launch, you know, in the next few weeks, similar to the process feature. Um, and, you know, but that's kind of the just core functionality of precognition is making that validation story on the client side much simpler much easier to handle while still being able to take advantage of all the great server side validation that Laravel has to offer. Um, so yeah, keep an eye out for precognition. Um, we'll be shipping that to Laravel soon with more examples and more documentation, of course, um, as you would expect. So I wanna to transition to just a final couple of things that are not code related that I wanted to show you. The first is an educational initiative that Jessica Archer has been working on. And right now, when you go to the Laravel website um, and you go to the documentation, it's great. You know, we've spent a lot of time on the documentation. Um, we've really racked our brains, honestly, trying to make it the best documentation available for any web framework anywhere. There is one problem with it, though, in that if you're new to Laravel, you kind of have to review a lot of documentation pages to actually learn how to do everything. So for example, I have to go to the installation page, and then I might have to go to the routing page, and then but then I don't know how to save anything to the database. So I have to go to the database page and then I don't know how to do validation. So I have to jump to the validation page and they're all, it's all of these separate pages that you have to jump between. And there's not really a good way to just get, you know, a high level overview of how, what Laravel looks like and how to use Laravel in context, you know, as kind of like a single story. Um, so if you've been around Laravel a while, you may remember that the documentation used to have a quick start over here on the sidebar um, that kind of served that purpose. Um, it would um, kind of walk you through building a to-do app 
and we had that back in like Laravel 5.2, but it was it was crammed within the existing documentation page, and that sort of constrained us as to what we could do. Um, so we've decided to that eventually got retired, by the way. But we've decided to bring back a full introductory tutorial to Laravel that's been greatly improved, greatly expanded to give newcomers to the framework a good introduction of what's possible with Laravel, kind of all in one story. And that's what we're calling Laravel Bootcamp, and it actually exists on its own page. So if I go to bootcamp.laravel.com, which of course we'll link to from the documentation, this actually walks you through building kind of a dummy Twitter type application called Chirper. And it walks you through all the way from installation to creating models, to showing data, um, all in sort of one cohesive story that you can follow from beginning to end. So it walks you through, you know, updating your models, updating even your front end components in Vue or React examples. And of course, we'll be working on a Livewire 3 uh, bootcamp, I'm sure, as soon as that is released um, to get that out there as well. Um, and it walks you through everything, you know, editing chirps. It even talks to you about authorization, how to make sure that this person can actually edit this model. And then all the way down to deleting notifications and events, and then deploying. And it, it really gives you the full story of how to use Laravel from beginning to end, which we didn't really have in our documentation thus far, so that if you're new to Laravel, you can kind of go through this and get everything in context, you know, really understand how everything fits together. Um, in a cohesive way without jumping between pages. So if you're at Laracon, I'm sure a lot of you, um, this may not be exactly, you know, um, something you need because you, you know, I'm sure you're immersed in the Laravel ecosystem, but for newcomers to the framework, there really wasn't a good official on our, on our website, laravel.com way to get a cohesive view of the framework from a high level. So we're hoping that this will do that. Jessica Archer did a really awesome job with this boot camp, and uh, we'll keep expanding this. Like I said, when Livewire three comes out to have sort of a choose your own adventure type of booth camp where you can go, I prefer to use JavaScript on the front end, or I prefer to use uh, PHP and blade on the front end. Either way, we'll have you covered. All right, so that is Laravel Bootcamp. And the last thing I want to share with you before I wrap up this talk is a new thing we're doing in Laravel Vapor. So Vapor is our, um, as many of you know, our serverless auto-scaling deployment platform for Laravel powered by AWS Lambda. You launch your application out to Vapor and it auto-scales, the queue workers auto-scale. You don't have to worry about operating system updates. It takes care of SSL certificates. It's basically the most robust way to deploy a Laravel application out to production, to be honest. Um, it's fully auto-scaling, auto-scales down to zero, auto-scales up to whatever AWS can handle and your AWS account can handle, I guess, and really great tool. So if you haven't used it, check it out. And to make it easier to check it out, we're doing something totally new in the Laravel ecosystem. If you scroll down to plans, we are launching a totally free sandbox plan for Laravel Vapor. This is available today. You can sign up, you can create a single Vapor project. You can, you know, uh, launch your Laravel application out to that project. You get a single app, a single environment, and you get an AWS domain. So your domain will be like a, um, a Lambda, AWS Lambda domain. You can't use a custom domain, but this is really great for kicking the tires on deploying a serverless Laravel application without any cost to you upfront. And we think it's just a really cool way for people to tinker with Laravel. You know, if you go through the boot camp, you can launch your application out here for free and see what it's like to deploy a serverless Laravel application. So if you haven't checked out Vapor, this is the perfect time you can create a free sandbox account, launch your first application and try it out. Um, it's a really cool uh, tool and we've added a lot of things recently if you haven't checked it out, where when you go to create a new Vapor project, you can actually click right here, fresh Vapor project, and it will create the GitHub repository for you. It will set up GitHub actions to do push to deploy, to deploy to Vapor as soon as you push your GitHub repository and configure all of that for you. And then you can just clone down the repository, start editing the code and push it back up to GitHub and it will deploy to Vapor automatically. So check that out. We're launching that free plan for Vapor. Again, that's available today. And final thing, you know, we're at Laracon. There's been a lot of talk about in-person Laracons. Um, we have Laracon EU, which is, I think, kind of quasi officially been announced uh, happening in January. That's going to be, uh, you know, more info will be coming out soon about that. And we couldn't let them do Laracon EU without 
obviously doing another Laracon US. I am going to try to bring that back this spring, uh, probably in the March timeframe, I would say. So, you know, block out some time on your calendar. I look forward to seeing you all again in person at Laracon US next year. And thanks for uh, listening to this talk. And thanks for coming out to Laracon online. All right. One more thing, mic drop at the end with the, the live event. I love it. Um, yeah, great job. As always, lots of amazing stuff in there. Uh, thanks, team. All right. Thanks for having yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wow, that was an awesome talk, as always, from Taylor. And a live Laracon. You've been asking. He delivers, as always. Okay. We'll do uh, a little business here. I want to uh, talk about Jump, uh, who's, again, another longtime sponsor. Um, they're celebrating and proud to be sponsored by Laracon. So they're going to give away uh, a Laracast Forever subscription to one person who retweets uh, their competition tweet, which is on their Twitter, obviously. Um, so you just need to follow that account. Uh, and, you know, there's all the details on their Twitter account. So head over there. Um, they're a, a consultancy, you know, a lot of deep knowledge of Laravel. Um, again, a previous sponsor of Laracon. Definitely check them out. You can learn more about them as well as a video about them on the swag page. So uh, take a look at that. And our thanks, as always, to Jump for sponsoring the show. Uh, couldn't do it without you. All right, up next, we have Aaron. Get him in here. Hello. Hello. I see him and I hear him. Wonderful. Let me share my screen. I see it. Oh. Okay, and you're seeing the main one and not the presenter one, right? Yep, you're good. All right, here we go. I'm going to start my timer. Uh, we have a lot to cover in the next 40 minutes. So without any ado, database performance for application developers. My name is Aaron Francis. I'm a Laravel developer. I am dad to 16-month-old twins. And as of next week, I will be a developer educator at PlanetScale, which is a database company. Um, I'm also the co-founder of Hammerstone, where we make components for your Laravel and Rails applications, including one called Sidecar, which I demoed at the last Laracon. Laracon is sponsored by a lot of great sponsors. This talk is individually sponsored, and so I want to say thanks to my sponsor, my wife. Uh, my wife is a full-time stay-at-home mom to our twins, and I wouldn't have the uh, time or mental bandwidth to do this kind of extracurricular stuff without her. So thank you for sponsoring, Jennifer. Why should developers care about database performance? Two reasons, I think. We are closest to the data and we are closest to the access patterns. So we are the ones that are writing the queries, the access patterns to pull the data out and to put the data in. We are the first line of defense because we are so intimately familiar with the data and the queries. In fact, we may be the only line of defense. If you don't have a DBA on your team or a performance specialist on your team, you might be the only line of defense. And so it's really important that as application developers, we have at least an understanding of database performance. We're gonna cover all kinds of stuff today, um, primarily focused on making it fast. And it's weird to say that making it fast is optional, but if your customers are happy and you're happy and you sleep at night and everything works, your app is fast enough. Um, there will maybe come a time where the database becomes a bottleneck, but I don't want you to leave here and think, well, I have to change everything about my database, my application, because some guy on the internet told me to. That's not true. Everything is relative. So if it's fast enough, it's fast enough. But if it's not, maybe this will help. But in the beginning, everything is fast. You're just cruising. You're loving life. Every day is a new day. The only question is, well, what color Lambo am I going to take to work? And everything is great until it's not. And you're still equally as cool. But your database has become the bottleneck. And so now we have to figure out how can we fix that. Okay. We're going to cover three broad sections. Schema, indexes, and queries. The schema is your first opportunity 
to make great decisions or um, to potentially shoot yourself in the foot. So when you're designing your tables, you're setting yourself up for success when it comes time to design indexes and when it comes time to query things. So as you're designing your tables, I want you to keep three things in mind. One is you should keep your schema as small as you can get away with, but make it as big as you need. I don't want you to mangle. I don't want you to potentially mangle your data to try to fit it into a slightly smaller column type, but I also don't want you to be generous. Don't, don't give your data um, room to grow that it doesn't need. It should be as small as you can get away with, but as big as you need. A good example here, I think, is integers. I think most developers just call when they're writing their migrations, they just call table integer and move on. And if it's if it's signed, that gives you a, a max value of two billion. And if it's unsigned, it's four billion. And that's that's a lot. Um, if you know that your data ranges from zero to one hundred, and that's it ever, you should make it an unsigned tiny int. And there's a lot of like, um, there's a lot of judgment call and a lot of art and a lot of um, experience required to design good indexes and queries. Designing a good schema is is kind of just science. There's no real judgment calls about it. Look at your data, figure out what the smallest column type that will hold the biggest range of your data is and use that one. And I know you may be thinking like, man, this does not matter. We're talking about one byte versus four bytes. Well, this is a database performance talk, so it kind of does matter. Um, but also you want to apply, like you want to apply this thought process across your entire schema. So we're talking, you know, dozens of columns across dozens of tables across billions of rows. And at that point, it, it does kind of matter. You want your data to be as compact as you can have it on disk, not necessarily because disk is expensive, but because you want to minimize the reads to the disk. And then if you do index it, you want to keep it as compact as you can in memory as well. You want to keep your column types simple. Prefer integers to strings. If the data is numeric and it's an integer, use integer. If, if it's a date, use a date. Don't use a string. You want to use the simplest column type that you can, um, but you, you, you don't want to, again, you don't want to mangle your data. You don't, want to, you don't want to try to squeeze stuff into the wrong column type. Strings exist and they're totally fine. If your string is truly fixed length, so it's like a two character, uh, a two character abbreviation, use a fixed length column. Um, if you have to use a variable length column, make it as small as you can. And if you have to use a blob, that's fine. But if you can get away without it, that's great. So where, where's an example in, I think, Laravel that we can potentially use a slightly simpler schema versus a more complex one. So if we have polymorphic relationships in Laravel, which we do, um, the, it gives us this nice morphs method. Under the hood, this morphs method expands into this. So we have an images table and the image could be attached to multiple different models. So if we look at this, this string is gonna be something like app models user, we'll say. Uh, the imageable ID is going to be the primary key of the user. So in the database, you'll see app model users and then one, two, three, four. And then it gives you an index. So this is what that shorthand expands to. I don't like to see fully qualified class names in my database. And so I use this really nice method that Laravel gives us called enforced morph map. Um, and now instead of using the fully qualified class name, it's going to use whatever string I give it. And I like this better because it, it decouples your data from your application a little bit. So it makes it less brittle. So now you can refactor, rename these classes and not be in a world of hurt, right? So if we enforce this morph map, now instead of the fully qualified class names, it's gonna use user and post. Well, we don't need 255 characters here. We can get away with just four. Why not? It's shorter, it's better, it's faster. Now, does, is this gonna change your life? No, is it a good practice? Absolutely. If you want to go crazy, well, the, the one potential problem with this is um, you would have to mangle your data just a little bit because you have, you're now restricted to four characters. I don't mind this. This doesn't bother me. I'm actually not in the habit of looking in the database at these polymorphic associations. And so seeing vid instead of video wouldn't bother me. 
if you want to mangle your data a little bit, you could turn these into integers. This is actually what I do. It's a little data mangly, but again, I'm not in the habit of, I'm not in the habit of inspecting the polymorphic table very much. So now instead of any string whatsoever, you'll have integers. And now you have room for 255 different polymorphic relationships, which seems unlikely to me. Um, so should you do this? I don't know. It's kind of it's kind of up to you. I like the intermediate of using a fixed length character. You could use an enum, which is like gives you the readability of a string with the underlying storage of an integer. I don't love those because you have to do an alter table to add new ones. And that annoys me. Um, so this is just kind of a good example of like if you spend a little bit of time um, inspecting your data, you may be able to design a slightly tighter schema. Finally, your schema should be honest. It should represent reality. If your data is not nullable, don't make your column nullable. But if your data is nullable, don't lie about it and then put some magic string to represent null. You should avoid null, but don't make up your own implementation of null. The database can handle null, but your, your schema should match reality as much as you can and make it as tight and compact as you can. Schema is cool. Indexes are way cooler. Um, indexes are like 10,000 times more powerful than schema at um, increasing the performance of your database. Having a good schema sets you up for better indexes. So we kind of had to talk about schema. When I am talking about indexes here, I am primarily or exclusively maybe talking about B-tree or B-tree plus indexes. There are other types. There's full text, spatial, maybe R-tree, gen indexes. I know little to nothing about those, which is fine because B-tree is the most common. So an index is a separate data structure from your table. Your table has, your table is actually an index and it has all the data in the leaf nodes. A um, An index is an, a separate data structure altogether that maintains a copy of part of your data. So when you create an index, it creates this separate data structure and takes some of the data over there. It also has a pointer back to the main table, back to the row. And in MySQL with the NODB engine, that pointer is the primary key. So if we have a table full of extremely famous people born in 1989, and we add an index on the first name, this data structure will be created. You can see that it's out of order from the table. The index is ordered by first name, which is what makes it work. And then the primary key is appended to the index. So there's a lot of discussion about, should I use UUids? Should I use GUIDs? Should I use ULIDs? Should I use integers? This should tell you, if you add an index to the last name, you get the primary key again. This should tell you that using GUIDs or UIDs is not free because that data is going to be copied everywhere. And so sometimes you have to use UIDs because maybe of your uh, the way that your replication is set up or something. But if you can get away with it, primary keys as integers is great because they're super small and it's going to be copied everywhere. I told you, you could look at your data and use your powerful brain and come up with a really good schema. Your schema is driven by your data. Your indexes cannot be driven by your data whatsoever. Your indexes are driven by your queries. You have to look at your access patterns to design um, effective indexes. A couple of rules about designing indexes. You should have as many as you need. Indexes are the most powerful thing to give you good performance. You should have as few as you can get away with. Do you see a theme here? Um, that, that separate data structure is not free to maintain. So you should have as many indexes as you need. Don't be afraid to add them. What you should be afraid of is adding indexes that are worthless because they're not free to maintain. Every time you add a row or update a row in the main table, that separate data structure has to be modified. And you may add a row at the end of the table, which adds a row to the middle of the index. So stuff has to be shuffled around and pages have to be split. And so it's not free. Don't, don't let that scare you away. I'm hoping that that scares you away from adding an index on every single column. Um, the final thing I want you to consider is the entire query. 
I think it's really common to look at a query and look at the where statement and say, okay, I need, I need an index to cover that. But you also need to consider ordering, grouping, and joining. Don't just look at the where, look at the entire query and that'll help us design good indexes. This is the table that we have been using um, and we're gonna use for the next couple of examples. It's very simple. You can see, however, that I've limited first and last name to 50 characters. Um, is that enough? Probably, I know that 255 is too much. So I'm already trying to keep that schema as compact as I can. We're gonna add this very vanilla lame index to the table on birthday. And let's look at some of the queries that this, uh, this index will help us um, in, in a sense of performance. So if we want, if we want direct access to people born on February 14th, 1989, that query is, that index is going to help this query for sure. You can also do a range of all people born in 1989, this bounded range, it will scan through the index. You can do an unbounded range and find the people born before 1989. Because the index is ordered, it really does help a lot in most cases with ordering because the index is already ordered, doesn't have to grab the rows and then reorder them by birthday. It can use that index to assist the ordering. What's nice is you can use that index kind of twice. It's read once, but you can use it kind of twice, once for filtering and once for ordering. And so this query is gonna be awesome. Finally, you can use it for grouping. So if you wanna count up the people born on a certain day, this index is gonna help you. This is good information to have. This does not thrill me. I'm not moved. I'm not moved by this information. This isn't that exciting to me. What's more exciting is when we start talking about multiple column indexes or composite indexes. Instead of creating separate indexes on first name, last name, and birthday, we're going to create a single index that covers first name, last name, and birthday. If you find that your tables are full of single column indexes only. That is a good hint, not absolute proof, but that is a good hint that there's a lot left on the table that you could potentially optimize. Some rules, uh, databases are just rules, apparently. Some rules for um, composite indexes that you need to keep in mind. Super duper important, left to right, no skipping. The database will work through this index from the left side to the right side, and it cannot skip a column. What I mean to say is first name, last name, birthday is left to right. So it's really important the order that you define your composite keys in, because that's going to dictate how the index can be used. And we'll, I'll show you some examples and some proof of this, but just remember left to right, no skipping, and it stops at the first range. Okay, so left to right, no skipping, it stops at the first range. I promise you're, you're gonna remember these, we'll cover them a bunch. Taking this new composite query, which of these old queries that we looked at will be aided by this index? The answer is none of them. Not, none of these queries will use this new composite index because we didn't go left to right, we skipped first name and last name. These queries are full of references to birthday to say nothing of first name and last name. And so the index doesn't work here. Which queries might work here? Um, if you have equality, if you have three equals across the three columns, that's gonna be great. You can also just use the first two columns. You don't have to use the whole index, but you can. In this case, we're gonna do first name Aaron, last name Francis, which will be assisted by the index. Same goes for just first name. So now you can see composite indexes can kind of cover a whole range of queries if you design them in the right order and you design them based on your queries. Working kind of back out, you can also do a range on the first part on the left prefix of the index, you can do a range. You can do an equality statement, first name Aaron, and then a range on the second one, or you can do an equality statement on first name, last name, and then do a range on birthday. So these are the ones that it will work with. Let's look at a few that it won't work with. Look at this guy. So we need to go left to right, which we're doing, stops on the first range. So the index will stop being used after the first name column because that's a range. This query will still run, but it won't use last name for the index. And again, left to right, no skipsies. You have first name and then you skip last name and then you have birthday. So the index will only be used 
for the first name part, not for the birthday part. Let's get out of those slides and have a little more fun here. Okay, so this is not school, so let's do some fun stuff. Select star from people, um, we'll say limit 10. Okay, we have people. We have people in this database, that is good. Explain, select star from people, where, uh, what is it? First name equals Aaron. Okay, here we go. Now we're having some fun. Look at this from my SQL. It's telling us it's gonna use the first name, last name, birthday index. So I'm gonna shrink that because it's huge. That tells us what key is being used. This is the thing that I think we want to pay attention to right now. The key length reports 202. What does that mean? I'm not gonna tell you. Um, we're gonna figure it out together. So the key length reports 202 and we used just first name. Now, if we add and last name equals Francis, the key length changed to 404, which is double 202. And because first name and last name were both declared the exact same length, it does seem like we're using two columns of the same length, first name and last name. Pretty cool. If we add birthday equals 1989-0214, the key length jumps to 407. So that tells us that the more of the key we access, the bigger that number gets, right? So that's the number of bytes that is able to be used from the key. Now with this information, we can um, hopefully prove, maybe disprove, we can hopefully prove what I was telling you earlier. Left to right, no skipping. So if we skip last name, I meaning we don't have a condition on it, only the first part of the key is used. The 202 part is used. Importantly, it's not 205, which would be seemingly first name and birthday because that is not allowed. It's 202. So if we do, we put it back, we go back to 407, the entire key is being used. If we change this second condition to a range, say less than Francis, then look, we're using, we're using the first two parts of the key, an equality on first name and a range on last name. And then birthday is totally hosed. We can't use that, right? So this proves this proves what I was telling you about the access patterns and the range. Now, while we're here, let's talk a little bit about sorting. So, probably the worst thing you can see, uh, probably the worst thing you can see is order by using file sort. So, if you see using file sort, that's usually bad news. Um, that means an index is not being used. It is not always avoidable. So, don't freak out if it's there. If the result set is small enough, it can be totally fine. But this is an indication that an index is not being used. It doesn't always write it to a file. It can do it in memory sometimes, but it's still, it's worse than using an index. Okay, for sorting, the same rules apply, but it's a little, it's a little bit different, maybe with some more nuance. Left to right, no skipping stops at the first range. So if we were to order by first name, the file sort goes away, that's great. That makes sense because first name is the left prefix. If we were to order by last name, we still get no file sort. And that's because the first part of the key has been unlocked by the where condition. So it, it is now available, but also the next one is now available. So we're, either, we're able to use either first name or last name or both names because both parts of, those, of that key is available for usage, right? So if we did um, and last name equals Francis, we're still not gonna get a file sort. And now we also have access to sort by birthday because first name and last name have been unlocked. And so now birthday is available to us to use and we could do, uh, we could do first name and birthday and we're not gonna get a file sort. Now, if we change this to a range, stops after the first range and we're hosed again. So it's important to remember left to right, left to right, no skipsies, stops after the first range. After a key has been unlocked, after a key part has been unlocked, it's a, it, it, you're able to use it for sorting. So we switch this back to equals, order by birthday, we're good to go. Let's talk about something else. I wanna talk about something called covering indexes. Um, there is no command to create a covering index. A covering index, is not a special type of index. It is a regular index in a special situation. So don't go try to figure out how to create a covering index. 
Um, not possible. What a covering index is, it, it is the situation where an index can cover the needs of an entire query. I told you that um, an index is a separate data structure and it contains a, um, t contains a copy of the primary key to get back to the table so that it can pull the rest of the data, right? Sometimes, sometimes it doesn't have to go back to the table. Sometimes everything it needs is in that separate data structure. And in that case, you're in super good shape. Um, if we look in this extra column, which is where MySQL just puts a bunch of stuff and it's like, good luck with that. Um, it says using index. It would be more helpful if it said using index only because that's what's really happening. So if you see a query that says using index, that means the entire query has been satisfied from an index without going back to the main table. So you have first name, you have last name, you have birthday. All of those things are in the index, but remember ID is also in the index, not because you put it there, but because NODB put it there. So any combination of these four columns, you can select and it'll be satisfied completely by the index. And this is like triple gold star, best kind of index you can have. If you add something that's not needed, the using index or that's not available, the using index goes away. I don't design for covering indexes very often. The reason is we live in, a, in a, an active record world, right? Eloquent issues a select star to populate your model, which I'll talk about later. And so this is the query that is most often run by our application. So I don't optimize for covering indexes for that. If you are writing standalone queries and you're doing it kind of uh, freehand, not like as a, as a eloquent populating a model, and you can find a covering index, that's incredible. That's gonna be super fast. You're gonna be real happy about that. But for the web app itself, eh, it's kind of hard to get. Let's keep going. I love this no slides thing. If we have, um, if we have some JSON, how can we index it? Well, you can't do it directly. And that kind of sucks. So I've designed this horrible table um, with a column for name and then a JSON blob. And I've hid the email in the JSON blob. Terrible design. Put the email on the top level if you're going to search by it. But it makes for a great example. So how do we index this JSON blob if we can't index a JSON blob? OK, let's look at a way to do this in Laravel. We have our JSON data table. We're gonna add um, a string for email. We're gonna restrict it as 100 too much. Eh, who knows? Um, now you may be thinking, okay, I can use a Laravel model observer. Every time the model changes, I can pluck the email and put it in this column. You super duper can do that. That feels a little brittle to me um, because every update then has to be issued through the model observer. And sometimes you turn off events, you do mass updates, and sometimes you just, update, um, you just go to table plus and update it yourself. So I don't love that. What we're going to do instead is we're gonna tell the database, I want you to keep a computed column. So um, you can have like a calculated column or a computed column, kind of like a computed property, um, a virtual column. And what this does is this puts the responsibility onto the database to keep our new fake kind of made up column to keep it totally up to date at all times, no matter what. You can look down if we do a little source dive here, this virtual as accepts um, an expression, which we'll have to figure out somehow. And it creates a virtual generated column and the Laravel drivers that support it are MySQL, Postgres and SQLite. So this seems cool, let's do this. Um, what are we gonna put here? How are we gonna get the email out of the JSON blob? I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna make Laravel do that for me. And there are a couple of reasons. One is I don't wanna mess it up on live, live on video. And also um, it's super duper important that we copy exactly what Laravel does. And I'll show you why in a second. So from this, uh, I think it's called JSON data table. We're going to select, what's it called? JSON arrow email. This is Laravel's nice way of like papering over some monstrosities. Um, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to dump it to, yep, yep, yep. Artisan test. Here we go. This is what Laravel turned that JSON arrow email into, turned it into this. That's great. That looks reasonable to me. I'm into that. So we'll take that 
and replace that and reduce some spaces. Uh, yep, yep, yep. Now we're telling, in this case, MySQL, we're telling MySQL, hey, I'm going to make a string called email. You are going to fill it with JSON unquote, JSON extract, JSON dollar dot email. And MySQL's like, yeah, I can do that. I'm a database. We can just add an index on it, just like that. So now we have an index on this JSON key. Let's run this migration, AR migrate. Okay, good there. Table plus, refresh the table. Look at that. Pretty cool. Um, we have this generated column that we don't maintain. And if I change, uh, what is this, more Alexis, if I change that to some foobar, it changes to some foobar. MySQL did it for me. If I change it over here, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, you don't own that column. That's not your column. MySQL is responsible for that column. So you can't change it, which is great. That's what we're after. Let's take a look, select star from uh, JSON data where email equals Aaron at example. You thought I was gonna give you my email address? Come on. Um, okay, so there's the one row, that's me. Let's see what is going on under the hood. Look at this. The key that is being used is that email index. That's pretty cool. So we're now we're we're now able to index indirectly JSON blob. The frustrating part is you can't use Laravel's arrow syntax anymore because there's this new like virtual generated column that has an index on it. And so now you're like telling your developers, oh, please do not access the JSON blob, access this column. And worse, there may be third-party packages that you don't control that are using the old way. Well, that's not entirely accurate. Um, one of the reasons... One of the reasons besides laziness that I had Laravel come up with this access pattern is because if you are super careful, if you're super careful, MySQL will look at this and say, hang on a second, I have a generated column that has an index on it that matches this expression. Why don't I just use that? I'll just use that instead of like going through the JSON like an idiot and manually filtering it. So MySQL is smart in that regard. If you dork up the access pattern, MySQL is going to look at it and say, no, I don't recognize that at all. So what, what I always do is I want to see how is Laravel doing it? I'm going to copy that and use that style for my generated column. Now, every access pattern, whether email or using Laravel's is going to work. Third-party tools that don't know anything about this generated column, totally still gonna hit the index. In MySQL 8, I think 8. Uh, like 023 or something, there's something uh, called functional indexes that can do a little bit of this song and dance without the generated column in the middle. I haven't used them, so I can't really speak to them. If you are using MySQL 8, um, you can also make this column invisible. So if you don't wanna see this email column, um, when, it, when you do a select star, this email column won't show up. You would have to explicitly select it. So is it useful? I don't know. It's kind of cool. Um, I kind of like the invisible because that helps with some of the select star problems anyway. Okay. <clears throat> there have been dozens and dozens of books written on queries. I'm sorry, written on indexes. Um, and I just covered indexes in like 20 minutes. So that is not an exhaustive, that is not an exhaustive um, look at indexes. When it comes time to querying, there are a couple of things you need to keep in mind. The first thing is please, for the love of God, use your indexes. Ideally, your indexes are based on your queries anyway, so you don't really have a choice. Um, but it, any tip or trick I give you is basically gonna be, how can I use an index better? So use your indexes. Do not obfuscate your indexes. Don't hide your indexes from MySQL. This query, very simple, will use an index on first name. This query, very simple, will not use an index on first name. You have wrapped the first name column in a function and MySQL looks at that and says, nope, nope, not me, I don't have that. And it just scans the whole table. So don't obfuscate, don't hide your indexes in some kind of function. And I know what you're thinking, Aaron, you fool, I would never do such a thing. Wouldn't you though? So what if we look at, what if we look at, I don't know, people, 
and we say where created at, and you're like, well, I want to say where created at this year. So I'm going to do where year created at, and let's just debug that and dump that. Oh no, what, what bad news? What a terrible outcome. You've wrapped what could be potentially an indexed column in a function. And so my, my SQL looks at it and goes, you're on your own, man. Could you make a generated column for this? Sure. Don't make a generated column for everything. Um, there's a better way to do this one. And that's just to use a where between. I know it's 2020, so I'm going to do start of year and I'm going to do end of year. And if we debug that, now this column is not obfuscated and it's using a range. Is this Eloquent's fault? 100% no. <laughs> um, Eloquent is a sharp tool that you could cut yourself with. You need to understand what is happening under the hood. Um, there are times where like using these handy Eloquent methods are the best you can do. To, to do a where month and not obfuscate the created at column, I, I actually don't know how you do that. You can't turn this into a range. And so... Using Eloquent is great. Use Eloquent as much as you can. Please don't write raw SQL when you can use Eloquent, but you do need to know what's going on under the hood because you might accidentally shoot yourself in the foot where you thought you were being clever. Here we are again, select only what you need. The common wisdom is um, don't use select star, otherwise you're a noob. So this may be a little bit of a hot take. I'm going to say select only what you need. Maybe, I don't, uh, this may make me a bad database guy, um, but select only what you need maybe. When we're living in an active record world, which we are with Eloquent and it's amazing and we love it, I don't like monkeying with the select star. Here's what could happen. You could optimize your select star that then populates your um, Eloquent model, right? So you're selecting a portion of the columns and you're populating your model and your model is partially populated. If you are not extremely careful, you could take that partially populated model and then start accessing things that weren't populated and running code paths as if those attributes are null when the attributes are just in the database and you didn't select them. So that makes me really, really nervous. So I don't like to partially populate eloquent models. If you are writing a query that doesn't populate an eloquent model, select only what you need. Optimize how much data you're pulling. That's great. There's potentially a happy medium in an active record world. And that is if you have a table that is potentially very wide, 60 columns or something, and potentially very long. And there are columns that you use extremely frequently. And there are columns that you use hardly ever. You can shuffle those old crusty columns off into a separate table, i.e. a separate model. So you may have a user table that has a bunch of um, supplemental or meta or addendum information and you're just carrying it around it's just it's just weighing you down you could potentially separate that in, into a meta table and use eloquent to like eager load it if you ever need it and then that way your um your hot columns the ones that you're accessing all the time on this big table that you're reading all the time can be whoop, compressed into disk much much better would I do this if I had a compelling reason? Yeah, um, I would wait until I had a compelling reason. But this, I think, is a happy medium between um, a DBA saying you should never use select star and an app de developer saying you should always use select star. Eh, you can kind of split the difference. Another method you can do is um, get close quickly and get right slowly. Um, if you're in the situation where you're trying to select star from tasks where, uh-oh, we have another function that is potentially obfuscating a an index on due date. Could you could you add a generated column? Sure, but don't just add a million generated columns because they're cool. They are cool. If you have an index on due date already, you can add what's called um, a redundant condition by saying due date greater than um, today. This is called a redundant condition because this won't change the results at all. This is like saying, give me, um, give me numbers that are bigger than three and are also bigger than two. And you're like, 
Yeah, yeah, that's redundant. But this redundant condition down here is totally available to be used should there be an index on due date. And so the theory here is that you can quickly chop off a whole bunch of records using the index and then slowly filter down to exactly what you need in the smaller result set. These are fun to find. I don't find them that often, but if you can find one, they're really fun because they're easy to add. You just change the application code a tiny bit and you're off to the races. I do this a lot with geographic searches. If I have a point of interest in the middle and then a comp complicated like haversign, whatever, to figure out the, the radius around it, I just make a, a big old ugly bounding box and I just chop everything off. And then I use the expensive calculation afterwards to eliminate those false positives. So this, the bounding box is a method of a redundant condition. Last one, let's talk about why subqueries are bad. Subqueries aren't bad. <laughs> so sorry for the tease. Subqueries are great. Um, you, might hear, um, you might hear people say every subquery needs to be rewritten as a join. And I mean, technically they're right. The database itself is going to rewrite your subquery as a join. So the database has the optimizer and the optimizer is crazy smart and sometimes stupid, but the database will take your subquery and oftentimes rewrite it into what's called a semi-join or an anti-join. And those aren't left and right joints. So one of the problems that I run into when I'm trying to filter on a related model, let's say, is when you join it in, you get this explosion of columns that you then have to like filter back down and you have to muck with your select statement. You could also get a geometric explosion of rows depending on what kind of join you're doing and how you do it, right? I like subqueries because it, it turns into this like semi, it's called a semi join um, under the hood. And MySQL will say, I know what you're looking for. I'm going to run it as if it's a join, but I'm not going to do any of that adding the extra columns you didn't ask for. There is one thing you need to look out for. If you are on MySQL 5.7, this query will eat your lunch and your dinner and your breakfast. This is called a dependent subquery. Under the hood, this where has turns into a where exists. The subquery references a, a column on the outside query, meaning it is a dependent subquery. This will totally hose you. And I'm talking like two orders of magnitude hose you. If you're on, if you're on MySQL 5.7, make it a, an independent subquery by using a where in with a closure. This turns into an independent subquery. My SQL 5.7 is like, yeah, cool, I got it. My SQL 8 can handle both of them on the top. They're called trivially correlated. And it's like, I'll just uncorrelate these. It doesn't matter. So that's just my word of warning for you 5.7 users. I have no idea if Postgres suffers from this issue. I'm, I'm, I don't know Postgres. Um, so just keep that in mind. If you're on 5.7, go look at your warehouses and see if you can change it to a where in. You might be surprised. That's it. This was a this was a whirlwind. Um, that was a ton of information in a super short time. Um, I am doing a full course that's going to be a lot a lot lower key. It'll be available at planetscale.com slash Laracon. It's totally free. I was going to charge just out the nose for it. And then PlanetScale was like, what if we made it free? I was like, oh, that's a good idea. Um, so go to planetscale.com slash Laracon to sign up for that. And I'll let you know when it's out. And then I spend basically all my time on Twitter, unless you're my new boss at Planet Scale, in which case I'm never on Twitter. I spend all my time on Twitter. You can follow me at twitter.com slash Aaron D. Francis. Thank you so much. With negative 30 seconds left, Ian, I yield back to you. Awesome. Great job. I love database indexes. One of my favorite topics. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it is a lot of fun. All right. Thank you, sir. See ya. All right, let's see. I'm going to share my screen for a minute. Let's go here. All right. I believe this is our, our final sponsor for the day, uh, About You. Um, they're actually hiring Laravel developers, lots and lots of Laravel developers and other developers, um, and just other technical positions, actually. I think where I looked just before, they have like almost 100 open positions. So if you're uh, looking for a new job, definitely check out their career page. Um, just a few we grabbed here, lead backend developers, senior developers, full stack developers, lead full stack developers, um, lots of jobs there. Also Lara Jobs users as well. So thank you so much to About You. They're always huge supporters, again, of sponsored 
lots of Laracons. Um, really appreciate them. And then also on the swag page, uh, this is the first time they've done this. Uh, they actually have a 10% off discount code to actually go use their store and they sell, you know, clothes. So if you're, I think you have to be in the EU, but uh, if you are, then go ahead and check that out and go on a little shopping spree. Uh, thank you again about you. Okay, let's get Kristoff in here. There he is. Hello, hello. Hello. Vienna calling. <laughs> All right, well, you look good and you sound good. So I'm gonna let you take it away. Thank you so much, Ian. All right, hello, everybody. Okay, this looks good. So hello, hello. Nice being here again at another amazing Laracon. It's so good being back here. So thank you for having me, but also thank you for organizing this yeah, great conference again. It's for free for everybody. How cool is this that we live in a world where we can have such a conference and you can just click play on YouTube and watch, I don't know, six hours of amazing content. So yeah, this is just very, very good. That's why also the first thing that we all do, please take your hand on the cursor, go here to the YouTube stream and please give it a like because that's how we show all the people, all the sponsors that we care about what they do. And it's just amazing. Please also think about subscribing. They really deserve it. So I want to see a lot of more likes here for the stream than we had before. So if you have already read the title of my talk today, you maybe thought about this one here. Do you know this documentary? You can say yes, you can raise your hands. We just do like we um, see each other, like we are all together now, like we're a family at a conference on stage. So yeah, ha have you seen this documentary? It's called Chiro Dreams of Sushi. And it's a documentary that Taylor Otwell shared many years ago. And it's about the guy here in the middle. It's Shiro, and he's one of the best sushi chefs in the world. And he was 85 years old when the documentary came out. And I think he's now 95 years old. And all of his life, he was making sushi. But not the fancy sushi that you get with avocado and fish eggs and stuff like that that you see today. The most basic sushi, but the best sushi that you can get in the world. So every day of his life for 60, 70 years that he's working, or maybe more, he thought about how can I make my sushi even better? And yeah, still every day he thinks about what can I do and until a point where he also dreams about sushi. And I dream about eating sushi from time to time, but yeah, I'm no master at sushi. But yeah, since I saw this documentary, I thought about what do I dream of? And let me tell you today about a little story and why I dream today of simple code. My name is Christoph Humpel. I'm a developer from Vienna. Um, you can find me on Twitter with my Twitter handle, Christoph Rumpel. I'm like Aaron a lot on Twitter. You will, you will always find me there. And please also use my Twitter handle if you have some feedback from my talk, because I always want to see it too. So my biggest story, my biggest journey so far started in 1985. And since I was a kid, since I was a little baby, I dreamed about writing simple code. Um, yeah. No, I don't think so. Um, I, I don't remember, maybe I did, but I'm pretty sure I didn't. So the first thing that I can remember is when I was five years old, or at least my parents told me that I wanted to become a professional soccer player. I'm here with my brother and we both played soccer for quite a long time. And this was the first dream that I had that I yeah, can still remember. As you might know, this didn't turn out as expected. So I'm not a professional soccer player today, sorry. So yeah, the next thing, um, I was, I think, around 14 years old. I had another dream. I wanted to become a professional musician. I had a punk rock band called No More Encore. We were, mo we were making music for 10 years, three full-length album. We toured through Europe. So yeah, uh, I tried everything I could to make a living from music. 
But yeah, also, as you know, this also didn't work out. At some point, we had to quit. And in 2009, I had to get a real job. Yeah, boring real job where you have to sit in front of a computer. Yeah, so in 2009, I started at the university. And to give you some perspective, I was back then 24 years old. Um, I wrote there my first lines of code and there was PHP version 5.2 and Laravel was not released yet. But yeah, the moment I knew that I wanted to become a programmer, that I knew that I wanted to do more coding, I had a new dream. I had a dream about becoming better at code every day. That's what I tried, especially because I started quite late coding, at least it felt for me 24 years old. So I felt like I was like 10 years behind everyone else. So in 2011, I had my first um, paid project. I was still at university and I was working on a dancing event website for uh, my client. And lucky for you, I found this contact.php file from this project. And yeah, back then there was no MVC, there was no model view controller. So everything was in this one file. So when we wanted to submit a form, we just submitted to the same file. That's exactly what we're doing here. We're checking if um, a form was submitted. And if it was, I'm bringing in some other files so that I get some database connection that I um, can write some uh, mails and stuff like that. And yeah, a bunch of other things are inside this file here. I'm also doing error handling. So everything was in this one file. And of course, as well as the whole markup, which started here. And when we scroll down to the end of the page here, yeah, a lot of lines here in this project. But back then I didn't care because the only thing that I was interested in was making my code work. So for me back then, good code was working code. And yeah, I moved on 2012. I had my first side project. It's an app that was called Hero of the World, PHP 5.4. And I used my first um, framework, CodeIgniter. And um, with this app, you could, um, it's a little game where you see two characters and you have to decide which one you prefer. And at the end, you will know which is your favorite superhero. And lucky for you, especially lucky for you, I also found some files of this project. And especially I found here this high score file where I'm printing out the high score for the game. And yeah, don't ask me, I'm printing out all the markup with PHP as well. So I would really love to say that back then everybody was doing it like this, but yeah, actually, I don't know. I think, I think it was just me, but at least we will never find out. So again, I'm not really sure that I knew what I was doing, but I was trying as much as I could just to make the code work. Good code is working code. And yeah, I was willing to learn more and yeah, as much as I could. And I learned on platforms like um, Treehouse. I did there many courses. I learned from NetTouch Plus, which was a thing back then where Jeffrey Way was working. And I tried to learn from Mr. Clean Code, Uncle Bob, or Kent Beck, which we also have already seen today. And then later, of course, I also joined Laracast, um, the learning platform by Jeffrey Way, which he has today. And yeah, one of the best learning platforms for PHP and Laravel out there. So yeah, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was willing to learn more and to improve. So 2013, I got my first job as a backend developer at an agency called Lichtenecker here in Vienna. And yeah, the first task which I had was looking for a new PHP framework because back then they were using CodeIgniter and CodeIgniter wasn't that well maintained anymore and everybody was looking for something else. And my colleague, Sarah, she was checking out Symfony and I checked out Level. And the next day we met at the company and asked, hey, Sarah, how is Symfony? And she was like, mm, maybe not so good. I didn't like it. It seems pretty complicated to get it started with. And I came back from checking out Level. Version four was just released and I was like, this looks so good. I, I really want to use Laravel. It feels like this is exactly what I needed. And this was the first time that I used Laravel. And this is now uh, nine years ago. So yeah, what a journey. And I never regretted that decision. Then in 2014, I had another side project called Famulas. It was a platform where 
people could log in and then share all their images and their food recipes. I was cooking a lot back then and I wanted to share those recipes with my family. So I had the side project, PHP 5.6, Laravel version 5.3. And yeah, as with so many other side projects, I was the only one using it. So I never really released it. But yeah, I also found something interesting because it was the first time that I was using a repository pattern which you can see here. It's a pretty basic one because I'm just doing the same with Eloquent, just with another method around. But yeah, I still remember very clearly that back then people told you, you should use the repository pattern because if you don't use it, you're writing code that is too close to the framework. And what happens if you want to change your framework? What happens if you want to change the ORM Eloquent? You're screwed because you're too tightly coupled to the framework and this is just something that you shouldn't do. Funny fact, it was also the last time that I used a repository pattern, at least in my projects. Another tweet that I found in 2014 was this one, early Christo saying, I guess I really start liking the TDD approach, turning things green can't be bad. Sounds pretty nice, right? Yeah, I also got one like, I really have to check out who liked this tweet. Probably it was just me, but yeah, um, I was trying out testing, I was trying out TDD, so a good thing. I was trying to learn more to improve. But also now, um, eight years ago, I can fairly say it took me at least four or five more years until I really understood testing, how to test, when to test, testing framework, and especially TDD and become efficient in TDD. So for me, it's fun seeing this tweet now because yeah, I wasn't there yet, but yeah, I tried. I also tried a lot with um, JavaScript. I started with jQuery. I think at university, we also started with prototype, I think it was called, and jQuery. Then at the company, we were using AngularJS version one. Then Vue.js came, everybody was using Vue.js. And then also TypeScript came. And then at the company, we were using Angular with TypeScript. Yeah, so I was trying all of them. And of course, there was much more um, than just the ones that you see here. But yeah, I tried as much as I could. And then in 2015, something changed for me. I realized something. So um, I wrote this blog article called Stop Reading Blog Articles Like You Do. And basically before that time, people said, and I followed, use the repository pattern. I did it. Um, use Vue.js. I did it do this, use codeception for testing or do that. And I just followed because I followed so many great and smart people out there and they were my coding heroes and I wanted to be like them. I admired them and yeah, I wanted to learn from them. That's why I always did what they said. And I didn't even question it because who am I to um, know what I want? But yeah, at that time I realized they, all those people, they don't know me. They don't know what what I'm doing, they don't know my projects, they don't know my clients, they don't know uh, my company, they know nothing about me. So who are they to tell me how I should code? It's, it's ridiculous now when I think about it, but back then I didn't even question it. But yeah, it's very similar to what Matt said today. I realized I'm not building Facebook or like he said, I'm not building Netflix. And I'm pretty sure like 80% or maybe even 90% of the ones watching, I guess you're also not building Facebook or Netflix. So why should I build my projects like I'm building Facebook? It just doesn't make sense. And yeah, it was really a deciding moment for me. And from that moment on, I knew that it all depends. And I stopped reading blog articles like, this is how I should do something. Even if those people told me to do it, I just read them like, hey, here's what I experienced. Maybe it's helpful to you, maybe not. You have to decide for yourself. So that's what I did from that moment on. And that's why this was a very, very deciding moment in my coding career. And also from that moment on, I thought about, okay, what code do I dream of? What is my opinion? What do I want? What, should, what is the code that I like to wrote? And it's, it's something that I didn't question before, but from that moment on, I thought about, okay, what do I dream of? What is, what is my sushi? And fast forward to 2018, I did a few steps to yeah, find out what I want and 
took some directions in, yeah, in the directions that I wanted to go. So in 2018, I founded my own one-man company just because I wanted to decide the projects that I work on. I wanted to decide the people I work with. For me, it's very important to work with people where there is a good energy, where we both benefit from each other. And yeah, I only wanted to work with those people. And I also wanted to work on quality and not quantity. Because before that, I was working a lot on yeah marketing pages that have to be super fast when you build them and probably you're going to delete them after a month or you don't have time for tests or TDD or other stuff. You just have to be fast and that's just not how I wanted to work. And yeah, founding my own company was one step in this direction. Another step was working in public. So I, I went to meetups, I spoke at meetups, I went to conferences. I later spoke at conferences, I had open source projects, I had my blog, I had Twitter, and so on. And what all those things have in common, all those things, this is content that I throw out into this world towards you. And then the world, you are going to react to my content. And then maybe you question me, why are you using Leobel? Why do you like TDD? Why don't you like the repository pattern? And at the beginning, sharing your content, your experience is scary because you often don't have an answer to that. Why, do I, why don't I like the repository pattern? At the beginning, it was difficult to, to say why it was like that. But the moment you put content out into the world, um, it's the moment that you shape your opinions, that you shame your personal preferences. And it's scary, but it also gives you so much back. And it helped me so much on my coding journey and also to find out what I want and what my opinions are. I also always try to surround myself with very smart and positive people, like on Laracation last year. Pretty sure you know all of them from the Laravel community. But yeah, this is just an example. I met so many amazing people in the last years, and I feel very thankful to work with them, but also call them my friends. And for me, again, it was also very important to surround myself not only with smart people, there are enough out there, but also with positive people. These are the ones that you want to have around you, especially myself, because I feel in this environment with those people, just the best and I can work the best. So that's important and also something that I realized and tried to do more and more. And I was already working with Lava for a few years and yeah, for me it became much more clear why I really like it and love it and use it every day. So of course, it's famous for its elegant syntax, for its simplicity. You can be very fast, but you also have all the tools to write big um, application for many years. And it has an amazing environment with so many great tools out there, but it also has a lot of developer experience. I guess some other talks already mentioned this today, but if there's one thing that Taylor's good at, or maybe if there are two things that Taylor is good at, Taylor Artwell, the first thing is bringing people together. Like today, thousands of people watching the stream now or through the day, Taylor is bringing all of us together. And second, um, developer experience. From the moment he built Laravel, he thought about how can I make um, the life of a developer easier? And yeah, I think this is just an amazing skill. And I noticed that we developers are important too. Because when I started coding in the early PHP days, I didn't felt like that. All the tools out there, there weren't for me. I didn't have a technical background. I just started with coding. Everything felt, yeah, um, really difficult and also ugly, <laughs> really ugly. Um, I did a lot of design when I started at university. So for me, having a good design is very important, not just because it looks beautiful, because design also leads you to the right decision. So design is important for everyone. And yeah, we developers are important too. And that's what I see when working with Level every single day. On my journey, I also found some products, some other products that helped me shape my understanding of code. This was a book by Adam Wethen called Refactoring to Collection, which um, shows you how you can deal with loops in PHP by replacing them with collection. An amazing book, and it's something that I use still every day. But I also started teaching myself. I wrote a book about building chatbots with PHP. I made a course about how um, um, Laravel works under the hood, how the core works, and what you can learn from it. I did a course about uh, mastering PHP Storm, how you can customize your IDE, 
but also how to get started with testing and TDD. So I did a lot of teaching. And the point here is, this is also something that not only helped, hopefully, all the people that bought my courses and watched the things that are provided, but it also helped me a lot. Because when you throw something out again in the world, you think twice before you do this, and you really want to shape the content and you want to shape your opinion before you do this. So teaching has helped me really a lot on my personal journey. Another tool that really um, that I'm really using every day is Tailwind CSS. And yeah, this is not another developer blindly follows um, Tailwind CSS without knowing CSS just because he's lazy something story. This is not at all the story here because I was using CSS quite a lot. I was also working before becoming a backend developer as a frontend developer. So I really knew myself around in CSS and knew the best practices. And this is also why it was quite difficult for me to get into Tailwind CSS, a utility first CSS framework because yeah, it was so different. And, but yeah, I knew this was again, another product bad and weapon. I knew he, um, he's amazing with the things that he do. So I gave Tailwind a second or maybe a third try. And then yeah, I realized again, that this is also something that benefits my way of coding a lot. And that's why I use it every day since then. Okay, now 2022, all of those things that, that I shared with you today, all the steps that I took, all the experience, all the learnings, all the te teaching, everything shaped up me as a developer today. And today I really know what code I want to write, what code I want to write today, what code I want to improve for tomorrow. And this is simple code. So today I can really say I dream about simple code. Of course, simple code is a simple term. So what does this even mean? So I'm glad that you asked. Let me explain it to you. So for me, simple code is code that is easy to read, easy to understand, less code and tested code. And don't just take my work. Let me show you what I mean by all of that. Let's start with code that is easy to read. We have here an array of users with a name, score, and if they're active or not. This is an example from one of my early apps. And then the request is, we want to get as a result only the active users. We want them to be sorted by the score. And we want the output to be a combination of the name and the score together. And in plain PHP, we have seen some of those functions already today. We can do this, there are a lot of methods a lot of functions in PHP to manipulate an array. And this is one way to do this. But yeah, we can also use a collection and then this suddenly looks like this. And how good is this now to read? We are wrapping our users array and create a new collection object. And then on our object, we have all those nice methods which we already know from PHP, but now they are chained onto our collection. And now if we see this code, we see we have our users, we collect them, we create a collection, then we filter them, we sort them, we map them, and at the end, we get back an array. And how, how good is this to read? I'm still amazed every time when I see the difference, and this is what I really call um, easy to read code. So I'm a big fan of collections, and I really use them every, every day. Next example is when we're writing tests, for example, in the other and other application, there are methods to make an assertion for a specific status code, like here 200, 201, and so on. But in Laravel, there are also some more descriptive methods to do the same. Want to check that you get a 200 code back? Assert OK. Want to check that something was created? Assert created. And now you can see what has changed now. The method name is now not telling us anymore um, how we're doing something, it's telling us what we are doing and what we're expecting. We're expecting that something is okay or was created and we don't care how we check this. We just want to make sure that this is done. And with this now more new descriptive way of writing this, this gets way easier to read, especially also because we um, got rid of the argument. This is also a general rule. The more you can get rid of arguments, the better your code will be to read because the method is already something that you have to read. And yeah, this enough tells us what we're doing here. So that's why I would always pick um, more descriptive methods. Another example is here from uh, migration. It's also a very good example where we're creating a, um, 
foreign key for a specific, um, for a different table, for a product table, and we're using the unsigned big integer method here, but we can also use the foreign ID for method. And again, the difference here before we were um, explaining what we're doing, we're using unsigned big integer, but yeah, actually I don't care as long as we are creating a foreign ID for a specific product. Of course, at some point you have to know what is being used in the back, but yeah, just when we talk about readability, this is so much better, especially now that we don't have to provide a static string anymore. We can use the class name of the products table. Love it. Another example also from our few files in plate, um, we can use the if directive to check if the user authenticated, then if yes, we're going to show some specific marker, markup, but we can also use the auth method, which again is less code and more readable code. And there's also the guest um, directive as well. So Lava provides so many options that sometimes you have to check a little bit which are the ones that you prefer the most. And I love to use the more descriptive ones. Okay, I think one more example for code that is easy to read. Here we are providing a status code and want to get back the right background color for this content. So if the status is okay, then we want to return a string with BG green and so on. And this code is already quite good to read because we have all the different validations on separate lines. And at the end, we're going to return the default value. So this is something how I would write it as well. But in latest PHP version, you can also use the match operator. And now we only have to use the status variable just one time at the beginning where we provide it to the method. And now on the left, we can see if the status is okay, then we return what is on the right. And this is not only half the code of what we had before, it's also way more readable um, for me. That's why it's always important to check out what latest PHP versions have to offer because yeah, there is pretty cool stuff coming with each new version. Oh, and the light to you, there's one more thing, one of my favorite topics. So when we talk about how good your code is to read, it's not only about the code itself, but it's also about how you present it. So we're talking here about your IDE or your editor, because here PHP Storm, this is how it looks like um, when you install it the first time without customizing it. And yeah, I think our code, even if the code is pretty, pretty simple, it is quite difficult to read because of all the noise around it. And with a little bit of customization, the same code could also look something like this. So we don't have now any distraction around us. We only see what is most important. This is the code. So this is why it's always worth to customizing your IDE because yeah, easy code is also code that is easily presented. All right, second on my list, next to code that is easy to read is code, which is easy to understand. And one of my favorite examples is testing with facades here. So here we are in a test where we want to make sure that a specific email was sent. And at the beginning we're checking, uh, we are faking out our mail service. So this means we're switching out the real mail service with a fake one, just to make sure that we don't send out a real email to uh, some of our users. And then at the end, we are going to make an assertion that the code that was run before um, sent out an email and we can do this now also with an assertion from the facade. And I'm pretty sure even if you're not that good at coding, if you're not get that good at testing, that if you take a look at this um, method here, at this test here, I'm pretty sure you can guess what's going on just because it is so easy to understand. And like before, it's easy to read because of good night names, but it's also easy to understand. And that's why I'm a big fan of using facades for tests because yeah, it's super cool to test them in level. Especially then when you can use the same functionality for your own services. So the mail facade comes with level itself, but this Twitter client, which I use in one of my projects, this is something that I created myself. And I just did the same. I'm faking the Twitter service. And then at the end, I'm making an assertion that something was tweeted out just because I love how this works in level. I'm using the same thing now myself for my services. Yeah, it is super easy to read and to understand. Also, what I'm a big fan of in the last years is single method controllers. So most of my controllers only consist of one method. And mostly these days, it's an evocable method, which gets automatically triggered, especially in level if you are binding it to a route. 
So you probably end up now with more files because um, you will have more controllers. But actually, I don't really care because mostly when I check my code, I'm only interested in a specific thing. And then I need, still need to go to the method. And now there's only one method in this controller. And this will help you a lot to understand what you were doing here. Because if there are like three, four methods in this class, it can get messy quite easily. So having a single method controller is something that I like a lot these days. Oh, next one is a good one. Working close to the framework. So this is a highly discussed topic in and outside of Laravel. So on the one side, people are telling you not to write close to the framework, like I already mentioned it before, like with the repository pattern, because yeah, there are some, um, it's, it could be dangerous if you have to change something. And people say, yeah, decouple your code as much as you can from the framework and for Laravel, for example. And then there are other people saying stick close to the framework because there are some advantages as well. And one of the biggest one is that your code and your code bit is easier to understand. Just because there is a default structure, default way of doing things in level and other people will know it because that's how you see it in the documentation. That's how they have used it in the application. And this will make it more easier when new people come to your project. And I think there are, of course, pros and cons for both of those concepts, but I really agree that sticking close to the framework will make your code base way easier to understand for the long term, especially also when we upgrade or update our, um, frame, um, our, our applications. Okay, next on my list is less code. Yeah, this is one of my favorite ones. Isn't it great to just write less code if you can? I, I, I just love it. So here we have a PHP unit test where we check if we make a um, request to our homepage, we get a positive response back or a 200 HTTP status code back. But with PEST, the testing framework by Nuno Maduro, we can write the same functionality like this, which is like half of the code than before. And it also provides us with some simple and elegant function and tricks here that makes writing tests really cool here. And yeah, this is now way less code than before, which is a good thing. I like to write a lot of tests. And if you write like 100 tests now, writing only half of the amount than before, this is a good thing because all, all the code that you don't write, you don't have to read, you don't have to update, you don't have to maintain it just because this code is not here. So less code is something that I really aim for for all of my projects. And another one, oh yeah, this is a spicy one. So here we have an example of a controller where we're using dependency injection to get in a mailer service and then we are sending out an email. At the same time, we can use a mail facade and the code just basically does the same. And when I highlight here, the difference is only on the left, we are injecting the service through dependency injection. On the right, we're using a facade directly, which in the back, that's just the same, but it is a little bit different. And every time I would go for the right side and would use the facade if possible when I start um, my to-do and my project. Like also Matt told today, I am building my code for today. Maybe, maybe for tomorrow, maybe for next week, but for sure not for next year. So I am big fan of, yeah, doing the things that work now. And if I ran into some issues on the way, I'm going to fix it then. I don't have to build Facebook or Netflix now, even if I don't know, because I don't know if my apps even get that far or that big. So that's why I would always go here for the facade if possible, just because it is a little bit less code to write and to read. And last on my list is tested code. As I mentioned, I really love to write a lot of tests and use TDD a lot. So yeah, testing is something that I do a lot. But when we think about testing, there are a few things that tested code is not. It's definitely not simple to write. You have to learn what to test, when to test, testing frameworks. Uh, TDD definitely is not simple. Um, it's also definitely not writing less code because actually you write a lot more code. That's true. But bear with me, there are a few things about tested code that still help me to write simple code. And the main thing here is that tested code is easy and simple to change and maintain. 
So the reason is if you have code which is well tested, every time you update it, you maintain it, you um, write some new code, you can run the test and they will tell you if you broke something or not. If you don't have tests, you are super scary about even touching your code because I have no idea if I break something. And then that's why there are many applications out there that people just don't touch. And other colleagues told, tell you, don't touch this class. It's working. We don't want to have any issues. And I think that's a bad thing. And tests really help you to write applications that are easy to change and easy to maintain. And also what's good about having tests is that it's very easy to hand over or share your project with other colleagues. Because again, they can run the test and see is every, if, is, if is everything working, but they can also check the tests and tests are like documentation for your code because tests are telling you what your um, features can or cannot do. And this is really nice to learn about a new application going into the test and yeah, finding out how this application works. And that why, that's why I still believe tested code helps me a lot to write simple code every day. All right, so again, for me, simple code means writing code that is easy to read, easy to understand, less code, tested code. And I think I, I even need to add one here, writing code for today. So what um, Matt, Matt, Matt mentioned today and what I also believe, don't think too much about the future, what is in one year, two years, thinking about what you can do today for a project and tomorrow is another day. Okay, but um, why am I doing all of this? Why am I dreaming about code? Why I'm trying to make my code more simple, readable, testable, whatever. Do I do this just for fun? Maybe a little bit, but yeah, um, actually there are some good reasons. First, I want to write quality projects, not only for my clients, for everybody who work for, but also for my future self. I wonder if I have an application, if I come back the next year to know what is going on. And that's why it's important that my code is readable so that I still understand it. And this is something that, yeah, can be quite difficult. Sometimes after one or two weeks, I have no idea anymore what I did, what I did two weeks back. And this is something bad. That's why I want to write good applications today, readable applications today, and also have tests which will help me on the way. So I'm doing this for clients, for colleagues, for my future self. But of course, I also want to challenge myself to write better code every day. This is why I'm doing all of this. So what about you now? Do you have to use facades now? Do you have to write tests now? Do you have to use TDD, um, use level now and do all the things that I showed you today? And yeah, I'm happy to say absolutely not. Because who am I to tell you what you should do or should not do? I don't know you. I don't know your clients, your projects, your company. I just don't know. So just do whatever um, fits your situation. And all I'm doing here today, I'm sorry, my talk today is not about you. I'm a little bit selfish here. It's about me. It's about my experience, about the code that I want to write today and tomorrow and how this all shaped up in my understanding of writing code today. So sorry, this talk was all about me, but yeah, probably there are still some things in my talk that you like and that are maybe helpful to you. And then there's a good thing. If not, that's okay too. So um, yeah, you have to think about for yourself what code means to you. So if there's one thing that you can take away from this talk is think about, about the code that you write today and the code that you want to write tomorrow. What is your opinion? What do you think? What code do you dream of? And I think it's very valuable for yourself to think about this and yeah, make up an opinion. And maybe at some point, or maybe already today, you know what code you dream of. And this is a very good thing. Whew, okay. Thank you so much um, for listening today. If you want to write more readable PHP, I have a course together with Freik and Spassi where we wrote a lot of tips which we collected over the last years about writing readable um, PHP. And there are also a lot of videos. So um, please give this a look. And also there's one more thing that I want to show you, something that I have been working for the last weeks and months. And yeah, I'm super excited to present it to you today. So hello, pest-driven level, my latest video course. 
if you are afraid of touching your code because you don't have um, tests anymore, then it's a good idea to start thinking about writing fully tested applications. And that's exactly what we're doing in this course. We are together building an application from start to finish. It's a little video platform and we're going to use TDD. So for everything we do, we are going to write a test first, make the code work, refactor it, and then move on. So this is the TDD mindset, the TDD workflow that I want to help you to establish. And on the way, we're going to use, as the title says, PEST, the testing framework by Nuno Monturo and his team, which I think is just amazing. And I want you to learn more about this. So if you're interested in this, please give it a look at pestdrivenlevel.com. There is currently a 25% discount code and the official release will be tomorrow. But yeah, just for you, this is from me to you. Um, I wanted to show you this today. Maybe it's a little bit for me too, but yeah, mo mostly for you. All right. With that being said, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the conference and yeah, see you around. Awesome. Great talk. Thank you very much, Christoph, as always. All right. Oh, man. Coming down to it now. We're getting close to the end. Um, okay. So let's do this. All right. Okay. So we're supposed to have a break and we're going to take a break, but we're only going to take a five minute break. Five minutes. So 422 Eastern, we will be back here and we're going to start the lightning talks. Um, and then, yeah, we're almost getting close to the end, but we have a bunch of lightning talks, I think six lightning talks, and then a final uh, very interesting talk on security. So don't miss that. Um, yeah, so we'll see you back here in five minutes. Thanks. Step one, wake up early, gonna rise with the sun. Step two, get some good, some food in you. Step three, you grow hard about what you wanna be. Step four, everybody just do your thing. Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. 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 Wake up. Today's gonna be a good day. Wake up. Today's gonna be a good day. Wake up. Today's gonna be a good day. Yo, set your affirmations, aspirations. I got shit to do. The aftermath of preparation. Good food, good mood, blood in circulation. One step at a time. Yeah, that's how you make it. Set a goal you control and the steps you take them. I try to pick one thought, have some concentration. And if I make a mistake, it's called education. I try to do this every day. Call it replication. Wake up. Today's gonna be a good day. 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 So life ain't easy, y'all. I think there's a reason, though. Ups and downs, just like every different season, yo. Sometimes I'm high, other times I'm barely breathing, though. I always gotta fight and hide from the demons, yo. Negative thoughts are poison, they ride. Uh. Head full of flaws, so here come the clouds. Uh. They'll never stop unless I can swap all the bad for the good in my head when I'm lost. Uh. Yeah, so I'ma fake it till I make it. Positive thoughts are overtaken. I got patience. One day at a time is how you operate a cadence. A flow, you grow, you show yourself a foundation. Stay away from all the shit that causes temptation. I know that I like to do it cause of sensation. I live my life in my head like a narration. Don't expect greatness, do my best, man, I'll take it. Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. Today's gonna be a good day. Wake up. 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 Today's gonna be a good day.
Even when you feel low, you can still go. Even when you feel slow, you can still go. Even when there's no hope, you can still go. I never answered a no, man, I still go. Go, go. Every single day I'll be making moves Till I'm buried in my grave uh, To the system I don't wanna be a slave I've been doing shit my way uh, Or the highway And in the driveway Is a nice range Cause I grind through the climb I invite pain You never hear me bitch Nah, I don't complain Just gotta flip the switch And you can go and obtain Anything you want Anything you need Your mind's got the key ingredient It's belief uh, Better see with the negativity But I just slide right by that Low, you can still go Even when you feel slow You can still go Even when there's no hope You can still go I never answered a no Man, I still go Go, go, go Go, go Okay, hello everybody We're back And so like last time i'm going to uh kind of go through all the lightning talk speakers here at the start and then uh then we're just going to keep moving once we're in there so uh first up we're gonna have rissa uh who she just said it's her first talk so this is gonna be very exciting um alex breck chris luke Colin, and he's the last lightning talk. And then we have one more speaker after that. So buckle up. Let's get started. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Everything's good. I'll take it away. Oh, you ready? Oh, yes. yes. Um, so sorry. Um, no <laughs> it just starts immediately. And for yep. some reason, I thought there was more delay. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, so my name is Rissa Jackson. I'm a full stack engineer at Loop, and I'm going to be talking about Git Interactive Rebase. My talk is: Is there any problem Git Interactive Rebase can't solve? Yes. Any questions? I hope you enjoyed the shortest Laracon talk that there's ever been. Feel free to reach out to me if you have more questions. Um, but you know what? I'm noticing that I have some more time on my clock. So maybe we can start talking about questions it can solve. And before we get into Git Interactive Rebase and talk about what it can solve, um, let's talk about what Rebase is. And I think for us to understand what Rebase is, it's really helpful to talk about what Merge is as well, because I feel like there's two camps. There's the Merge camp and the Rebase camp. And, um, you know, sometimes uh, they don't want to mix and match, but, you know, there's there's value to both of them and they work in different situations. Um, so here we have a very simple main branch um, has a couple of commits and then we have a feature branch, which is uh, branched off of commit two of the main branch. There's been some updates to main afterward. And I feel like a lot of like pictures of uh, branching, merging, uh, rebasing can be really complicated. And these are the slides, they're the pictures that I'm most excited about because I think they're fairly simple. Um, so let's say that we wanna bring our new work, our future work together with the main branch, we could merge it. Um, so what merge does is it preserves Git history. We still have this history of these two branches. Um, the feature branch is still based off of commit two of main. However, we have this brand new uh, merge commit where we bring the work together. And that can be a really nice way to see what the history is, but see how everything can be brought together. For a different solution, we have rebase. So 
what rebase does is it rewrites git history um it ends up with this um maybe more streamlined line from uh, main to feature where um, the feature is now based off the latest from main and uh, the git history is no longer there it's been rewritten but um, it might be very easy for certain people to follow that line of work and then you can see like these feature uh, commits have been put on the end and they're new commit hashes so this can be another solution that we can use um, both have their pros and cons um, but now that we have a basic foundation of Git, inter uh, Git Rebase, let's talk about what Git Interactive Rebase does. We understand that it rewrites history. Once you start a Git Interactive Rebase, you see all these commands that you can work with, which is really helpful to remind you how it works, but it can be a little overwhelming. I know when I look at this initially, I just, my eyes glaze over. I don't even know what I'm looking at. So let's uh, let's break this apart and start talking about the pieces of it. So the well, first one we're going to look at is drop. Um, basically, we don't want this commit, and we're going to get rid of it. Pretty simple concept. So if we did a git log, we we see we have some commits, but then we have this unnecessary commit. We don't need it anymore. So let's figure out how to get rid of that. So. Um, we're, the command we're going to run is git rebase dash i for interactive with the hash for the commit we want. Now, one thing that's important to note about this is this is not inclusive. This would only be the commits up to this point. However, if we add the squiggly line at the end, the tilde, it will become inclusive. So it will include this commit. So as you can see here with our interactive rebase, we have pick this commit and then we can do some work on it. Now, when you do a Git Interactive Rebase, there are multiple options for how to util for how to run it. Um, I think generally the, the like standard one is Vim, and that's the one that I'm comfortable with, so I'm gonna walk through that, but you could change it to a different editor, like your editor of choice. So the way that we handle this in Vim is we would put our cursor at the beginning of the word pick, and then we would type CW or change word. The great thing about this is it deletes the word pick for us, but it also puts us in insert mode. If you're familiar with DW, delete word, it works the same, but it will not put you in insert mode. Insert mode is necessary to make changes. So once we have gotten rid of that word, we can type in drop and then hit escape to get out of insert mode. And then we'll type colon WQ. Um, there are other ways to do this, but this is the most verbose. I really like to say it out loud to myself when I'm doing it, colon, write, quit, to make sure that I do it correctly. Sometimes people get confused on the order. Now, if I've made a mistake here, I can do a colon, quit, uh, colon, Q, and just get out of it. Um, but that will save our changes. And so when we do our git log again, we'll notice that unnecessary commit gone. No, no longer need to worry about it. Get history has been rewritten. Um, so let's look at some other things that we can do with this. So if you've ever typed up a commit message and it was the last one and you made a mistake, maybe you put a typo or something, you may be familiar with git commit dash dash amend. That can be a really great way to fix a commit error or commit message error. However, if you're trying to do this further back, like commits that are much older, you really can't use that. So that's where interactive rebase really shines. Um, we have two options for this. And first I'm going to talk about how they're similar, and then we'll talk about how they're different. So both reword and edit will allow you to edit the commit message. Um, so that, you know, like drop or that unnecessary commit I had before, if I wanted to change that to a more helpful message, I could use either of them. However, edit has one additional thing it can do. So you can change the git commit message, but you can also stop to amend the whole work. So you could change uh, your work in the files, delete files, add files. Just be really careful when you use this further back because you can definitely cause merge conflicts and that can be a problem. All right, now we're gonna get into some meatier and more interesting things we can do with Git Interactive Rebase. 
Um, so we have some powerful tools here, squash and fix up. These can be a little bit confusing and it can be um, unclear sometimes how to use them and how they're different. So let's just break this down and take a look at them. Again, first I'm gonna look at how they're similar. So both squash and fix up are going to take a child commit and a parent commit and they're gonna smush them together. And um, the difference is squash, when you smush them together, will have two commit messages for that one commit. So we'll look at what that looks like in a moment, but just try to keep that in mind. Fix up will get rid of one of those commit messages. It will get rid of the child commit message and only keep the parent one. So you will have one commit again, but only one commit message. Um, that one commit will have the same diff of both of those commits. It's pretty neat. So let's look at what a squash commit might look like. So here we have a commit hash. It's just for one commit, but we have two commit messages. Here is a Smith squash commit and here is another squash commit. Now we're gonna take a look a little more in depthly at fix up so we can really understand how this works and how we use it. Because there are definitely some pitfalls along the way. So we have two commits. Um, maybe we were doing some work and we saw a typo and we fixed it, made a commit for that called cleanup. And then a little bit later, maybe we saw that some formatting wasn't good. And so we made another cleanup a commit and we just named it cleanup again. Um, this is obviously okay, but it's a little bit messy. So let's see if we can make it cleaner. Um, people who are reviewing your PRs might really appreciate if you have a really clean commit history. So what we're going to do, same thing we did before, we're going to do get rebase dash I for interactive, and we're going to do this commit hash again. Now, uh, important things to note. One is that this hash is for the parent commit, the cleanup one. That's the one that came first. And then for us to have both of the commits, we add the squiggly line, the tilde. So it's including the parent commit. Now, one other thing I want to mention here is um, notice that there is this shortened version of the hash here, and then it matches the shortened, the beginning of this hash, the full one. You definitely could do a get rebase dash I with just these seven characters. Um, the important thing here is that you have at least four characters and that they are unique enough that they point to the right commit. So in a big code base with a lot of commit history, maybe, Maybe it would be harder to do only the first four characters or maybe even the first seven. So I typically am really just straightforward with, I do a git log and I capture the whole uh, git hash. It's easier for me, but please know that you have other options here. Okay, so we have our two commits, clean up and clean up again. All right, so again, Vim mode, we are going to do a CW to delete the word and put us in insert mode. We're going to type fix up and then we're going to escape and hit colon WQ to get out of there. Um, is it important where I put this fix up, which commit? It is very important. And we'll look at that in a little bit. Um, another thing I want to mention is, as you might notice here on this fix up line, it has an F only. So you could just put F here instead of fix up. That can be a shorter way to do it, but for this talk, I wanted to be a bit more verbose, so it's very clear what's happening. Okay, so after we've saved our work, what we have here is we have one commit. It has the parent commits message cleanup. And one other thing to note besides the fact that we just have the parent commits message is that we have a new commit hash because this is a new Git object. Something interesting that you can dig into if you're in here if you want to. All right, so now we're going to look at this um, from the beginning. Ooh, okay. I was wondering if that would happen. So let's just go over here. We're just going to do this live. I was wondering if that would happen, but that's okay. We roll with it. Get rebase dash I, I wanted you to get a chance to see what this looks like live, just so that you can see it all together. Screenshots don't show it all perfectly. So we have our two commits, right? We have clean up, clean up again. So I'm gonna put my cursor on the pick line, CW to delete that word and put myself in insert mode. And then we're gonna do fix up 
escape to get out of insert mode, colon WQ, and then we hit enter. So now we can do a git log again, and we see that we have just the one cleanup commit. You can also see another one from earlier. I had been messing around with this branch already, but this is our new one. Here's our new hash. Ooh, awesome. So let's get back to our slide. Okay, now we talked about what if we put the fix up on the parent commit? Like, is that fine? Can we get away with that? So this is what it looks like if you put fix up on the parent commit, you'll get an error that says cannot fix up without a previous commit. Now this kind of makes sense, right? Like we are taking a child commit and we're smushing it together with a parent commit. If you only have one commit, there's nothing to smush. It's just already there. It's just the one. So we have a way of handling this and this is our emergency exit in general. We have get rebase dash dash abort. Um, this will handle that situation and then we can start over and put the fix up on the child commit. This will also help us out if we get into some tricky rebase situations. Um, most situations this will take care of if you're concerned about what's happening. All right, so we've done all our work. We've changed Git history, we've cleaned things up. We're ready to push our work so that people can review our PR and see our amazing work. However, you do a Git push and it fails. Um, what's happening here is that often when you do a Git rebase or Git interactive rebase, um what you'll experience is that you've rewritten git history you can't just push it straight um straight forward so you need to force push it now force push can be a little bit scary especially with rebase because you know rebase has some tricky situations so where rebase really can go wrong is when you make some git history changes and you force push that to an important branch like main or develop or you're working on a feature branch with multiple people and then you're rewriting Git history and they have their local copies and there's all this shenanigans happening. So that can be potentially a bad situation and why people are a little sometimes hesitant to use Git rebase makes sense, but we have a safer way to do this. So if we do Git push dash dash force with lease, this is what I like to call like a Canadian push. It's a very gentle push. You're just like, um, I would please like to push this work, but if I shouldn't, if there's problems, if there's shenanigans upstream, I, I won't push it. It's fine. And so the nice thing is that this will not create those problems that rebase is infamous for. Um, so definitely keep that in your back pocket. That's generally the force push that I use because I like I like that safety measure. Okay. Um, wow. We made it to the end of our talk. We've learned so much about Git Interactive Rebase, hopefully. Um, if you have additional questions, uh, comments, feedback, or would like to talk to me more about that stuff, please feel free to reach out to me. I would love to talk more about it. Also, if you're interested in handstands or partner acrobatics, feel free to talk to me about that. I love those both. Um, and thank you everyone who helped me work on this. So many people. Uh, too many people to name. Uh, JPA at Loop helped me with these slides. Thanks so much. And that's it for me. Okay, thank you so much. That was great. I think uh, everybody was really enjoying that. Great job. All right, we're gonna move on now. Thank you. To Alex, let's see, let's bring him in. Hello. Hello, hello. All right. It's, uh, I can hear you, so I think we're ready for you to take it away. All righty. Let me share my screen really quick. Let's see here. All right. How are we looking? Are yep, we looking I, good? yep, you're good. Right on. All right. Let me set my timer really quick. I'm pulling an errand. need to make sure I don't go way over. Alrighty. Well, hello, folks. My name is Alex Six. I am the Apprenticeship Program Lead at Kirschbaum. I'm also a project lead over there and a developer. And whenever I say that, that I was a developer, or I am a developer, I always have to stop and chuckle a bit um, because I was not supposed to be a developer. For as long as I can remember, I was supposed to be an engineer. Think like building bridges, mixing chemicals, things like that. And up until right about the end of my first year of college, to which I went for engineering, I was supposed to be an engineer and realized really quickly it wasn't for me. 
long story short, I had someone who I'd known from before I went to college reach out to me and say, hey, I have a web firm in your hometown. Do you want to come work for me this summer? And I said, by all means, I would love that. And what followed were the most incredibly crazy 12 weeks of my life. I got to sit shoulder to shoulder with an incredible programmer and learn as much as you could possibly learn in 12 weeks about writing Laravel code. I think we're on Laravel 4.2 at that point. So I was not supposed to be a developer, but I am where I am because of mentorship. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about what it means to be a mentor, why be a mentor, and why people are mentors. And then I have five quick tips to being an effective mentor. So let's start with what it means to be a mentor. In my mind, it's actually pretty simple. Mentorship is the opportunity that we as mentors have to share our expertise and our experiences with others. Now, whether that other is a brand new junior just coming into the programming field or say a senior developer doing, I don't know, iOS development, and they want to move into web development with Laravel, we get the opportunity to share all the experiences that we've had up until this point to give them a leg up to make their transition into web tech or into Laravel or technology as a whole so much easier. So down there at the bottom of the slide, I have two questions in italics and YouTube live chat and Discord, I haven't forgotten about y'all. I want you to answer these for me. Have you ever had a mentorship experience? And if you have, what did it mean to you? I'm very curious to see your answers. While you're typing those, let's go ahead and talk about why you would become a mentor. So I've worked with dozens of mentors over the past couple of years, and I always love to ask this question because it, their answer seems to almost always fall into one of these three buckets. So first, it's to give back to the community. Second, it's to help your coworkers or any new employees on board, either to the company, to new technologies, new projects. We actually do that at Kirschbaum. Every new hire gets a, an onboarding mentor, and it's a fantastic way to ease into things and get your feet under you. And third, and this is where I fall, because someone did it for me. I was mentored into this amazing community and the amazing life that I have now as a developer. And now it's my turn to turn around and do that for other people. So live stream chat and Discord, you're back on deck again. If you are a mentor, what is your reason for being a mentor? Or if you want to be a mentor, what is your reason? Again, I'm curious to see if it falls in one of these three buckets. And while you're doing that, let's move quickly into the five tips that I have for becoming an effective mentor. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but these are five of my favorites. And I think number one is far and away the most important. Tip number one, build the relationship. This is so important. It's the foundation of everything else in a mentorship relationship because mentorship relationships are built on trust. We as the mentor have to trust our mentee and especially our mentee has to trust us as a mentor. However, it's really difficult to trust people that you don't have a relationship with. Personally, I am much more likely to take criticism and advice and information from my close family and friends than I am from the guy standing in line next to me at Starbucks, right? And I feel like most of us are the same way. You have to have that relationship in order to build trust. And people ask me all the time, if relationships are such a key piece of mentorship, how do we do that? What is the best way to start building a relationship and building it early? My answer is almost always, start by scheduling a consistent time with your mentee. That goes for any mentorship relationship, regardless of relationship or not. However, the first time, two times you meet, take time to get to know your mentee. What do they like? What do they not like? What are they passionate about? What is really cool to them in programming? What's the coolest thing they've ever coded before? What are their hopes and dreams? Anything you can get out of that, those first two, one or two meetings is going to be so important when you're building this relationship. So tip number one, the most important, build the relationship. Tip number two is to practice empathy. I'm a firm believer that we need a little more of this in general in the dev world, but especially between a mentor and a mentee, we as mentors have to practice empathy. I think it's really easy for a lot of us to forget that we were beginners at 1.2, right? We write things like public function, whatever, or PHP artisan, make model, whatever, so many times over the course of a project, it just becomes trivial as it should, right? Practice makes perfect, or so they say. But for somebody new, again, whether they're just coming into tech or they're coming over from a different tech industry, those things may not be as clear cut. 
And so it's important for us as mentors to take a step back and walk in our mentee's shoes, see the world through their eyes. And again, the only way we could do this is by having built a relationship in the first place. Two ways we can affirm, or two ways we can practice empathy are to affirm frustrations and celebrate victories. We'll come back to the celebrate victories in a little bit, but I want to talk specifically about affirming frustrations first. There is nothing that will stop a mentee in their tracks more quickly than being frustrated and alone. Our job as mentors is to make sure that we affirm the fact that our mentee is frustrated and struggling with something, say the service container. I know that's one that trips up a lot of people. And we have to go to them and say, hey, your frustration is valid. This is a hard thing. Programming is a hard thing. But you know what? I've got some resources. I have some advice. Let's figure out the answer together. That way, the mentee is not by themselves. They still have to struggle through and learn how to fix things. But we as the mentor are walking with them to help them fix the problem. So tip number two, practice empathy. Tip number three is to level up with pair programming. I love pair programming. It's probably one of my favorite things you can do as a developer. And I really do think it's the best way to build understanding of technical topics or complex sections of code. A big shout out to the folks over at Tuple. I love Tuple for pair programming, especially since Kirschbaum is a remote company and I work with remote mentees. Tuple is amazing. If you haven't checked it out, check it out. There's my plug. Tuple, you can send me money, uh, send me money later. But I think pair programming to me in a mentorship relationship is so strong because we can use it to build our mentees' confidence. I'll talk about that a little more in a second, but I do want to go into this thing I have highlighted down here as the last bullet, the gradual release of responsibility. So I brought this into pair programming because my wife, who's a teacher, was talking about this, this model uh, that, she, that she learned out in all of her education courses and used in all of her classroom uh, experience. The idea behind gradual release of responsibility is that as the class is learning something, you gradually release the responsibility of being able to do that thing to them over a set span of time. And in education, that looks like these three steps. I do, we do, you do. So I do, I'm you know, writing a, a math problem on the board and I'm saying, okay, class, here's how I'd work out two times two. And I'm talking through my thought process, but I'm also doing the problem in front of them. Then we do. I gradually release some responsibility to the class and I say, okay, class, I'm going to start this problem, but now you have to finish it. Or, okay, class, I'm up here and I'm going to write whatever you tell me to write. Right or wrong, we're going to do it together. And then once we've gotten through that, the next and last step is you do. And you may remember this from your time being in a classroom. It's when the teacher steps back and says, okay, I'm here if you have any questions or do you have any problems, but now it's your turn you do this problem. What is two times two? So I brought that into programming. I actually split out the middle step into two separate steps, but by all means, feel free to squish them back together if you would. But I start with I talk, I type. Here, it's just like the I do step. I have my hands on the keyboard and I'm talking through the thought process of whatever task we're working on, say, making a controller method. The, the mentee's entire job here is to sit back and absorb as much as they can. Then I still continue talking in the second step, but I actually pass control of the keyboard over to my mentee. And that's so they can start getting hands on the keyboard and working their muscle memory. I want them to type dollar sign variable name or public function index over and over and over again as we're going through this task. I'm still talking though, and I'm telling them what to type so they don't have to focus on the logical higher, higher level of it. I just want them to be familiar with how to actually type these things out. Then we flip the roles. Then I say, okay, I'm going to type and I'm going to type whatever you say, but you need to tell me what to do. And this is where the magic happens because we can build our mentees confidence right here because we can push them out to the edge and really force them to dig in and try to figure the problem out. But because we are the ones typing, there's a safety net there. If something goes wrong, if, an, uh, if there's an error in my editor or at runtime, we bump into a bug. If the mentee can't figure it out, they're not alone. Remember, the number one thing that can stop a mentee in their tracks is being frustrated and alone. But if they're talking and I'm typing, I'm here to help them get out of the bug they found themselves in. And then once we've gotten through that section, we have gradually released this responsibility of how to write a controller, or a, a controller method, a controller endpoint, 
to our mentee. Now it's you talk, you type. So I sit back, I'm here for questions, I'm here for comments, concerns, whatever it might be, but mentee, it's now your turn. Let's, let's see what you know. I think pair programming is incredibly powerful. And if you use the gradual release of responsibility model, I think you can get even further and dig in even deeper when you're pair programming. So tip number three, lean into pair programming. Tip number four is encourage your mentee to set concrete goals. Concrete goals have a defined end and a tangible output. And those parts are very important. When someone is coming into, let's say the Laravel world, brand new, it can look like a lot. There can, they can look around and realize, wow, there's a lot to learn here that I just don't know right now. And that can be very disorienting. So having concrete goals set gives them a path to follow. And every time they complete one of those concrete goals, it puts a mile marker in the ground saying, I have been here and I have done this. The important part is that tangible output. Because when you have tangible output associated with these goals, your mentee can look back at the trail they've blazed from not knowing anything to where they are now and see not only have, you, have they covered all of these different topics throughout their goals, <clears throat> but they can look back and see proof that they've covered those things because of the tangible output. The one thing I'd recommend here is make sure your mentee is choosing reasonable goals, but if they choose something that's a little beyond where they're at, just shelve it for later. Don't forget about it, write it down, make note of it. Because all of these goals are important in pushing them forward. And this is where the celebration comes in from earlier. Whenever our mentee reaches a goal, we have to celebrate. Positive reinforcement is so powerful. And each time our mentee meets a goal, they are steps closer to being a developer, transitioning into web development, getting their first job, whatever it might be. Every milestone is important. So tip number four, encourage your mentee to set concrete goals. Tip number five, let your mentee lead. This is the pinnacle of mentorship. Your mentee should be the one driving the mentorship process because they know better than we ever will as mentors what their final goal is. They can tell us over and over and over again, but at the end of the day, they know best. So it's our job to help however we can. Now that said, since it's out of our control, we have to be able to embrace fluidity. If things change, if our mentee needs a little extra help on the service container or takes half the time that they thought they would on controller methods, that's great. We have to be able to adapt and help them with wherever they're at. The important part here, and I've said it a couple times before, but we're putting a bullet point. We as mentors should prefer advice and experience instead of just giving out answers and solutions. Nobody's gonna learn something if we just give them all the answers. However, going back to the empathy, empathy slide, if we're there to walk with our mentee and give them advice and experience and show them resources and walk all the way to their goal with them, that's how they're gonna learn that's how a mentee is going to feel confident. So tip number five, let your mentee lead. As a reminder, I was not supposed to be a developer. However, a mentor saw something in me and changed my life forever. I love what I do. I love being a programmer. I love the Laravel community. I love my job. And I love that now I have the chance to bring people into this amazing community like my mentor did for me. And I'm really excited because I actually get to be a pretty direct part of Kirschbaum's apprenticeship program. We had an ad earlier on in the day, if you saw it. If you are interested in applying for this program, I just want to reach out one more time and say, there's the link. Hit us up. We would love to hear from you. Before I finish out, I would like to show you a picture of my adorable Corgi Leia, but also give some thank yous. Um, I want to give a special thanks to Katrina, Melody, and Justin. Thank you so much for sharing your menteeship experiences with me. And for helping me shape this talk and really dig into the fundamentals of being a mentor. And also a huge thank you to my incredible teammates at Kirschbaum who absolutely inundated me with tips and tricks that they've learned from their time being mentors as well. Thank you for making it immensely difficult to narrow this down to just five. And you live chat, thank you for being here. I wanna hear from you, whether you're live chat now or it's on in the future, you're watching the recording. Do you agree with me? Do you disagree? Do you have thoughts or comments? Have you had a mentorship experience that was really impactful to you? I would love to hear it. My Twitter handle, Twitter handle is down there in the footer at Alexander6 underscore. The underscore is important. Or if you'd rather chat with me live, I go live every Monday and Thursday uh, from 8 to 11 Eastern-ish at twitch.tv slash Alexander6 underscore. Again, thank you all so much for being here. 
and enjoy the rest of your Laracon online. Awesome. Thank you. That was great. Yeah. Thank you. Nice job. Got to check out the Twitch. Yeah. I didn't even know yeah, that. Got, you know, got to pitch it, right? <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. And we're moving. Hello. Hello. Yes. Nice event you're running again, Ayn. Thank you so <laughs> much. Thanks for being a part of it again. We're almost yeah, to uh, almost to 1,500 likes. So get those likes in, everybody. It's amazing. It's unbelievable how many likes. Um, nice. All right. Well, I'm going to let you take it away. Okay. Hello, Laracon people. Let me get some things here set up and share my screen. And then we can get the show started. I want to share desk, desktop number one. Yes. And like Kaneko says, uh, can you see my screen? I hope you do. Otherwise, the voice of God, Ian, will uh, just just tell me. I hope that you have uh, are enjoying uh, the conference as much as I do. Welcome to my talk. I shall... Uh, say or define this only once. Uh, I'm Freek. I'm one of the developers at Spassi. Uh, my Twitter handle is Freek Merze. I got a blog, Freek.dev, where I talk about Laravel and PHP development. Um, I've made uh, three SaaSes together with uh, my team. Uh, Mailcoach.app is, dare I say it, a better MailChimp. Odir is an uptime monitor that can do a lot of checks, and FlareUp is the best exception tracker for Laravel applications. Now, before heading into the talk, I want to say a few words about our open source efforts. We currently have 300 packages on packages, or more than 300. Uh, they've been downloaded for 360 million times and they are being downloaded for 20 million times. And this is quite nice for a small team like ours. You can find a list of everything that we've done on uh, our company website. We have an open source section there and I'm pretty sure there's something there for your next project. Those packages, they are not entirely free. There's a special license on them called Postcardware, which means that if you use any of our packages, you are required to send us a postcard. We get postcards every day, and we also share them on our virtual postcard wall that you also find on our company website. Okay, that being said, let's talk about data. At SPASI, we mainly work on very big projects. And those projects, they take a lot of time to develop, uh, half a year, sometimes uh, over a year. And these projects, they mostly have complex data. We have lots of models. Uh, those models have lots of properties and relations. And Laravel is, of course, our tool of choice, but we saw that in a lot of data structures that we define uh, the same uh, kind of things multiple times. Say, for instance, form requests. We see a list of attributes in there that we also see in API resources and that we also see in our TypeScript definitions when we are using something like inertia. And we thought, hey, we want to get rid of this duplication. So we made uh, something that we often do when uh, we see a problem. Uh, we made the package. And that package is called Laravel Data. And it allows you to create powerful data objects. And a data object is a single definition that can be used for multiple purposes. This package was mostly created by my colleague Ruben van Asse, who did an awesome job on this. And we use that package for all our own projects. And it also has already 250,000 downloads. So it's, uh, it's battle tested. And in this talk, I want to show you a simple example and then a little bit of real world usage in Flare. So let's code a little bit. Um, I've created a little application here, the Laravel uh, context with some people that uh, you might know. And it's a very simple application. We just have a list. And if I edit uh, Ion, 
uh, then you can see that we have a um, detailed page as well. So this is a contact. Uh, let's go to the application that powers uh, this, uh, this little website. And you can see that we use um, inertia here. And if we take a look at the uh, update method, then you can see this request here. And we have uh, our rules. And you can see the list of, um, of attributes here. It's only a few here, but imagine that in a big project that you have like more here, maybe 20, 30 or something, but I want to keep the example very simple. Um, in this application, let me do a little bit of window management here. There's also an API. So if I go to API here, then, then we see the JSON representation and we also have a list here. Let's head back. That uh, API is um, being run by this little controller, and we use a contact tree source here. And guess what? We also see those attributes here. And let's go to our front end. So I'm using React here. And we're not using uh, the full power of TypeScript here, but we're using something like JS Docs, uh, which can be used uh, to read defined types here. And you can see that we have in my defined type here, the, which I manually created, we have the same list of attributes here. So we have it here three times. Why do we have uh, the, those types on the front end? Uh, we have them so that we can let our ID understand uh, which kind of properties there are on here. Um, okay, let's replace all of this by a single object. And I've already installed Laravel data in this project. And I'm going to create a new directory data where I'm going to create these uh, objects. And of course, you can save them, uh, these data objects, wherever you want. And I'm going to call this one uh, contact data. And if everything's good, I've already got this in my clipboard, so you don't see me type. And you can see that I, I have got the same uh, attributes here. Okay, now let's start using this data object. So I'm going to go to the context controller. And instead of the request, I'm going to use my contact data. And I'm going to use uh, data here. And instead of request validated, I'm going to give uh, the uh, eloquent update method uh, the array representation of this uh, data object. And with any luck, uh, this should still work. So I can save here and I'm, I've got true here, but let's see how validation works in this case. So in the regular uh, request, let me go to the request. You can see that we have an email validation here going on. So let's see if that uh, still works. And you can see that I could save an email which isn't actually an email. How can we put these rules on the data object? Well, very simple. On a data object, you also can have a rules function. It should be static in this case. And if I try to save this now, then you can see that we need to save a valid email address. But this is like a very um, verbose way of doing this. Um, when you're working with data objects, Required isn't even necessary because it is inferred because these uh, properties on the data object are inferred. If you want to have something optional, you have to make the property optional itself. So you don't need to have these required if you're using rules, but there's even a shorter way of adding um, uh, validation. So what you can simply do, if you say this, sh this should be an email address, is you can type here an annotation rule and here you can give it any rules that uh, that you want. So uh, I want to have the email rule being applied here. So if I save now, uh, yeah, we have uh, to be a valid email address. Let's do it away here for a little bit so I can save it. So you see that this this actually this actually works. This email uh, rule is actually being uh, being used. Okay, let's uh, use the same object in our API. So here I can also use contact data and I have uh, the collection here. 
I can also pass it a collection of models and probably in a real project, you are going to paginate this, but let's keep things simple. And here, uh, instead of using the contact resource, we can also use uh, contact data. We can use the from methods and pass it a model. And this should also just uh, still work. So let's try our API here. And it seems to work. And let's uh, change our contact data a little bit to see if the changes are reflected here. So if I remove name here, then you can see uh, name isn't in our API anymore. So we use the very same definition here. OK, let's go to the, uh, the TypeScript here. So this is what I wrote myself. Let's, let's just remove that. And here I'm going to. Um, call an artisan command that's provided by the package and it's called uh, TypeScript transform, which will uh, transform all of my data objects to uh, TypeScript. And if I do this the first time, then you see uh, that we have uh, zero types that we have, um, that we have transformed. Why is that? Uh, that's why it's because we didn't add another annotation here. Here, we should also uh, say that um, we want to have like a TypeScript uh, variant of this. And if I do uh, TypeScript transform now, and I go back to my generated stuff, then you can see that we generated the TypeScript definitions for this. We even put it a little bit in a namespace here. So if I uh, use it here as well, uh, up, data, contact data, then my IDE should still know which properties there are. So instead of three different uh, definitions that we need to manually maintain, we now have one single definition of what contact data now is. And uh, I'm using it now to replace all three instances of, uh, of where we used uh, Laravel and TypeScript objects before. But of course, you shouldn't always go all in. The, all in. There are other possibilities as well. Let me show you a little bit of real world uh, usage of this. And for this, I'm going to uh, show you a little bit of uh, redesign of Flare that we're working on. This is the um, uh, project uh, screen. Oh, and this shouldn't be there. Um, we have here a controller, the create uh, project uh, controller. And you can see that it uh, gets uh, the create project data here. So this controller is invoked whenever we save uh, this uh, little form here. And you can see in project data itself, it has uh, a little bit more uh, properties. You can see that we have uh, more complex uh, attributes as well. This is, uh, this is an enum. And you can see that um, we get it in this controller. So if uh, everything is correct, this controller will be executed. And we can pass the entire data object to the execute method of the action that will actually control uh, the project. And I'm not going to explain actions in full. They are uh, just classes that allow you to do something. And by passing in a, uh, or by letting it accept a data object, it, uh, it's uh, easily testable for us because uh, data objects are very easily constructed. While if you would pass here a request that wouldn't be um, uh, constructed in tests that easily because it's dependent on HTTP. Now, let me show you another uh, example, the project index view um, controller. That's the one I'm using. So this is the controller that builds up this entire view. And you can see that we have different kinds of information on, on here. We have project invitations, we have the projects themselves, and we have uh, all of the groups of uh, the project. So um, here we have the Flare group, and here we have a GitHub uh, group. Now, how do we pass information from our backend to the frontend? Well, for that, we also use data objects. Here you can see that we render a view. And we have a view model here, which is an encapsulation of everything that we want to pass to this view. 
if I open up that view, then you can see that it's also a data uh, object and the data object accepts other data objects. So project data is everything that a, uh, all the attributes that a project has. And you can see that we have a lot of, uh, of things uh, here. So you can have nested data objects as well. If I go to the generated uh, TypeScript definition of this, and I'm going to copy this, uh, generated TypeScript definitions and search for this, then you can see that uh, we generated the same structure here. So we have that uh, project index view model, which also uses the generated uh, project data here with also all of these properties. But all of this code was just generated. And by having like a single definition on the backend, we know for certain that uh, what we sent in the backend is exactly what the front end receives because they, they use the same definitions. And this is yeah, a big plus of using a data object. Let me go back uh, to the slides. So, it's only a, um, a lightning talk that I can give. The package can actually do a lot more. But uh, the basic thing is that it can do uh, Laravel data is that it can um, uh, give you rich data objects, which can allow you to define a structure only once. It can be used to replace API resources and form requests. And it can also generate TypeScript definitions. It also can do a lot, which I haven't uh, touched upon. Uh, there's support for optional properties. You can lazy load properties. You can create data objects from incoming requests, from JSON, from other objects. It is infinitely uh, configurable. And then there's still a lot more that I don't have time to mention. I only want to give like a short introduction in this talk. And if you're interested in this, uh, you will find that we've written extensive documentation about this on our documentation site. So do uh, check that out. You can use Laravel data for everything like I've uh, shown you in the first simple example, or you can just only use it for some smallish, uh, some smallish parts. Don't just discard the Laravel defaults. Uh, form requests are still very good. API uh, resources are uh, wonderful as well. Um, don't just um, use this because uh, I mentioned it, uh, heat Christoph's uh, warning and um, make your own informed choices about this. Uh, talk with your team where you could use it and where it uh, could fit a project uh, really well. Now, that is the talk itself, but I have one more very small thing and that is that we uh, are running a Laravel promo on everything that Spassi has. We don't only um, create open source projects, but we have uh, paid products as well, which yeah, pay all of our bills. And there's a 20% discount uh, for a couple of days on everything that we have. So be sure to take a look there. Um, that's everything uh, from me. I hope that you enjoy uh, the rest of the conference. I know I certainly will. And that's it for me. Back over to you, Ayn. Thank you again. That's uh, Those are, I didn't even, there's a new package. Every time you're here, it's a new package I haven't seen before. It's unbelievable. So that one's very interesting to me. So I will be checking out this uh, talk again, actually, uh, after the event when I can fully focus on it. But great job. Cool, man. Thanks. Okay, let's get Chris in here. So, there he is. Hey. Hello. Okay. I got to close the browser because you're still talking 30 seconds ago. Uh, <laughs> I think that has messed up a few people here. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to let you take it away. All right. I have to do a screen share button and yes. then this thing. Share I'll let it. you know. It looks good. I can see okay. it. Uh, oh, I the can plus. see the whole the editing UI of it. Yeah, know. yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, okay. All right, I'm good to go. Yep. Cool. All right. All right, let's talk about remote development. Hopefully that feels local. Uh, the search for the perfect development environment. In other words, remote development environment. 
so my name is Chris. I work at Fly.io, which deploys applications close to your users. It's Heroku-ish. Um, I also run Chipper CI, which is continuous integration specifically for Laravel. And you can find me at on Twitter at Fiddleford. Okay, so back in 2011, 11 years ago, I had a MacBook Air, which was my favorite laptop. It still is. It was 11 inches, right? They had a, a great keyboard. It's super good to travel with because it was super small, but it had a super small disk drive. And even for like 11 years ago, the, the CPU and RAM was, was kind of bad, right? It was a MacBook Air. Um, so as a result of that, I tried out my first stab at remote development, but back then that was really like throwing a Linux server under your desk and, uh, doing some network stuff. And I had no idea what I was doing. So I don't even remember what network stuff I did and it kind of worked, but it was a little bit kludgy. Uh, so I kind of moved on after that and used like Vagrant and I had an iMac instead of a MacBook Air. So that was okay. And, you know, it was all good. Uh, 11 years later, I just got a new job at Fly like three months ago ish. And I got my second ever MacBook Air, but of course it's a whole different computer, right? It has the M2 chip, um, a big disk drive. It's really fast. I don't have any of the concerns of my 2011 MacBook Air, but I have new and better concerns. Uh, like I don't want dependency hell on my laptop. Uh, I tend to jump around a lot of projects with different PHP versions, different MySQL versions and all that good stuff. And managing that kind of sucks. Um, my go-to has always been Docker, but Docker, on Windows and Mac is slow because it runs in a virtual machine. So you have another layer of stuff um, and it's just not great. So on this laptop, which I got, I've been trying to install the least amount of stuff as possible. And because I work at a company that does servery stuff, I thought maybe there's an opportunity to make a remote development environment. And uh, I did something. So um, I work at Fly.io. Fly.io is Heroku-ish. They make it pretty easy to run an application on their app servers globally around the world. They have you package your application up as a Docker image, but they don't run Docker on their servers at all. Instead, they take a Docker image and they convert it to an actual virtual machine and run that on their servers. And they use um, the same technology that Lambda uses on AWS for their serverless stuff, uh, Firecracker is called. So uh, they have a really neat setup. A little bit more about Fly.io, uh, they are global, right? So they have regions all around the world. You can distribute your application easily to regions all around the world, uh, which also means for like a local, or I'm sorry, remote development environment, uh, you can find a region super close to you. So it would actually be fast to develop on. So it's easy to use. They have like a few commands you can get up and running, especially for well-supported frameworks. Well, Laravel is one of those, which is why I was hired. Uh, so it's really easy with just a few commands to get up and running with a Laravel application on Fly. It's also fast because they have their own servers. They rent their own servers in those regions across the world. They're not using AWS or anything like that. And they have a great free tier. So this is kind of like the first thing I noticed when I was thinking about remote development environments. Now, Fly also has this thing called machines. Machines is the next iteration of their application platform where they're going to have people spin up new applications on. It's available for use right now, but it's not like the main thing just yet. But you can use it. Okay, so there's a few other things, a few puzzle pieces getting into place that let me do a development environments with machines. One is there's an API I can use to spin up an application and, a, and the virtual machines within that application. Two, they can stop when your application exits. So if your application exits with a non-error status code, a code of zero, then the fly machine stops and you are not charged any longer for that compute time, right? So your server is not running, so you're not getting charged for it. Kind of like just turning off an EC2 server on AWS. Um, so that's really cool. Now, Fly machines can start really quickly too, because it's just like Lambda, they're using the same technology. A new machine, a virtual machine will start back up in just a few milliseconds and it can wake up from network access. So if I send a web request or an SSH connection or something, the machine will just wake up and it's like, you know, it always takes a few milliseconds. So you barely even notice that there's a cold boot time. Okay, next puzzle piece that fell into place, uh, this guy named Amos works at Fly. He's a Rust developer, and he did the development of the Fly proxy layer, which proxies web requests all around the world in Fly's network. He wrote an article about remote development on Fly, right? That seems pretty handy. He wrote about um, a few things, but the most interesting thing is that he wrote a little Rust program, and what it does is it listens to see if there's any active SSH connections. And if there's not an active SSH connection, it has a countdown, so like, you know, a minute or something like that, and then turns the machine off. And um, you know it exits with a status code of zero. So that turns the machine off on Fly's infrastructure. So in other words, if you're not actively hacking on your development environment, then it spins down and you're not paid for that time or you're not paying for that time. 
uh, assuming you're out of the free tier. If you're in the free tier, it doesn't really matter, but you know, this is still nice. Okay, so he uses Vim. He SSHs in, uses Vim and all that stuff, and I don't develop using Vim. I don't like that. I want to use my own editor on my own computer. I don't want any fancy network setup, right? So I don't want to use like JetBrains tools that have you install uh, their gateway program or VS Code in the browser or VS Code with their SSH agent. I don't want to deal with any of that. Uh, I also want my Git and my tooling to be local to my computer because it's nice and fast there. Uh, so for example, Git being locally is also really nice because I can just do Git push origin main, whatever I want to. I don't have to worry about SSH keys being on the remote server so that they can talk to GitHub and that kind of stuff. Uh, I also want my compute to be remote, right? This is the whole point. I don't want my PHP to be local. I want whatever version of PHP and my SQL and whatever I need to be the correct version on the remote server. And if I have projects, multiple projects that run different versions, I want that to be all set up for me. Okay, so we almost have all of that stuff. We can almost uh, accomplish that on fly, but I still need file syncing and network forwarding. So file syncing is uh, because my server, um, sorry, my code files are local on my machine and I want them to sync quickly to the remote machine whenever I make changes, because I want the source of truth to be on my local machine, uh, which is like a personal preference thing, right? It's like my code editor is local, my Git is local, my code is local. I want all of that set up like that. Um, and network forwarding. So I don't want my development machine to be available uh, to anyone else except for myself. So instead of you know having a server that's up and running and anyone can reach it in their browser, I want it to be specific to me. Uh, Fly actually IO does actually have this concept of a VPN. You can VPN into their private network. Uh, but I also can just set up network forwarding, which is uh, a simple thing where it just forwards like localhost 48,000 to something inside the machine and only I can access it. Okay, so how do I do that? Mutagen. Mutagen is a tool that does file syncing and network forwarding, the two things I exactly want and need. Mutagen, um, you might have heard before if you paid attention to Docker Desktop, like Docker on Mac and Docker on Windows, because at one point they used this to help speed up file synchronization between your containers and, um, or between your local computer, your host machine, and the stuff that's running in your containers. And they did that because it was slow to share files inside of the virtual machine that Docker ran inside of. Okay, so the building blocks are kind of in place here. There's Fly, which is global, right? There's a region close to me. It's easy to use, the servers are fast, the free tier is good. There's Fly Machines that has an API, so I can programmatically spin up machines. It can stop, uh, so I'm not charged for it. It can quickly start on network access. And then mutagen, right? File syncing and network forwarding. I have all these puzzle pieces. So I put all these puzzle pieces together in this tool I'm going to call Vessel, or am calling Vessel. Uh, Vessel is also the name of a thing I used to have, or still have, it's around, uh, that did local Docker-based development environments. But Laravel Sale exists now, and I don't need to maintain that, which is awesome. Um, less stuff is good. So Vessel is the name for this project. I'm just kind of stealing that name and using it in this new project. So if you go to vessel.fly.dev, you'll get forwarded to this GitHub page, which is the Vessel CLI tool, which does all the fancy stuff for you, wrapping up all these tools, calling API, uh, Fly's API, and making some machines for you, and all that good stuff. So the only thing you need to do is have a Fly account. So you install Fly, the CLI tool, sign up, uh, which is also done in the command line there, and you authenticate so you're logged in, essentially. And then you can install Vessel, which is almost the exact same thing. It's just a curl request to the install script that is provided by Vessel here. Pipe it into shell, uh, and it'll install Vessel, in, uh, which is just a single binary because it's built in Golang. Um, and it installs that in your computer. It tells you how to add that to the path, so you can just run Vessel commands and all that good stuff. So they're installed and ready to go. Uh, and then you can use Vessel auth, which is a simple command. All it's doing is grabbing the API token from Fly that you set up when you signed up for Fly. And we can kind of start to see um, what this looks like now. This is a uh, brand new Laravel application. Just I just changed the homepage a little bit, and we're going to use this to see what it looks like. I'm not doing live coding. Uh, I have a video, and I'm going to probably mess up the timing of which I talk over parts of the video because it goes too fast at some points, but such is life. OK, we're going to call a vessel init. That's going to create a development environment. I'm going to name it Laracon something 2022. I'm going to select a base image. So remember, it uses Docker to package up your application. I have a few out of the box. 8.1 is what you selected here. You can define your own, which is a fancy thing if you have your own image. Um, it's in registered. It created the development environment. It's adding some configuration to my SSH config file so that Mutagen can sync files and forward and all that good stuff. Um, Mutagen is ready. It would install it if it wasn't, uh, but I already have it, so it's ready. And now it's waiting for the environment to be available over the network. Now we're good to go. We can run vessel start. So I'm in a new tab, vessel start. That is going to be a long running process because I like uh, having to hit control C to cancel it because that reminds me that I have a syncing thing in, in, pro in process. Um, and we can go back to this tab and we can do stuff. 
So vessel dash, vessel dash dash composer install is going to run composer install against the remote's machine. So it's doing a one-off command inside of the virtual machine. Uh, I do that because I don't sync the node modules directory or the vendor directory because that's kind of a waste of bandwidth. So we can just run those um, steps and that gets run in the server and you need to do that because the vendor directory isn't on the server, it's not synced. Um, okay, you saw I just ran vessel open, I hope, and that opened localhost port 8000, which is actually running against the remote server. So we're looking at a website hosted on a remote server, but it feels local, A, because it says localhost, but B, because it was really quick. Um, 30 to 40 milliseconds is the timing that I'm getting for a region that was selected for me. This will select the closest region to you automatically, which for me was Dallas, because I live in San Antonio. Uh, so 30 to 40 milliseconds, uh, anything under 100 milliseconds, it feels basically instant to humans. So it's kind of the metric I go by. Um, and this is 30 to 40 milliseconds. And if it was truly local, it would be like 10 milliseconds. So you know, it's, it's adding a little bit of time, of course, because there's a network time and a delay there, but it's pretty minor. It's really fast. OK, so Fly has regions uh, mostly everywhere-ish. So uh, there's going to be more in South America. There's going to be some coming to Africa. There's a lot in the US and Europe and Asia and the one in Australia. I'm sorry, Russia and China. You're probably not getting a region, as far as I know. Um, but there's going to be a region close to you, is the point of this slide. Customization. So a vessel.yaml file gets created when you do that vessel init step. And you can customize some stuff. The remote stuff there is just connection details, so it, can, it knows where to connect to. But the forwarding is interesting because you can add uh, or change the forwarding. So you can do a different port that's not 8,000. You can add extra ports, like if your environment runs MySQL or something and you want to locally connect to it. Uh, and then you can ignore more or less directories. Like maybe you want the vendor directory synced and don't want to have to do that composer install stuff, then you know get rid of that. Or you can add other things for it to ignore. And there's more options coming soon as I add more features to this thing. Um, and you can use any Docker image. So uh, the Docker images I showed you were for PHP 8.1 and 8.0, eventually 8.2. And all they basically do is extend this base image, uh, the vessel app base image. That vessel app base Docker image has SSH installed into it in, the, in that Rust program that will shut the machine down when it's idle. And on top of that, you can make your own Docker image and it just has whatever you need in it, right? PHP, Nginx, whatever in my case. Uh, all right, so I like this a lot. It's fast. It's not running 24 7, so I'm not getting charged. It will wake up a network access really quickly, so I don't have to think about API calls to like start it up or anything. SSH is available, so I can actually run the vessel SSH command to SSH into it. Um, SSH is also just there, so I can run SSH, and if I know the host name of the machine, then I can just SSH into it. Uh, it's customizable and extendable, like I just saw, so you can customize that vessel YAML file. You can use your own Docker image, so put in whatever you want and whatever you need. Um, and there's a few annoying things, like you have to have the fly command line tool installed because it uses some stuff to make API calls. There's no data persistence yet. They're completely ephemeral, which I kind of think is a feature and not a bug, but I know that's going to annoy some people. Um, so there's no data persistence. If your machine shuts down, goes to idle, and then spins back up, it's starting from a blank slate. So you have to run the composer install and stuff like that. And uh, you may want a database or Redis or something, and there's kind of you're kind of on your own for that right now. Uh, which is something I hope to change. It won't be too much of a lift to add like extra services that you can run also. I generally just use SQLite because it's a file, right? It's locally, it syncs locally to me and syncs into the uh, remote server. And um, it's great, right? SQLite is file-based, so I don't have to care about making network calls to other services. So I use that for as long as I can possibly get away with. Uh, you can see some issues, open issues on the right. I actually closed, I think, three out of these four. Like I already did them, and there's some more there now. Um, but you know, I have I have stuff I plan on doing to make this better. Uh, all right, so you can go to vessel.fly.dev right now. Um, give me feedback, try it out, add some issues, find me on Twitter and yell at me there, whatever you want. That is it. Awesome, great job as always. Thanks. Kept it under the wire and everything, perfect. <laughs> All right. No live coding. Thanks. Can't do that. <laughs> I thought no live coding. It. That's the key. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. All right. Let's see here. Hello. Hello. All right. You're live. You're on. Howdy, who? Very exciting. Great. Let me get sharing. Looks good. OK. Yep. Let's do it. OK. Uh, this is valid variants of validating validation. 
look, I've got 15 minutes and so much content. So I'm just going to jump straight in and we can catch up after. Uh, but what on earth do I mean by validating validation? I'm talking about uh, testing the validation and controller logic in your applications. We do this all the time. And in my opinion, there are three ways to do it. Uh, that is the rule snapshot, the shared array, the request factory. Now, if those terms mean nothing to you at the moment, I don't need to panic. In fact, I'm, I'm sort of banking on it because that's the entire point of the talk. But by the end of the talk, not only should you know what each of these approaches are, you'll know the pros and cons. So you can discuss with your team, or if you're a one-man team, discuss with yourself uh, which approach is best for you when it comes to testing validation and controller logic. Obviously, if I'm going to show this off, I need a demo application. And I thought I'd take a break from ParrotCon this time, not that the parrots are too happy about it. But we have this awesome movie website where we have all of the classics here uh, that you watched as kids. And if there's something missing, we can add a new movie. Let's stick with the Vs. V4 Vendetta seems like a good idea. We'll upload the movie poster. And here's a cool thing about the director field, right? If I add a director that doesn't exist in the database yet, like Luke Downing, I've not got around to <laughs> directing my own movie just yet, you also have to upload a portrait and a date of birth, okay? And then we take that data, we create a director in the database, we link it to the movie. However, if the director already exists, as is the case with James McTeague here, we just send the director ID over and the form handles that. So that's going to come in useful later on, important knowledge uh, to keep in mind. This came out all the way back in 2005. So now you feel old. And it was rated R, 132 minutes. And what is it? Robin Hood with masks, basically. <laughs> Let's click add movie and V for Vendetta. There we go. It works. So why don't we jump straight into testing this and the approaches I talked about earlier. The first is that snapshot approach. Now, this is not my approach. I didn't come up with this. This is actually something that uh, JMac, Jason McQuarrie talked about a few Laracons ago. So you should definitely go and remind yourself uh, by watching the talk that he gave on the subject. I'm sure he's enjoying uh, his seat from the viewing party right now. So I hope, I hope you don't mind me talking about it, JMac. but here you go. So there, there is one slight caveat to this approach, and that is you have to be using form requests. As long as you're using form requests, you can use this method here, assert action users form request, drop in the controller, drop in the controller method and the form request you want to use. If you are not using that form request, the test will fail. After you've got that in place, you're going to capture the rules from the request. So here we are, here are the rules, and I'll copy them just now. Once you've captured the rules, you're going to paste a copy, a snapshot of those rules inside an expectation or an assertion. And the whole test will finally look like this. Now, you could compare this style of testing to double bookkeeping and accounting. So, so double bookkeeping, you write all your equations in one book, you write the same equations in another book, and if the totals come out to the same amount, you can kind of guarantee that things have worked correctly. And in fact, if we run this test, PHP artisan test, filter it down to just the snapshot, yeah, it works. So very quick to implement this test. However, it assumes that you understand that one plus one is two. If you are double bookkeeping and you think one plus one is three, it doesn't matter how many books you keep, they are going to be out. So it's very important that you understand Laravel's validation rules and that you don't make mistakes and that you test manually in the browser. Let me illustrate. If I jump into our request again, and I'm a junior dev, and I think, oh, there's nothing wrong with adding the int validation rule to the name property. Well, hopefully you're all screaming because that's obviously incorrect. But as long as our snapshot also has the int rule on it, when we run the test again, it still passes. In other words, our test is telling us the application is fine, but you and I know full well that it's not fine. And although it seems silly that we would ever miss something like this, on a larger form, where the rules are complicated, you can easily make a mistake like this. So because of that very problem, I tend to reserve the snapshot test for very simple forms, perhaps with just a single or two or three fields on it. If you want something with a bit more power, maybe you should reach for an array test. And an array test might be what most of you think of when you hear the term validation testing. We log in, we make a post request to the movie store endpoint, we pass a payload, the payload is almost all valid apart from one or two fields. And those are the fields we expect errors on. Then we check that the response includes a certain validation exception. We check the property and the name. We do that for every single rule 
in our form. Now, of course, this takes a long time. You can see I've only, I've only checked three validation rules here, and I've taken up 48 lines of code, which is probably the exact reason why JMac came up with that package in the first place. But we can clean this up a little bit and make it easier to write. All we have to do is introduce a shared array. So I'll take this duplicate content that we have in all of these tests, and I'm going to jump into a before each hook. So before each, no, no points here, runs before each test in the file. If you're using PHP unit, you can do uh, setup, which does exactly the same thing. So this valid data, and I'm gonna drop my valid properties in there. Obviously this is not valid. So let's change this to be V4 vendetta like so. And once we have that in place, we can actually go ahead and remove all of these extra fields from these tests that we don't need. And then we'll use PHP 8.1 to spread out the valid data and override just the name property. If you're not using PHP 8.1, by the way, you can do the same thing with array merge, but uh, PHP 8.1 supports spreading with associative arrays. So that's super useful. But you can see the tests are now so much simpler. We've removed so much boilerplate and duplication across these tests. If you look carefully, however, you will realize that the tests are still very much the same. In fact, the only thing that changes between them is this line here where we pass the data and this line here where we pass the errors. Well, when you see that pattern, it's time to refactor to a data set or a data provider again, if you're in PHP unit. And I've already gone ahead and done that in interest of time here. So here's the valid data array and here's the refactored test. You'll see that the test function accepts data and errors. And instead of hard coding them, we just pass them in. So there's the data, there's the errors. And now each validation rule is a single line in the data set, which makes this so much easier to work with. Like it still is going to take longer than doing the snapshot test, but you're actually testing your application logic here, which is really nice. And on more complex forms, it's what you really want. You want to make sure that your forms work as expected. So I just add a new line here whenever I want a new validation rule. However, even with this refactor, the shared array method starts to fall apart when things become more complicated. And in order to demo this, why don't we take another look at those director fields we talked about earlier? You see, if I want to test anything to do with the director, because these are all interconnected, right, using required with and required without, I'm still going to have to lug around all of those properties. So, so check this out. We've got a test here. It checks that the movie is linked to the director. Well, we're using the shared array, sure but we still have to lug around the director ID, name, portrait, and born on fields. Then we have another test. It checks that the director's portrait gets stored correctly. There are those same four fields duplicated. Now we don't want these in all of our tests because the data is only necessary if you're creating a director at the same time, which we're not doing in all of our tests. We have to do the same here, look, four fields all manually inserted again. The reason we, we have this is because a shared array is nothing more than an array. It's a very basic data type. We need something more powerful for these more complex use cases. It's when you see this that I recommend you reach for a request factory. Now, request factories are not built into Laravel. They're actually a product created by the company I work for, Worksome. And we created the package because we were fed up of having to do this over and over again. So we thought, why not just give it to the community? So Composer Require Dev, Worksome forward slash request factories, get it installed put it in all your projects and benefit. Once it's installed, we can say PHP Artisan, make request factory. We'll call this the store movie request factory. And I'm going to copy this shared array from the top of the file, right? So I'll copy the data from it and let's jump into that store movie request factory. Now we have this definition method. This should look very familiar if you've ever worked with Laravel's model factories. And that's because we've tried to keep the APIs identical so that you feel right at home from day zero. Now, what goes in the definition method? Basically, the smallest amount of data required to make a valid request. In our case, it's the shared array. So let's drop that in there. Now, some cool things we can do to clean up. We don't need to use uploaded file fake because requ request factories know you want fake images a lot of the time in your requests, and you can just say this image. We'll import the movie rating enum, and we'll import the director model. We don't have to create the director model, which can actually cause some tests to fail if you are comparing actual IDs and aren't expecting duplicate directors to happen. I often come across that in tests uh, from time to time. You can just pass director factory instead and we'll only create the director where necessary. So that's super useful. Once you've got that in place, it's time to jump back into our factory test, 
and start refactoring. So let's take this manual array and remove it. And we'll say store movie request factory will create a new instance and we'll pass it the dynamic data from our data set. All right. And then we're going to call create, which will transform this from a request factory into an array that can obviously then be passed to our movie store endpoint. Let's check that work, shall we? So PHP art is in test. And we'll filter it down just to this factory file. And our first three tests are our data set tests. So yeah, it worked. We've successfully refactored uh, to use our request factory. Let's carry on and take a look at these more complex scenarios. So we have these director fields, as we mentioned earlier. Why don't we get rid of the array first of all, store movie request factory, new, no data to pass into new this time, but we can call create and we could pass the director fields directly into create. But why would that be any better than using a shared array? Well, it wouldn't, we'd be duplicating the data. Instead, because we're now in an object oriented approach, we could just extract a new method with director like this. So let's extract that method onto our request factory. And anytime you want to alter the state of a request factory, well, you call the state method. Again, if you've used model factories in Laravel, you'll feel right at home, it's no different. I'll drop the director fields in there. We can clean this up by saying this image instead of having to worry about the uh, fake uploads. And so far we've been passing director ID in as null, but still including it in the payload. What if we want to completely remove it from the request payload? Because you shouldn't have to pass a director ID if you pass these other fields. Well, we can do that. We just use the without method. So without will remove any properties that you define from the payload. In our case, we'll remove the director ID like so, right? Let's run our tests again. And you'll see something interesting. We get a failed test. This is because request factories have actually picked up an edge case bug in our code. This is really cool. So if we jump into the movie controller and take a look at this method, which gets called, you'll see we're using array access syntax to access the director ID, right? Now, obviously that works fine if we send the director ID over, but make it null. But if we never include director ID in the payload, PHP is gonna throw an error. So why don't we refactor this to say filled? And we'll say director ID, We'll run the tests again and everything should pass. So I think that's really cool because I would never have written an unset function using a shared array in order to catch that error. I would have just shipped that and then a user would have complained about it. But thanks to request factories and how easy that made the process, I was able to do it in just seconds. Okay, let's go back to the factory test. I'll copy this line of code, one line of code, and we'll replace all of this code here in this test with that one liner, super nice. ID auto completion, all the rest of it, so nice to work with and so fluent. Like how nice does that test look? Let's move on to the last test where we're checking the date of birth. Now we're being very specific about the date of birth here, right? 1985-0101, 1985-0101. It would be nice to keep that specificity in our test. You can absolutely do that. There's nothing to stop you doing that whatsoever. So when you call create, you just pass any fields you want to be super specific about there. And we can still remove all this array. We're left with a super clean one-liner. Let's run our tests one more time, make sure everything works. Of course it does. And we can jump back up to the top now because we no longer need this shared array. We remove it. And what we're left with is this gorgeous test file that is so easy to maintain. I mean, think about it. If you need to add a field to your form, you come to the definition method, you add your field here. You need to remove a field from the form, you remove it from here. All of your tests automatically get updated. You'll barely have to do any changes when you make a giant, uh, obviously breaking change in your form. So I think that's really cool. And I think you're really gonna enjoy it. One more thing to show you. Let's take another look at this data set and specifically what would happen if we wanted to test one of our director fields when it comes to validation? Imagine we wanted to say, look, if you've passed director name, but you haven't passed director born on, then director born on has an error because it's required with director name. Okay, we want to test that validation rule. Well, if we were using the array syntax that we've used here, we'd have to pass a lot of fields because you also need to pass the other director fields and you would have a very messy data set. Here's the cool thing. You can pass request factories, other request factories. And so what that means is you can do something like this. Store movie request factory, new, with director. So give us the director fields, but then remove the director born on field, right? Remove that field. And obviously at that point, I would expect the errors to be director born on. And I think it's required when, right? 
so required when, and we don't have to change any of the logic here. We don't have to do conditionals based on whether the data is an array or a request factory. It all just works. If I run this again, yeah, there's our new test, right? Now, obviously you'd give it a label so that it's nice and pretty in the test output, but you can see how simple that is to work with. Like if you need to use an array because it's only simple, use an array. If you want a request factory because you get the extra power, use a request factory, mix and match. You know what? That's basically a nutshell of those three approaches, the rule snapshot, the shared array, the request factory. Uh, pros and cons, rule snapshot, very quick to implement. One rule, all of your validation rules are covered, but you're not actually testing the logic of your app. You're just testing that the rules you've set are there actually are there. So make sure you test thoroughly in a browser. Make sure you read the documentation on the rules and don't make assumptions. And again, I would only use this approach for very simple forms where you're absolutely sure nothing can go wrong. If you need a little bit more confidence, then why not look at a shared array? All of your application logic will actually be tested. All of the data stays in one place, in one file. Your shared array at the top, your tests underneath. But in certain circumstances, it can still be tedious to write. You have to unset arguments. You have to uh, still lug around properties when you're working with complex validation like required with and required without. So if you need the extra power that only object-oriented approaches can bring, then there's the request factory. Now, granted, you move the data into two files. You've got your request factory file, and you've got your test file. But if you can live with that, I mean, you still have a single source of truth, right? You can still update all of your tests by just updating the request factory. And that means you can write multiple test files for a single request. So if you want to split your, your test uh, structure up into loads of files for one request, you can absolutely do that because now you've got a single source of truth for all of that request data. Obviously, as well, complex validation logic is hugely simplified. Think about the with director method that we were able to easily extract. And if you're removing data, you've got the without method. If you're working with files, you have a file and image, loads of helper methods that are just built in to help with the common use cases you'll come across when working with factories. But it's not one size fits all, right? So choose the method that works for you and your team. Have a discussion. Decide what you want to do. And, and just enjoy it. Like, just make sure you're writing the tests so that you have confidence in your code. Okay, before I finish, there is free swag. Uh, a parrot isn't the, the, the best uh, model for these things, but he was so angry about not being overly involved in this talk that he asked if he could model for it. So I said, yes. Basically, uh, you can win a free work, work some t-shirt and a uh, Laracast, a free month of Laracast subscription. All you have to do is decipher the blurb in the Mission Impossible movie uh, that was shown earlier in the, uh, in the talk. So if you can do that, uh, then DM me on Twitter at LeapDown in 19 and I'll send you your prize over. You may find my blog downin.tech very handy for deciphering that message. All right, but with that said, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed, hope you learned something, have something to take away. Enjoy the rest of Laracan Online. Thank you. Really great stuff as always, appreciate it. You are welcome, thank you. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. All right. Last lightning talk. Let's see, Colin's coming in. There he is. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Good. All right. You look good. You sound good. Take it away. All right. Thanks a lot, Ian. Okay. I'm just going to share my screen and we'll get this going. All right. Actually, I just want to step into now we're fine. All I can right. see it. Perfect. All right. So thanks a lot, Ian. Okay. Before uh, we dig into this grab bag of goodies, though, what I want to do is uh, just talk a little bit about myself and where I work. So my name is Colin DiCarlo, um, and I'm a software developer. I work for Vehicle. We're a software consultancy that's located in Ontario, Canada. We specialize in building web apps using PHP and Laravel on the back end and React and Vue on the front end. Uh, Vehicle has been a very long time supporter of Laravel and Laracon, and I'm really excited and grateful to be able to give this lightning talk to you today. And I just hope that you enjoy it. So we've got three goodies in the goodie bag. And what I wanted to focus on was tips that kind of fit into the category of either hard to document or maybe just not clearly documented. Now, the last thing I want to be very careful, I'm not trying to throw shade 
on the documentation effort for Laravel. It's a very big framework, does a lot of things. So catching everything in the documentation is really a difficult task. So my hope is that you find value in these tips. And um, it's not like when you go to a five-year-old's birthday party and you get some things that you really don't care about, like this ribbon thing or this balloon whistle thing or whatever these things that happen to end up on the ceilings in my house. Um, instead, what I hope is you look at this and you reflect and you think, boy, that was actually kind of like I was on the Price is Right Showcase showdown and I got this awesome living room set and this... <laughs> This dehydrator just cracks me up. This awesome food dehydrator and, of course, a, uh, a brand new car. So in more concrete terms, the agenda for this lightning talk, which is hopefully more prices right than five-year-old birthday party, is we're going to be talking about how we can configure xDebug when you're using Valet and PHPStorm in your local development environment. We're also going to be talking about how you can shim database functions into SQLite when you're doing your testing. And then also model factories, giving pivot columns uh, different values on your many-to-many -many relationships. Buddy, this is the worst time, okay? You need to leave. Mommy is ready. I'm never getting those 20 seconds back. I apologize. Um, all right. So let's just, uh, let's just dig right in then. Uh, let's talk about Valet and XDebug. So for me, this is probably the most important tip of this lightning talk. Uh, for me, it's necessary to have a development environment where I can do debugging during my test execution and when I'm using the application through the browser. So setting this up is really important. Valet is an awesome tool and getting it to work with XDebug can be a little bit difficult. So I've got it all in a step-by-step uh, process. I've drawn the line at installing software, so there will be no live demo, but I will demo it working um, at the end of this uh, at the end of this tip. All right. So step one is we want to install the xDebug extension, and you can do that using the peckle command line tool. So we're going to say peckle install xDebug. That's going to generate a whole lot of output that you're likely not going to read, but you do want to make sure that it says that the build process completed successfully and that xdebug was installed and it's enabled. So you can validate that by running the command php-m. What that does is list all of the modules that PHP is actually loading in the runtime. And you can see here under Z modules that xdebug is actually there. That means that it's been installed and PHP knows that it's there. The next thing we want to do is configure the xdebug extension. So PHP gets all of its configuration information from INI files. You can run the command PHP dash dash INI, and that's going to give you a lot of information about the configuration files that this iteration of the PHP process has loaded. What we want to pay attention to is this line here called scan for additional INI files in this directory. This is where we're going to want to put the configuration file for xdebug, OK? That configuration file is going to look like this. It's just one line, and I promise that's the only thing, xdebug.mode equals debug. So with this happy little one-liner, we can create that file with that content. It's really important at this point to restart Valet. That will restart the PHP process and make sure that the new xdebug configuration is loaded into the FPM service. All right. So we've installed and configured xDebug. Now what we have to do is allow the browser to start a debug session. So that actually happens using cookies. The PHP process is going to look for a cookie in the request called xDebug session. Now the value of this cookie doesn't really matter much when you're working with Valet. So what I do is I set it to the name of the IDE that I like to use the most, which is PHP Storm, all day, every day, uh, real diehard fan. Um, to send that cookie, we're going to use a browser extension. I use uh, Firefox, so I use the xdebug helper for Firefox. If you are a Chromium user, uh, you can use the xdebug helper. Once that extension is installed, you get this little bug in the address bar, and that's the xdebug helper. When you click on it, you're presented with a menu, and to begin a debug session, just select debug, and the little bug goes green. 
That means that with every request that the browser is going to send, it's going to include that X debug session cookie. All right, feeling good so far. This is the next step, which is teaching PHP Storm where the entry point to the valet application is. And this is kind of the most difficult to uh, describe. So I really hope I do a good job here. Um, when valet, when you go to your browser and you make a request for a valet site, valet handles that request and you get your application. It feels a lot like magic, uh, but that magic is actually just three services that are configured really nicely to work together. First is DNS mask, then Nginx and PHP FPM. DNS mask's job is to say this valet site that um, you're asking for, that's hosted on this computer. So send the request to the local host. Nginx picks up that request and then says, okay, I'm going to service this request by passing it through valet's server.php script. That's what I'm talking about when I say the entry point. Every site that valet serves runs through this server.php script. So we have to tell PHP Storm that that script exists and where to find it. You do that in your preferences for PHP Storm. What we have to do is we have to find the PHP settings and then add an additional include path. So you click the little plus, and then we're gonna specify another directory to look in. That opens up a finder window, and this is where we have to find where Laravel Valet is actually installed. Valet is a global composer dependency, so it exists in the .composer directory in your home folder. Once you add that include file, everything is set up and we're ready to demo. All right, so this is the application that I'm gonna be demoing with. It's called some CMS. Some CMS has users and those users are on Teams and they can write posts. I'm gonna start my debug session by saying I want to debug here with my xdebug helper and then scooting over to PHP Storm. To start a debug session, I need to click on this little receiver here that says start listening for debug connections and then set a breakpoint here. I'm going to return to the application and refresh the browser. With any luck, we've stopped execution at our breakpoint. I can step over the line. I can inspect what users is. And ultimately, I can allow the request to finish. Going back to the browser, we see the pages that we wanted. So that is setting up xdebug when you're using Valet and PHP Storm. All right. The next thing that I want to talk about is shimming database functions into SQLite. So it's really common to use an in-memory database um, like SQLite in your test and CI environments, but use a different database in your development and production environments. Uh, the Eloquent ORM just papers over all of the, dis, uh, the differences in those database vendors and allows you to talk to everything the same way. There are times, however, when you might want to use a native database function in your application that SQLite doesn't provide. Um, so here's an example of what I'm talking about here. We have this new feature for some CMS where users want to see what are the aggregate number of posts that they've made in any given month of the year. We know that we can get that information using this SQL statement, but we're using SQLs or MySQLs date format function, and that is not available in SQL Lite. We're going to push forward though, and what we're going to do is add an attribute to the user model called monthly post that runs an eloquent version of this query, making use of that native MySQL function date format. We're going to have to shim it into SQL Lite in our tests, and I'll show you how we do that. Okay, so let's go to our user and I'll show this is the monthly post attribute that I was talking about. And here is that big ugly query that has been turned into an eloquent ORM query. And then here is the date format function. Now, again, this doesn't exist in SQLite, it only exists in MySQL. So if we check out the user activity test, we have a test here that says we can view a user's aggregate posting activity. We're creating a user that has five posts. Three of those posts are going to be created in September. And two of those posts are going to be created in August. We're going to make a request to our user show route and assert that it was successful. 
but then assert that we also see that there were three posts in September and two posts in August. So I'm going to run this test and it's going to fail. Um, this is the tip inside the tip. Read your error messages. This is telling us that there is no such format, no such function date format. So we have to add that to SQLite at runtime. How you do that is by using a function called SQLite create function. And that's available on PDO connection that you can get from the uh, database facade. So SQLite create function, here we are. And this is what it looks like. So we're gonna get the PDO connection off the DB facade and SQLite create function accepts two parameters, the name of the function that you're adding to it and then a PHP implementation of what you want that function to actually be. This is on the level, in my opinion, of live wire when it comes to magic. I have no idea how this works. I'm just happy that it does. The best thing is for my testing purposes, I don't actually have to implement the entire date format function. I just have to implement it to the point where I'm gonna satisfy my tests, which is formatting every date that comes in, in year and month. Now that I've stubbed this in to SQLite, I can go back to my user activity test and run it, and it's gonna succeed. All right, trucking right along, trying to make up time for when my son came in. Uh, we're gonna take a look at model factories. And when we've got um, model factories and giving pivot columns different values. So to put this into context, some CMS has users and it has teams and users can belong to multiple teams and on those teams, they can have different roles. So we have to have this pivot table in between them uh, that has that column specifying, you know, what team they're on and what their role is. Now, the documentation talks about how we could create this setup when each user has the same role. So say we want to create two users with the same role of member. That's in the documentation. And this would be really useful for a test, like if we want to make sure that one member can't actually edit the test of or the post of another member. But the documentation isn't entirely clear of how we could also create um, two users where one has a member, has a role of member, and the other has a role of editor. This would be useful for a test that says, as an editor, I can edit any post of a member on my team. So I'm going to show you how we can actually do that, though. So here is the last demo. All right. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at, oops, we're going to take a look at our post policy test. Let's give ourselves a little bit more space. And here are those two tests that I'm talking about. The first test is another member on the same team can edit other use, can't edit other users' posts. So we're creating one team, and then we're going to use the user factory to create two users. And they're both going to be on the same team, and they're both going to have the same role of member. We're going to create one post for one specific member, and then instantiate our post policy and assert that our other member is not allowed to update that post. So I'm going to run this, and it's going to work, hopefully. Perfect. And it was really easy to create those two users with the same role. Now for this next test where I have an editor on the same team can edit any post, I have a different setup. I still have creating that same team that they're both gonna be on, but I have to duplicate the code here to create one user that has the role of member and the other user that has the role of editor. Then I'm gonna validate that it, the editor is actually allowed to update the post. I'm going to run this test and it's going to pass. And that's great, but what I would really like to be able to do is to use a stanza that's kind of similar to this in that other test. So in order to do that, what you do, I'm just going to delete these lines because we don't need them anymore and change this to our editor, is we can actually use a sequence where we specify the values for the pivot columns. So I can create a new sequence here and I can say that the first user is going to get the attributes that are contained in this array. And the second user is gonna get the attributes that are contained in the other array. 
So basically our member is going to get the role of member, and then our editor here is going to get the role of editor. So I'll run this test and validate that our refactor worked just fine. The test passes, and that is how we associate different pivot column values to different users uh, using many-to-many -many relationships and factories. All right. And uh, that's my time, a little bit over, but thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the content and uh, thanks for the opportunity again. All right, great as always, thank you. No trouble there with a little interruption. We always got to shake it up a little bit there. All right. All right, how are we going? Thanks, man. Okay, wow. Last talk, we're here, we made it. All right, uh, let me bring him in. I'm getting a little punchy myself here. Been a long day up early. Okay. I think Steven's coming in now. There he is. Uh, okay, cool. Where am I? Hey, is this working? Oh, uh, yeah. I awesome. see you. It's just not, uh, your screen isn't shared, but I do see you. All right, cool. So share my screen. There we go. Looks good. Awesome. Anyway. Thanks. Okay, so what are web browsers? Web browsers are the gateway to our digital lives. They're how we check our emails, talk to our friends, do our work. We're all here because of Laravel, and Laravel is a web framework. But the thing about web browsers is they do so many different things that they're overly complicated. They, they're basically magical creatures at this point. There are so many different functions and features and abilities that they do that trying to understand it all is virtually impossible. Now, one of the problems with a tool like this is because there are so many different features, it's hard to keep across what, what is where and what you need to use. And when it comes to security features, that's especially important to understand what do you need to care about and how can you keep your site secure and what features do you need to worry about when there are so many different options. So when we think about magical creatures, you've got this, right? It's a unicorn, you've got the rainbows and the stars and it's all cute and cuddly. That is not a web browser. Web browsers aren't cute and cuddly unicorns. They're demons of flame and shadow. They're overly complicated creatures that could easily bite you. So when you're getting started on trying to secure your website and use browser features to secure your website, where do you start? Well, I like to use a tool called securityheaders.com. And the way this system works is you give it a website and then it'll run a scan and it'll tell you the security features that are enabled on that site based on the headers. So jump over to the browser if I can find it. Here we go, cool. And so on securityheaders.com, what we can do is type in my one of my domains and I'll go scan. And what it's doing now is it's checking the website to see what headers are enabled and what security features I've enabled on this site. As we can see, we've got a big fat F and a bunch of things that aren't enabled. So we currently don't have any security features enabled on here. So let's go through and add these security features and try to tighten up the security of our website. First up, we have strict transport security. Now, strict transport security jump over here is a response header that solves the problem of upgrading um, your connection from HTTP to unencrypted to encrypted. Now, the way it works is when the browser re hit, re makes a request to your site and sees the strict transport header response, the browser remembers that. And you define the max age attribute on the header and then the browser will, will remember it for that time. So that's defined in seconds. And so the idea is if you set say a max age of a week, then every time the browser tries to go to your site within that week, it will require HTTPS. It will require an encrypted connection. It won't let you connect to it via HTTP, via an unencrypted connection. You can also add in include subdomains as well, which means that when you access any of the subdomains of the site, it will require HTTPS immediately for that. So if we look at say developer.mozilla.org, we're at the subdomain developer. 
So if they have HSTS, the strict transport security header defined on, on one of the subdomains or all of the subdomains really, I should say, if they have the header defined and it says include subdomains, then accessing developer.mozilla.org will set the header in the browser and it will remember it. And then if you go to say a different subdomain, like I don't know, plugins.mozilla.org or the root domain or something, the browser will automatically know it has to use HTTPS. It has to be encrypted because we have include subdomains, which is really handy because the problem we have here with HSTS, with strict transport security, is what's called the trust on first use problem. And the problem here is that the first request, the browser doesn't know it needs to be secure. And so it can send an, an insecure connection. And that's the first use. And if you manage to get in the middle of that, so you've got your browser and you've got the application, if you can get something in the middle, so be a person in the middle attack between the two, the first request, if you can hijack that, you can hide the, the strict transport security response header and the browser won't know about it. And so you can hijack that request. So this is where the preload directive comes in. And what the preload directive does is it opts in to use the HSTS preload list, which is a list of domains that are required to be preloaded for HTTPS, for insecure connection. And this list is shipped with Chrome and Firefox, Opera, Safari, IE, and Edge by default. So when you download Chrome, it has a list of the preloaded domains in it. And that means that anytime you try to visit any of the domains on the preload list, the browser will require an encrypted connection initially. There is no initial unencrypted connection that can be hijacked and that it avoids that problem entirely. So let's implement this header and have a look at it. Oh, here we go. So going to Forge um, and I'll go up and edit my configuration. And I just wanna point out those who know Forge know it does implement a couple of security headers by default, I have actually removed them for the sake of this demo, but I'll tell you which ones they are. So where is my strict transport security header? Pop it up in here, done. Okay, so I'm adding the header strict transport security. Here is our parameters in here. We're setting max age of that, which is one year in seconds. We're saying include subdomains and we wanna preload it. So we're saying for all of the requests to sgcz.net and all of its subdomains will require HTTPS. So now that's saved, we'll jump over to the preload list, sgcz.net, and I'm gonna go check eligibility status. It's gonna do its thing, have a think, check the domain, nice big green screen. So now it's telling us that we can submit the domain to the preload list and we can assert that we are the owner or have permission. And we can assert that we understand that this will require this domain and all subdomains and nested subdomains to have encryption, to have HTTPS. And if I click that button, it will add it to the preload list and then in a future update of Chrome and Edge and Safari, et cetera, will be released with that domain in the preload list. So we can look at other domains, say google.com and give that a run. And we'll see here that that was a surprise. I should have checked that in beforehand. Um, let's try a domain I do know is on the list. But that's my domain name. Here we go. So it's telling us that Stephen Reese Carter is actually preloaded in the preload list. And if you looked at the preload list in the latest Chrome download, you'll see my domain name. You'll see a whole bunch of different domain names. But if the domain isn't on there, we'll go back to Google, the surprising non-inclusion on the list, we'll see that it will give us an error. It will tell us that it can't be added to the preload list because it doesn't match the rules. And we can look through the instructions and it will actually tell us how to add the list. The problem with the preload list and HTTPS in general is that it requires encryption, which that's the point. But if one of your domains doesn't need encryption for whatever reason, or isn't using it or can't use it, then you shouldn't use HSTS, or at least you need to be careful. Maybe you add it for each individual domain and subdomain, but you don't add include subdomains and you don't add it to the preload list. Ideally, you want to move all of your domains and subdomains that can't work over HTTPS onto a different domain and keep them off your main domain. So your main domain can be preloaded, can require HSTS. Sorry, it can require HTTPS. Um, but that's something you need to work out on a case-by-case -case basis. So the other thing is, as I mentioned, the max age directive here is when you're rolling out strict transport security initially, maybe start with a low max age, say, you know, five minutes or an hour or a week, because the, that's how long the browser will remember it. But if you get it wrong, if you realize that it's broken something, 
that's how long you have to wait before it resets. And you can't go around to all of your users' browsers and reset this value manu you, manually. You can't tell everyone, okay, go do this complicated set of instructions in order to cause the browser to forget about this domain so you can access the HTTP version. I don't know if that's even possible. So you don't want to do it. So if you need to start off with a really small max age and then double check that everything is working and slowly increase that, and then once you get that up to a year and you've got subdomains enabled, then you can think about doing the preload list. So I'll go back over to the scanner and I'll rerun it. And as we can see now that we've jumped up to a rating of D with strict transport security has been flagged. So fantastic. So we've got one of our headers enabled. We're gonna skip content security policy and we'll go straight to X frame options. So X frame options is a header that dictates when the current page can be embedded in something. So say a frame, an iframe, embed, object, etc. And the idea behind it is it's for stopping click jacking attacks. So um, the two options that you have are X-Frame options deny and X-Frame options same origin. Deny says that this page cannot be included, sorry, cannot be embedded, full stop. You can't load it in a frame or an embed or anything else. Same origin says that you can include this page in a frame or embed it on itself. So anything on the same origin. And by origin here, I mean the same scheme, which is HTTP or HTTPS, the same domain name, including a subdomain, the full thing has to match and the port, which is assumed from the scheme, but doesn't always, isn't always assumed. Um, so as long as that matches, you can load it in a frame. And this is actually the default that Laravel ships with, sorry, Laravel Forge ships with. So if you're using Laravel Forge, it will have X frame options, same origin already set in the header for you. And it is, a, it is the same default, unless you specifically need your page loading in a frame on a different domain, on a different origin, then this is a good default to use. So I mentioned before that this is designed to stop click jacking. And so let's have a, let's have a look at click jacking. I'm gonna show you what it is so you have a better idea of how it works, because it's actually pretty cool. So this is um, Port Swigger's Web Security Academy, and they have a bunch of different labs in here for learning all sorts of different web security tricks of security techniques, and it's a lot of fun to play around with. So go check it out. It's also completely free. So I'm going to open up the lab and it's setting up, um, uh, I don't know, a container, um, virtual machine, something or other. I'm not really sure the infrastructure, how it works, but just give it a moment while it sets it up for us. Fantastic. And so what this works, so I'm just going to log in to create the account. Um, oops. I think that's the login. Awesome. Okay. so. What we have here, we are logged into this web application as the account whiner, and we have two options. We can even update the email address or we can delete the account. And if I go to the exploit server, um, let's just bring that over here so it's next to it. Okay, and if we go to the exploit server, what we can do here is build an exploit in order to try and attack the site. So in a click jacking attack, what we wanna do is cause the user so who is logged into this account, to this site, to do something. And in this case, the easiest one for, me, for us to um, play with is delete account. So what we wanna do is cause this user to delete their account by clicking that button. But we don't want them to think they're clicking the button. Instead, we want, the, want them to think they're doing something completely different. So I'll go to our exploit page and I'll grab my exploit code, dump it in here and I'll make it a bit bigger. So what we've got here is a div, which says, please click me. Then there's an iframe here, which I need the hash for. There's an iframe here, which is loading the my account page, which is the page on this tab here. It's loading it in the frame. And then we have some CSS, which says for the iframe, give it relative positioning. We want to set the width and height, opacity 0.5, Z index of two. And then the div, we want absolute positioning. We want to position it 500 pixels down, 60 across, Z index one. I'm going to store that in the exploit system and then view exploit. And it's going to load the page. There we go. It's now loaded the page. So it's slightly hard to see, but what we've got here is a frame. And inside the frame, we have the Web Security Academy page with the My Account page. And we can see I can fully interact with it. It's at the top of the thing. So I'm entering into the email address. I can hover over the buttons and they're going to highlight links or highlight. It's a bit hard to see, but over the delete account button, it says, please click me. That's where I've located the text. If I jump back onto this page before, now opacity of the frame. 
if I make that a really, really tiny number as opposed to 0.5 and go store, and then view exploit, we now have a blank page and it says, please click me. If I hover over it, you'll see the mouse changes to the, the clicky hand. It's just a div, but we've got the clicky hand here, right? And we'll go up a bit and we've got another one. If you remember correctly, above the delete button, which was located here, wink, wink, we have update email address. So here's another button and here's a field where the email address goes. If I keep going up, you'll find some other clickable things. There's my account over here somewhere. You can see at the bottom of the screen, if it's coming through on Zoom, that these access to the hover over of the link. So the frame is still there. It's still interactable, but we can't see it. All we can see is please click me. If I open up the browser console and then I click on please click me, nothing happens on the page, but a whole bunch of stuff happened over here, including this one here, which is a delete call, request your URL to the web, um, the application my account slash delete, send a post request with a 302 response. Um, and so that's what we would get for a delete. So we've fired this delete request off. The user has no idea what they've done. And if I go back into the account and refresh it, we're now logged out because we've deleted the account. So that's click jacking. The user has no idea what just happened. Nothing was visible to them at all. If they weren't looking at the console, if we weren't looking at the console, we wouldn't have seen it. And that's click jacking. And so by setting up the X frame, what is it called? X frame options header, we can prevent that from happening. Because if we have deny or same origin set, then the frame here would not load. The browser would refuse to load it because it's being loaded in a separate site, in a separate origin. So let's add that into our site or back into our sites, given I turned it off from Forge's default and go save, wait for that to tick through. And here's the point where I hope that Forge doesn't go down for maintenance or something during the middle of my talk because that will ruin the rest of my demo. Okay, give that a refresh. Oh, it's, sometimes it takes a few minutes for it to come through on the cache, so that should go through shortly. We'll move on and come back to it. Okay, so content security policy. The next one on here. Now, the point of a content security policy is as a backup plan. It's not your primary security feature. It's kind of there if other things fail. So what I mean by that is here we have a very basic form. And if I type in hello world, we'll see that it, it outputs the text here and it gives us the URL. Now, what if I put in this little script tag that will say alert, boom, and go submit. Boom, we're running our script. So this is a very, very simple example of cross-site scripting where the page isn't escaping the output properly. It's just dumping it straight on the page, which allows us to execute our own JavaScript and then in, um, hijack the page and do whatever we want. Now, ideally the solution for this is you escape the output. And so you either don't display the script tag at all, or you convert it into special characters and then display it in raw text. Either way, the JavaScript shouldn't actually execute. But what if that fails? What if someone discovers a vulnerability in your site that shouldn't exist? Well, in that case, you want a backup plan. And that's where a content security policy comes in. Because you can use a content security policy to tell the browser what resources should be loading on your site. And so for a good example, we'll jump over here into this page. And we have a very simple content security policy defined here. So the header content security policy we're using a script source directive, which means for scripts being loaded on the page, we want to allow self. And self means resources that are loaded from the same origin, such as you know, app.js files. It's not talking about inline script and code, it's talking about external files that are loaded via the script tag. And the same thing for you know, fonts and styles and all those other directives as well. And we're also allowing um, resources coming from the apis.google.com um, domain as well. And if, if any JavaScript tries to run on the page that doesn't come from one of these two places, from itself or from apis.google.com, the content security policy will block it. So in the screenshot down here, hopefully you can see it. I'm gonna just make it a bit bigger, wrong way, a bit bigger. Uh, it says here, refusing to load the script evil.com slash evil.js because it violates the following content security policy directive. And so the content security policy has blocked loading that script because it's not defined in the list. And so you use the content security, content security policy to define all of the different resources that are allowed. 
The other benefit of this is when you're using like third-party tools, and if one of those is compromised and someone adds additional things in there and it's trying to load extra scripts and resources on your site, if your content security policy is set up properly, it will allow the third-party tools to work, but it won't allow them to load additional things. And so if someone breaks into them and adds another thing from a different domain, the content security policy will block it. Now, they are quite complicated. There's a lot of different steps involved in setting them up. So I, you can't just go out and push it out to your site now and have it all work flawlessly. That's where a tool like Report URI comes in. So your Report URI is a reporting collector for, for browser reports, essentially. It collects reports from all sorts of different browser security tools and a few other things as well. And so when you define your content security, content security policy, um, give me a sec, do I have the good one over here? Um, no, sorry, in the wrong spot. So when you define your content security, content security policy, you define the reporting URL that you wanted to send reports to. And then those reports can be collected. So if we jump back over to our demo page, actually, no, I'm gonna add a header. Sorry, I lost my track of where I was going. So I'm gonna add in a content security, content security policy header in here now. So you can see here, there's the header name. Then we've got default source self. So default source is basically a collector of all the different sources. So you've got fonts and scripts and styles, et cetera. And if they aren't defined specifically, it'll fall back to default source. And so what we're saying here is we want to allow any resources loaded from self, loaded from the same origin. We also want to allow forms to submit to itself. We don't want forms to submit anywhere else. So you can't send a form off site, but you can send a form to yourself. And then we've got frame ancestors. So this is actually overrides your X frame, oops, your X frame options header by um, allowing you to define the, the behavior with frames with your site. And so you don't need the X frame options header if you're using a content security policy. It gives you much fine grained control and you can allow your site to be specifically embedded on specific sites, but not others. And then as I was saying before, we have report URI here. So this is the reporting input. Oh, sorry, it keeps jumping around. I'm just gonna put a new line so it's easier to see. This is the reporting endpoint that you can define in your content security policy. And anytime there is a violation of your policy, it will send a report through to that URL. And then you can monitor the reports that are being sent to see what's happening on your site. So if your policy is blocking someone who's found a vulnerability, the vulnerability won't work, but you'll get a report. So you'll know about it anyway, which means you can go in and fix the vulnerability. And you can also set a read only, a report only um, header such as this, which defines the rules that the browser um, will enforce, but only report. So it won't, sorry, it won't enforce, it will only report, which means that any violations, it will send a report to the URL, but it won't stop it from happening. And this is perfect for adding a content security policy to your website, because it allows you to safely block everything, get reports for everything, and then build your content security, content security policy over the course of say a week or a month, without the risk of anything breaking. And then you can deploy the policy on your site once you're happy it covers everything. So um, put that in here, save that. Now, while that's loading, this is the content security policy wizard in report URI. And this thing is absolutely fantastic. I love it. Because when you point the reporting URL, which I had on the previous slide to here, what it will do is, it, is it will try and determine all of the different directives that you're missing from your site based on the reports it's getting. And we can look through here, we'll go to the end because it's easy down here. We've got a bunch of style reports in here and it's saying that style from self. So I'm loading my own styles and there I've got inline styles and I've got some GitHub asset styles as well. Now I'm ticking the boxes because these are all allowed. This is a WordPress site and I am inventing GitHub just I think it is. This is actually my own website that I set up the report on. And so I'm allowing all these things because I know they're allowed on my site. Now under script, however, we've got, yeah, later in scripts works, unsafe eval and inline. Um, yes, I probably do need to enable that because this is WordPress um, and it's a necessary evil of that, unfortunately. Facebook should not be loading on my site. I'm guessing this is someone's embedded Facebook browser snooping. So we're not going to tick that. And as a side point, content security policies actually stop snooping um, in built in-app browsers from things like Facebook, which is really cool. Gonna allow GitHub and Fathom and then Twitter, um, Cloudflare stats. No idea what this thing is, so I'm not gonna tick it. And so what you can do is you can go through and um, tick all the different things that you wanna run on your site and then go add selection to content security policy. 
So it's going to list, remove them from the list in here. But if I go over to policies, it now has generated the policy for me. So this is the policy that I can put on my website. And the way that you'd use the wizard is you'd set up the wizard to report on everything, block everything. Then you'd iteratively go through and allow the things that you know should be there, add them to your policy, then update the, um, the, the header on your site with the new rules and the policy, and then repeat the process. And so you'll see new reports coming in over the course of a week if anything new is discovered, and you'll slowly refine your policy and you'll get less reports in as you add more to your report only header. So if you remember, we added in a, a proper header in here, not the report only headers, this one enforces. And if I go here and refresh the page, we have our payload in the URL, we should see nothing. The pop-up is gone. If I open up the console, and I'll just make it bigger, we can see the browser is telling us it refused to execute inline script because it violates the following content security policy directive. And so it's blocked our cross-site scripting attack here because the policy doesn't allow it to happen. And this is exactly the point of the content security policy. It's also giving us suggestions of how to enable it. So say we could add any unsafe inline keyword, which would enable it if we wanted to, or if we want to enable this specific bit of JavaScript, we can use the hash of it, or we could add a nonce. Um, we're not going to look into details. We don't have time for any of that, but to give you an idea, there's just, there's lots of different options to make it work and it does help you implement things. Okay, where are we going next up? So refresh that, we should have, great, we're up to a B, we've got three out of the six. Next up is X content type options. This is another one that is enabled by default on Laravel Forge. And what this header does is it tells the browser to ignore what it thinks a downloaded file is and listen to the content type being given by the application. And the purpose of this is if someone can maliciously upload a file to your site that your site thinks is a JPEG, or an image or some, something benign and simple. But when the browser figures out the type, sees it's something different and then tries to execute it, then your users can get hacked. They can get malware, they can download malicious files. And so by enforcing adding this header, it tells the browser, ignore what you think the file is, listen to us. And so if your application was tricked into uploading a file that it thinks is an image, the browser is going to download the file thinking it's an image. It's not going to execute it. It's not gonna do anything with it and it keeps it safe. There's only one value for this, which is no sniff. And there is no reason why you shouldn't enable this unless you're doing something very specific with files and downloads that the browser needs to actually use its intelligence for. But I can't think of a reason for that. And if you're doing something complicated like that, then you should already be aware of what's going on here. So let's add this back in here. And as I said, it's a um, default Laravel header anyway. So let's make that all nice and neat. Is a default Laravel header anyway. So it should already be enabled if you're running Forge. But obviously if you're not running Forge, then definitely check if this is enabled. As I said, there's no downside to it. So that's done its thing. We're gonna refresh this. Hopefully it will update quickly. No, it'll take time. That's okay. Next up, we have the referrer policy. Okay, the referrer policy defines how referrer information is transmitted. And there's a few different options. And it's worth pointing out that the de current default when you don't define it option is this one, strict origin when cross origin, which means that if you're making a request um, that goes across origin, so goes to a different site where you've got your know, different scheme, excuse me, you know, like scheme, domain name, subdomain or port or whatever. If you're making that, a different request over there, it will only send the origin, the, the basic root of the request, you know, like um, this bit here, when it's making that request to a different site, um, which masks the paths and keys and anything else that's in your URL. So it's quite a sane default, but you need to be aware of this if say you're working with like an internal toolkit and you don't want the domain name or any information to be given about it. You don't want people to see what the name of your internal tooling is. In that case, you could use something like strict origin, which allows you to send referral information internally when it's all within the one application, but not send it externally. Or maybe you, your application is a completely public website, there's no login, and you want to broadcast the page that was being used, well, then you can um, unsafe URL if you really want to. Um, or if you want to block referrers entirely for whatever reason, you can do no referrer. So there's a bunch of different options in here that you can use depending on the need of your application. The same default here, strict origin when cross origin, is what the browsers do already. So it's, you can probably leave it as is and be fine. 
but it's nice to define these things absolutely so you know with certainty that if the default changes, that's still what's going to happen. And as I said, if your, your application has special needs, if you want to mask its domain for whatever, for privacy reasons or something, then you need to look at a different directive. So let's add that one in like so. Oops, let's go. Add that in. We should get content type options should be updated now. Okay, the permissions policy, previously called the feature policy. And the syntax has already changed. It's, it's complicated and confusing. Um, a better way to look at it is the, the header generator, which gives you an idea of what it does. So the permissions policy allows you to enable, sorry, disable and enable the different features in the browser that you want the page to be able to access. And so if your page isn't going to use like the accelerometer and autoplay and battery and camera and full screen, et cetera, then you can disable them all. And that way, someone if someone manages to hijack your site and run their own code, they can't enable these features. And these features are used for snooping on users and all sorts of other malicious things in some cases. And so you can use the permissions policy to lock things down. And you can also use it to say you can only do, you only like use the camera on self or on custom domains. It's, I haven't looked too much into it, so I don't really know much about it. Um, but there's a lot of things in there. If you're doing websites that do a lot of interactive, interactive things, it would be a good idea to check this out and get it working for your site. Okay, we're gonna add that in. Now it's worth pointing out that um, with the feature policy, though the permissions policy, sorry, it can have unintended consequences. So if you're running a browser extension that like, what's it called, Vimeo screen recorder, the way it works is it embeds a webcam inside the page that you run it on. And so the permissions policy will actually stop it from working. And I had an issue, interesting issue a while ago where I was trying to use Vimeo screen recorder to record a, record a screencast, but I'd set a permissions policy that was blocking the camera. And so it blocked the extension. I had to remove the header in order to get it to work. So you have to be aware of these sorts of things where, particularly with extensions, because they embed things in the page and the way they work is by injecting their own stuff on your page. And so things like permissions policy and content security policy and other tools like that can actually break extensions or cause issues with them. Okay, we're gonna run the scan now and we should have everything lit. Ah, oh, great, okay, cool. Give me a sec. Okay, so that's all of those things. Um, now it's worth, as I mentioned before, you might remember there are three default headers that Laravel Forge comes installed by default. We've got here the frame options, we've got content type options, and we've got XSS protection here. Now this header is, let me just go to the page, is a non-standard header. It was added um, by some browsers such as Chrome, um, Safari, and Internet Explorer that was designed to work with their cross-site scripting filter. And the idea of the cross-site scripting filter was as another layer of protection to prevent cross-site scripting. Problem is cross-site scripting is really hard to detect when you don't know understand the context of the application. And in some cases, the cross-site scripting protection actually allowed cross-site scripting to happen, which I'm sure you can understand is a huge problem. And so the audit has been basically removed. Firefox never actually implemented it or the header. Um, and so the, you don't really need to use this header before and header anymore. It's, I wanna point out though, that the vulnerable directive that was used that allowed for cross-site scripting vulnerabilities was this one here. Laravel uses the block mode, which means that even though it's enabled and in some legacy browsers, they will actually respond to it, it's not gonna cause you a problem. So it's safe to have there, but there's no need to have it there basically is the point I'm trying to make. But I just wanted to mention it so that you're aware in case you see it in your Forge config or in whatever else your site is running on, if you see this header around, you know that you don't need to worry about it. It's no longer an issue. Okay, um, where next? Okay, so this site, as I said, tells you about all the headers you should have and gives you a rating. It also tells you about upcoming headers and it does get updated by Scott Helm who runs the project periodically with new headers. The expect CT one here, I'm not sure why it's on the list um, because it was something that Chrome set up in order to to test their certificate transparency reporting requirements, but it seems to be depreciated and it's not being used anymore, but it did serve a specific purpose. So Scott's leaving it up there, I think, because he's not sure what's happening with it, but you don't really need to worry about it. I don't think it's gonna last very long. 
I think it'll probably be removed soon because it doesn't seem to be they have much support and I don't think the browsers are, are following it anymore. There's also the cross origin policies down here and we'll get to those later in the talk. They are a fun pile of complexity that I will give you an, a summary on, but we'll get to that later, I'm getting sidetracked. Okay, so back to our slides, because we have more. It's not just about the headers, there are more things to do as well. So sub-resource integrity. Now, the point of sub-resource integrity is to prevent malicious third parties from uh, affecting third parties, if that makes any sense, probably not. So, what, so when you have a website and you're loading in resources from third parties, then you, you're trusting that the third party script that you're loading in is trustworthy. But if that third party script can be compromised and something else gets added to it, how do you know? What might be a perfectly safe script to run today might have some malware added tomorrow which might hijack your site. And this is where credit card skimming comes in. And um, oh, I can't remember what they're called. There's a grid that does it. Um, Magecart. This is where Magecart comes in and that's what they do. And it happened on, it's happened on so many different websites, big government websites that use like accessibility tools from third parties. Those have been targeted and broken into in order to run scripts running on the government website. The sub-resource integrity is designed to solve the problem. Oops, ah, wrong way. Um, oh, I lost my browser. Okay, so in order to demonstrate some resource integrity, I'm going to pick on Alpine. Now, just to caveat, Alpine is not insecure. I'm not, I'm only using Alpine because it provides a really beautifully simple example. That's the only reason I'm not trying to pick on Alpine and say it's insecure in any way, shape or form. Don't sue me. Okay, when you go to Alpine.js, it tells you to install Alpine using this line here. But the problem is, you have no control over what is in this file. Granted, yes, it's running on unpackage.com, which is a CDN and it's it's running and it's gonna pull in the Alpine for unpackage.com and we trust the Alpine developers. But what if unpackage.com is hacked? What if someone gets into unpackage.com and adds malware to every single script they're serving? How do we know? What if one of the Alpine developers is hacked and someone manages to, sneak, to slip something malicious into the code that they're pushing up to the, the content delivery network to part of the package? What if MBN is um, compo um, compromised? What if any of other options that could modify that file and allow someone to get something dodgy in there, someone to get something malicious in there? If we're doing this on our site, then that malicious code is now running on our site. And the content security policies do help with this, but only to a point. We can tell in the content security policy, we want to allow code from unpackage.com slash alpine.js but it has no control over what is being run. And that's where sub-resource integrity comes in. So what we wanna do is we wanna tell the browser, we only want to run a specific version of this file, a safe, a safe version of this file. And we can do that using a hash. So I'll grab the URL and I'll go in here, that one in, and we have there the script tag and we've got source there integrity. So the integrity here contains the hash of the content of the file. And the browser, when it loads this script tag, will check to see if the contents of Alpine.js matches the, well, sorry, generates a hash that matches the hash in the, the tag. And if it doesn't match, then it rejects it. Sorry, if Alpine, if the, the file changes at all, then the browser won't run it and it keeps the site safe. But the problem, and hopefully you've already figured this out, is that this changes. This points to the latest version of Alpine.js. And we don't know what the hash is of every updated version. We don't want to have to update the hash every time a new version is updated because the site will be broken between the update going out and us changing the hash. But unpackage.com makes that really easy. We can go straight to the URL and it actually redirects to the full version to version. So we've got here the version number 3.10.3. .3. There's the file there. And if we dump that into the generator, we now have the full source in here and the hash. So we can use that on our page we can put that script tag in and the browser will always load 3.10.3 .3, and it will verify that it matches the expected version from the hash. If that file has changed, it, so that file should never be changed for legitimate reasons because it is a version that has been released. So if it's changed, then it's probably dodgy. It's probably malicious and we don't want it running on our site. Yes, we've locked to ver Alpine version 3.10.3, .3, but is that such a bad thing? It stops any our site works on that version and any bugs that are introduced or any feature breaking changes or any major features like that that could cause problems won't be uploaded on our site. 
we do need to keep abreast of the changes and we do need to update it. And so when a new version rolls out, we can update the hash. But for now, but from a security point of view, this is a much better solution. Having to manually update the, the URL and the hash is a much better solution than potentially being vulnerable to someone taking over that file. Okay, so that's sub-resource integrity. Now, you'll notice that it includes this cross-origin thing here. And the reason for that is that in order for this integrity hash to work, the server that's serving it, it's unpackage.com, needs to be returning an allow access header. And if I try and put in a different page, one from my website, we can see here that it's throwing an error because it doesn't have the header. So this is the header that tells the browser that we allowed to return this resource and it prevents the browser from sending any authentication information such as cookies to the server, which keeps the request completely anonymous and it keeps your privacy and security up to date. So it's, there's a lot of complexity in here that we don't really have time to go into, but it's all part of cross origin resource sharing, uh, which, yeah, so that's the header that you need on your content delivery networks. And if you're, if you're serving resources that get loaded by other people on their sites, then you really should have this header set up because then it removes, rem removes that sensitive information and, and allows them to use the integrity attribute and to ensure they're getting the right version of the file. So as I said, this is part of the cross origin resource sharing. And there's a bunch of different headers in here that allow you to control all the different aspects around it, headers, credentials, et cetera. We don't have time to go into any of this, but if you're running a system that provides resources that are used by other sites, by other origins, then you really need to look into this and understand how it works so you can properly configure it to, to your user's advantage. Like I said, browsers are horribly complicated creatures. You can easily bite yourself while trying to protect yourself. So just be careful, implement these things slowly and carefully, maybe run them on test sites first, look for reporting options, Make sure that you're not just diving into things and throwing it all up immediately because you could break stuff. And hopefully someone gets this reference because this is a great movie. Okay, same site cookies. I'll just go through this quickly because I'm pretty sure I'm running out of time. Same site cookies, and you'll probably recognize same site lacks down here, are a way of defining cookie behavior when you're going between different sites. So what I mean by that is if you're on site A here and you're making a request to a get this going to a different site, if it's a safe request, i.e. a get request or a um, head request, then same site lacks and same site none will allow the cookies to be added, which means that you can click through from site A to site B and your authentication cookies will be enabled on site B on the first request, so you're logged in. If you enable same site strict, it will block the cookies. So even if you're doing a safe request, say a get request from A to B, the cookies won't be sent. And that's a security feature. And there, there are reasons why you might want that. But most of the time, you just want same site lacks, which will only protect those safe, which will allow you to use those safe requests. If you're running an unsafe request, such as a post and a put and a delete, anything that changes something, same site lacks will block the cookies. And this is cross site scripting. The other, no, it's not cross scripting. Cross requ um, request forgery protection, um, cross site request forgery protection. And so, if you set up a form on site A that submits like a form request to site B and you have same site lack set on the cookie, the cookie won't be added, which means that you can't set up a CSRF attack, a cross site request forgery attack on your site that triggers a form and submits data to the second site because the cookies will be blocked by lax. Um, and so it's the same default is to have lax. That's what Laravel comes with. Um, so unless you're doing something that revolves multiple domains and sending data between them, you should be fine running lax on your site. Um, or if you have, but if you have like extended security requirements or you need to send data across and you have a really interesting setup, then you need to look at the other options here. Now, cross origin isolated, which are the different cross origin policies I mentioned before. The point of these is to mitigate the vulnerabilities that were discovered in Spectre and Meltdown, which exploits speculative execution and shared cache. Basically, a bunch of the features that allow CPUs to do things really quickly and give a bunch of performance benefits. The problem is that this affects websites too. And so if you're running code and you're pulling resources from multiple locations, then these vulnerabilities can be exploited to exploit, to load information from your site onto a different site and, extra, and pull information around, which is a problem. And so to use the advanced browser features that can be used to exploit these vulnerabilities, such as shared array buffer, performance now, JavaScript self-profiling API, et cetera, you need to look at these headers. 
And I mean, they're not simple, they're, they're quite complicated and there's lots of different moving pieces. So I don't have time to get into it today, but it's something to be aware of that if you do complicated things on your site and you need these high performance wins, then you need to look at these headers and configure them across the different origins, across the different um, parts of your application that are doing stuff in order to set it up and get it working the way that you want it to work. And keep your security going, obviously. Okay. There we go. Hopefully that's given you a good overview of the various different security features in your browser. Um, and as long as you don't wake the dragon and you know steal the cup, then it should come back to bite you. Um, as I said before, definitely take things slow, add things one at a time. A bunch of the security headers we looked at on the site, you can easily add, especially with the same defaults. But then you've got things like content security policy, which does take time, and your strict transport security, which again takes time, depending on the complexity of your app. Cool. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you learned something. Uh, feel free to send me an email or reach out on Twitter if you've got any questions, want to continue the discussion. Um, I've got a discount running for Laravel Security in depth if you want to learn more about security. Um, and I do Laravel Security audits and penetration tests. So check that out too if you want help with anything security related. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we just did a bunch of this stuff in our help spa application and it's uh it's confusing and complicated stuff so uh when you had this it idea is. for the talk i was like this is perfect uh expose people to a little bit of this world and uh what's possible there so all right awesome. thanks a lot appreciate it no worries okay do some final business here all right well, we made it. We did it. Another one in the books. Uh, thank you to all our sponsors. Um, thank you to all you for attending. Thanks to Taylor, of course, um, and Eric, who helped me run it, and uh, uh, the moderators who helped join in, and all the people who helped make this possible. Really appreciate it. Um, uh, and Kaneko and Flick. So thank you, everybody. Uh, if you have feedback, we'd love to get it at laracon.net slash feedback, just a quick little MPS survey. So that would be awesome if you could take literally one second and fill that out. Um, and of course, on your way out the door, if you could like and subscribe, that would be amazing. Uh, and we will see you next fall. And hopefully we'll see you in person at the live Laracon in the spring. But until then, have a good year. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.